Welcome to the quarter century celebration here at the Konami Esports Arena in sunny California. We are celebrating 25 years of Yu-Gi-Oh! history over an entire weekend marathon. And we're kicking off day two with an event that a lot of people are excited for. And I'm happy to be bringing you the action. I'm Kangas. I'm joined by the legend himself, Billy Briggs. So excited to be back. We had a late night last night, but we're here yep. early in the morning for the UDS tournament. I can't wait to see who's going to win today. And Steve Darling joining us again for the kickoff show. Absolutely happy to be here. Yesterday was an incredible series of duels, but today is going to be that much more. So again, mm -hmm. if you love Yu-Gi-Oh, sit back. This is the place for you. We just wrapped up some of the anime marathon as well. We saw some of Sevens there. That was oh, fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so good for people to get into Sevens. It's such a great series because it's like real card game vibes. They they open packs. They don't get what they want. They post YouTube videos. Nobody watches them. <laughs> but they find a way to make their fan format work out in the end. So it's just such a great show. <laughs> just living the average, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh duelist yeah. life, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, shout out to the GX episode last night. We saw uh, Fonda, oh, Fonda Fontaine, Fontaine show yeah. us the one card uh. combo of Bonfire and Burning <laughs> Algae. So uh, we'll be seeing probably more of that uh, coming up yeah, so this weekend, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah. You got your bonfires from Maze Millennia. Make sure you also get your burning Burning algae, algae is yes. an important part of that combo. Not a lot of people talk about that one. Uh, but let's uh, start off the show by recapping what happened yesterday. For anybody who missed it or those that are just still reliving the glory, it was a great day. The Master Duel Invitational ended with uh, the Jesse versus Josh match. And even though Jesse's team won... It was still a 2-2. We didn't get the, the finale. They didn't finish the best of five. So what do you think, Billy? Oh, uh, man, yeah. I really wanted to have a decisive winner there, but it's just going to keep on going. We're going to have to wait till the World Championship to really see. I, I mean, I can so. only assume they're going to be there again. We've seen them here facing out, but I don't know who the best player is. We still have to wait to find out that answer. The rivalry just keeps <laughs> building here, Steve. It's like we can't, we can't learn who actually wins between these two. I know, I know. Even though Jesse Cotton will be competing today in the Ultimate Duelist Series, right, finding a undisputed champion title would be great, but it still doesn't settle the rivalry. We still have yep. to find out who's the better between the two of those. Yeah, and then the Duel Links Invitational as well. That finals, I mean, you said it was a late night. It was a late night. We played the maximum number of games in that final. Serenity had to win six duels and did win six duels before their opponent won three. Yeah, that was really fascinating. I mean, going into the game, you said, yeah, Serenity had to win twice as many games as Zeta, but the whole time we felt like Zeta was the underdog right? in that match, <laughs> even with those handicapped games like to play around with. And in the end, you know, Serenity was able to hold it down for their team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sir, honestly, props to Serenity. Oh, if yeah. you're in that kind of situation, we were down to joking about it, Steve, about like, okay, the team tried their best. You were part of the team that was trying oh, their best yeah. to get I Zeta did those my wins. Part. I absolutely <laughs> did my part. It was one of those things where I wanted to make sure that I contribute to the team to put the captain in the best possible yep. position. And we did our part, but it was such a great set of duels seeing Tachyon going up against Shiranoi. That's really what you're seeing a lot in the Kaiba Corporation KC Cup right now on Duel Link. So mm -hmm. anybody who was inspired by that duel, I mean, it was incredible, but you can literally relive it right now on Duel Links as we speak. Uh, but props to Steve, undefeated. The casting desk yeah, is undefeated. Oh, at the the you want to you're going to leave you hanging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. Uh, so that was awesome to see that. I think that the, the Duel Links finale was the most anime you could possibly get. Oh, yeah. I really, the comeback was phenomenal from Serenity. Just yep. Exactly what you get where you, the underdog is unexpected to win, but finds a way. Yeah. Uh, so that's the Master Duel and Duel Links Invitationals kind of in a nutshell there. It was awesome to see all the competitors play. Uh, so shout outs to them. Uh, but now focusing on the rest of the weekend, we have mm. the return <sighs> of the UD. Yes. Now the undisputed UDS. Steve, I want to start off by sending it over to you. Talk to me a little bit about the history. For anybody at home who maybe isn't aware or uh, maybe those who have just forgotten, this is a long time coming oh to get goodness. to this weekend. So this has been basically a decade in the making. If you don't know what the UDS is, the Ultimate Duelist Series, it was a tournament program in which you couldn't just, one, you know, enter in as a competitor. You had to qualify for it via UDS points. You got these from your local tournaments, maybe a regional championship. Even Yu-Gi-Oh! judges were eligible for it, too. And then, after you qualified, you had to travel to the Ultimate Duelist Series events. Then, after that, you still had to play six to nine rounds of Yu-Gi-Oh! and win that belt. So every one of these duels, like what makes an ultimate duelist? It's specifically that they didn't just win, they had to prepare and prepare and prepare and win against people of equal caliber. So everyone here, they're not just ultimate duelists, they're also seasoned competitors in their own right. We have world championship competitors, but 
every one of them got this giant wrestling belt. And you might see some of us <laughs> broadcast so cool. wearing these wrestling belt pins. That gave you VIP status. So if you've seen those belts sitting at the front of one of those YCSs, that meant that one of those Ultimate Duelists was at the event, and they got VIP treatment, meaning they got a buy for the first two rounds. Nobody had to test them. We knew that they were that good, so we launched them right to the third round. And many of them even qualified or made the top cut after that, showing they really were those Ultimate Duelists. So it's incredible that we're here now to find out who among all 16 competitors that are here, including one person who won two belts, is the undisputed Ultimate Duelist. I mean, this is like the first time we've ever actually done something like this, where we've taken the winners from a whole tournament series and brought them all back to yep. compete to find that one undisputed champion. And I just can't wait. There's so many, even just so many good players. Everybody out in that room is one of the best in the best. Imagine like the, the UDS tournament, the way I like to kind of visualize it is you're just taking top cuts from YCSs and throwing them all into a big pool of players <laughs> to compete for a title belt. It's like, wow, that's, that's like the best of the best right there. But there was plans to do this big tournament to say, okay, we're gonna figure out who the undisputed is. So, you know, we have all these people walking around with belts. Well, who's the best one with the belts? But then a little thing happened in 2020, which delayed those plans. I know a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh uh, players had some, you know, it, a lot of things stopped in that mm -hmm. year. We did have to switch to remote duels there. Remote yep. duels did keep us going, but it's it's so lightning and electric here for those of us who have been in the studio, seeing all the players get ready. They're getting their instructions from the fabulous judge team. Some of the hardest working Yu-Gi-Oh judges are here. and you can tell that they are just in it to win it. Everybody just has like their game face on. So as fun as the Invitational was, this is a different vibe. These are, again, ultimate duelists and they are battling it out to find out who's the best among them. The Undisputed. It's four years in the making for this event here, but I like that you say a decade in the making <laughs> from the initial belt being handed out. And that's pretty big treatment that you get there for having one of those belts. So now, I mean, imagine uh, the flex that you get to do if you say, well, I just beat everybody else who had a belt. So <laughs> undisputed, undisputed right there. Uh, also really cool prizes that they get for that. But with that said, let's take a look at the players that will be competing for the undisputed title. Going through them. Coming in all around the world, starting off with Ryan M, Juan A, Aaron F, and Osman A. Yeah, I want to take a quick look at Aaron Furman. He is my pick to win it this weekend. He is a YCS champion, UDS champion. He's competed at the World Championship. He's one of the players of the highest caliber. I'm going to have my eye on him to win it all this weekend. I like that belt, too. The the white band is really nice. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the blue yeah. eyes one is amazing. Aaron's a nice guy, too. All right, next up, Alejandro, Joseph, Jeff and Rudolph. Oh, this is a stack slide. I mean, Alejandro Berger, he's the only two-time UDS champion. You see him with the two belts there in his picture. Incredible duels. Joey and Jeff, also amazing. Rudolph, great in his own right, but Jeff, you know, is the winner of that Shonen Jump Championship. Edison, a lot of players love to go back in Time yep. Wizard and play that format from April 2010. I'm cheering for Jeff's cat. cat. Also. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I no, the cat's in it to win it. I think a lot of folks will be looking at that cat. Up next, Cameron, David, Andre, and Tyler. Uh, David, one of the nicest duels I've ever met. Cam, the man, Neil, is hungry for a win. He has that UDS win. Has, wasn't able to win a YCS just yet, so I know he's really going to want this win here. Andres, he's won plenty of YCSs. Would love to add to his amazing resume as well. And Tyler, phenomenal duels in his own right. And next up, finally, the last couple to win it. We have Paulo, Jesse, Shunping and Oscar. Yeah, Shunping actually won the last UDS in Tulsa, kind of brought Dragon Link over here. Jesse Cotton, you know him. We saw him on the Master Duel Tournament yesterday. The only five-time YCS champion. And Paulo, of course, he's won a UDS, he's won a Team YCS, and a regular YCS, all within like a month period of each other. Mm -hmm. So, and Oscar definitely here in it to win it as well. All these duels are incredible. Just have a completely stacked lineup again. Just looking at that, these aren't just ultimate duelists. You'll see them at your local shops. I know specifically yeah. from going to some of my shops, I've seen Cameron Neal just hanging out there just week to week, grinding it out in the matches because they'd be dueling whether there was a prize or not. They really are duelists at heart. Yeah, I would, back when I lived in Texas, yeah, I used to play Cam every day. We'd be at the local Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm talking during the day. We would just be playing for hours. No one else would be in there, and we'd just be locked into that, you know, hyperbolic time chamber, yeah, just yeah. dueling it out. How many times do you think they brought their belt into locals with them. You know, I know the YCS <laughs> here, like the official tournaments, you're getting that bump. Do you think they do that at locals too? I never saw Cameron bring the belt to locals. That'd be so great to be like, excuse me, I let do. me just 
oomph to yeah, drop that yeah. down. They just wear it the whole time. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that might be uncomfortable. Uh, but also a two-time uh, winner as well. One, one, one of the duels has two belts. Yeah, right? Burger. He's just a, yeah. the only two-time UDS champion. He's an incredible That's player. That's crazy. And the, the, having that picture just with the two belts, yep. that is phenomenal. It looks so awesome. He's That's definitely one flex. of the players to watch this weekend. I was going to say, favorite to win, maybe? Yeah. I mean, nobody else has two belts. <laughs> it's true. true. Could yeah, be the yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> lots of multi-champions in here, but the only two-time UDS might be the one to look at. Yeah, uh, Steve, do you have a, a, maybe a favorite to take it? I mean, we just saw them all, so it's fresh in our minds. Anybody you know, that's I, kind of rising to the top? It's hard to pick a favorite. I will say there would be something magical if Jesse Cotton won, and I know that's not my hometown <laughs> hero, True. but if you have somebody with that many credentials and they've got the belt and they've got the ring, yeah, it might give Joshua Schmidt a run for his money. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, I think it's just cool to see that many top-level duelists together, but it is important to note that that's across many different years, many different... Uh, uh, you know, eras of Yu-Gi-Oh, if we want to call it that. So now coming here, we're in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be the top power decks for this time. I'm curious, do we think, Billy, that there's maybe a skew for players like Jesse who are, you know, won back in 2020 as opposed to earlier on? Or do you think that still all mm. these players are in top form? Yeah, I mean, I do think there are more players that we've seen more recently on the feature matches. I mean, we've seen Jesse win a YCS multiple. I think he won two last year. I don't know. I, I lose count with Jesse when he just keeps <laughs> winning all the YCSs. He pretty much into I we're getting it past I one think, hand. So yeah, we're going to have sure to use two soon. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm pretty sure he topped 10 events last year, 10 or 11. Ooh. Something crazy and a phenomenal number. So, yeah, you definitely want to look out for those players. But even, like, the players who won, like, the older ones, like Ryan Murakami, definitely never want to count him out. Yeah. He won one of the earlier UDSs. But, yeah, it could really be anyone's game. I mean, because a brand new set just came out, Phantom Nightmare. So the meta's kind of open for everyone yeah. that could have tested the past couple months and be this ready card. for it. Yeah, from this card. This card right here is going to go crazy this weekend. <laughs> we, can, we can already We can agree that, on that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That. And uh, that is what's exciting, though, because this technically, while well, we do have YCS Costa Rica going on, this is going to be your first peek into the highest level of play of Phantom Nightmare, and it yeah. might even give you some ideas for next week's Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series Las Vegas. So, again, point. Phantom Nightmare is an incredible set. It impacts so many different decks. We're probably going to see a lot of Fonda Fontaine yeah, plays. Yeah, yeah, a lot of Fonda Fontaine plays. Before we get too much into the weeds of the meta, though, let's take a look at the format for the weekend, so that way we can catch everybody up at home as to what they're actually going to be watching and what it looks like. So, Bill, walk me through how the format of the undisputed UDS will go. That's right. So the, the Ultimate Duel Series are known for having not as, a, as many players as a YCS, but still having a ton of rounds. So even though we only have 16 players, we are going to have six Swiss rounds, 45 minutes each, best two out of three. And then we're going to cut to the top four, come back for day two, and we're going to find out which one of those last top four players will become the undisputed Ultimate Duel Series champion and get that incredible ring. Exactly. I'm happy you highlight that because day two, <laughs> the winner there, they're going to walk away with the big prize. Let's take a look at the prizes because that's what everybody here will get something. They're all uh, top class duelists. So this, Steve, walk me through the package here. Everyone's walking away with at least this. So just an incredible set of Ultimate Duelist Series prizes. During the Ultimate Duelist Series, you could redeem your points in order to get these prizes. They're just getting all of them. So you've got pins that are reflective of the different belts that we gave away. There's also various things reflecting. I mean, you can see Dandelion, a fan favorite, as well as Dark Magician, and so yeah. on and so forth. So there's just some great stuff there's as well as There's a little shiny flare wingman there. Yeah, <laughs> there's some good stuff. There's also those beautiful cloth mats that you see depicting Exodia, Elemental Hero Stratos, the Seal of Orcalcos, and no one will know that you are not an Ultimate Duelist when you've got that great Ultimate Duelist hoodie. Yeah, and exactly. I believe the, the, the bomber jackets are customizable, so I think they're going to have, uh, they're personalized for each player oh, as well. Oh, that's so awesome. It's going to be so really, cool. really Gorgeous. amazing. And yeah, getting those game mats, this has to be the best participation prize. I mean, maybe rival something of the World Championship. Yeah, In terms of what all the players are getting. This is up there for sure. I mean, that pot of green pin looks pretty yeah. nice. <laughs> but everyone's gunning for first. So let's take a look at what first place actually gets. Billy, this is a, a little more than uh, what everyone else is grabbing. <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to win this tournament. You can get that undisputed Ultimate Duel Series Championship ring, a super rare copy of another vs. Plutonia, the current YCS prize card, a new UDS cloth mat that's Black Rose Dragon. I actually have that right here to show off when we cut back to us. And also the three cloth mats, Exodia, Silvery Calcus, and Stratos. Mm -hmm. You also get their custom dual series jacket and an custom dice set for this tournament specifically. That's awesome. But the biggest one, the one on everybody's oh, mind right here. 
the ring. Just I mean, a gorgeous, gorgeous ring. Now, this is just a render because we don't know who our prize champion is going to be yep. because we need to size it for them once they win. But again, it is 14 karat gold plated sterling silver. It's beautiful. You saw with all the diamonds, the rubies, etc. Yep. That that show. I mean, I don't know if you put that in a glass case or you just put your hand on the deck box and slam that on the table every time you show up to do it. Yeah. I mean, you get the bell, but the ring is incredible. And this is the dual mat. I'm happy you're being able to show that off here, Billy. That is beautiful. Oh my goodness. That's that's Ooh. gorgeous stuff. All right. Um, do, do you do? Do we get to keep that? That one's oh, this one's open, mine. So no, no, this one's mine. This one's coming home. Just kidding. Snap These are steel. only for the ultimate duelist. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to duel some of them afterwards and like challenge them for their game. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah. mm, that, I want that. Makes Give sense. me that. Shadow Realm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Ours is coming later. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, we'll, we'll, we'll we just have to win a UDS. Wait like ten years and then. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, we get a challenge. Actually, that's the the final boss. Is that the, whoever wins gets to play us? Oh, uh, Pegasus okay. style. I like yeah. that. I like that. <laughs> uh, well. With all that, a reminder for everybody at home that we do have a charity drive going on right now so you can get involved and help out here. Not only is it for a good cause, Doctors Without Borders, but there's a lot of cool stuff. So Steve, walk me through the charity drive. Oh, absolutely. Again, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Trading Card Game, Konami is hosting a charity sweepstakes with amazing prizes. We're showing them off on the table, but again, this is all to benefit. Medicine Sans Frontières, it's Doctors Without Borders, because just like Yu-Gi-Oh!, this is a message that goes across regardless what language you speak. Mm -hmm. Participants who donate 10 US dollars or more will receive one entry into the highest tier that their donation makes them eligible for. Make sure to check that website thoroughly because you don't want to miss it. We're going to pick 130 lucky winners that will be chosen at random for all of the great prizes. Yeah, and I believe we can take a look at some of those prizes you can get. So 130 uh, lucky winners will get some of this stuff that you see on the table right here. The uh, Just the case for the Kaiba briefcase is on the line as well. Uh, we got the giant Slifer card. We got so much cool stuff, Billy. Yeah, and awesome. We got this brand new. That's so cool. <laughs> Put it on, a hundred character game mat. Right here, I'll, I'll, I'll be so It's Figure. bigger than yeah, a regular yeah, yeah, yeah. game mat. It's a desk mat. That is but, so oh, many yeah. characters. And just having like everybody out here is so neat because you're getting every generation of Yu-Gi-Oh. So regardless of whether you started out at Duel Monsters mm -hmm. or you're just joining in on Seven, everything is depicted there, and that's so cool. Yeah, and this is just half of the prize. When you get a two, you get two game mats if you win this prize. So this is just one of them. But that's incredible. Definitely want to show off this brand new mat because oh, I think Manikeep. it is awesome. I found him. I was like, where's my guy? <laughs> yeah, find there your is. favorite character on here. He's kind of like a Where's Waldo for all the Yu-Gi-Oh characters. Oh, that's a fun game. Plan, actually, you can you know go to locals, just pick a character, go find them. There you go. This is how they're organized by the show. But so gorgeous, yeah. so gorgeous. Again, That's awesome. Please donate, please, because again, this goes to a great cause, and you do have a chance of getting something. But it's more important to benefit Doctors Without Borders. It's just so great. But we would love to be sending you these, and we can only do that if you donate. Yeah, a special shout out to Fanatic for providing these incredible uh, ingot little cards. We got Pot of Greed. We got Dark Magician right here. Uh, these are incredible, really high quality stuff. We also have some really cool plushies that have been donated as well. So, uh, yeah, come check them out. Uh, you can check them out by helping out with a donation. $10 to, gets you in. Big shout out to Great Eastern Pool, too, for the plushies. Yes, yes, Great Eastern. So, with all that said, we're getting ready for the duels themselves. We're ready for the introduction, at least for the show. So, now is when we can start teasing what is in front of us here. Because, Billy, Steve, you kind of hinted at it. We talked about it yesterday at the top of the show, but there has been a new set released. So, Billy, I'm going to send it to you first. What is the top dog right now when we're expecting uh, players to look at strategies coming into this weekend? Okay, well, it's definitely going to be Snake Eye something. It's either Pure Snake Eye or Fire King Snake Eye. Those are the things mm -hmm. you're going to want to look at. Uh, with Maze of Millennia and Fan Nightmare coming out, they got Bonfire. They got Promethean Princess, Bestower of the Flames. The biggest thing is Snake Eye's Poplar. Being yeah. something you can add off that Snake Eye Ash really enables so many different combos with the deck, and it's become really popular. We've kind of been anticipating this deck for quite some time, and now not only are we going to see it perform, we're going to see some of the best players in the world use it on the very first weekend that you're going to be able to see it. That's what I'm excited for because we've seen the tutorials. I've watched everybody online be like, oh, this is the combo. This is how you do it with this card, with that card. But seeing two top-level duelists pilot them, I mean, we're maybe expecting some mirror matches with that just being the top uh, expectation. That is going to be very interesting because you get into situations that, like, I would have no idea how to play it. I know the, the basic combo, but what happens when this happens? And then that what happens, happens when they stop? What you happens when you react? Yeah. So I think that's really awesome to see. Steve, do you agree? Is that going to oh, be the one absolutely. to look out for? So we just got the Snake Eye package added to Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, so a lot of yep. people at home are probably familiar with it too. But they're learning, you know, all these different permutations. However, the Fire King package isn't a Master Duel either, so this is really a master class of all these duels showing how great 
great these combinations go together. And it's true, it's one thing to do the combo when nothing happens. It's a completely different thing to be in that moment and somebody slam down that card that stops your plays, whether it's Cosmic Cyclone, Droll and Lockford, different things that can interrupt that deck. Mm -hmm. But these people are prepared for it. They know because they're ultimate duelists and now you'll get to learn at home, okay, okay, so this is what Jesse would do in this situation. That's what <laughs> yep. I'm gonna do. Oh yeah, I have my brain. What would Jesse do? Yeah. <laughs> and then I was lost in the game. I just, all right, what would Jesse do? And then, you know, I'm right back he on the He would not have added this many hand traps. Listen, uh, my bad. Or he probably maybe would have had enough. Maybe uh, not. <laughs> uh, I think maybe go on the board breaker route a little bit. <laughs> I think it's cool because whatever deck wins this has almost like a cemented place in history as the undisputed UDS championship deck, right? Oh, I think yeah. that's a high esteem to have. So I think it's a cool strat. It's a fun deck. If it does end up winning, it's also in a very esteemed position of it's, you know, hit a really strong finish at a, a top tournament. Definitely, yeah. And it's not the only deck here this weekend. While it is the most popular yeah. deck, what, there what are some other I mean, The other strategy that we might see this weekend, because it debuted in Phantom Nightmare, is Voiceless Voice. Mm -hmm. Ritual centric strategy mm -hmm. falls around low and her prayers for Skull Guardian to come down and protect her. But uh, there's also other strategies that can use cards like Dimension Shifter. Uh, so you have like Kashtir, uh, yeah. Fluandries. Because Dimension Shifter making you have to banish all cards uh, instead of going to the graveyard, really strong against the Snake Eye and Fire King cards since they all, you know, involve the graveyard. Yeah, I mean, Snake yeah, Eye yeah. can special summon from your banish, but like, but you're the, still in tough spot. The primary <laughs> combo, when we were talking about top players, how do they react? It's hard to react with the Snake Eye uh, deck if everything you're sending to the graveyard is going away because a lot of the combo involves getting stuff back from there. Yep. But I think as an ultimate duelist, you have to know that. You can't necessarily just say, I'm going to walk into Dimension Shifter and lose. So I would assume each of these duelists that has a great graveyard centric deck whether it's you know all the decks that we talked about or even voiceless voice they've got to have a game plan you can't just sit there and say oh it's dimension shift or i lose you mm -hmm. can put them on better habit i'm just saying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a winning strategy probably exactly though. exactly <laughs> but it, they've got to have a game plan and so again this is just going to be that master class of saying okay i did get dimension shifter I'm not going to panic. I don't even have to believe in the heart of the cards. I'm just going to do what it is I know works in the mm. situation. So that's what I'm really looking forward to is just seeing masterful plays. Yeah, like Alex said yesterday in his master duel game, or the duelings game, he's just like, I'm just going to do the yeah. best I can. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way you got to look at it. Yeah, I find myself in that position quite often. <laughs> uh, okay, so Dimension Shift is powerful. What decks can run it then? If we're thinking of maybe what you're playing around that, it is a very powerful monster. We've seen it be a terror in uh, past metas. So what do you expect here? It's any deck deck that just isn't going to be using the graveyard that often. Some decks like the graveyard, but they don't care if they lose it. So I think Kashtira was a great example, mm, Billy. Yep. Luanda Rees, they never worry about the graveyard anyway, right? They're just they banished. Anything, Are the birds yeah. back? Are the they, birds back? They could they be. Never they never left. They never left. They never left. Right, birds of a feather flock together. Around, you know? it, it shows you that even if your deck maybe, you know, Fluanda Rees wasn't winning every tournament a couple of formats ago, but now it could be coming back. So you really got to cheer for, well, your feather, your fine feathered friends. Oh, sure. fe yeah, Feather Storm. That's uh, that's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the oh, best Lundry's card. Yeah. Storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So, so if we're expecting maybe top deck to be Snake Eyes, and then you know Dimension Shifter being a very powerful counter to it, some of the decks that can play that. What about? side decks mm. what can people be playing in the side deck and what do we expect to be the popular cards because if, if we think that it's gonna be that popular that the majority of the field will have it well kind of got a target on its back when it comes to the side deck yeah so the both the strategies are really good at going first they really don't have if they go first they're gonna assume that they're probably gonna win that game so they're probably gonna dedicate a lot of their side deck to going second cards so you're gonna be looking mm. at cards if they're not main decking triple tactics talent maybe something like triple tactics thrust to go into a talent as well we also have my control that just went back to three change of hearts mm. available snatch steals off the forbidden limited list yeah so taking control of your opponent's monsters is a big way to uh, break the boards in the fire king matchup even something like uh, subversion of the snake eye the mm. simple Spoils mm -hmm. card that came out in Duelist Nexus. That's something you can side since you can add that off Poplar and pushing back that Amblowell into the Spell and Trap card oh, zone yeah. is a good way to prevent maybe the Princess from coming out from the graveyard. You can also use cards like Monster Reborn to take the Princess out of the graveyard to start your turn off. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. Dark Ruler No More is a card that I've kind of been looking at for okay. side decking right now because uh, Snake Eyes, they put up a lot of uh, monsters. They can have like a Bear yeah, and a Boral yeah. Load. Or if you're facing down like something like Tier Limits, they kind of 
not always have access to like Tierman's crime, so Dark Little More can really shut down the board that they make uh, that, as well. That's a more generic one, mm -hmm. right? You can get a lot of value out of it. But Steve, I don't know if you were following. What I heard a lot of was non-monster effect <laughs> well, <laughs> removal it's true, options. Though, and throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history, there'll be formats where like monsters are really strong, and so people are playing cards thinking about monsters, but they're not worried about spells and traps, and then yeah. vice versa. But I think Billy had a great point. We have so many different ways to take control of your opponent's monsters, and when you're running possibly the deck that you expect many of your strongest opponents to be running, taking control of their monster just means, oh, cool, I'll just take this combo piece right now and I'll begin my combo. Mm -hmm. And we did see that last year in the North American World Championship qualifiers when it was a lot of Kashtira mirror matches. Mm -hmm. People were using cards like enemy control to be like, no, I just, thank you for bringing yeah, this Kashtira yeah. for me. Now <laughs> I'm going to use it and I'm going to win this duel. Beyond that, I do think that Cosmic Cyclone is going to be oh, really yeah. important oh. because thinking about all these cards being, like you said, being pushed into the spell and trap zone, they could be brought back, right? Flamberge, right? A Snake mm -hmm. Eye monster might be able to just go ahead and special summon them back unless you go ahead and Cosmic Cyclone before that happens. So you just don't want to wait for your opponent to have a chance to do that. You want to stop it. And as we've seen, many of those turn one plays are about setting up the board and depending on which build you're using, using either something like Formula Synchron or IP Masquerina, putting it in the spell and trap zone so you can make some powerful plays next turn. Yeah. Cosmic yeah. Cyclone does interrupt a lot of that. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Cosmic Cyclone had a 100% play rate this week. And I do think that That's might cool. be the key card. Whether in the, It's almost good enough to main deck right now because mm -hmm. even something like Fire King Island can also help mm -hmm. you break the board because it can't be protected with the Fire King Sanctuary since it's being banished as well. But also talking about why Cosmic Cyclone is so good, I was saying about the going second cards, but Anti-Spell Fragrance, I guarantee oh, you, is going yeah. to be in these players' side deck. Oh, yeah. Since a lot of the decks do use those spell cards, they side in those uh, breaking board cards like Mind Control, Dark Rule No More, yeah. and then Anti-Spell can just completely lock that out. And with the Fire King deck, or the Snake Eye Fire King deck, uh, you're able to go into like Deco Talk or Heat Soul, you have an extra chance to draw into something like Anti-Spell Fragrance. Mm -hmm. So those are going to be some of, the, some of the key side deck cards we're looking at. And Interesting. I like that because it also, you know, going first, going second, you're able to use it uh, in the mirror match as well. Mm. Now, I I'm going to give you a hypothetical here. Who wins if in the mirror match one opens full combo and the other opens, you know, triple mind control, monster reborn, change of heart? You know, we sideboard all those. You just take the whole field. You're yeah, like, I'm playing with your guy. That's the situation. I'm going with the guy who wins second. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> give me that. Once <laughs> we if added take... up how many cards there were, I was like, if wait a minute. Can, if you can take all their monsters and monster reborn them and they don't have a way to get another fire monster yeah. on the field, it's over. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. done. <laughs> they're, they're cooked, you know? <laughs> God. It's just one of those things where, like, you would never expect to see that hand, but again, that is what's making the ultimate duels, is you have to be able to play out of everything. And we saw mm -hmm. people in the lobby, when everything was getting set up, they were still play testing, even interacting friendly with each other, knowing that their opponents are gonna be there, because you just have to be ready for anything. So I'm really excited to see what the heads up plays are this weekend. Yeah, we got to see a lot of players interacting, and I wanna hear more from you, Steve, about the energy, because you, you tease it a little bit. It's a little more serious. Yesterday, it energy is, was it very is. high. Here, so, it's still like electric, but in a different way, right? So there's, there's nothing wrong with all the fun that we were having during the invitational duel, but those were duelists who were known for very different types of walking, you know, the different walks of dueling life. Yeah, yeah. This dual is... Dual-tainers. Yeah, dual <laughs> Hey, I'll be doing beat too, right? But the main thing is is that these are people who, you know, wake up 6 a.m. in the morning, pack all the stuff in the bag, show up, wait in line, fill out the deck list, sit there, wait, make sure that they're sitting on time. It's mm -hmm. it's methodical, and you see that here, that even though they, they've all done this and all very serious about it, you also develop friendship from that, right? We we saw a lot of that yesterday. Some of the competitors like Rhyme Styles and C-Reacts, me and Shiggy's, you're still friends even though you're playing a competitive game against one another. And so it has this weird vibe where everyone's like, oh man, good luck. I mean, it's going to be me, yeah. but good luck, right? <laughs> and it's so cool. Everyone's just slapping their belts in front of each other. Like, yeah, I got this. All I, got this one. Each I got two. Other with their belts. <laughs> 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 it is really exciting to see it because, you know, we got to see the judges uh, behind the scenes giving the player meeting and stuff. And if you, if you haven't been to a Yu-Gi-Oh competition, you really should. Obviously, you love Yu-Gi-Oh if you're watching this broadcast. Yeah. But it's this very like formal and sacred thing, and, and it shows you how serious everyone is taking this moment and how they have waited. Imagine you're like the first UDS belt winner. You've waited a decade for this exactly. moment. You know, it's not just four years to, to find out that you're getting that crown trophy. So the energy really is electric, but it, it's this world championship energy. It's the seriousness and we're, we're going to be, I'm going to be excited just watching it, but I'm just going to have to keep my nerves because I don't know how they're doing it out there. Yeah, you, this, <laughs> you mentioned the World Championship. This is the closest thing that the air feels like for the World Championship where mm -hmm. all the players are a little quiet, they're a little focused, they're sitting down, you know, across from their opponents mm -hmm. in that player meeting, but not so much conversation. Everyone's really locked in because they know what, how important these next six rounds mean for their dueling career. Yeah, yeah. Now, as we're getting ready to ascend to the stage here shortly, we're, we're getting to that point where we will actually see the duelists take to the stage. 
page. Uh, I want to send it to you, Billy, here, because I, I know I, we had asked uh, when looking at the individual screens, maybe some of the, uh, the favorites or some of the people that had the more interesting stories to follow based on their past histories. I'm going to put you on the spot here and say, if you had to pick a favorite and see if it's coming to you next, uh, who do you think should be the undisputed by the end of the weekend? Should and why? <laughs> well, maybe not should. But who do you predict? Uh, who How do, who do you I predict? predict? If I go. had to pick one, first of all, I think any one of the players here can walk away with the win. They're all amazing duelists. Anyone can become the champion out of all of them. But I would have to put my bets on Aaron Chase Furman. He's Aaron Chase yeah, I've been friends okay. with him for a long time. He's an excellent duelist. I know he prepared for this event. I mean, I assume all of them, you know, spent a lot of time preparing for this. Uh, tournament. It's been years in the making, and uh, yeah, he's my pick to win it this weekend. Uh, what what decks is Aaron Chase Foreman known for? Um, for uh, well, he won his first YCS with uh, True Draco Zodiac, I believe, so masterpiece okay. like one of his key cards. He came in second with Cosmo, so I always like uh. refer him as like a Cosmo kind of duelist. Uh, and then at the World Championship, I think he also used True Draco. So yeah, masterpiece. Okay. I kind of associate masterpiece with uh, Furman a little bit. Sure, but he's definitely not going to be playing that card this is weekend. Is ever coming off the list? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I love that card. Also Cosmo. Hey, we and, got a Cosmo so, player yeah, right here. Cosmo yeah. ain't bad, but my pick for the weekend actually is the hidden anime fan. It's going to be Jeff Jones, who not Ooh. only qualified with a Pendulum deck when it was in its prime, but also was featured in like the promotional materials for Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5. Yep. So it's somebody who not only like loves the game, but loves the whole vibe here. And I know he was very excited for this tournament. So I know he probably put the time in. So yeah, I'm going to give my vote to Jeff. Okay, Pendulum not probably played this weekend. Probably right? not playing Pendulum this weekend, but All it's right. in spirit. Sorry, it's it's sorry, the heart. Triff. Yeah. Pendulum always in spirit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's been, where's Electromite? We're talking about Masterpiece. Yeah. <laughs> no, Electromite can stay Is it ever coming back? <laughs> Pendulum deck's Who ever going to be meta? I don't know. <laughs> well, Snatch Deal came back. back. Anything can happen, right? <laughs> well, what came back? Snatch Deal. Sna oh, yeah. hey, yeah. Yo, it's true. true. I remember the reactions to that right away. It was like, there's no way. And then it's, oh, Change of Heart was all like the news. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. some crazy stuff. But it, it is true that like, there's been so many things leading up to here. I just can't wait to see what it's like for these duels to go head to head because it's not just about the anime fans. It's not just about the master duels. It's not just about the casters. It's about these 16 people who have dedicated their life to this game, them having their spotlight and their moment in the sun. Yeah, we've talked about it, and I just want to reiterate the fact that they had to accomplish so much just to get the first belt, and every single one of them had to go through that journey, had to do that story. Now we're multiplying that by 16. I guess technically 15. One person did it twice. Still 16. <laughs> and they're going to be up on that stage competing against each other. This is like the best of the best at Yu-Gi-Oh! right now. And uh, I think that just that builds up this event. It's a decade in the making. Four years planned to go. And now we're finally getting to see it paid off. This is such a big moment, Billy, for the, the fans, the community, everybody who's been cheering these guys on throughout their journeys for each of their individual runs. Uh, and now they all get to compete against each other here. Yeah, just phenomenal. I, I Even though I am, you know, have a pick to win it, just because, you know, a little bit of bias in there, I really don't know who's going to win. It really could be any one of these players. I mean, yeah. they're all playing phenomenal decks, and they're just so excellent duelists. Anyone could take it. Who are you rooting for? Let us know. But with that being said, we're done with the pre-show. We're going to send it to a short break. And after we're back, you're going to see the players take to the stage. And the duels will begin. We'll find out who's undisputed after this. Happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game. Hi, my name is Greg Abbey. I was the voice of Tristan Taylor in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! and also the voice of uh, Yusei Fudo in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. Let's rev it up! Very exciting. Um, my greatest, my greatest Yu-Gi-Oh! memory. I, I would have to say that I, I loved working on the shows. I, um, I love voicing these characters, but more than that, I always mention this. It was the people I got to meet while I worked at 4Kids and Konami. I mean, some of the actors I became lifelong friends with, um, but not just the actors, there were the directors, there were the writers, the producers, the engineers. There was this incredible community of just, you know, talented, awesome people. So when I think about my time doing those shows, that, that's what I think about is these people I met. Um, and then the last couple of years, I've started to go to some conventions with the actors and having the opportunity to meet some fans that you know, you can really see that the show meant so much to them, has been really gratifying, and then, and that they, and seeing that they kind of found their tribe, you know, with this show and with this card game, has been really meaningful. So, 
I just feel very lucky that I got to be a, a small part of the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe. Um, I won UDS Medellin in Colombia in 2019. I played Sky Striker, which was one of my most successful decks. And it was really challenging. It's a really difficult event. I got close two times, like I got third, and then I got second, and then I finally won. So yeah, it was really, really challenging, but it was really, really nice to win finally. The UDS that I won was in Panama 2019 with Lunalite Orchest. It was a tough tournament. I played a lot of really good opponents, including top four. I played another UDS champion, Andres Torres. In the finals, I played world champion, Galileo de Valdia. I won um, Las Vegas 2019 with Sky Striker. Um, it was a very challenging event. Um, you know, I went through, I don't remember how many rounds it was. I went X2 day one, though, and then I won out day two. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was the first time I've ever really been in top cut. And so it was, uh, you know, it was very challenging for me. And, I won the UDS in Florida with Pendulum Editions, and I was fortunate enough to go undefeated through the entire event. So it was, had some challenges, but one of the easier tournaments I played in. Uh, it was in Mexico, Monterey, 2018, I believe. I was playing Thunder Dragon. Uh, yeah, it was really hard because it was an FTK format. Everyone was in dangers. And I decided just to play Thunder Dragon because I like it. I think I was like the only player with Thunder Dragon at that event. And yeah, so it was really hard. I won UDS Chicago, Illinois 2016. It wasn't really challenging. I went undefeated, didn't really, didn't lose the match. Gané el UDS que se llevó a cabo en mi país, El Salvador. El deck a utilizar fue ABC. Fue un torneo fuerte, pero al final se logró. I won the uh, first UDS at Vegas and I played Zodiac. And I think any time that you're playing a tournament that's got 13 rounds of Swiss, it's going to be challenging. So. Yeah, I would definitely say that it was super challenging. Well, I won the UDS in Ecuador March 2016. I played Cosmo in that event, and yes, it was a lot of a challenge. I won UDS Kansas City in 2018 with Goki, and it was not very challenging, but you can read my feature match and let me know. Yeah, I won UDS LA in uh, 2015. Uh, I played Cosmo, and uh, yeah, it was pretty challenging. Every opponent I knew or heard of, and they're all pretty good. Yo gané el UDS de Bogotá en 2020 con Luna Light y sí fue un evento desafiante porque era el último evento en el que se podía clasificar al campeonato indiscutible de UDS. Entonces por eso fue complicado, fue un torneo muy largo, pero afortunadamente lo logré ganar. Uh, I won UDS Tulsa at uh, beginning of 2020 with Rocket Dragon Link. Uh, I went undefeated for the whole event. I guess it wasn't as challenging. Um, I won with uh, uh, UDS Indianapolis in 2019 and I won with Pure Thunder Dragon. Um, it was pretty challenging, considering that maybe I was one of the only Thunder Dragon decks there, uh, as far as Pure, and everyone else played a heavily combo-based deck. Uh, but it was, a, it was really challenging in the beginning. I lost the first two rounds, and I ended up continuing to win. Principios de 2017, gané con Zodiac. En Perú y finales de 2017 gané con Spiral en Trinidad y Tobago. Eh, fue un reto porque todos los torneos a los que voy siento que son un reto por todas las personas tan buenas que van a jugar y pues fue algo muy, muy extenuante, tantas rondas, tantos jugadores, el día 2 seguir jugando porque no estás dentro del evento. Creo que el UDS por eso me encanta porque es uno de los mejores eventos por tanto juego. Gané el UDS Invitacional de Santa Cruz el 2018 en Bolivia. Eh, jugué Pendulum Magician y sí fue un evento muy desafiante porque fue el primer evento premier al que asistí y pude ganar.
I feel like it made me want to travel a lot more. And to run by is just a bonus. Fue un gran impacto porque fue el primer evento al premier al que asistí, pude ganar y eso me motivó a seguir compitiendo. Muchísimo. Ya había ganado antes una YCS, pero creo que eso me consolidó como jugador y este me demostró que pues podía seguir ganando y podía seguir haciendo más en este juego que pues me encanta. Well, after I won the UDS, I have many more options to go and play international events and having the two buys was a really good advantage and also for me it's like a more motivation to go and play those events because I have an advantage between the other players. Eh, tuvo mucho impacto en mí como jugador porque siempre había estado cerca de ganar los eventos pero nunca lo lograba y afortunadamente después de ganar este evento, un año después logré ganar mi primer YCS y seguir constante en los tops. You know, any time that you can win a tournament that, uh, like an invitational tournament, it'll, it's super cool, it's, it validates all the hard work you put in, and uh, it's awesome. It definitely helped me want to try and get better and play more. It was my very first win, and later that season, it allowed me to get a YCS win as well as qualify for the World Championship qualifiers. Uh, to be honest, that year was like kind of hard for me. It was just some family stuff, but I decided to just take one year to play Yu-Gi-Oh! And that year was awesome. I won uh, the YCS 200, I won the UDS, I won uh, another YCS. So yeah, that, like that year was crazy for me. Winning a UDS is probably one of the best things you can win in Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, the two buys are invaluable, but for me personally, the VIP system where you get your own seating area is uh, pretty valuable because I don't have to be around a lot of people. <laughs> um, it impacted me uh, pretty hard. I, uh, like, I don't have that many tops or actually the UDS is pretty much my only premier top. Um, I can't make it to a lot of events. I have a lot of other things going on in my life. So I just, uh, you know, being able to go when I do, when I am able to go to events and have a two round buy is really nice. And so it's, uh, you know, and then in the 3v3s and my friends get to, we get to start in round three all together. So that's pretty cool. The UDS Championship is one of the absolute coolest tournaments to win. Any competitive player strives to win one. The honor of having the belt and the perks that come with it are unmatched, so I was super ecstatic to have won it. Fue algo muy especial para mí haber ganado un evento tan grande como un UDS. Well, winning the UDS is really good because, of course, we got the buys at the YCS, and that's for our competitive player like a right. uh, big edge. And, but not only that, but the prestige of winning an event like this is really big and oh, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Uh, it made me feel good. This is my, still to this day, it's my only win and um, getting two buys every event is pretty nice too. So back then when I first won my first YCS during end of uh, 2018, it wasn't as impactful to my career because back then I was using a meta deck. However, the UDS win was with a completely new deck for the whole meta, and then not many people even knew about the deck at that point. So that definitely um, made my name a lot more um, impactful in the whole, in the whole community. Um, well, I've always wanted to win an event. Uh, growing up, I really uh, was reading articles, trying to be you know, one of the best players as well. Um, I really did my best to you know, train and work hard. Uh, the impact that it gave me was, you know, the people were always rooting for me. Um, people always had my back in my city. Uh, they were, off, I was always, you know, helping them out too, as well, teaching as well. And uh, obviously, winning the UDS also proved that, you know, I could do, I could keep doing it. Uh, and as of now, I still teach uh, certain players. I still teach some people. Uh, I work overnight, so it's really hard to juggle. But uh, my job supports me, and my family supports me, so it's. It's a work-life balance. It's time to do, 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 do. everybody to the quarter century celebration here in sunny Los Angeles, California. We're at the Konami Esports Arena and we are about to kick off round one of the ultimate, undisputed actually, UDS Championship. Uh, I have joining me on the desk here, Billy Brake, 
Happy to kick off round one with you. Oh, yeah. Super excited to be back. We had Master Duel and Duel Links yesterday, but today it's the Undisputed Ultimate Duel Series. As you mentioned, some of the best players. I've played against so many players that are out there, and I can tell you they are some of the highest caliber players that have ever touched Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and now we're going to crown one of them to be the Undisputed Champion. Subtle flex, but I'll no. allow it. Tom Box. I could flex a little harder. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? All of these players, they're just the top of the cream of the crop. Yes. Definitely some of the best out there, and the journey here definitely was not easy. You had to qualify you know, at the earliest level of the UDS qualifier. Then you had to go to the UDS and win that. And mm -hmm. through that, it's like another invite into here. It's crazy. It's a, quite the journey for these players. It's crazy. We have Mike waiting uh, on stage on standby for when we're ready to actually walk the players out and get going. But this is going to be the caster pair for the first round. Tom Box, we haven't been able to hear too much of your thoughts on the players. I like putting people on the spot okay. here. Do you have somebody, a favorite maybe, to, to go all the way and become undisputed? And if so, why? My root, I'm always going to root for Jesse. Okay. Hometown, Canada. I don't even think we need an ex explanation <laughs> anymore. That's all. But, but Jesse, you know? I've, I've talked with him personally. Yep. And uh, he's he's just he's very insightful and he's willing to try a lot of things that are just a little bit more offbeat from time yes. to time. Yes. He's he's a wild one. He's a wild one. But I am hearing that Mike is ready. So we're gonna send it over to Mike on stage to kick us off and introduce our first signature match. On the red side, we have Jesse Cotton. And facing off against him on the blue side is Jeff Jones. The competitors have taken to the stage. Jesse versus Jeff. There you go, Tom Box, the one that you were just defending, the one that you think might be favorite. Oh, yes. So, this is actually a really interesting matchup. I look up to both of these players. When I was like starting, like when I was starting to get into the competitive play, I'm like the name Jeff Jones, Billy Bragg, and, yep. and of course Jesse Cotton. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. These are the names I look up to. Everyone wants to like, oh, what were they playing? Like, how do they do it? What's well, like, what do they do that's different? <laughs> yep. How these do the they do it? How do they do it? You know, and these are the two that I definitely look up to the most. Mm -hmm. And seeing them as the very first pair featured, this is going to be a crazy exciting one. Yeah, when we looked at the pairings around one, there's a lot of phenomenal matchups. We kind of knew that going into this, that we weren't going to have any lack of options for a feature match but this one really stood out seeing jeff jones versus jesse cotton jeff you know he won shonen jump edison new jersey mm -hmm. so many years ago people were really fond of playing that in our time wizard format he also won a different YC, so i think it was anaheim so he's a two multi-time champion and then jesse unbelievable he grew up as a dragon duelist and rose all the way to the top has been to the world championship multiple times and a five-time ycs champion yeah incredible this is just two titans going at it in the very first round of six rounds of a ultimate dueling we're gonna have today two legends in their own right and i'm happy that we're highlighting them to kick things off here because um uh, both have just a lot of uh a name value behind them, right? Like, I've heard of these names before. They're held to such esteem. Tom, is there any history between these two, though, that you're aware of? Any maybe, like, rivalries or past tournaments that they matched up? I think that's more of a Billy question. But uh, I think... I really want to know what Billy thinks yeah. here. All right, all right. Maybe <laughs> I don't, I don't, know, I don't Billy, know this Do you have anything yeah. here? I genuinely don't know if these two have face off. I'm sure they have encountered uh, each other throughout the years. I don't know of a particular match where I can think of where they've played against each other. So I really don't know who's going to have the edge mm. here. Because, I mean, it is this fresh kind of format with Phantom Nightmare really shaking things up. But the thing is, both of these are veteran duelists. So the one thing is for sure, they prepared for this tournament. Neither of them are going to come in here and not know what's going on. But it's going to be which way they went about it. Because the, the Snake Eye Fire King deck has a lot of different things 
things you can do with it. Even though you might be playing similar strategies, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it to try and catch your opponent off, off guard. A lot of tech choices you can use differently. What are you including in your main deck to give you the edge in a mirror match potentially? And what they decide to prepare for will come out to play. It's going to be go beyond their skill, go beyond their credentials, and really going to come down to what they do in this specific tournament on this day. Yeah, I think this is going to also shape up what's going to happen next week as well. And people are mm -hmm. definitely, you guys got to keep your eyes open to these matches to learn what you might have to deal with in next week's event. Yeah, and I love that you can see that Slifer there right behind it, Jesse. That's the prize yeah. I won from the charity after donating. But let's jump right into it, Kangas. Duel number one underway here for the first round of the ultimate UDS, undisputed UDS championships. I love the digital games, but there's something about the physical TCG that gets me so excited. We see an eight from Jeff and an 11 there from Jesse. Good way to start off the tournament. You really want to go first, and they are playing Fire King Snake Eye. That's the matchup we are looking at this weekend. A lot of the players brought these strategies together, mm -hmm. and we're going to see why they pair so well. And it looks like he's going to start off with Snake Eye Ash. This is where you want to be as a Snake Eye player. This one card is everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to grab you another monster. It can use the other effect on the field. And we're going to start off with Snake Eye Poplar. Yep, since it's added to the hand, it can reveal itself in special summon to the field. And then when it special summons to the field, it's going to be able to add a sinful spoil or no, sorry, a Snake Eye Speller Trap. Yep. Yes. Really key here because you're also able to grab Divine Symbol of the Snake Eye while Diabell Star can only access the Sinful Spoils. Mm -hmm. But going to go ahead and grab that Sinful Spoils, the original Sinful Spoils. And then we're going to see, okay, this is different. He's going to oh. start with the effect Flect of Ash, Ash, I think. Yep. So he's going to be trying to summon a Snake Eye monster from his deck. Yeah, Does I, I have, have seen blossom? different versions of that combo where you're trying to get, you know, either back row or the field spell to be the one that you send instead. So why, why do you think the reason is for this pivot? Oh, it actually gets hit by the Ash anyway. Mm. Mm, but the Poplar is going to activate in the graveyard and putting itself as a continuous spell onto the field. Definitely. So a lot of the times you see here, you see a link with away the poplar for a link creator, but decides to go this route a little bit differently. Going to be able to send that poplar to special summon a level one fire from the deck. You see that beautiful quarter century yeah. secret rare original sinful mm. spoils. And he's going to go right into the fire king aspect of the deck. So he's probably not going to have access to snake eyes, flame burst dragon, which is huge for uh, Jeff to be able to break the board a little bit. But he's going to go for Ponix and Ponix is let him add a fire king speller trap from the deck to the hand. Legendary fire king Ponix. He is truly legend. Wait yes. for it. Yeah, wait for it. Wait for <laughs> there it. There we go. <laughs> My girlfriend begged me not to do that. No. <laughs> it's so not hard enough. Not so hard there enough. is the... She uh, can't stop me. Fire no King. one can stop me. <laughs> uh, so there is the uh, Fire King Sanctuary that's been activated, and that has placed a Fire King Island onto the field that enables everything now. It depends on now where Jesse's going to take the Fire King Island. What is he going to destroy? Yeah, the resolution of Fire King Island will let him get two monsters on the field to be able to destroy this Ponix here to add the... I want to say his right name, Sacred Fire King Dr Grunix. There and we then go. when it adds to the hand, since a fire monster was destroyed, it can reveal it and special summon from the hand and then destroy a fire monster from the deck. Going to destroy that Fire King High Avatar Arvata. So he's going to be able to get that into circulation, bring back the Ponix. He still needs to get another monster on the field if he wants to go into Promethean Princess, but it's just going to be a link to here. He can go into Hida since there is an Ash Blossom on in Jeff's side. That's why Ash Blossom and Joy Spring kind of a dangerous card yeah. to use. You want to make sure it has a high impact because then you're putting that fire monster in your graveyard. He special yeah. summons it back. Link climbs up into Promethean Princess, brings back the Snake Eye Ash so he can go into that amphibious Amblowell. And it's Amblowell. It has landed onto the field. Very what? powerful okay, so. link card. I, I like this one. It, is yeah, it a boat? Is it a tank? Actually. Oh, is it? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's a really good card, and especially with the Promethean Princess. Since it triggers uh, when it's yep. destroyed, you can destroy it to bring back the princess. Yep. And then you special one back another link monster. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. when it's in your graveyard, it's going to have another uh, interruption effect to be able to destroy. But we see that card we talked about. From hey, the What's the name? Is it Burning Algae? <laughs> Are we searching for Burning Algae? To be. It's Bonfire, <laughs> of <laughs> course, <laughs> is the name we're looking for. This is one of the most uh, sought after cards <laughs> in current Yu Gi Oh! Definitely from Maze of Millennia. This is a kind of dangerous to open with the bonfire. It tells a lot to your opponent, though. Because yeah, so it doesn't have Snake Eye Ash, probably. Because, yeah, bonfire, a little susceptible to draw and lock burn. Yeah, and that will actually shut True. down most of the other lines as well. So that opening with bonfire, a bit dangerous here. But it's going to go straight for Poplar. So it's a quarter century secret of Poplar. And there is the Joan Lockbird. Okay. Won't be adding any cards nice to the deck. Nice response from Jesse. Definitely. 
This, and this, this is the ideal card to Drone Lockbird, because if you just mm -hmm. use it on Snake Eye Ash, they're still able to build their full board and do yep. a whole combo. But Drone Lockbird's actually at its best when you are going first, because you're able to establish the board and cut them off from being able to add cards from their deck to their hand. It's tough to come back. But mm -hmm. we don't have the strongest start from Jesse, but having the Princess, the Amblowell, and the Garunix, that's still so many interruptions with just those few combination of cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a very big test, starting with the Bonfire. You don't have access to Fire King. You can't go for mm. Island. A lot of lines are just cut off, and it's going to be difficult to actually build a board. You're going to need to summon an additional monster, maybe to hold on with another Link monster. Also, a back row available for Jesse. What do we think? I, I don't know this deck mm. to use much back row. What are the options, or is it a bluff? It could be a bluff a lot of the times. There's our stuff like the main deck cards like Fire King Skyburn, but it's kind of falling out of popularity recently. Sure. But mm -hmm. So if I'm thinking, I'm looking at Infinite Permanence. That's a trap yeah. that kind of lines up into a lot of decks. Maybe Called By. Called like By that. the Graves yeah. is a really good yep. one in the Mirror Match. Oh, and speaking of, is that Circle of the Fire King? That is Circle of the Fire King. He's going to circle it to destroy his Poplar to swap it out for this Ash Blossom. There may be a copy... Uh, of the original simple spoil for Jeff to do this. That's why he's lining it up, putting another card in the back, generating two monsters onto the field. Well, yeah, because Jesse used the Promethean Princess, so he wanted to make sure he still had that monster and didn't mm -hmm. have nothing left on the field. And now the Princess destroyed the Amblowell. I don't think he has a Link 3 or lower monster to summon back from his graveyard with the Amblowell. Should have no. the Charmer, right? There is a Charmer. Yes, the Heat out the Fire mm -hmm. Charmer. Oh, he does have the Heat, so he could yeah. bring back the Heat. You're right. But hmm. since a, a Fire Monster was destroyed, he's going to be able to... We can't hear them talking. I mean, they did oh, clear there's their the chain, chain links. Link. So yeah. there's the chain links. Both right. the they chained the Grunix, chained the, or sorry, the Amblo Whale. The Grunix can destroy Kieran from the deck. Oh, this and is the Kieran's going to summon from the wow. Grunix. Wow. <laughs> this is the power of the deck. I mean, the board, this field looks so unassuming. And this is what you're able to do with just a single activation. Yeah. That is and the so best, much. Yeah, and the best part is you get to bring back this Arvata so he has the monster effect negate. And Jeff has seen enough. Jesse's going to take it with a decent Ooh. hand going first. Yeah, the, we really got to see, like, a key thing. Just having just Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, sometimes I consider not even using it turn one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you do use it and it's your only form of interruption, it's almost never enough against this deck. But mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that sometimes against a card like, uh, say, the Snake Eye Ash or the Snake Eye Oak, you just have to do it. Or else mm. the Flam Bridge Dragon comes out, and now you have even more to deal with. True. Yeah. That board could have been much bigger. Maybe use it later on <laughs> once they already have a more established field and they don't want to go into a <laughs> the Char or the Hita. <laughs> but it, uh, it is tough that the fire attribute is so powerful right now for uh, your own deck build, but also if your opponent's using that because the fact that Hita exists. Definitely. Uh, now, when would be the best time to use Ash? I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you that one. If it's not early on to try and halt the progress of the combo... Is there a correct time to use it, or do you hmm. just side it out <laughs> once you know you're in the mirror? Yeah, it really depends on your hand. There's, It's pretty hard not to ash a Snake Eye Ash when he's using two monsters from the field, mm -hmm. but you can also hold it for the original Sinful Spoils, because if you use, hold it for the original Sinful Spoils, you're cutting off access to the Fire King aspect of the deck, which mm -hmm. stops them from having the Grunix to destroy Kieran, to destroy a monster, to bring back the Arvata to have a monster effect negate. Instead, you're going to be dealing with just the Princess and Amblowell, maybe an IP Masquerina that can go into something like Appaloosa. So you kind of got to sure. pick the avenue of which uh, boards you're trying to your it hand doesn't can feel play good, into. but it, feels it never better feels good. to do yeah, you <laughs> one want, of them. You really want to pair those two of those uh, uh, interactions from your hand when you're going second. You want to have yeah. something like Impermanent Nibiru. I mean, it's the classic. Oh, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> or even Ash Blossom Nibiru can help because after Nibiru, if they're saving the original Civil Spoils, you can Ash it. Okay. Well, now now I asked this at the start of the show. I'm going to get Tom Box's thoughts on this. What are your prime cards to look out for when it comes to the side deck against the mirror match uh, just you know top choices things that you think should be on everybody's radar i think top choices for sure one is going to be anti-spell fragrance there's just so sure. many cards are spell cards and a lot of the cards that counter your deck especially if you're going to be going first you want to shut them all down yeah. triple tactics talents you don't want to get hit by uh even some of the more techie choices like mind control like things that take control of your cards because once you lose control of a, a card like appaloosa or your ip or something along those lines it's really really bad mm. um and other cards cause Cyclone because Fire King Island does have a liability effect where if it does get removed from the field, whether it gets banished or sent to the graveyard, it will destroy your whole field. But you don't destroy it early. You wait till your opponent commits into a couple of cards, yeah. then you use the Cosmic Cyclone on it, and that's where you can have the most impact. If you do it right away, then we all the cards the are going to come back. Come out. Out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything comes out. Amblo activates. Everything's just back on the field. It doesn't. That doesn't make the difference. You have to time it well. So understanding the timing of this matchup, knowing what people are going to side against you is going to be crucial. You can also use different disruptions like the Cyphering Package, but I'd argue that's the biggest difference between the pros and the Joes is knowing when yeah, having the right card 
is important, but knowing when to use it to properly interrupt your opponent. Let's see after the side decking here yeah, and that's how very, Jeff approaches that's this. That's very key in this specific format in these matchups. The timing yeah. of your cards is huge in the mirror match. If you waste it or you use your card too early, your opponent will still have so much more forms of disruption mm -hmm. that it can just really backfire on you. So that's a really good point for I'm you sure it's something up. we'll talk about a lot <laughs> in, in <laughs> these mirror matches <laughs> as we see them happen is where are the points of interruption? When do these players decide to actually interrupt their opponent? Yep, and we'll have to see what Jesse puts in for going second here. There's a lot of different options. I mean, you know you're going to have a good chance going first, so a lot of your side deck's probably going to be dedicated to going second. We'll see what he has and what Jeff's going to bring to the table here in game number two of round one of the UDS. This is game two, not round two. But game two, <laughs> duel two, underway. Jesse versus Jeff. Jeff down one but does now get to go first here. I, I'm happy that you're talking about this side from Jesse. If you know that you're going second, mm. what do you choose to side at that point? It's going to be very different than going first, so probably not the anti-spell fragrances yeah, and no. things like that. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm wondering what type of field Jeffrey's able to assemble here. Already the bonfire, and it's be able to not... Add. Uh, interacted with. Well, so. so one of the cards you could side in, we didn't see it here, is Cyframe Gear Delta. It's able to negate spell cards, so ah. we would have seen it used here on Bonfire. It's pretty much key for, but Infinite Permis is coming down. Snake Eye Ash, okay. does he have the Kirin? Maybe he's not maxing out on the copies of mm -hmm. Kirin, so he doesn't have it in his hand here to stop that uh, disruption, but does have Wanted, the Seeker, the Sinful Spoils, going to be able to access Diabell Star this time. Chain so... Chain Oh, there's oh, a Delta. Delta. He was saving oh, it for the Wanted. Wow. Very heads up play from Jesse. And this is what we talk about when we say the difference between the best players, the best duelists, and the average duelist. Mm -hmm. is I think a lot of people would just say, don't stop the bonfire. That gets everything going. But you already know you have the answer to what the bonfire is going to search in the infinite impermanence. So you save that for this. Yep. And it definitely makes sense with that infinite permanence because, yeah, you want to use the imperm first because after you Delta, you're going to stick those monsters on the board and not be able to use it. True. So it makes a lot of sense that he would go with that imperm. But this is what I'm talking about. One interaction from the hand, usually not enough, but when you can compare it and combo with two other, have two, it can be stifling to the opponent. But there's still a chance Jeff hard drew a Diabell Star if he's playing multiple sure. copies or something like that. I was going to say then, what are the next plays Jeff can look for? Yeah. Or is the turn <laughs> just over with this? If this is it, Ooh. It looks like <sighs> it looks like he's still thinking yeah, of his Delta, so he might yeah. have an Ash Blossom. Because you can Ash Blossom the Delta. It stays in the hand, but That's it can point. still be used later on in the turn. Yeah, there are so, not once per turn. Yeah, so he would still have to worry about him using the Delta on the original yeah. Sinful Spoils. And so, he uses uh, Ghost Bell to stop it. Because, same kind of thing. Same yeah. thing, because the uh, Cyphrame Drive can be summoned from the Graveyard, and because it's mentioned in that card text, you can use the, the, this particular disruption. Yeah, it doesn't feel great, but if, you can't, if it's going to stop you from being able to do anything, like you just yeah. got to do it sometimes. And, and now you know it's there. And you know, once Jesse has his turn, that uh, you won't have to worry about it too much after that. So I, I think that that's still correct. Jeff, very good Ooh. at drawing Bonfire. Discards another copy of <laughs> his special summon that Diabell Star, the Black Witch. Did hard draw that. First Century Secret Rare. Love Easy. this card. One of my favorite new uh, cards. Puts so. down the original phase down, but we do know the Delta's still there. Indeed it is. So he's going to have to keep that in mind. Just going to go ahead and force it out by activating the original Sinful Spoils. He's going to want to activate it no matter what, because yeah. he wants to put that Sinful Spoils in the graveyard mm -hmm. so he can use the Wanted to get a draw out of it, despite knowing that the Delta's coming D I down. think Jesse just summoned the Cypherm Driver from hand. Did oh. he? I believe so. Oh, yeah, I didn't see him pick up his... I think he just set it yeah. down from hand, so that's a that's rough draw. That's huge. At least a little bit of silver lining there for Jeff. Like, he may be stopping my stuff, but he's down three cards. <laughs> so he's only going to start his turn with three cards in hand. Mm -hmm. But if there's a strategy that can do a lot with a little... It's going to be Snake Eye. Yeah, just if he opens with the correct correct card, then Ash. Now, the Imperm, why I like using Imperm against the Ash here is like twofold. One, you stop the card from being added to hand. And secondly, you can't use the effect on the field to mm. just summon another one from the deck because that's going to be negated. So it's twofold. Mm hmm. Yeah, but the, uh, on the other side of that, if Jeff finds a way to get more monsters on the yes. field, he can use the Promethean Princess, bring it back, and still have access to that uh, second that is effect true. later that, on. That, that's but that's the cool part about this yeah, thing. There's exactly. so many things you can do. And Jeff also has Triple Tactics Talent, a very oh. powerful reaction to this the Gamma. This is huge, especially when he's uh, if he had to use that driver from the hand, he's going to be down to two cards in his hand. Yeah. But it looks like, is he chaining the Kirin from his hand? He has a quick effect to destroy a fire monster from his hand to summon it. But it looks like he is choosing to do it. That's going to rip out, uh, I think... The remaining cards completely. I could do it. Because the other two are not yeah, fire I mean, Delta, monsters. Delta that is on the monster. field. It's going to go away with Driver and then... Yeah. Ooh. 
<laughs> Destroy Flame Bird. Oh, so, how, oh. so I just want to be clear. Jesse has no cards in hand, right? Yeah. No, he has nothing. no cards. Nothing in hand. I've never seen this in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! where a player empties their whole hand turn one without the <laughs> other person doing anything. Is I mean, that, I guess the that, talents count. Yeah, the talents count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. He's a Kieran and a Prayer. Can he draw oh, Snake Eye Ash, a Fire King Sanctuary? I, Starting I, his turn with zero cards in hand. I, I will say, Heart has, of the cards. has stopped Jeff. So if, if any, oh, we just battle phase oh. attack. So oh. right now, Jesse and and Jeff basically consider pushing both each other into a simplified game state. Yeah, where, yeah we're going to be very simplified. Cards. Game if game we're playing one card at a time. I love how we built this up to be the biggest. You know, you know, this deck's going to combo. This deck's going to combo. We're going to have these crazy fields. And this is dual two <laughs> yeah. of the entire this event. This is perfect, though, because they perfectly, basically emptied out each other. Yeah, They tried to stop each point. other as much as possible. Otherwise, if Jeff went off, then, well, Jeff, Jesse with one card is going to be very difficult. And in the second duel, this is much more common when everyone gets to side deck and we're focused heavily on the interactions mm -hmm. and stalling each other out here. Oh, oh, what a draw from Jeff. Poplar is going to be able to add. He put that original Sinful Spoils back in the deck when he used Wanted on the first turn. Like, uh, even though they're all down to cards, I still feel like Jeff is kind of in an advantageous position because oh, he does have access yes. to more cards. He had that want to draw. He just was able to get to the snake eye effect faster. But who knows what Jesse has? He did draw two cards and pass, so there could be some sort of defensive options from the hand. Now it's oh, good. just going to link it away. Yeah, up. Link yeah. Karibo. Yep, so by linking it away, you get to use Snake Eye Poplar Effect to place a fire monster into the spell and trap card zone, essentially giving you a free card to send with your original Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. So you're going to be able to build more monsters onto the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Link Karibo, one of the best monsters in the game right now. Not only does it use, work with Poplar to where you can do this combo, now that the Link Karibo is in rotation, anytime there's a level one effect that's activating, you're going to be able to use that quick effect from the graveyard to tribute out and dodge effect negation. That's yeah. right. Really I think I learned that from uh, MST.TV yeah. TV video. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a one of the best interactions the deck has. I, honest, I mean, you say Link Reap is one of the best cards. I think any one-star fire monster is one of the best <laughs> exactly. cards. Exactly. Right now. Yeah, now, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're learning. Yep. We're learning. So, uh, the legendary Fire King Ponix has been summoned onto the field, and the Fire King Sanctuary has been now uh, added to hand, I believe it's going to be activated right away, mm -hmm. and that's going to set up the Fire King item being placed onto the field. Yeah, I'm a huge Fire King fan, and the fact that Island is like the focal point of the deck and makes everything go, I love that. That's how they incorporated it into the new strategy, revitalizing mm -hmm. this old um, fan favorite. Still well, good at least when it came my out? favorite, one of my favorites. Yeah, your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say there's a decent amount of Fire King fans no, out there. No, definitely. I'm one of them. Yeah, <laughs> more, more now than there used to be. <laughs> the structure deck was incredible, too. Yeah, the old one, yeah, Onslaught of the Fire Kings. I mm -hmm. loved that structure deck. All right, now we know that Jesse has just really nothing to uh, interact with here, so it's going to come down to Jeff and how he wants to approach building out the field. He has so many options. He has yeah. heat options since that flame bridge is in the graveyard. He can heat of the flame bridge, put a card in his spell and trap card zone if he wants. He can push back that Kieran to not have to worry about mm -hmm. it. I think the pushback might be a good call on this one because you don't know what's in Jesse's hand. If Jesse's hand has a Fire King monster, then it could just get the ball rolling for Jesse. Yep. Okay. I'm going to I'll just take it away. Yep, summon heat and get that flame bird. Let's see if he. This is our flame bird. <laughs> We're sharing. We're sharing the deck now. Now, does he push back the Kieran? Does he wait to use the effect? Does he not use it at all? Doesn't well, use it at all. Well, luckily, you know, Jeff is very safe at taking the flame bird. Usually, it could come with a huge risk of oh, summoning back your opponent's level level one fires. Oh, yeah. But there's, there's not enough there. in the grave. Yeah. <laughs> that card, that effect yes, is not targeted. All, so uh, interaction. You have to have two. The Promethean Princess is going to bring back that Snake Eye Ash that fell down that first turn. And now Jeff's going to add Poplar. Even though he used the Poplar Ooh. effect to add, he can still use the Poplar effect to special summon from the hand when it's added off Snake Eye Ash, but decides not to here. Just hold back. Hold back. Uh, save some resources just in case there's not enough to do all the life point damage. Maybe it would give him a fi uh, five summons, and he wanted to get the Flame Bridge out before to play around Nibiru. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and Looks and like with Jesse. nothing in hand, Jesse just says, yeah, it's done. Smiles on the faces, but that's a one-to-one -one score line here as Jeff does take the second duel. What a fun one that was. Very simplified game state we got to.
<laughs> yeah, that was. I mean, it was, even though he, Jesse, you know, that's your goal. Just stop your opponent when they go first, right? That is like the main goal. Mm -hmm. But if it empties your hand, yeah. you're, you're still not in good shape. I mean, he had a lot of cards to get top. Battle he, phase, got to attack. So yeah, a couple, you know? couple attacks. I mean, he could have drawn. He put himself in a position to win the game, but unfortunately, he didn't draw the bonfire, the wanted, yeah. the snake eye ash, millions of cards he could have drawn, but they weren't there for him. There's a and lot of one card starters for the snake eyes deck. Yes, oh, so about thirteen. About 13 or so? No. Okay. Is that actually the, the number? I, I haven't like, done the math. You, just, you guys don't have to do the math. Well, <laughs> everyone's a little bit different, but it's about like... For yeah, you guys can figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that, yeah, you're right. The fact that that next draw wasn't the out meant that, yeah, it, it was pretty much over for Jesse. But he had that he had that chance, and uh, I mean, maybe that's like... I mean, the side deck, we have to consider, like, are you putting in too many cards that are going to stop your opponent? Yeah. Is there such I, thing as too many cards? I think I, I chuck a lot of that up to drawing the driver. I, I believe mm, he oh just yeah, played that, that from hand. We didn't yeah. see any deck shuffle or anything. So if my eyes are correct, yeah, he just was like, well, that's one card that's just kind of useless <laughs> in that opening rip. So well, if you don't use start it, with that, he did get to use it. But if you don't start with that, uh, and that's something else like the bonfire, like the ash, then that's a very different duel. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, just being minus a card right off the bat. I mean, yeah, drawing the driver is not fun. At least you drew it with the Delta, but it's still just too devastating. Yeah. I suppose the triple tactic talent still that would was have gone key. for whatever uh, the, the best card in the hand was. So Jeff also had very good cards. But you're right. Now we're into uh, the next side decking, and it will presumably flip sides. So mm -hmm. now we think, okay, we reverse those positions. <laughs> uh, it's not going to be Jesse going first and then Jeff going second. Yep, yeah. so we saw how well that worked out for Jesse uh, in game number one. Jeff only had that Ash Blossom to try and stop the turn, but it wasn't enough. Mm. can only assume that Jeff's going to be putting in more cards for going second, stuff he can use from the hand to pair with stuff like Ash Blossom, but mm -hmm. we're going to have to see exactly what he's going to have. And then even still, like, how is he going to counter what Jesse's going to be putting in? Does he have the deltas that Jesse had? I mean, he doesn't want to spend all the cards out of his hand yeah. like Jesse did. But there could be uh, key things he's looking for. Is he worried about board breakers? Is he siding in things? We already know he plays talents. That's a great card for going yeah. second. And speaking of, like, board breakers, I was asking some of the players yesterday, I was like, oh, which would you prefer to go through? Would you prefer to go disrupt from the hand to prevent them from kicking off? Or would you prefer to just destroy everything on the field and make your way through? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of been about 50-50. Yeah, I would say I like a little mixture of both. Like, I want to have enough of those going second cards from my hand for I have a chance to draw two of them, but I don't want to draw too many, but I still want to have, like, yeah, triple taxes talents to take mm -hmm. control. A lot of these boards will see stuff like, I mean, the Amblowell taking control, that's pretty strong, or something like Appaloosa, the Bow of the Goddess. So if you have stuff like triple tax talent, mm -hmm. change of heart, mind control, really powerful cards. But at the same time, then you got to worry about your opponent having anti spells. Yeah. So then you go on a bad cyclone. And then it's just like more layers. You just yep. got to keep outthinking your opponent like at every step until at some point you got to just hope you catch it at the right part of the circle. Yep. It's uh, such an intricate it. part of the side decking process is thinking through all those different steps, all those different interactions. There's not one right answer, that's for sure. At least that's yeah. so. I've been testing you know this format for quite some time, and yeah, I still don't know what the right answer is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's people talk about formats being solved. This one might be one of those ones where there's not a solution to the format, but just one that the player, personal player preference. Exactly. As we get into duel three, game three between two legends, Jesse and Jeff, one to one. Now Jesse getting to go first. Two titans in their own right. Two of the best players to ever sleeve up a deck. Now they're facing off each other round one. Now we saw that there's six rounds a day with only 16 people. That means even if you lose a couple of rounds, you still have a chance to make that top four cutoff. Mm -hmm. That's actually quite funny. You know how you know a lot of these players mentioned a two-round buy? I guess they get to play the two extra rounds now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. All, All right. right. So starting off with Ponix. So this is not the ideal start. You want to usually summon this card from your hand some other way. So this would lead me to believe that Jesse doesn't have any sort of snake eye access. Because mm -hmm. even if you open up with the Ponix, there's if you have the other snake eye, so there's many times where you can special summon it from your hand throughout your combo. Yeah, mm -hmm. you would probably just destroy it with the Fire King Island or something that, like that. that. Yeah, and then summon it uh, with the uh, Armata. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, opening with Ponix is actually another big tell of what your opponent has, because typically you do want to start with the Snake Eye stuff. You do want to, like, like, like you rather mm -hmm. have Bonfire rather than open with the Ponix. Definitely. So I'm wondering what the strongest field that we can actually set up with this opening is. I mean, we, mm -hmm. obviously there's the ideal opening, but based on where we are right now, where can we go with this? Oh, well, oh, we can go far now because he has original Civil War. Okay, well, well, <laughs> this will access the other aspect of the so he's going to have Snake Eye. But if he didn't have that before, he'd at least be able to stick two monsters if he destroyed the Ponix, summon the Grunix. 
but if he had another fire in his hand, he would destroy the fire from his hand, get three monsters on the field, go into Princess, bring back a fire, and link into Amblowell. Sure. But the original Sinful Spoil is here, uh -huh. just hard drawn. Going to be able to send the Sanctuary. A lot of players cut the Xyz Grunix from their edge deck because so many of their combos involve sending that Sanctuary off the field. So he's going to get the Snake Eye Ash to add Snake Eye's Poplar. Snake Eye's Poplar summons from the hand, and then if he plays another Sinful Spoils, he could add it here, or a Snake Eye Speller Trap, but he does not. Mm. Or it seems like he does not, or he has one in his hand. Yeah, it could already be in the opening rep. But Making now the decision. Yep, he's going to be thinking about using Snake Eye Ash. He's probably going to link away the Poplar into a Link Karibo. The Poplar is going to crystallize itself into the Spell and Trap card zone. This is summon number <laughs> four, so this is where this is a very crucial <laughs> junction in the play. Yep. Like a lot of things you have to consider is like what part of the uh, the combo line are you at? Mm -hmm. And yeah, there you're going to use the. Uh, Ash here. Jesse's going to use the Ash here, uh, and he's going to put away the Poplar. Didn't now, realize that uh, Poplar was Crystal Beast, by the way, Billy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've been looking for a terminology to yeah, replace yeah. in the Spill and Trap That's zone. a good one. Yeah, I, I like got a reference by, by crystallizing it. Yeah. yeah, I got to reference Jesse Anderson, you know. Yeah, I just Even to though confirm. they are Crystal Beast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, in the spirit of, you know. So we, we were thinking of you, Jesse. We're thinking of you. So this particular line here. Uh, we put up the Snake Eyes Flamberge Dragon, which makes it safer against Nibiru in case you do lose your field here, yeah. you would get to back two. If you could get one more monster on the field, if you can make Promethean Princess while leaving Flamberge on the field, you're actually able to do your Fire King combo, and then you're able to bring back Arvata yes. uh, with the Princess while you have Flamberge up. Then you link away the Princess and the Flamberge, but unfortunately it doesn't look like he's going to be able to access that, so he's going to have to link away the Flamberge to kind of play into Nibiru here. Mm -hmm. um. But yeah, Flamebridge kind of works as Nibiru protection just by leaving yep. it up there and using all your other monsters That's instead. right. You at least can keep going after that. Instead, it looks like Jesse's going to be looking for the other play. If Nibiru is perfect right here, because if otherwise he goes into the Princess, bring back the Flamebridge. The Flamebridge will put the IP Mascarena in the Spell and Trap card zone. But it's Phantasme, another Ooh. fantastical card against Snake Eye Fire Kings. <laughs> And maybe can get you into that Nibiru. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's so good. Yeah. You get to dig for those pivotal cards. There are two oh. Link monsters on the field. That's going to provide, I believe, a three-card draw, and you have to put two back. Yeah, now if Jesse can get his Link monsters out of the field, Jeff would only draw one card and put nothing back, but he would only do one card instead of two. But he's just going to ash the Phantasme straight yeah. up. Ooh. Keep it in the hand. I, I think that's smart from Jesse because it signals that the Nibiru is not in hand if it's in the deck. So you don't want to give <laughs> the opportunity for Jeff to draw into that. Flamebridge resolves on the chain link to bring back two level one fires mm. from the graveyard. And Phantasmi also has other applications because it does prevent your opponent from targeting your car your monsters. Definitely. And you could destroy them too. So it adds another layer of protection, especially when a lot of these effects they do target. Mm -hmm. It comes from the uh, the Snake Eye Fire Kings. Definitely. Except Kieran. Except Kieran. <laughs> Except Kieran. There's always an exception. <laughs> Except Kieran. But that's what this deck is. It's full of exceptions. You can't really pin down like a weak point in it, which is why it's so strong. I love how Phantasme comes back into meta relevancy every <laughs> now and then. You, always, like, you always need to keep those in your binder. Don't don't yeah. trade all of them away. You need a playset. Definitely. It's one of my favorite cards. Yeah. I believe it's coming uh, reprinted in the Rarity Collection, too. Ooh, that's exciting. I can't wait for that. But he does have he the does Nibiru. He does have yeah. it. This is huge. Not wow. being able to get that other monster on the field. Having to get rid of the Flame Bridge means Nibiru the Primal being touching down. This card either does a lot or nothing. In this case, it's a lot. Uh, Jesse's going to need some other card to extend, but I don't know if he's going to have it. Because, yeah, the big thing about, uh, I didn't really go into why the Flame Birds protects you from Nibiru, but if you get Nibiru while the Flame Birds is on the field, you get those two fire monsters back. You can, can link away the token and one to uh, yep. IP Mascarena, mm -hmm. link away the IP Mascarena and the fire monster into a Promethean Princess, and still have a, a board despite the Nibiru, but that's not happening here. Jeff, putting the token in attack mode, this is something you can do with the Fire King deck, because sometimes if they stop a lot of your stuff, you want to summon your monsters in attack mode and crash it into the Nibiru token True. to trigger your Fire King cards. But right. it looks like Jesse does have Kieran. He's going to destroy the Kieran from the hand. This is what Jeff didn't want to see, that he had another fire monster in hand. Mm -hmm. So he's going to be able to do Garunix and Kieran in the same chain link. Garunix comes from the hand to destroy from the deck. The Kieran can special summon back Ponix from the graveyard, and he's going to be able to destroy Nibiru. Okay. Now Garunix is going to destroy another fire monster from the deck. That's the Arvata? sacred. Yep, it's usually Arvata. Arvata here, and uh, that's going to bring back the Kieran. Yep, and now he's going to have enough monsters. So even though he didn't have, <laughs> he found a way, since he had the extra fire monster in his hand and opened up with the Sanctuary, this is actually just another way to play around wow. Nibiru, able to get more monsters on the field to go into the Princess after being nibiru This deck is so powerful. Look at what it can do. <laughs> it's just one card. And this is through a Nibiru and a Fantasma. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. <laughs> 
Especially after burning your Flamber's Dragon as well. Notably, though, I believe Jeff still has three cards in hand. Uh, he still has four because one was uh, negated. Oh, true. In hand. Yeah, yeah, so he yeah. still has a Phantasmic in hand. But the, knowing that there's only three, three cards you have to deal with and mm -hmm. one of them is not Phantasmic. Yeah. Well, here we but, are. But I mean, it, it, I highlight that because there's a lot of starters for this. Oh, game. So yeah. Jeff yeah, it's still, true. Uh, depending on the field that Jesse's able to build here, I think that Jeff could have a very powerful turn two. I, uh, he might have done enough, is really what I'm getting to. If you mm -hmm. only have to get through one Promethean Princess and an Amblo Whale and maybe an IP Mascarena, that's not unrealistic. It's when everything else comes online uh, <laughs> behind that, too. Yeah, it could be a lot worse. That's right. We'll have to see if he's going to link away these two monsters for... What's he going for? He's not angry. He's Sunlight Wolf. Oh, he's going for Sunlight Wolf. Ah, so he's going to sure. trade out the Ponix for the Link Kribo to try and add back... I would imagine the Kieran yeah, to the, the hand. Likely the Kieran. Yeah, so Sometimes they add back the Garunix just so that they can play around stuff like uh, Soul, uh, Soul Release. <laughs> Not, yeah, Soul Release Soul is release. good, especially in game number three. Is something to keep in mind. Yeah, Jeff's going to want to have a power spell to try and get back into this one. So, yeah, it looks like Jesse is thinking about the Garunix or the Kieran. The Kieran's smart if you have another fire monster because you're going to be able to destroy the fire monster to trigger the Garunix in the graveyard at any time that you want. Mm -hmm. So it kind of oh, will play around whatever good. card they might have to disrupt your board. I'm assuming Promethean Princess is about to hit the field. The highlighted card of the entire weekend. If you don't have this, you want it. Oh, yeah. If you yep. have it, you're happy. Bring out. The Bestower of Flame is going to bring back Flame Burge. Now Jesse can use that Flame Burge effect to effects. put the IP Mascarena. He's going to need to get this Princess off the field, though. Does he have something he can leave Amblo the Whale? Amblo Whale. Yeah. Amblo Whale. Amblo Whale. He doesn't want to use the Flame Burge because he needs the Flame Burge to summon IP. Uh, oh, oh, that's right. So... And if he leaves the... Okay, that's interesting. Interesting. You I can't want summon Battle yeah, the IP at the moment. You're, you're a little bit stuck Prince. right there because we are locked into Fire Monsters while you have the Promethean Princess. I'm wondering if maybe... Well, I mean, obviously, Jesse has a plan here. Oh, right? yeah. like, if we oh know he has the Kirin. The Kirin will Kieran. be able to destroy it. And oh, then that would be there back in the graveyard. Yep. We can push it back out. You know, There's a lot of sequencing here, but you'll, you, Jesse has the right steps again. There we go. I'm happy we arrived there because I was like, there is another way to do this, but this is the correct way then. Yes, yes. He'll be able to destroy the princess and then be able to summon the IP. But he doesn't do it right away, so Jeff's going to get the first action here in main phase one. It's going to be normal summon Snake Eye Ash. We're going to say that a lot this weekend. Yep. <laughs> I'm imagining Jesse... Well, he, what, do we know what Jesse has in hand at this point? Uh, Kieran. Just Kieran. Just, yep. Kieran. just Kieran. We don't know what that face down spell Could trap card is, though. Could be an infinite impermanence, I suppose, if he's wondering, do we use this now? I like the card highlight for the spell and oh, oh, it's a it's side a strike. Oh, strike. It's All not royal right. rare like we saw in Master <laughs> yesterday, but it's beautiful it as counts. a regular rare. It counts. It's it's a, it is actually card. very similar to how good it was in Master Duel against the Rosin when it works against Snake Eye Ash. Because yeah. Snake Eye Ash is the same effect where it adds on summon and has an effect on the field. So if it never it, hit the field, yep. yeah, get it out it, of there. It's huge. Yeah, it's one of the best cards to have going first. That's why they play cards like uh, Cyframe, Gear Gamma to take care of these monsters because you need that removal. That removal is so crucial when it comes to the Snake Eye Oak, Ash, Birch, all those. Anyone that would summon something from the deck is just very big, just not let them stay on the field. And Solemn Strike, just another powerful trap in the side deck if you know you're going first. But Bonfire James is the Bonfire. second of James. <laughs> I can't I just stop myself every time, but I just can't. <laughs> So please don't, actually. That's, that's <laughs> incredible. Uh, so Bonfire used uh, as we'll grab the Poplar. Yep, Poplar coming down. Poplar is inevitable, everybody. <laughs> Going to grab the original Simple Swiss. I, I really like playing the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye in Fire Kings. I don't know if a lot of people are playing it this. Uh, we can, a lot of people see it in Pure, but I like it in this deck as well just because it helps you play around a lot of cards uh, pretty well. You get I mean, to put put a uh, monster into the back right away. Yeah, on you the get activation. to put Snake Eye Oak or Flame Bridge if you want to play around Nibiru. A lot of the times you do the. F there's a really cool play where you can put Flame Bridge in the spell and trap card zone, and then you make like Celine into an Appaloosa, and mm. then you use your original Sinful Spell on Flame Bridge, and you get five monsters on your field underneath your Appaloosa. Wow, that's like my favorite play. Well, hopefully we get to see that this weekend. But when I mean, you get five monsters once, you get the you get Ash Oak. Poplar, then Ponex, and then Ponex gets you Island, then you get Garunix. Yeah. Garunix is yeah. <laughs> There's a few more Ponyx, steps to get all, to there. It's all from that one play. <laughs> Billy's brain works, you know, I'm 20 skipping steps to the ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now we see the original on the Poplar to summon Ponix. All right. It's legendary. You didn't wait for it that time. I didn't wait for it. We're not waiting All for right. it anymore. We're in game three. No time to wait. <laughs> Poplar's We're going into to this one. <laughs> Poplar's going to put itself in the spell and trap card zone. It's really cool to note that Poplar can put any fire monster from either graveyard into the spell and trap card zone. 
a lot of Master Duel players like realize after the first time and they're just like, oh wait, I have all these other options. Yeah. Like, yeah. I thought it was just Poplar. I People never just kind of helps you. Think they're Amazing <laughs> Princess. Wow. <laughs> There's the Viking Island coming down. Jesse off the did field. lose 1,500 life points, so he is sitting at 6,500 thanks to that solemn strike. So keep that in mind if you're watching at home. True. Good call. We only have to get 6,500 here for Jeff. How many cards does Jeff have? Three cards? There's still so many moves that Jesse can do. Jesse is just rank waiting for the right timing when it comes to when he's going to destroy his own Promethean princess. Yeah, at, any, at any moment, Jesse can use Kieran to destroy the princess. Kieran will come out. Then he can use Grunik's effect to summon back. Then he destroys a Kieran from his deck to summon back Arvata and destroy another card on the field. And then... Oh, actually, that would fill him up to where he wouldn't be able to summon the IP Masquerina if he summoned all those monsters. He, he may push the IP Masquerina out a little bit earlier, leaving the Grunix in there, just so he can use the Grunix a little bit later if he needed oh, to. Oh, and then save the Grunix to, mm -hmm. to use off the Promethean Princess effect? Mm -hmm. I see that, because, yeah, that makes sense. Step number one is getting that Promethean Princess off of the <laughs> field, though. Yeah, you got to also be careful with it, because it locks you out of using stuff like Nibiru the Primal Being as well True, while it's yeah. on the field. All right, so it looks like he's going to use Fire King Island to destroy the legendary Fire King Ponyx. I love that Ponyx was like on the artwork from the cards years ago. You can see it on the circle of the Fire King. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now we finally get the card. It's Many the years later. Game of Courier. <laughs> yeah. so he's like flying Need around Shureg. And then we finally got it as a card. I love it when that happens. Need a time to hatch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, need a time to grow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get, get big and strong. <laughs> so Garunix comes to the hand. Garunix summons to the field. Yep. Going to use the effect to destroy a fire monster from the deck. This is pretty good. I, maybe Jesse's trying to bait Jeff into destroying his Fire King Island, but yeah, there's absolutely no reason to do that here. I would probably, uh, yeah, the thing you have to destroy is the flame. I th is that the most advantageous? I don't know what you destroy with Kieran here. It's either Flame Bridge or IP, I feel like. Not the princess. <laughs> mm, it has to be the tough IP. place to be in right here. Yeah. Yeah, not the princess. You, yeah. you, you destroy the princess <laughs> on your own. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jeff definitely knows what's online. He knows that Kieran's in hand and what that represents. He's probably trying to... He's, we're, how we were talking about the board being clogged. Is he going after the token? 26, I think. No, he's asking how much this, attack does this. it have. So the thing is, when you're going second... Even though if your opponent has a ton of monsters, there's a lot of different ways in the Fire King Snake Eye deck to still finish them off in one turn. You mm. can use your extra deck, you can use Access Code Talker, but more recently, yep. Salomon Great Raging Phoenix into World Sea Dragon Zelantis. Oh, yes. You, use the sea, you can banish all the monsters on the field, they all come back. You pick the positions, you can put them all in attack mode, but then you get to use the Promethean Princess from the graveyard, destroy one other fire monster you have, and then that brings back the Raging Phoenix who gains all that attack and you mm. have to do so much damage. And there's even more with that because the Zelantis now co link, likely going to be co Link with mm -hmm. the Promethean Princess, which will allow you to destroy two more cards in the battle phase. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways yes. to break their board. Monsters won't defend you, but having keeping your opponent off getting to those access. I know Jesse's really, really considering that right now. He has to watch out for that. And there's also ways you can do it even if they don't have a monster. If you go into uh, Raging, Fe uh, yeah, Raging Phoenix into Zelantis and you get a co-linked... Uh, Sunlight Wolf or Nightmare Phoenix. You can just go to battle phase, attack with Zelantis, attack with the other one, the other Fire Link. Use the Zelantis effect, destroy it, and then you bring back your Raging Phoenix and attack for game with that. Wow. So they don't even have to have wow. monsters. A lot of people think that the Fire King deck needs monsters on the field for that line, but there's also another way. Mm. <laughs> very smart. <laughs> but very wait, smart. there's more. But wait, all you gotta do is keep summoning monsters on the field and keep accessing that extra deck. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, he's taking his time with it. Eight minutes on the clock here for Jeff Jones. This is a critical point. The token oh, so he, has been destroyed. He wouldn't have to. I was like, yeah, there's not a good like. There's just not a good Kieran target. It's either the token or IP. I think. Yep. Jeff, considering going into his extra deck, he has two fire monsters right now. One thing that's a bit dangerous about the matchup later in the game is that if you did load your graveyard with the Snake Eye Ash, with the Snake Eye Oak. The Hita now is just, hey, your graveyard is my starting hand. Oh, yeah, and mm -hmm. Jeff's also probably looking at Hita. Hita's a great way to climb into Promethean Princess. And once you start climbing. Now, that's, a, that's the intricacy of these mirror matches. Can you please play faster, Jeff? Uh, All right, so it looks like time is winding down. So, you know, Jesse asking to play a little bit faster. This turn's been going on for a while. A lot's on the line here. you gotta, you got to play at a reasonable pace. Yeah, definitely want to keep the pace of play up. Seven minutes still on the clock. Jesse is at 6,500 to 8,000. Now he's going to send the Poplar to summon Diabell Star, the Dark. Sure. 
Okay. I'm oh, sorry, the Black Witch, not Dark Magician. It's... He's going to get a search. <laughs> Does he play the other Sinful Spoils? No, he's going to go for the wanted. wanted. Instead of Wanted. Might as well. Oh, boy. Three monsters on the field. Like, there's just so many different ways to actually branch out into these combos. Mm -hmm. But Jesse hasn't really committed to too much of his interactions yet. He's Je saving them right now. Mm -hmm. Jesse's very, very patient here. Yeah, very patient play. I feel uh, like a lot of players would have tried to stop on its own. Earlier. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're very tempted to just, I just want to play it right now, just get rid of your cards, but you just don't know how much follow-up is coming. But Jesse's always on top of this. Mm-hmm. All right, so now that the heat is down, this is the time for Jesse to use that Kieran. He's going to destroy the princess. Now here comes the Garunix. Since the fire monsters destroyed, the Garunix can summon back from the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Garunix effects. That's going to probably destroy Kieran from the deck. Kieran effect. Kieran effect. So he doesn't have Arvata in rotation here, so he's just going to get the destruction and not have that monster negate. Mm. Oh, no. Oh, that's right. He did destroy he Arvata, but it got the field got Nibiru. To, that's right. Mm -hmm. I forgot. He still had the Fire King access after Nibiru. So what does uh, Jesse have to, in his disposal right now? How okay. many pieces of interaction does he have on his He has field? the Arvata for a monster negate. He can move up the IP Masquerina from the Spell and Trap Card Zone to his main monster zone with Flamebird Dragon. And, and then, then he can either link into... Knight. Yep, SP Little Knight is a huge one. He can also go into a huge Appaloosa. But since we're at this point in stage, I think, yeah, we're looking at SP Little Knight. That's a good call. I mean, we, we're talking to all these new cards. We can't forget about SP yeah, Little Knight. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't forget about that card. card. Age of Overlord was a phenomenal set. That's, uh, <laughs> that and Bonfire are probably up there as the two most sought-after cards right now. It looks like he's adding a Kieran from the Fire King Island. Oh, did he have the Grunix in his hand already? I think oh, no, so. this is from the Hida. Hida, Hida, Hida destruction. Hida, Hida destruction. Hida, Hida, Hida adds like a 1,500 mm. lower defense monster right into the hand, which is great. Hida, the, the, the uh, Kieran's just perfect for that. Indeed. Mm -hmm. I just love that Jesse Hida's somehow has summoned more monsters on Jeff's turn than Jeff's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes <laughs> Nibiru is better on your, your own turn yeah, now yeah, than right? it is on theirs. But since the Arvato is destroyed a battle, it's going to be able to spell someone back. The Ponex defects can be negated, and it's going to be destroyed during the end phase. But since it's destroyed during the end phase, that means it's going to go back to the hand during Jesse's next standby phase. You know, it's funny you say, Nibiru. Have we summoned four at this point? And where if S or IP would be... I think I, IP would be four, and then the link off of that would be five. Yep, so... <laughs> if Jeff has another yeah. Nibiru, that'd be very funny. I don't know if he would be choosing to play a Nibiru going, uh, going first. Probably not, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, uh, oh, Jesse second. got to go he first. Could, he, yeah, well, he, yeah. Could be, he could have one. Yeah, we I'm already saw sure. one from Jeff. Yeah, he did, he did, he did, he did. Oh, oh, is that it? That's the pass. Oh. Just, had, just got some damage across. I don't know yeah. if this particular mm. deck plays a lot of disruptive uh, trap cards. Going I know one seconds? of them wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah go, so. going second especially not. I mean, uh, it made yeah. sense for Jesse to have the solid strike. I don't see a world where Jeff has some like that. Yeah, it looks like Jesse's just going to use the Flame Bird Dragon effect to push that Grunix back into the spell and trap card zone. Very Valence effect feeling. Mm -hmm. I, oh. think, I think we <laughs> might see why Jeff took so long to decide his turn here. Is if you don't have that many uh, moves to go, you have to be very selective of what you have. And we didn't even get through the IP play. Like, uh -huh. uh, that's rough. Definitely. And that looks like Jeff responded with the Kieran from the hand to destroy the Grunix. Not what you want to do. You really want that Grunix in the graveyard and then destroy something else with the Kieran to bring the Grunix back from the graveyard. But he, just having this Kieran defense mode it's something, because if Kieran's destroyed, he's able to summon back a monster and destroy a card in the field. It's not a lot, and Jesse should be able to navigate a way to victory here shortly. But he's still lower in life, and time is ticking down. Oh, the Hita comes down. Mm -hmm. Hita can also basically summon back uh, the, the Grunix, and that yeah. takes care of the <laughs> Wait problem. A minute. Oh, this is such uh, an entertaining has, mirror match. He had another Ash Blossom for the Phantasme again. Oh. Yeah, I, oh no! Oh. Now the flame bird. Oh, you snake! I asked to get poplar. Yeah. 
You know how in the Rescue Ace matchup, if you resolve Turbulence twice, you more or less win the game? Uh, it's very similar where you get to resolve the effect of Flamberge twice and summon your monsters back twice. <laughs> it's kind of, You generate about the same amount of advantage, but you definitely can do a lot more with this particular line. And uh, we're seeing the second time that this is coming out. And there's the uh, Garunix being summoned out through the Hita effect. That takes out the, uh, the interaction there for the Kirin. Yep, and he's going to be able to use the Garunix effect on special summon to destroy a fire monster in his deck if he wants. He only might not have any other things to destroy that are advantageous, though. Does he have another Kirin? <laughs> we can bring back the Ar 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 Arvada. Doesn't look like it, though. Maybe he sided it out. Or maybe he only plays two. Phoenix. Nightmare Phoenix. Ooh, okay. He's going to go after the unknown Speller Trap card. Yes, he is. This is going to be it. This will, yeah, this will telegraph the rest of the field. Yeah. What does Jeff have back there? He's thinking. Is it, a, it has to be called by the grave? Like, <laughs> what else, why else would the graveyard matter this much? Right. It has to be called by, I think. It's Three a good minutes, card, but this is probably the not clock. the position for it. Ash, uh, but I don't know if it's going to be called by the grave. He, he would have he called by the grave the, the Flamber Dragon, right? so yeah. it's probably not he, called by. He might by. be looking at what's already been used, what effects have been used this turn. He was at just asking Jesse about some of the, uh, I think, the, the Ash Blossom and, and how that sequenced the cards that were there. Because mm -hmm. he knows when that was used this turn. Chain. Oh, we have a chain. Cosmic. Oh, cosmic. Okay. Oh. That is a, not a bad one to have here. Okay, okay we're paying 1,000 life points for that. Going to take out that field spell. That's a great card. Now everything goes. The Kieran effect and the Hita will trigger if he has something to add with Hita. He didn't destroy anything with the Garunix, though. So. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, three Kieran. <laughs> I've played a lot. Yeah. It comes up. I, I, I We're only in turn three. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the two Kieran camp at the moment, but I can see your point. Sorry. I can see your point here. Billy's like, it's okay. You can be wrong. <laughs> no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so Arvata, it looks like they're he's trying to decide when he swims back with the Kirin. I thought all hope was lost, but one card. Yeah. We talked comeback. about Cosmic in the pre-show. Yeah. You mentioned it as a key card. I think it might be one of the most played cards right now. I, I would genuinely blind to this. I would say 100% of the players might include it in their deck, main wow. or side. It's yep. that good it's, right now. It's really, really good. And uh, as mentioned uh, during, uh, during our little uh, side talk here, you wait for them to commit. If you did it early, it would have been terrible. But now that a lot of stuff has been committed, Jeff looks through the grave of what has been used mm -hmm. and decided to Cosmic there. And uh, the board is still fully rebuilt here, which is still <laughs> unfortunate because you resolve Flambridge twice. It's going to be uh, very hard to yeah, play. I love how impactful that one activation was and then maybe <laughs> how inconsequential it also was based on... That's kind of uh, how it goes. Yeah. The flames of rebirth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Phoenix Eye, rising from Snake the ashes. Eye Oak, Snake Eye Oak was a card a lot of people overlooked kind of initially. Uh, they were looking at like to the OCG, how they were playing these strategies when they came out over there. Yeah, not, a, lot, a lot of the lists include Snake Eye Oak. I think but that's over a, here, yeah, over yeah, here, you have to play it. I love it. the card. Oh, so we, summoning Dark the Dark Charmer with the Link Karibo. Yep, so Dark going after that Diabell Star, but wanted being able to add it back from the graveyard. Yeah. But now he has exactly what he needs the Kirin might stop him from doing enough damage, though, because the Kirin can still destroy a card and special Princess. swim back. He's going to go into Princess. Princess can come back. He can go into Raging Phoenix, into Zelantis. But the Zelantis would destroy the Kirin, and then the Kirin would summon back. So we might just try and find a way oh, to use our Vod on the Kirin. That, should, uh, that might be able to uh, clear it out. Jesse's just trying to pave a very clean path to victory. And I do just think one card in the way. I do think there was there might have been a slow play warning from Jeff's previous turn. I kind of heard the judges talking mm -hmm. about it. I'm not 100 yeah. percent So we might have three more additional minutes on top of this. Okay. Okay, that's what it is. Could be. Jesse's just gonna try and get as much whale. done on the field right now. Still has the IP, but nothing to bring it out. Yep, so it goes into Amblowell and Zelantis. Ah. Zelantis effect. It has a really cool effect. It can banish all monsters on the both players' side of the field. Spell summon it back to the owner's side, and you pick the positions. Face up attack, face down defense. I like to think of it as it's pushing the tides out, and it wheels <laughs> yeah. it back in. Yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, it's, it's also thematic. just such a cool-looking card. I love it being mm -hmm. like in the ocean on that Link monster. That blue just looks so nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's one of those cards that came out. I was like, this card's going to be really, really good yeah, one day. It, at some <laughs> point, it's going to be very utilized. 
It just yeah. has the potential for yeah, it. Yeah, and I mean, the big thing that it does is it forces your opponent to special summon, which can enable your Promethean Princess from your graveyard. Mm -hmm. But this Kieran is going to be an issue. So yeah, he's not going to use the Promethean Princess, just going to use Poplar Link. <gasps> oh! He, he got another application for Zelantis. He picked the zone he wanted it. Relinquish and right. Give me that. Give me that. Th what a Kieran. cool oh, card to play! Wow. Jesse God it. takes it! There's, oh, wow. I mean, we talked about there's so many different ways to finish the duel off in one turn, and you're just showing one of the many uses of World Dragon Zelantis. Incredible. Wow! Well, I, you know, I, maybe I am. I've been kind of like a hater on Relinquish Anima. Like, I'm like, oh, you don't really need it. Link Karibos enough. But in this combination of cards, especially in this specific situation, if it was any other monster besides Kieran, he could have just done the regular play with the Promethean Princess effect to destroy mm -hmm. it. But because it was Kieran, he had to find a different route to go about it. And time was winding down, so he knew he had to end it quickly since he was half of the life points that Jeff was at. And he just found this beautiful play with Zelantis. Yep. putting Put it in the zone and take it with Relinquish. So cool. It was awesome to see a relinquished card make an appearance here in 2024. <laughs> first winner, first match winner here on stream, Jesse Cotton for the undisputed UDS Championship Series using essentially a Pegasus card there. We'll call it that. <laughs> Might as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, if we're trying to see who's undisputed, I like that. In the I mean, everyone's using that, the Fontaine card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a classic anime card. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what a way. I mean, it was so back and forth. A lot of interactions. We saw how close Jesse actually was to getting, or Jeff, sorry, was to getting out of there. Um, but it just wasn't enough. The, the fact that the interactions were too much from Jesse's side. Really? Yeah. I mean, I was trouble finding a way to navigate because even just just one Kieran can be tough sometimes but incredible play I mean it also you gotta give some credit to Jeff there in that game going second in game three at the, on the biggest page mm -hmm. tough to do didn't have a lot of those answers in hand the answer he did have that Phantasme was stopped uh, twice twice, yeah. Yeah, twice. Not able to get that. I mean yeah maybe Phantasme it's a good card but it does have its ups and downsides but it was still yeah. almost a break through the board and found a way to survive there was a win condition there for him he found it but Jesse just proving like, no, not today. This Kieran's not going to save you. We also saw the power of Cosmic Cyclone. We've been talking yeah. about it. Like, that did a lot of work in that duel. Unfortunately, uh, it was not enough in that case <laughs> yeah. because the uh, the uh, uh, Flamberge already activated the second time, loaded the hand, the, the O came out, everything just went sideways from there. But I think the coolest point was the non-destructive removal that you need to handle this matchup. Mm. That's where the, and Jesse fit an extra one in there, which is the Relinquish Anima, which we did yeah. not see coming at all. Definitely. It, I think uh, part of it is that the anima, it's very powerful in its removal, but it takes a decent amount of setup, right? You yeah. need to get to the Link 4 first mm -hmm. and then also have a one-star, which, I mean, I say you have to. It's not that hard for the <laughs> fire get, Getting a one-star fire. fire do, yeah. but, but, you know, that's a really cool application of Zelantis, though. Just yes. Choosing the position of where yes. you're going to put it and then setting it up for that particular non-destructive removal. Yeah, there's so many different ways you can use it, and that's not even one that was really on my radar going into this tournament. And mm -hmm. I've been prepping for months for this thing. I mean, <laughs> I've seen Anima around a lot, but see it used with the Zelantis to take a Kieran in that specific situation. Mm -hmm. That really just shows you why, like, theory can only take you so far. Like, yeah, yeah. you can practice much, but just knowing those key, tiny little interactions that you're only going to get from playing hundreds and hundreds of games. And I'm not joking. You just got to keep grinding and keep playing. As long as you're having fun, that's important, but you want those scenarios to pop up. You don't want to be in a position where you're in a tournament with the time, you know, winding down when you're like, I don't know what to do here. You want to yeah. be like, oh, I've been here before. Yep. I want to see. It's kind of like when you play chess. You kind of memorize your openings, your yeah, opening yeah. gambits. It's very similar. I mean, that's why I like Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, it feels the same, but it's completely different every time. Memorize what these two cards can do together. <laughs> memorize what these two cards can do together, right? Well, with that being said, that's match one in the books. We're getting ready to send it over to Cyber Knight, who's on stage with an interview with Jesse Cotton. Uh, first off, congrats on your win. And how did it feel to win your match? Uh, it's incredibly stressful playing for someone who I respect a lot and is a friend of mine. So being up here stage round one, stage, like being on the stage round one right away is a bit intense. So yeah, happy to have it over with in one. I bet so. I'd be <laughs> really nervous. Uh, why did you choose the deck that you use today? Uh, I just think it's the best deck, I think, in every way. It looked like a lot of fun, too. Uh, what was something that stood out in your match? Um, in the last move, the Relinquished Anima on his Kirin. Uh, so obviously, you want to make sure not to destroy those Fire King cards. There's a whole bunch of effects go off. And one of the ways to do that is like weirdly rearrange their zones with Zelantis, and then you put it into the Anima zone so you can steal it, because uh, obviously a good player like Chef would not do that intentionally. 
But yeah, like I said, it was a great match. So congratulations again. Awesome to hear from Jesse Cotton himself after that win. It's just the best deck, Billy. It, it, it is. is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why they go into it. Like, there's a lot of reasons why I prefer the Fire King to the just pure Snake Guy. But they both have their comp pros and cons, and we're going to see how it's going to play out this mm -hmm. week and which one of these decks is going to uh, uh, end up being on top. The Undisputed Ultimate the Duelist. Undisputed. undisputed. Ultimate Duelist, Ultimate Deck. Well, with that said, a reminder for everybody at home, you can get involved in the action this weekend with the charity drive happening right now. There's a lot of prizes that you can win. All you need to do is donate $10 USD or more to receive entry into the highest tier that your donation will make you eligible for. If you donate more than 10, you get into a higher tier, of course, as well as entry to all the lower tiers. 130 lucky winners will be chosen at random. We got so many cool prizes, a bunch of plushies, Cool artwork cards, cool game mats, the giant slifer. I mean, that's oh. I think on a lot of people's radar, Billy. Yeah, I definitely want that giant slifer. I mean, it is the top prize, but I may or may not try and walk away with it. Somebody okay. might tackle me on my <laughs> Did way. Did you out. donate? <laughs> I have. I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I think if I donate, I don't think I'm allowed to win. Still, oh, okay. But right, 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 I would love to enough. donate to a wonderful cause of Doctors Without Borders. Because I mean, uh -huh. Yu-Gi-Oh is a game without borders. I've met people from all around yes. the world throughout my life. I've been playing, you know, a quarter of a century. It feels like over 20 years, and, and I, you know, I've met people that don't even speak the same language as me. But being able to share the same mm -hmm. hobby, the same thing that we both love, you know, that's the best part about Yu-Gi-Oh and Doctors Without Borders. It's, trying to break down borders throughout the world and bring good and happiness and joy just like Yu-Gi-Oh. So please support and donate this weekend. May not speak the same language, but you speak the same dual language. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yu -Gi -Oh. With that being said, that's round one in the books. We're going to send it to a short break before we are back to continue the quarter century celebration with the undisputed UDS championship after this. I have been playing Yu-Gi-Oh since the very beginning. I came home from school one day and turned on the TV, and the first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh was playing, where Yu-Gi-Oh was playing against Kaiba, beating him with Exodia. And as soon as my dad got home from work, I made him take me to the store to buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and uh, I've been playing ever since. Inicié por un amigo que este por un primo que me enseñó las cartas y pues de ahí empecé a jugar porque pues me llamó mucho la atención. Llevo aproximadamente 20-21 años jugando, este, intermitentemente, pero 20-21 años aproximadamente. Eh, yo inicié en Yu-Gi-Oh! viendo la caricatura en televisión cuando era pequeño y aproximadamente en el juego competitivo yo más de 7 años jugando. Bueno, empecé desde muy chico, unos amigos jugaban en el colegio, eh, com vi cómo jugaban, me llamó la atención y empecé a jugar. Eso fue hace como unos 20 años. Uh, I've been doing since... Man, since I was like in fourth grade, uh, maybe that's like more than like 14 years. Uh, but yeah, I've been dueling for a really long time. I co started collecting cards. I started watching a TV show. And uh, I didn't get competitive until I got maybe to high school. And uh, there were a lot of adults playing in the library. Uh, they were playing like Teledad decks. And uh, I really liked how the interactions went. and. You know, I really like how Yu-Gi-Oh was going, and uh, I really liked how you know you can perform like comebacks and things like that. And, and I really liked the game the way it was and the way it is now uh, because it's a lot more complicated as well. I feel, uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's really good. It's really good. I got into Yu-Gi-Oh about 19 years ago. I was in kindergarten, and one of my friends showed me his deck of cards, and that was it. I've been hooked ever since. Bueno, creo que la mayoría conocemos a Yugi por la serie. Allá por el 2005 conocí por primera vez una carta física y dije, ¿en serio existe el juego de monstruos? Desde ahí comenzó mi amor a este juego, ya son 19 años. 
So back then when I first started, Yu-Gi-Oh! was doing, I think, elementary school. I was very young. Just some other classmates brought cards to the, to the, uh, to the school, so everyone just got on it. Uh, my first time travel, I believe it was 20, uh, beginning of 2014. I was in junior high school and planned a trip to a YCS and a college visit at the same time during my spring break. So that's the first time I started competitive and it's been almost 10 years. Well, I get for you, like a lot of people, for friends and the anime. Uh, I've been playing for like almost 20 years now. And yeah, I start with, with friends. Uh, I started playing 2013, so about 10 years. Uh, I got into Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, my last year of high school, my friend wanted to go to locals, and then ever since then I started going every week and playing on and off since then. Um, so my cousin bought like starter decks when we were uh, kids, and um, but back then we didn't really like know what we were doing, like playground rules, you know, just kind of summon three blue eyes in one turn, you know, and just didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but like really got into the game in like 2014 Duelist Alliance era. Um, I played Burning Abyss and that's when I like started playing meta and you know getting more competitive and you know having a lot more fun with it actually. So. All right uh, I know the game for so many years I decided to play competitive like maybe seven six years ago but I've been playing for like ton of years. Uh, I get to, into the game because of my cousins and yeah that's more than 10 15 years maybe. I've been playing since about tw 2008, when I first started watching the show. Me and my friend, he brought over some cars that he, his parents bought him, and been playing ever since. Um, well, I first probably got into Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was watching the cartoon show when I was a little kid. But uh, I, the first time I went to a tournament, I was probably 18, so it's been a little while now. And uh, yeah, uh, I've had a great time since then. I started playing again after a few years and I'm glad that I'm back now. I've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh for probably since like 2002, 2003 when the show came out and I went to Toys R Us and saw the two star decks. Me and my brother got the Yu-Gi and Kaiba one and then uh, I kept playing ever since. In 2012 I started playing more competitive Yu-Gi-Oh as well as starting to travel more. Well, I've been doing it for around 15 years, but for most competitive scene, I've been playing around eight years, and all started like I think everyone else watching the show and playing with my friends in the school. Hey everyone, Ted Lewis here. Jack Atlas and I would like to say happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh card game, and may you have many more. I would say my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh memory is that. 25 years ago, I got to meet some really remarkable people while doing the show, many of whom have become very dear friends of mine. Dan Green, Wayne Grayson, Gregory Abbey, Tara Sands, Darren Dunstan, the list goes on and on. The cast was really wonderful and I'm really grateful to have those people in my life. I'd say the line that I am asked to quote most often as Jack Atlas is, of course, I'm Jack Atlas, the master of FASTA. I'm really happy to have been a part of something that has had such a positive impact on so many people's lives. I've met fans at conventions, at live tournaments, and they consistently tell me how Yu-Gi-Oh! helped them through tough times, taught them about friendship, about loyalty, about believing in oneself, and uh, I think that's wonderful, and, and I'm so grateful to have been a part of, of something so positive. It's, it's really great. La verdad me siento muy agradecido y honrado de poder compartir este evento con jugadores de alto nivel y pues a darlo todo, solamente quiero ganarlo y ya. Uh, it feels good. I've never been in the Konami office before, so seeing um, you know, all the video games up that I played when I was little is a nice feeling. Muy emocionado. Creo que este es el evento más grande que he jugado con jugadores muy grandes de muy alto nivel y creo que va a ser una experiencia muy agradable. La verdad es que es un honor ser parte de esto y es Increíble. Uh, I'm really excited. I, as you can tell, not many people were invited to it. Um, I'm glad to be one of them as well, uh, especially since I won the UDS. I became, I was able to be a part of it. Um, it also motivates, you know, people from uh, where I'm from as well. You know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I've, I work overnight and it's very challenging to keep playing. But you know, as long as uh, my job and my family, they have my back too, then you know, 
it was, I, people can see that, you know, it's also, they can do it too. I'm very grateful I can be invited and I think I will be performing or try to perform as, as best as I can. Uh, this is an awesome experience. Like, I think this is like an event that everyone should be here. Like this is, this is maybe the, the biggest event that I'm been playing. So uh, yeah, being here is just like an excellent experience. I can't believe it's been 25 years since the game has come out. It seems just like yesterday when I started playing the game and started traveling and meeting all, all friends through Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, it's a huge honor to be here. Uh, celebrating 25 years of Yu-Gi-Oh! It's a huge part of my life and I'd love to be able to celebrate that with amazing people and amazing players. It's awesome that the game has been around for 25 years. I'm super honored to even have a small part of it and uh, hopefully I'm sure everybody agrees that there's we have another 25 years after. Oh yeah, I'm stoked to be here. This is like, yeah, I never would have thought I would be here. I almost feel like it's undeserved for me a little bit just because I don't play a lot. Um, so the fact that I'm even here is like a pretty humbling experience. Well, it's a really great experience because it, it feels amazing. Being invited to the quarter century celebration events is a huge honor. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a large part of my life. And to be part of that game's history, it's, it's awesome. I'm super excited. I feel honored to be invited and just I'm gonna try my best. Uh, that's awesome. Like, it's such a big part of my life, um, playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, I, a lot of things that I do, a lot of friends that I have are involved in the game. Yeah. So being part of the celebration uh, is really important to me. It's really, yeah. really nice. All right, welcome back. We are back here at the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series. And again, we had a great round one, but this tournament is not even half over yet. We still have five great rounds of intense dueling action. So, what do you think of that last match that we just saw? I did not know what I was seeing for half of it, I feel. A lot of things kind of went unexpected, and especially that ending, I really didn't expect it to be relinquished anima to really close out that game. I wasn't really sure what he was doing with the Salantis. Usually when you're making World Sea Salantis, you're using the Salamangrate, uh, is it Rising Phoenix? Raging Phoenix? Yes, yes. But seeing the Amblo Whale going there, I wasn't really sure what he was trying to do, but then we saw he was just moving the Kirin, so get him in that zone for the anima, like very unsuspecting. But, you know, I think players are ready to go into round number two. So let's go ahead and go to Kangas down at the stage. Thank you very much, Caster. Is let's welcome to the stage, starting on the red side, Juan Sebastian Andrade Castro. UDS history. He won one of the first three, I believe. I remember I met him at the following UDS that he got to go to because he won his original one. He's hometown Guayaquil, Ecuador. Also, just one of the, my favorite people in this tournament. He has hosted me several times, and I'm I, I, just a little bit of bias here. I hope you don't see it too much. Oh, no, you're fine. I'm a new Cosmo fan after performance yesterday, so having his favorite card beat Cosmo Tin Can is hype. You don't have to show any bias there. But it's going to be a tough one. I mean, he, again, coming out of that round, is going to have to face another person of the same match record. So basically, he's got his work cut out for him if he's going to continue his tournament success. I mean, off to a great start, though, 1-0. You know, you definitely want to start winning pretty early. So we're going to go back to the stage for our next competitor. And facing one is Cameron Taylor Neal. Now I feel this player almost needs no introduction. He has been in the tournament scene for so long. Hometown Arlington, Texas. Favorite card, Red Eyes Black Dragon. Kind of goes to show how long he's been around. Oh yeah, representing with that great shirt. And we saw during all those player interviews, you know, Cameron's a little bit of a soft-spoken duelist, but once he gets the cards out, he is incredible, right? He lets the cards do the talking. Obviously, just kind of getting into his mode, very excited. Uh, plays in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, obviously somebody I've seen before. And again, like I mentioned before earlier in the broadcast, he is at the locals all the time. So he's 
not just an ultimate duelist, he's a daily duelist, throwing those cards out at your sneak preview events and everything. So it's good to see him here and good to see him representing the old Red Eyes Black Dragon there with that gorgeous shirt. Absolutely. He is one of the most dedicated players I've seen in the history of the game. He's playing constantly, always putting his all into it, always coming with some interesting ideas, especially in uh, the beginning of formats like we have today. You know, these cards were just released and we're already seeing them do so much. I think both of these players are here for a reason. They're excellent duelists and they're both very deserving of that potential undisputed ring. But we'll have to see who gets to duke it out and become the winner of our round two. I think that's a tragedy of watching this tournament. Only one person can be the undisputed ultimate duelist and I want all of them to win but it's true, we can only have one winner. So players are getting ready here, obviously, just making sure they have all their tournament supplies and a lovely staff there and judges really hard working just to make sure that all the gameplay is fair and focused. Absolutely, you definitely want, especially at a, a tournament of this caliber, you want to make sure everything is going as smoothly as possible. That's why we have everyone here on staff, making sure that things go just exactly that way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you definitely recognize these staff. If you have been to any Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series in the last, I don't know, 15 to 25 years, you've seen these faces, so you know that they're all just as dedicated. These are people that give up their time, wake up even earlier than our tournament competitors to make sure that there is a fun and fair format. But right now, it's really all about the duel. The duelists are shuffling, getting ready, and they're both very just in there, right? They're only thinking card game thoughts. Oh, they're locked in for sure. I mean, they've already made it through one round, so they got a bit of those nerves out of the way. You know, going into a tournament, like this is almost like a world championship level tournament, right? There's going to be those nerves, no matter how long you've been playing the game, how many tournaments you've been through, how many championships you've won, you still have to get through it. And that round one is always, I feel, the most nervous that first round of the day. But now you've already dueled, you've played a match and you're ready to go. You know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know what you're going to expect. And I feel at this point, we should talk about, it's such a small tournament, you get to kind of see what everyone else is on. So I think there's, both players have a pretty good idea of what the other person's playing. Oh, absolutely. And we've seen, you know, obviously all of these great new fire cards from Phantom Nightmare are very popular. And we're going right into game one to see what it is these duelists are going to be playing. Yeah, I think this is going to be one of the determining matchups of the entire format here. Fire King Snake Eye versus Pure Snake Eye. Whose deck reigns supreme? Get to find out who goes first here. A little roll of the dice. Oh, maybe not yet. Let's see what Cam rolls here. That looks like a nine. Nine is hard to beat. Juan finds a 10. 10. Just enough. Just enough. All right. Well, great sportsmanship. I guess we'll see. Looks like our Snake Eye player, Juan, is likely to go first. It's weird. I've been saying this. I, I think maybe this is a hot take. But for game one exclusively, exclusively, I think if you're playing a fire mirror match, going second might be a little bit more ideal because you have access to those charmers. You have access to just so much more that you can use because of the battle phase as well that you end up being able to find a game shot more often than not because there's less tools in your like game one. You don't know which card you're playing around. Right? Are you going after the Droll and Lockbirds and the Birus? Are you trying to play around the Super Polymerizations, the Triple Tactics Talents? Like you have to kind of really pick and choose your field, and until you have that information as to what your opponent's playing, it might not make the best board possible. Well, speaking of information, after that bonfire was activated and slapping the Snake Eye Ash on the field, unfortunately, its effect was negated by Effect Failure, and a beautiful copy of that. Snake Eye Ash, when it gets hit with something along the lines of Infinite Permits or Effect Failure, it seems like it would really end the turn because there's not much you can do with it. You can't even use, well, I mean, I suppose you could use, but it would resolve without effect, the effect of Ash to send itself as well as another face-up card to summon a Snake Eye from deck. Be, not being able to access that effect as well is really costly, but at least when you're able to put up two bodies here, you can try to dig your way through, eventually get your way to a Charmer if your opponent has a graveyard, and get yourself to that Promethean Princess to bring back the Snake Eye Ash. Definitely the card of the hour. And speaking of cards of the hour, it's great to see Magician souls on the field having sent that dia bell star to the graveyard she is a level seven dark spellcaster with dark magician stats so it does kind of work this is very interesting we see the magician soul send the one copy of triple tactics talents which almost certainly means you have another one because at the very least you just activated to draw two instead of just draw one so here we go ah, there it is I probably just wants to take a look at the opponent's hand here. I'm a big, you know, user of the forceful sentry style effect, you know, revealing the hand and putting something back. Whatever cards I'm going to draw, I'll probably see them later, but it's always nice to get a peek on what your opponent's hand is and maybe stop those starters. But it looks like we're going to draw instead. Yeah, that's the, when you have to use the draw to, that feels like the desperation move, right? I feel like when you activate Triple Tactic Talents, especially in a format like this, it's very predominantly going to be taking your opponent's monster, removing a threat, as well as giving yourself a resource or just looking at your opponent's hand to make sure you know how to map out the rest of your plays. But 
But when you have to draw to, that means you don't know what you have going on for you. And I think that's exactly why Magician Souls was activated prior to the Trip Tactics Talents, because Juan didn't know what his resources were, and he didn't have exactly what he needed yet. So he's still digging. But hopefully those two cards got him to where he needs to go. We're going to find out as he links away that Link Rebo and that Snake Eye Ash, maybe into just an SP Little Knight to have along the way to either push back with a Flame Barge or hopefully not to pass on. Oh, there is that Little Knight, a fabulous quarter century rare. Certainly gorgeous there, but I think you're right. The SP Little Knight definitely is a more defensive style play. Obviously, Link Karibu is good and has many ways to help you dodge your opponent's effects by sending those level one monsters to the graveyard before something resolves. But this turn isn't seeming as explosive as we know this deck can be. An SP Little Knight, a set card, and that's pass. Didn't even opt to use its effect going after the effect veiler in the opponent's graveyard, which you wouldn't really think is that relevant, but it is a spellcaster, and because the charmers are so popular, Selene does seem some play, and getting a spellcaster out of your opponent's graveyard could prove useful. Certainly could. Obviously, if you were able to bring that back, it can really get things moving, but Cameron just pensively staring at his hand, figuring out what we're going to play first, and oh. it looks like... I just missed it. He actually banished his own Snake Eye Ash to block the Hida going after from his opponent's side. I think that's a pretty heads-up play as well. It really is. Obviously, Hida the Fire Charmer is great because you can borrow those fire monsters, and it seems like swapping monsters across the board might be the way that these mirror matches go. It looks like that Forbidden Chalice is going to stop Snake Eye Ash, so we're not really going to resolve that card effect yet. But, I mean, just looking at Cameron's hand here, he sees it pretty much face up on the field. That's plenty of ways to keep going. He has the Diabell Star to just put that Poplar in rotation, but more so, like, he's probably just going to activate the Sanctuary first, just try to get uh, a card on the field that he can give up for free, while also placing Fire King Island on the field. Fire King Island could destroy that... Uh, uh, Fire King Pop, or sorry, <laughs> Snake Eye Poplar in the hand. And because Grunix is already in the hand, you're able to just kind of start the entire Fire King engine because you do not have to go and grab that Grunix yourself in that moment. So you can add something along the lines of Fire King Arvada, use Grunix effect because a fire monster was destroyed, summon it, destroy Kirin, which is able to special summon from graveyard or hand, and put the Arvada on the field, which will then be able to protect yourself from any further... Uh, plays that Juan has, especially that Little Knight that's staring him down. Well, we saw earlier in the tournament how important Arvada on the field can be. It will even force your opponent to enter the battle phase just to attack over it, just to keep yourself from getting locked out of those precious card effects. But right now we are seeing Sanctuary go ahead and bring out Fire King Island, and Cameron is thinking about his next play from there. Yeah, Juan has to choose if he wants to go after Snake Ash. Maybe in the situation that is the only fire monster that Cam has, will Juan take that gamble? Yeah, he's going to use the Little Knight, going to go after that Snake Eye Ash. Just worried that it might be the only thing he has. Obviously, don't want him to be able to search through that deck with the Fire King Island effect. But if he's got other cards, oh, let's see. Yeah, giving up the Poplar there, also quarter century. Definitely, this would be the tournament. If you wanted to show up with some valuable cards and show off, this is the one. Yeah, being able to grab that Arvada here, just like I predicted. The Garunix is going to be able to trigger in the hand, going to be able to destroy the Kirin, not going to be able to destroy anything with the Kirin, but it will be able to summon that Arvada from hand. And then you're free to basically go with your plays with the Diabell Star from that point. So we're going to see Poplar go back to the Spell and Trap Zone. Kind of nice to see that mechanic again, since we Crystal Beasts are really, I think, like the first cards that were showing up in the Spell and Trap Zone, but so many different decks do it now. Yeah, I don't think you can quite call it crystallizing when you use the effect of a Snake Eyes, but I guess that's the closest thing we have. Yeah, yeah, it kind of reminds me of Centurion, too. So just lots of different decks taking advantage of the fact that there's lots of zones on the field. So you are now protected from something along the lines of Effect Veiler, which could be very powerful here. You know there's not... Uh, well, at least it's very unlikely for there to be an infinite impermanence because it would have been set along with the Forbidden Chalice at this point. Yeah, I definitely feel like if you're going to use infinite impermanence, you could save it in the hand maybe to surprise your opponent, but then you wouldn't get that powerful effect if it was set. So I feel like it probably would have been set on the Chalice. Look at the face down card, though. We're going to go ahead and flip over our original Sinful Spoils and go ahead and grab something from the deck. I imagine because you've already gone through your entire factory engine, this is just going to be a Snake Eye Oak at this point. Took a little look at the Poplar, but you're absolutely right. Here comes Snake Eye Oak. Mm -hmm. Going to be able to uh, go after the Poplar in Graveyard, I imagine, because you have not used its effect yet, given maybe you don't have any targets. Yeah, just going to go ahead and grab that Snake Eye Ash that was uh, banished off the Little Knight instead. Likely means that Poplar would not have a target to go after because the original Sinful Spoils has already been used. Now, we've seen how strong this field can be from the Fire King version of the Snake Eye deck, but also how fragile it can be if you lose your Fire King Island. Again, if it's removed from the field, you're going to have all those cards destroyed. They like being destroyed, but you also like having a lot of monsters, too. Uh-oh. And there is the Nibiru's, uh, but the Arvada is still online here. So unless there is an additional uh, effect failure or something, yeah, now Oak is just going to be able to send another monster. And let's see, there is 18 on the field. 
This uh, 24, or sorry, it's 27 plus 12 from the Kirin. Believe so, but we're not out of this duel yet, but... Oh, I might be exactly out of this duel. It seems like yeah, that was enough for Juan. Yeah, and conceded. Yeah, Juan definitely sees that there was enough damage just on the field with the Flame Bridge about to come out from the Snake Eyes Oak. There was already enough damage with the boosted Garunix as well as the Arvada still on the field. That Nibiru was not enough because the Arvada came on the field so early. And he's just going to have to move on in game, game two. Well, technically, that makes it a vote for the Fire King Snake Eye version of the deck, right? We got to see how powerful it was and how important Arvada is for just having that additional summon on the field, being able to have a body that's big enough to hold its own, but that powerful effect to negate. Obviously, Nibiru would have just closed that duel out, but it didn't come up, right? And so now the duelists have to think about what they're going to side, how they're going to do something different. What would you be thinking about if you were in your side deck right this second? Well, I think going first is obviously very strong. So you want to really focus on the parts of your a deck that will not struggle, or at least not susceptible to your opponent's main uh, targets as far as like Effect Veiler, Infinite Permanence, and Nibiru. So usually what we see is people putting in trap cards, powerful trap cards, especially if you're able to resolve powerful draw effects. Given Droll and Lockbird is a card that has been popular going into this format, but it seems like it's less powerful going second compared to how powerful it is going first to back up your field. So I don't think that's something you're necessarily worried about, especially when you're playing pure Snake Eye, right? When you're getting Droll and Lockbird, it cuts off nearly the entire Fire King engine, but it doesn't really cut off anything except for the initial play in the pure Snake Eye deck. So you're, because it's not as much of a concern, you can try to lean into uh, effects to draw because you do have Magician Souls in your deck. You do have that additional want to draw uh, when you activate that and resolve your Deal Bell Star stuff. You can get a few cards in there. And I mean, if you do play the Jet Synchron, you can go through formula. So like when you have that many draws in your strategy, you want to probably draw some powerful trap cards to really make sure that you win immediately because you went first. It's nice to see all those powerful draws, but unfortunately, even with the Magician Souls draw and the Triple Tactics Talent draws that Juan used, he didn't necessarily get into the cards that he needed and those cards that he did half were stopped so hopefully in this duel he gets to get a little bit more of that gameplay come into the field again it's really cool to see all the different combinations of this deck right it's not just a one trick ponix if i will yeah. but it's it's true that you know while it's certainly spell reliant the fire king build unless you're running into something that stops spells like the cyframe zeta that we saw earlier in the tournament or delta excuse me and all the other ones it's just wild that like spell negation is kind of back people are starting to look at the anti-spell fragrances so that might be something that if juan has he can consider adding from his side deck absolutely i mean you, you are right you definitely want to prioritize getting your engine through but having that trap card to back it up really does make things go a lot smoother but resolving a Snake Eye Ash is the key to everything at this point. Whether it be the, like, the entire way through or just getting it to resolve at some point in your turn, you just want to be able to put the Flame Bridge on the field and then just get your play across. And now we're moving on into game two. Let's see if Juan even chooses to start. I imagine he does. He did start game one and again, as it turns out, sometimes it's just more favor to go second because you even have a, just a small stop. Your opponent has access to all the Charmers able to play through your graveyard and they have a battle phase but now you have to play into every single post side card. Now, if you take a look at Cameron's hand, just because we can see from the overhead camera, uh, lots of points of interaction. I think I saw a Droll and Lockbird as well as maybe an Effect Veiler and a Poplar, so a pretty decent start. Yeah, there was, uh, I believe, two copies of Droll and Lockbird and Effect Veiler and a way to play, so that seems like good enough for now. But we're leading off with Dia Belser, sending the Flame Bridge here. Not necessarily as costly in the pure Snake Eye strategy because you more than often play two. But True. This that, oh. yeah, Juan stopped cold from another Effect Veiler this time. Oh, that Effect Veiler is putting in work. If that's the same Effect Veiler, you should be thanking it, Cameron. It's definitely putting its work in. But, oh, there's the Anti-Spell Fragrance. With zero spells in hand. But at least this Poplar uh, was the only play a starter here, so not going to be able to do enough at this point. He's going to be able to set the Sinful Spoils, but that's not going to really do anything to get him started. But Juan might still not have a play here. Uh, okay, this is what I was worried about. Uh, Cameron opted to go after the Poplar here because it is his only way to start playing. But the cost of this is this puts a Poplar potentially in his grave if he, uh, Juan has a way to remove it once it's uh, able to put itself back in the Spell Trap Zone. If it is sent to the grave at any point, Juan can go after it with Hida and just start playing his own deck as well. But he will be stopped by his own anti-spell, so... You know, I wonder how much his anti-spell will hurt Juan before it helps him. Well, he does have quick play spell cards like Forbidden Chalice, so maybe that's what his thinking pattern is, is that he's just going to like wait and use his spells later. But it is true that this is really going to slow Cameron down, and that's what makes anti-spell fragrance really powerful again. You know, when we have these formats that are mostly monster effects, yeah, you can include the anti-spell fragrance in your side deck, but you may not see a lot of use out of it, and you may eventually rotate it out. But this is a spell-centric format, and it's going to continue to be in the future just because of how powerful those Fire King spells really are.
Now, we do see the copy of Infinite Impermanence in Cameron's hand here, and I, on, I wonder, yeah, so this is what I kind of expected from Cameron. It's a bit of a bold move, right? If you assume that Infinite Impermanence set, it probably will be in the same column as the, the uh, Anti-Spell Fragrance, but... I'm no magician, but I think he might have set it in the center column. More worried about the face-down card. It is true, though, that if he did set it in front of the anti-spell fragrance, he could just negate a monster's effect on his own turn and start playing spells, but it depends. He might be more concerned about that face-down. And look, we're going to see another Die Buster. I wonder if he has to kind of get rid of his own anti-spell if he wants to play, right? And this is a play that you can easily predict uh, in the situation that Juan is in. Cameron could see that he's not going to be able to play without getting rid of his own anti-spell, so he doesn't have to really worry about it. So he could have put the Infinite Impermanence just blocking that other spell and trap that Juan has. Yep, and that's exactly what happened. So he is going for the face down there, saying no to Dia Bellstar, and also Master Duel fans can probably imagine the bubbles on the screen crossing the field. I mean, if it stopped him one turn, it probably stops him again. He only had one draw to get out of it. But now he has access to Draco Sack. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Two rank seven or two level sevens combined. But I don't think we're opening up the overlay network. Looks like we're just going to go into the battle phase, attacking. Yep, you're going to go ahead and make sure to use the Hector Poplar there, not taking any risks of a fire monster coming down. It is true that Heat of the Fire Channeler has never been better. All these different Link monsters. We saw that before, you know, when Dark was around. It was a great way to get out Destiny, Hero, Destroyer, Phoenix, Enforcer. But now with everybody playing various strong fire decks, eh, there's a new Fire Charmer in town. I mean, it goes to show that both Hita and Dark are very, very popular. I think it's a near staple in all of these uh, fire extra decks because Diabell Star is Dark, mm -hmm. and that's just uh, the same thing, essentially. Well, it'll be wild to see with all the Artemises, Selenes, and Effect Fillers running around if people start using Lena as well. Eventually, the whole extra deck is just Charmers and Selene. Working as intended, but looks like Cameron's going to go ahead and get into things. Looks like another Joel and Lockbird appearing. Oh, it looks like he drew a Fire King Avatar Kirin, actually, which is fairly useful with the Arvada. He's able to just at least have a live target for the Kirin if it ever comes up. Oh, uh, he's doing the traditional hand shuffling, keeping those cards randomized so his opponent doesn't know which is the card he just drew. It's always a really great thing to do and obviously keeps the game fair and fun. But we're going to go ahead and flip that over and send the Snake Eye Poplar to the grave to maybe search something or not. Let's see what this face down card is. It looks like it's a crossout designator going to banish his own copy of Original Sinful Spoils here. Uh, very costly if you don't play a second copy, because the only way to really put it back is going to be wanted, which you currently do not have access to. However, with strong monsters on the field, locking your opponent out of doing anything when you've seen them have several flustered turns back to back, it might be the only way for him to just basically battle phase again, get rid of that Arvada, and then start his own turn. Not really a whole lot y you can do in this position. I wonder if he ever just activates the Kirin to destroy the... Uh, like, just to clear one of the Diabell stars, right? And it puts the Arvada back on the field, but the Arvada still won't be able to do anything without the Kirin in hand, so he probably just has to preserve it as is and just pass turn again. I gotta say, it is nice to see Crossout Designator again. It's a, certainly a powerful card and doesn't always see play in formats, but right now, with so many powerful cards that activate from the hand that you can Crossout Designate and the possibility of playing against another popular deck, it's probably a good idea, but play passes right back over to Juan and he draws for his turn. Yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of, uh, more popularity for Crossout Designator because of how much engine it hits, and I think that's usually when Crossout becomes more playable. When you're just going after those points of interaction from hand, it doesn't seem like it's doing that much, because it, there's not always that much consistency in what everyone's playing. I mean, you can tell Infinite Impermanence is going to be popular, Ash Blossom is going to be popular, Nibiru is going to be popular, but sometimes people play a uh, wide skew of those points, because you know there's a lot more available. But when you're able to go after cards that have to be played because they're part of the engine, like Snake Eye Ash, or the, the original Sinful Spoils like this, or just even Bonfire, it can do so much more. Oh no, it looks like we do have another battle phase. Get rid of Arvada pass turn, just setting a single card and letting it go back over. I do see a Bonfire, so it's time to go back. Oh no, that's not Bonfire, okay. We got the Wanted here. There it is, yeah. Wanted's very solid here, because at least it puts up the Die Bellstar. You already have the card face up on the field, and oh. because you have the original Sinful Spoils in the graveyard, you're able to put it back, making it live again. Might be one of the best draws you could have at the moment. It's definitely Cameron's way into the duel. Obviously, it's great to have all those points of interaction in the hand, but if your opponent isn't really triggering them, right, by doing those plays that meet those conditions, you don't really go, oh my <laughs> goodness, it's another cross out designator. Hold the phone. Yeah, and cross out designator does negate the entire effect of Wanted for the turn, so he's not going to be able to use its effect in the graveyard either. I mean, I suppose he could attempt to, uh, to try to put back the original Sinful Spoils and get that additional draw. A pretty strong interaction here, but I think Juan would have much rather just drawn a playable card. 
just to like get his place started. But eventually, Cam at five. I, I didn't even look over there. Five hundred life points. Those Diabell stars are big. Two Dark Magician-sized monsters can't be wrong, but you're absolutely right. The cross-out designator, while it is keeping Cameron out of the duel, it's true that this duel may already have been over if Juan was able to just draw another powerful card to get in. It's kind of a pattern we've seen, right? In round one, there was also just a lot of ways to say no to your opponent, but no way to get into the game, and that's what we're seeing out of Juan, both in duel one and duel two of this game. It looks like Cam is opting to use the effect of one. Am I missing what cross-out designator does? Does it actually not... Uh, stop the second effect as well? It should. Let's take a look at Yu-Gi-Oh! Neuron here so we can make sure that we have the correct text. Even the judges taking a look at the card just to make sure that we know what it does. Again, just card, or excuse me, declare one card name, banish one of the declared card from your main deck, and if you do, negate its effects as well as the activated effects and effects on the field of cards with the same name. So you can absolutely banish that from the graveyard. See, okay, so I have to try to read that again to try to perfectly understand it. Because, yeah, it's declare one card name, banish one of the declared cards, and if you do negate its effects, as well as the activated effects and effects on the field of cards with the same name. Which applies to cards that were already on the field, but I believe it still would negate all of the, those cards' effects. It should, but it does look like our... You can see those red stripes. Head judge just making sure, again, these are some of the hardest working judges in the entire program, people who have worked at the World Championship and, well, even back to your locals and there again. So we're just making sure that this gets clarified so that everybody knows exactly how this works. Yeah, okay, that's, that's how I assumed it worked. The second phrasing on it, just to clarify that it would also stop effects that are still already face up on the field. It, but basically, if you cross, like, just make this easy for everyone else. If you activate cross-lock designator on a card, that card's effects for the turn are invalid. So the short version is no. <laughs> yeah, that is enough. There is no way for Cam to block out 500 points of damage here. So we have our great Yu-Gi-Oh! judge staff here. Just to make sure we do understand how the cards work, sometimes you've got your brain wrapped around it one way and it turns out to be something different. It's okay, but it does mean that Cameron's going to have to pack up the cards for this duel. And we're going to go into the next one. Yeah, honestly, when I said going first is going to be favored post side here for Juan, this is not what I meant. I didn't think it was just going to be summoning two monsters and attacking for 25 several turns in a row. But I guess that's what happens when all you're trying to do this format, like, I guess you can tackle it two ways, right? You either try to make sure your opponent does not get started at all, or you're trying to deal with it after the fact. It seems uh, from what we can tell from this match, it's been way more popular to go after everything and make sure there's no play made, trying to really focus down on those effect failures, infinite impermanences, and we see that from both sides here. Nothing really being able to stick, but Dia Bellstar at least putting itself on the field, 2,500 attack, that was enough to get there this time. 2,500 attack will do it, right? We've got to see all those great anime episodes earlier in the morning and well dark magician stats can't be wrong but now this is going to be interesting it's down to the wire they've got to make those decisions cameron now has that information about anti-spell fragrance being in Juan's side deck or maybe his main deck we're not really sure we just didn't see it in the first duel i would assume the side deck i would hope the side deck that would be a, a little chaotic to have hey, that in your depends. main deck i mean i'm not an ultimate duelist maybe juan knows something that we don't but now they've really got to think it out and juan has to make this difficult decision of I haven't really gotten my deck online. I won that first, or excuse me, I won that second duel. I've been able to beat him, but I haven't really been able to get all my combos off the ground. Do I need to change something? Do I need to insert a little bit more engine or maybe water something down? <laughs> Funny joke to make with a fire deck, of course, but still, we've got to figure out how Juan is going to get into this game. Yeah, I think as far as Cam goes, he's going to be doing the exact same thing that Juan did uh, game two. So if Juan has that read, how would you tackle playing into the field while also trying to deal with something along the lines of anti-spell? Do you ignore the anti-spell and hope it doesn't happen, or do you try to hedge your bets a little bit? Well, you know, there's another great card we could talk about that's like that. It's kind of the Nibiru equation, right? Do I think that Nibiru is in the hand or do I not? And some duelists just want to charge head first, summon five monsters and find out what happens then or they want to be very conservative. The good news is, as long as you sequence your plays right in the Biru, you can go ahead and put out that Arvada, but unless they're running something that gets rid of that trap card, you can't really do the same thing. So you just kind of have to go in 
and hope maybe you have a Cosmic Cyclone to back you up. And if not, that's going to be it for that turn. Yeah, I, I believe Cosmic Cyclone is a strong card because especially against the Fire King deck, you are able to go after the Fire King Island, potentially just wiping the field, which will most likely have half of it come back. But usually in some of the stronger hands, you're able to lead off with an, uh, an Appaloosa, sometimes made with an IP Mascarena, although a little bit rare. And it would still be destroyed by the effect of Island because it's your card, not your opponent's. So that's like an easy way around that. But, and then if you happen to run into the anti-spell, you're still able to cover it with that Cosmic Cyclone. So, you know, probably one of the cards Juan is looking for. And we mentioned Nibiru as well. Fire King able to play around it a lot easier because you have Arvada to actually cold stop it. How do you think the Snake Eye deck really tackles it down? It feels like, see, for the most part, they just try to leave a Flame Bridge on field and not link it away. So that at least, or even if they do, they want to have Temple on the field with a Flame Bridge in the back so that you can at least push up. Because I think the bare minimum that you want to get, at least through a Nibiru, is a Flame Bridge with an IP setup, right? Now, it would be nice to see the Temple, though, kind of scrolling back in the chat there. When you think about it, that would push the attack values high enough to get rid of that Arvada, which really just seems to be the problem with Juan. But there's a lot of different ways into this duel that we just have to hope that we see him. But here's the thing, you know, it, it really also just depends on luck of the draw, right? And I don't mean that this game is without skill, but there are combinations of cards you can draw that just aren't the right ones. So as we go into game three or round two of the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist series, we're gonna have to see which side the heart of the cards is going for. Is it Cameron or is it Juan? We've seen both players uh, be stopped very quickly from a single point of interaction along the lines of Infinite Impermanence or Effect Failure. Sure. But I don't think it's going to be as simple looking at this hand from Cameron. We have the leading off Snake Ash, but there's also a one for one in his hand to extend further. But it looks like Juan didn't even have anything to stop the Ash this time, so already back against the wall. Definitely. I mean, unless he has some sort of Nibiru, the primal being in his hand, you probably would have done some stuff here. And it looks like we're going straight to the special summon there. So there may not even be a Droll and Lockbird in his hand either. Juan's hand just face down the field, not picking it up, just kind of watching these plays happen. I mean, we do know Juan does play a lot of the spell cards and try to maybe focus down on interacting with the field even after the fact. But it oh, oh, looks like he has the strong hand going for the Divine Temple himself in the Fire King strategy. This has been very popular lately. Well, it's a great card. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of synergy and crossover between these two decks. And historically, Yu-Gi-Oh! has always been about that. I mean, I can remember ages when Gravekeepers and Monarchs were put together and we were like, oh... That is genius. And in the same way, having the Fire Kings and Sinful Spoils work together, I mean, it is working as intended. We're going to now use the Snake Eye Ash, getting rid of the Oak to go ahead and summon the Flame Bridge here. Divine Temple just adding additional uh, uses for the Snake Eye cards, being able to not necessarily give away cards that actually cost you anything, but also generating the Oak in the graveyard, which is going to be an additional body once this Flame Bridge happens to leave the field, which looks like right now. Flame Bridge is just such a powerful monster. I remember when it first came out, maybe people were like not sure about it, but it's obviously become a staple effectively in all of these different decks. Interestingly, going for the Sunlight Wolf already, Flame Bridge Effect is going to be able to summon out two of those level one fires from the graveyard opting to go for that Oak as well as Snake Eye Ash. Oak is going to be able to trigger Try here. Okay. Yep, Poplar is going to go back on the field. Okay, here. This Push might be an easy time to uh, nip because the Flame Bridge is already used, <laughs> but you still have to deal with a likely original Sinful Spoils from the hand because just because you search the Divine Temple doesn't mean you don't already have the other spell. No, you're absolutely right. Looks like here it comes. There we go. Smashing down onto the field. Nibiru, the primal being, is going to go ahead and remove all these monsters from the field, distributing them off. And where are we going to put that token? So Poplar has not been used yet, so right. Poplar would be yeah, able to put itself, uh, or any rather like fire monster from the graveyard, back onto the field. Oh, it looks like it did on the flame bridge. Ah, I see. And the Divine Temple is going to be able to push it up because the Nibiru was used. This is what I mentioned earlier, uh, the Snake Eye strategy to play around Nibiru. And now he's free to just start activating. Oh, to, oh, you're going to go directly after the oh, hand. Oh, OK. So now we get to see, looks like, original Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. We've also got Triple Tactics Talent, which is yep. going to go back to the deck. Yep, he has plenty of room to be able to play, to be able to stop the engine. Just wants to take off those additional factors here. Talent is going to be one of the easiest ones to be able to crack the board. Just going to go ahead and remove that factor. We also did see a Flamberge in the hand there, but I don't know if it's going to be able to push too hard, considering what's on the field. Cameron considering. Uh, oh, sure. There's the Diabelser. That's how you're going to get access to your spell here. 
So really the turn's just begun for Cameron, right? While Nibiru set the progress back, there's certainly a lot of different things you can do from here on out. I think at this point you are going to be able to resolve the entirety of the rest of your combo. Well, Juan's got a great poker face, right? We didn't think he had anything in his hand, but it did seem like the Nibiru came right at the right time. So maybe there is something else. I don't think Droll and Lockbird is likely. We probably would have seen that a little earlier, but here comes our original Simple Spoil yep. sending Dia Bellstar. I mean, we know Juan doesn't have anything left. He got his hand taken away. True, true. There's the Ponix. Ponix is going to be able to add the Sanctuary. Go ahead and add the Island, assuming none of those are already in the hand. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's the Sanctuary. Going to be able to place that Fire King Island on the field. Cam, thinking through what else he has to do. Because usually you have an idea of what the combo looks like at this point. But now, because he knows the exact cards in Juan's hand, he can make a field that perfectly counters every single one of those cards. And I think that's what he's looking for right now. Definitely a great position to be in when you know what your opponent has. You can basically figure out a strategy that counters every single thing. And so really the only surprise is going to be whatever card Juan draws. And given, you know, how limited his hand is right now and doesn't have any follow-up from the triple tactic cell, unless he just draws it back, mm, there's not really going to be a great jump start into this duel since Cameron has the ability to just basically make whatever premium package. It's a custom field. I think Tactics and Poly is the card that Juan needs to draw. Maybe Cosmic Cyclone because the Fire King Island is most likely going to remain on the field. Between, I, I, it has to be one of those power spells, right? It doesn't, I don't think Engine gets you there anymore. I think you need to draw those cards that are in addition to your typical strategy and really focus on cracking Cameron's oh, board. Sense. Sure. Now, gonna go ahead and stick about a Flamberge here to grab ourselves a Fire King from the deck. Flamberge already used, so not gonna be able to trigger again. I wonder, oh, since sun, the Sunlight Wolf is also used, I wonder if he's going to go for Kirin or Arvada here. It looks like Arvada would feel pretty good because then you're not worried about any monster effects that your opponent's dropping down. Just wondering, because he doesn't actually have to worry about them this turn, is it how okay. useful okay. is the Arvada sure. on the following That's turn? Really he's probably going to be able to end on Appaloosa knowing that the Triple Tactics Talents is not there. He's going to focus on getting the Kirin. He can summon back the a Sunlight Wolf from the graveyard with the effect of Promethean Princess in a zone that would uh, be able to be pointed to later, like just right under the extra monster zone, I imagine, and be able to add back that Kirin, just getting him uh, uh, just more additional removal Go looking into P Juan's hand. Well, speaking of looking at the hands, take a look at the extra deck. Looks like the Princess. monster of the hour is here. It's the Promethean Princess Bestower of Flame. Such a powerful card. Uh, opting to not go for that. Going to just get put the Flamers back on the field. Going to be able to put the IP in the back row. Obviously, Flamberge has been very powerful, whether you're using the variant that runs Formula Synchron or IP Mascarena, being able to bring out one of those smaller monsters that has a quick effect to perform either a Link Summon or Synchro Summon during your opponent's turn gives you just additional ways to interact with whatever they throw out. It looks like we're going to be able to uh, link away the Promethean Princess here. Still locked into fires until this Link Summon is conducted, so likely going into that Amblo Whale. Amblo Whale has been just such a powerful card. It was good before, but it's great now considering the fire interactions back and forth. And the fact that now you also have the Promethean Princess in the graveyard active, right? Being able to destroy a fire monster and then a monster or card on your opponent's side of the field. Yep. So powerful and, and really showing why it's it earned that spot on the play mats that have recently been printed. Yeah. Stand by. He could have opted to make the World Sea Dragons Atlantis with the uh, Amblo Whale just to make sure he doesn't randomly lose to a top deck Super Polymerization. But it doesn't look like Juan has any of that to lead off with. He's going to go into the main phase, normal summon Snake Eye Ash. That is going to resolve. We'll see how far he's able to get before we're going to start activating all those effects in the graveyard. No, if you're cheering for pure Snake Eye in this duel at least, this is your last chance. So Juan, make them proud wherever they are. Poplar is going to be able to activate its effect right now, just attempting to summon itself from the graveyard. Potentially going to be using the flame bridge here to just put the IP Masquerade on the field. Yep, looks like that's what Cam's going to do. Sure. Definitely the time here, that way right before your opponent gets anything set up, you can have IP Masquerade. Go ahead and perform that Link 7 on the turn and figure out what it is you're going to do against them. But Poplar's hitting Juan's field and going ahead and activating its effect. So this might be the moment that Cameron wants to use the effect of Promethean Princess going after a fire monster on his side of the field as well as a monster on Juan's side of the field. 
and he would be able to now chain the IP Masquerina to make sure uh, to make a non-fire monster before that Promethean Princess resolves. So I think that might be what Cameron's looking for right now, but he doesn't necessarily have to because Princess, once it's going to be able to hit the field, you could just go and summon the Garunix. The Garunix set itself up. And if you had access to Arvada elsewhere, uh, you're able to get rid of the princess that way. Or if you just have another Karen in hand, yeah, that's another way to just easily get rid of the princess and use the IP Masquerina later. I'm going to do a quick little shuffle and cut here and see what comes up next. Now, obviously, it's, it's good to have added that card to your hand, but it just doesn't quite feel strong enough with the threat of IP Masquerina, right? There's a lot of different monsters you could jump into, and you still do have the Promethean Princess kind of lurking mm -hmm. in the graveyard. Yeah, we're looking for as many extenders yeah, as possible fine. here because you want to take advantage of those charmers to just use your opponent's graveyard to climb up into your own princess, being able to just go from a link one, like just two bodies into a link two, into a link three very quickly, while also generating Everyone value because your opponent is likely using all the same cards you are. Well, it looks like we're going to use SP Little Knight's effect to go ahead and banish the poplar. And now we're going to have him searching out some little fire monsters, level ones each, from Flamberger's effect in the graveyard. It looks like we're going to go after the Oak as well as the Ash, not only getting them out of his graveyard, but being able to use their effects to generate even more value here. Generate ash is going to be able to search. I'd imagine Oak, uh, Oak has the option to special summon or add back to hand. He might be choosing to add Ponix no, back Ponyx. to his hand here. Yeah, that's fine. He is. Yep, putting it back in his hand rather than special summoning it. This is an extra layer of protection because if your field gets wiped, the Ponix will be able to trigger in hand to special summon itself. So just keeping yourself alive as much as possible, which is what you want to do in this position. You just want to see another turn. The only way you lose this game is if you lose right now. So Ash and the Juan Ponyx, is right. checking yep. the graveyard. Might be looking for all the different types of things in there, right? Certainly a lot of Link monsters that love jumping out of the graveyard is a little jump scare. Cameron's showing it off as well for the fans, <laughs> but looks like we're going back to the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye. Mm -hmm. Was that, that had to be the card that was drawn because I don't think Cam knew about that card yet. Which uh, gives Cameron perfect information now. Uh, use SP. Cameron activating the effect of SP a little bit. Of course, since a card effect is activated, you're going to pick two cards. And it looks like we're going to say goodbye to Ash and SP Little Knight until the end of the turn. Unless... No, okay. Juan might have activated a card from the hand there, but decided not to do anything further. Yep. Moving the Ash is very important here because it would have been an immediate threat being able to send either the card that was put in the back with the Divine Temple or the Divine Temple itself and immediately summon something along the lines of Flame Bridge or any other Snake Eye monster from the deck. Just going to be able to remove that option or at least push it back a little bit further so Juan has to commit even more resources before he's able to get that far. Well, he's going to get something. So really, you know, it's not to put the pressure on Juan or anything, but it's just true that you're staring down so many cards and so much setup, and you know your opponent has what you have. So this is all about grit and determination. Obviously, he's an ultimate duelist for a reason, but and it looks like the deck may be stacked against him, so we'll have to make his choices carefully. Going to just be another copy of Snake Eye Ash here. I think he wants to leave the Snake Eye Oak in the deck, and you don't really want to get rid of the Flame Bridge at this point. Those are the monsters you want to summon from the deck. This makes a lot of sense. It's going to just be likely used for free fodder. There is that Sinful Spoils that was added off the Poplar earlier this turn. He's going to be able to send either the Ash or the, uh, the, Ash or the Temple. I'm probably going to go after the Ash. Keep in mind, Divine Temple is very similar to Flame Bridge, where it can go from both sides. So if at any point there is a car, uh, monster pushed back on Cameron's side, the Divine Temple could trigger when Cameron summons a monster to summon that monster to one side of the field. So he actually wants to keep it on the field, just in case that does come up. Again, this is going to be a fun format with all these borrowing cards. Do hear time on the round, but remember that's only for the main tournament. The featured match has its own separate clock. Sometimes that clock's going to be updated too because there may be a time extension or communication from the judges or the team. So don't worry if time gets added. We're just making sure it's straight. Mm, thinking, okay. I'll target. Vanish Snake Eye Ash. Going after the Ash that was banished off of the SP Little Knight here. This makes it a little bit harder for Cameron to remove it's both because both of these monsters are able to use the temple to try to summon another monster from the deck. Mm. So Cameron's goal is to try to remove both of them as quickly as he can, but I don't know if he will be able to that easily. Well, there was a special summon monster, so technically the Promethean Princess could jump into action here. Yeah, I guess Princess and Kieran would remove these monsters very quickly, but Juan put himself in a position for that to happen, so hopefully he has some kind of answer for it. It is true that he may have set up Cameron specifically for this, so whatever other cards he may have in his hand, that's when he jumps in the duel. 
I do believe the last card in his hand is that Dia Bell Star, right? That we knew from the tactics. Which I believe Cam should know that too. So this puts him in a position where he should be mostly Ash fine. Because now that the Sinful Spoils is used as well, there's not really much a lone Dia Bellstar can do. So we are going to see the Promethean Princess, though. Yeah, that's fine. Hesitant to put it in the graveyard. Hard to believe it, oh, but it is Grunix. true. Promethean Princess is back in action. And that's going to be able to trigger the Grunix. A fire monster was, in fact, destroyed. Sure. Grunix is going to summon himself out in defense mode, Grunix. just in case. Yep. Hey, you never know. Every life point counts, especially since Cameron lost quite a few. But this is a fresh set of duels, so we're taking a look at Promethean Princess. I mean, it's just a, such an excellent monster. I want a Promethean Princess for everything, right? Give me one for wind, water. I, I personally do not think Light and Dirk deserve one. <laughs> but they are some of historically the most powerful archetypes, yep. but this is definitely fire time. Yeah, I think, like, you know, fire felt underappreciated in previous years, and we can no longer say that. Yes, anybody who thinks that that is not one of the strongest attributes. There's a plenty of great attributes. Right, we got to see Zelantis, but right now it's a fire field. Uh, yep, and that is a concession from Juan there. Cameron's going to be able to take it. That's used up every single... Oh, it's, it was Flame Burge, not the Divestor. Even less useful. Ooh, that is not going to help. A very decisive victory for Cameron this time, after very conflicting game ones and twos. No, absolutely. I mean, the first two matches, obviously, the duelists are evenly matched, right? So they definitely were scrapping it out, just trying to put on the field what they could. But now we're signing that sacred match slip. Cameron Neal is going to be victorious in this duel. You know, a tough loss to take, even after like winning round one for both these players. But again, this is round two of six rounds, right? Six rounds, exactly. And there is a possibility that we go into our top four cut without an undefeated duelist because of those extra rounds. So honestly, Juan could still make it. There's no reason to be discouraged. And honestly, a duelist who got this far has tough enough skin to keep going. Absolutely. All of the players here in this tournament are here for a reason. They have already at least one championship under their belt, literally. <laughs> literally, it is their belt. So for those of you at home, a 16-person tournament normally would only consist of four rounds, so two additional rounds being played, which just eliminates variance, you know? You get to play more rounds, which means the more wins you can stack up, the more likely you get to move on, you get to show off your deck building choices, and they really, deck building matters so much more the more rounds you get to play. So this is one of those tournaments that's really built in with that in mind. So losing one round is not the end of the world, and both these players are still in regardless. No, it's going to be an exciting show no matter what, considering that we still have four more rounds of great Yu-Gi-Oh! action. And, and that's the thing. Every one of these matches, this is not one of those formats where you put all your cards on the field and you say, go ahead, opponent. I'm just going to say no to all of it. This is a really interactive and engaging format where all of these cards, even if you're playing the same variants of the decks, it's so, like, back and forth. We've seen different things that you would never expect. Monsters that are supposed to be clearing the field with their effects instead just going toe-to-toe -to -toe in the battle phase. So it's really cool to see this stuff. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of things that you can't really predict because there's a lot of things you're trying to play around from different facets, right? If you choose to play around the infinite impermanence or the effect failure, you might lean into the triple tactics talents or the super polymerization. You have to kind of think of what it is that you are okay with losing to and what you can afford to play around. Sometimes you can't play around anything and you just have to go for it. And those choices are going to matter a lot because it's a lot of just gambling and a little bit of guesswork and just using the knowledge that you have based on what your opponent has presented to you and just going with your gut from that point on. No, you're absolutely right. There's no luck of the draw here. That's the thing when you have, you know, so many similar cards. Think about Cross Out Designator. You're using that to go ahead and stop those options because you know the deck so well, but your opponent knows the deck so well, and your opponent worked just as hard as you in order to figure out their strategy. So those nuanced deck building choices, right, those little changes where maybe I'm main decking the Cosmic Cyclone, maybe I'm not going to main deck it, that's really what's deciding the tournament. This tournament may have been decided, not necessarily from the dueling, of course that's important, but from which cards they decided to write down on their deck list so many weeks ago. Oh, I, that is something I believe is so true every single tournament. I think m the majority of the work happens way before round one, and that deck list is so important. Those choices that go into how you're going to play the rest of your tournament, how your cards are going to interact with your opponent's cards. And we saw even in this round alone, Forbidden Chalice, that was not a card that likely your opponent is going to have for a for, uh, cross-out designator, right? Oh, yeah. Forbidden Chalice, I guess maybe that's why he chose to run because if you're running cross out designator, then maybe somebody else is running cross out designator. So you've got to run weird cards, but you also have to run the same cards as them. So there's a lot of this guesswork. I mean, we have layers and layers and layers on this tournament. So that's why I was so excited again for this masterclass on how to play this new format and how to see all these exciting cards from Phantom Nightmare slap down the table.
Yeah, I mean, between just the list that we've seen so far, I want to see what comes out on top, whether it's going to be the strategy of just having them commit to their field and using powerful spells like Super Polymerization and Tactics, or if it's just going to be Effect Veilers and Impermanence. But we're going to have to see it from the players themselves. Let's hear it from the interview. Yeah, let's go back to the desk. Or well, actually, not the desk, to the stage with Steve Kankos. Oh, looks like there was a pause for the audio. Give him just a second. It's the lovely uh, JRB Jobber going to go ahead and interview. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Can you hear me? Right on. <laughs> All right. Cam, the man, how did you feel to win your match? Uh, I feel pretty good. It was challenging. Uh, why'd you choose the deck to use today? Uh, I think Pure Snake Eyes is better, but I felt like for this tournament, Fire King was a better choice. What was something that stood out to you in your match? Um, there wasn't really much to say about games one and two. Game three, I put him on top decking, so I just had to hope he didn't top deck what he needed. Right on. Well, congratulations. Best of luck in the rest of the tournament. Thank you. Again, pulling back over to us at the desk. It's, uh, like, like I said, Cameron, very soft-spoken duels, but the cards really just speak for it. Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely right. You know, once you put your opponent on its back leg, you just kind of pressure and pressure until you can get it done. Yeah, surprising to hear him say that. Yeah, I, he actually thought his opponent's deck was better, but he thinks his choice is better specifically for this weekend, which I guess comes up a lot, right? When you have such a small group of people, it's 16 people, and you can kind of... De like dictate what they're going to play because it's a highly competitive tournament. It's not going to be like the 3v3 in Vegas next week where it's going to be a much wider field. You could expect everyone to be on the most competitive strategy available. So maybe he thought the Fire Kings were better for that purpose alone. I wonder why he thinks the Snake Eyes is going to be better in like something next week. Well, he may not have something that we don't, so we'll have to find out at YCS Las Vegas. But it is true that, you know, when the stakes are so high, it's not like there's other decks out there that aren't good, but you just, you can't risk it. You got to bring home that ring for your town, for your team, that has been supporting you, whoever it is in your life that loves you as a duelist. But yeah, it is going to be interesting when we go back and we see like it's it's going to be so cool in Vegas because the stakes are still high, mm -hmm. but they're not as high because you got your great teammates. So I think we're going to go ahead and have a quick break here. And then we're going to have, again, four more rounds in Yu-Gi-Oh! So do not go anywhere. This is the spot to be. We'll see you soon. Happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game! My favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! memory over the years... Uh, gosh, it's gonna be hard to choose. Recording Duel Links was a lot of fun, but I would have to say the KC Grand Tournament, where I met a bunch of other voice actors and content creators in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community, that was a memory I will cherish for a long time. I learned a lot, I met a lot of people, made friends, it was great. Most iconic. I'm gonna have to back up for this. Hold on. I'm feeling the flow. If I have positively impacted duelists around the world, I mean, that's amazing. If that's truly the case, I couldn't be happier. Uh, it means a lot to me to even be here. So if I can make someone happy while being here, all the better. Yu-Gi-Oh has influenced my life in many ways so much so that it influenced my life before it even influenced my career. Uh, when I was a kid, I dressed up as Yugi for Halloween. If that doesn't tell you how it influenced my career down the line, I don't know what does. Uh, it's seriously a dream come true for me to be involved in this and to just be a part of this community. If I could be in any other Yu-Gi-Oh! series... I feel like everyone's gonna say the original series, but I'm gonna say GX. Yeah. I'm gonna say GX because I like Jaden and I like how positive he is. I like his spunk and I like 
his heroes. The, the elemental heroes are cool. But yeah, that would be it. The original series wouldn't be bad either, though. Not gonna lie. Uh, I've been training and testing with my friends, and my girlfriend's been helping me out a lot with testing. So, uh, I spoke to my job about that, and uh, they, like I mentioned earlier, they support me. Um, I got the times, I got time off to actually play and put in more time, and then my wife also, like I mentioned, supports me as well, so I put in a lot of time while still, you know, doing the things that I have to do. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it, my friends. Uh, they're basically also like a family to me, you know, because that's what Yu-Gi-Oh is really all about. Uh, you know, meeting friends, seeing people, you know, and uh, they help me prepare as well. And yeah, that's basically how I prepared. Well, to be honest, like for the last month I've been playing, but uh, yeah, I feel prepared for these UDS. So YCS Las Vegas is the following weekend after this UDS event, so I was already preparing for that one. So it's kind of just like doing two tasks at the same time now and I hope uh, my strategy will work out for both events. I've played with some friends online through, um, through video camera and, and other card games, stuff like that, just to prepare. Me preparé para este evento con muchas horas de práctica con mis amigos. La verdad, ellos han sido de demasiada ayuda y pues ojalá les pueda recompensar ganando este evento. Estuve practicando con unos amigos, me estuvieron ayudando, analizando el metajuego, cómo es lo que yo pienso que van a jugar las demás personas y pues enfocándome en eso y haciendo La baraja, a ver si tomo una buena decisión. <risa> Practicando prácticamente todos los días con mis amigos, el último mes fue practicar, practicar, practicar y practicar. It was a huge honor being invited, of course, and uh, I've just been playing a lot with my friends, talking, uh, theorizing, and uh, just going over uh, replays and uh, just trying to improve. Well, I prepare a lot for this event. Uh, I've been testing since December, and we are now in February, so. Uh, since a new metagame, new format, so it's gonna be really nice. Uh, I practice every single day. Um, it just feels like a second job for the amount of effort and work I've put into this event. Para mí prepararme este evento fue muy difícil, ya que acaba de salir la nueva expansión Phantom Nightmare y solo lleva dos semanas. La verdad que fue difícil decidir qué cartas usar, pero espero que la decisión sea la correcta para dar un mejor desempeño este torneo. To prepare for the undisputed UDS championship, I decided to go to the Chicago Regionals last weekend. It was a large tournament on 500 players, and it was the first weekend with a new set Phantom Nightmare released, so I figured it'd be the best possible opportunity to get practice for this tournament. Uh, to be honest, uh, in the recent time I'm not playing like that much Yu-Gi-Oh, so it was really hard to get into the game again, try to understand like everything learning the game, like, there's a bunch of new cards. So yeah, but my friends helped me a lot. So it was more like more just get used to the game again. All right, so this is kind of crazy. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't able to prepare all that much because I was uh, in Arizona like two weeks ago racing motorcycles. And then last week I was in New York City filming music videos for my band and then um, you know, so like my friends, they, they kind of caught me up in the last like week, couple days, Monday, Tuesday. Um, and that's where I'm at with it. Uh, got to shout out Mason Blake and uh, my friend Table and uh, Andrew Amaro. I prepared just by playing. It's the only way you really can prepare for anything. Hello and welcome back everyone. We're at the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series Championship here this weekend. We're celebrating a quarter century of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game and we're doing it in a big way. Three days anime episodes in between three awesome tournaments. We already had Duel Links and Master Duel yesterday and they were incredible, lived up to the hype. But today, this is the tournament I've been looking forward to for years now, years. This was something that was scheduled to happen before we had COVID and the pandemic had to duel remotely. But now we're back in person and we're here at the Konami Esports Arena at the top floor of the Konami office building that I love to come to every day and work on this amazing, not just an amazing card game, arguably I'd say the best trading card game on the planet. For sure, for sure. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. Last match, pretty exciting. I thought, I thought I've seen everything, but definitely the games can evolve very differently. These are all like the strongest of strong players. Oh, and yeah. like, 
things can simplify to a point where it just becomes a, a little bit of a slugfest almost. Yeah, you at home should be a little jealous because like while I have my off round last round, I'm not just you know sitting back not doing anything. I'm walking around, I'm looking, I'm like these are some of the best players ever, as you mentioned. So I'm checking all these matchups, and I promise you, there's so much cool stuff out there. We're hoping to get as much as we can onto the feature match stage. We're gonna have a lot of mirror matches or things that look like mirror matches because fire. This is the time for fire. There's been so many years of the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game where the fire was kind of a slept on attribute. Not too many powerful cards to really access. Volcanic Rocket was mm -hmm. like notoriously the best one forever. Royal Firestorm Guard, maybe. Okay. Uh, but now we're up to like Snake Eye Ash, Bonfire, finally be able to add something better than Burning Algae from your deck to your hand. <laughs> and now they're one of the best decks of this format after Phantom Nightmare. There are other contenders. It's not the only deck being played here this weekend. So we're going to have to see a lot of variety, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I hope to see some of the other matchups. We bring back some of the old favorites for sure. They're, they might get a chance to see that. We don't know, but uh, <laughs> we'll find out for sure. Definitely, and we're going to have keep having exciting matches. We're going to feature some undefeated players. We're not going to meet them just quite yet. We're going to wait until they're ready for an interview. But before that, we can talk about some of the exciting stuff that's already happened. I mean, looking back at round number one, I think that really exemplified like what this format means. Like You can know how to play really well. You can know what your cards do, but the timing of your activations, knowing some special ways to get around your opponent cards, they, all the cards have huge interactions. Just a legendary Kieran in defense mode, right? Yeah. The Fire King High Avatar Kieran. It's just sitting there with the Grunix in the graveyard. That represents so much disruption if you were able to just, just like attack it and destroy it by battle. Mm -hmm. It would be just able to destroy, pop a card on the field, bring back the Grunix, summon back another monster. It's just incredible all the different layers you have to think about when you're navigating your uh, plays. But then we get to see awesome plays from Jesse Cotton. But I think we're ready to see our next feature match. So I'm going to toss it to Kangas. Introduce our players for round three. Thank you very much, Billy. Introducing first on the red side, his claim to fame is winning three events in three weeks. Paulo PRRJ. That's right, it's Paulo. It's the myth, the man, the legend. You've seen him before. He is a mainstay on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series. And uh, his favorite card, Enemy Controller from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Yep, left, right, A, B, right. enter the code. Enemy <laughs> Controller, fantastic card across all of our all our games, our digital games mm -hmm. and the physical ones. I think it's one of the scariest cards in the game. It's, it's such a long-lasting card, too. You know, it was out of favor for some time, and then came back. Oh, taking control of the cards are good. Oh, maybe use it to dodge cards <laughs> like Infinite Impermanence. We got Apollo. And he also was also uh, in yesterday's features as well. Indeed he was. All right, Kangas, who is he going to be playing against? And his opposition on the blue side, he's called the musician, Tyler Pfeiffer. All right, here we have Tyler. He's from NorCal, I believe. We don't see him at too many events. He says he can't really go to too many due to his life, but he is an undisputed champion. That is for sure. Well, not undisputed. He's an ultimate duelist here. He wants to become undisputed. His favorite case card is Sky Striker Ace Ray. So, although you can't go to a lot of events, but you could be your local boss. Like, oh, the player that no one really want to play against, especially at locals, because, oh, oh that guy's just going to be the tough match to beat. <laughs> and it seems like maybe even here right now, I believe he is 2-0 and oh going in. So not a lot of history behind him, but who knows how he's going to fare here. And that's right. Yeah, I said he was from NorCal. He's actually from Reno, Nevada. I knew he was from somewhere up there. It's kind yeah. of NorCal. It's okay. like it counts. It's close enough. It's north of where we are right now yep. in beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, California. Now the duelists are shuffling up. We are going to have, it's not a mirror match. It's going to be kind of, I think, the same matchup we saw in our future match last round where it's going to be a Snake Eye deck versus the Fire King Snake Eye deck. Now, Tomax, tell me about the differences. Why would someone play Snake Eye as opposed to including those Fire King cards in their deck? Well, if you want to go for more of a Synchro-esque play, then you might want to go for the more Snake Eye-esque cards. You get to play more into the field spot because not every single Fire King build would play the fields for it, uh, field spot, for instance, for the Snake Eye Divine Temple. Uh, but I think the Fire King line just offers so much. Everything, you get more layers of destruction. Mm. It's just a simple destruction. It's so scary when you destroy the wrong card, and then you just set off this like chain explosion <laughs> of effects. And uh, that's why I prefer the Fire Kings personally, but the Snake has, still has a lot to offer. Maybe mm. you want to shut people out from being able to start their plays at all with Definitely. the negation. Yeah, I think it's that opening gambit. The first board you can make on your field is what the deck can do. Maybe relying on those monster negates or just spell and trap negates, you can say Omni so they can negate monster 
monster spell or trap. You have Borlode, Savage Dragon, and Baron de Fleur being accessible via Formula Synchron, so you need to draw from that as well. You also can still make IP Masquerade on top of that. There's a lot of different variety you can do with the Snake Eye deck, and maybe a lot of people out there feel it's a little more consistent than including the Fire King cards. You know, I'd kind of argue against yeah. that a little bit. I'm, I'm on the same boat as you because I love the uh, Fire King High Avatar Kieran. Just such a versatile card. The, how much pressure that card alone puts out as long as you have Fire Kings in the graveyard? Oh, wow. It's like you just can't get through that battle phase. <laughs> yeah, Garunix is a lot of follow-up. It can stand for a lot. Not only does it summon itself, it destroys a card from the deck that's going to summon another monster, which could be our Vata, which is a monster effect in the game. And when you destroy that Kieran, you're going to get another destruction effect. But it looks like our duelists are shuffled up in there, drawing their opening hands. We're moments away from this die roll. Both of these players are sitting at a 2-0 record, which is a phenomenal start. You can take some losses. We're going to see which one of these players is going to get their first loss here in round three. It's game one of the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series Championship. High roll. We may never, ever see a tournament as big as this ever again. <laughs> so we have three and we have an eight from Tyler. Tyler's choosing to go first. I mean, that's a significant advantage right there. <laughs> yeah, you feel like when you're in the die roll, step one is complete. <laughs> <laughs> At least you get to play some cards with an open board, and that's uh, that you can't underestimate sometimes how important that is. But some people would choose to go second, build a going second deck, and then we throw you off your tempo. Definitely. But it looks like Tyler is going to open up with that turn one. Amazing starter. It's Snake Eye Ash. And Paulo is forced to use Effect Valor on this. It opens it up to Triple Tactics Talent. It's a very dangerous card to use because it is a monster effect after all. And we have Kieran. Oh, there's the follow-up. You can now destroy it. Now, Effect Village will not negate the Snake Eye Ash, and we get to summon up the Kieran, and the Ash will resolve normally. And you throw open to the triple deck. Yes, and this is why I like including the maximum copies of Kieran as I can include in my deck to dodge these effect negations, because even if they're not playing Effect Village, you know Infinite Impermanence is probably in there somewhere. So the Ash is going to resolve since it's no longer on the field to add Snake Eye's Poplar. Poplar is going to add a Snake Eye spell or trap from the deck to the hand. Likely now, that's, yep. I was going to say, there's a lot of cool plays you can actually do with this. If you play the Xyz Garunix in your extra deck, there's like a way you can do a full combo to where you make the Xyz Garunix. Uh, well, you first you have to spell some of the Garunix with the Kieran effect, not mm -hmm. by his own effect. Mm -hmm. You make the Xyz Garunix, you detach the Garunix to destroy your Fire King Island, you protect your Island of Sanctuary so it destroys your Garunix, and then your Garunix is going to summon back our Vata, and since the Fire was monster destroyed, you summon back the Garunix Ooh. again. <laughs> it's kind of a cool play, we probably won't see it here, but let's go ahead and jump into back into the game. Triple Tactics Talent coming down, as you mentioned. Yeah. There's a downside to using cards like Effect Veiler. That's it, and it revealed the Nibiru in hand and also the Field Spell. Now, this is really interesting. If I had um, Effect Negation and a Nibiru, there is some argument to holding that till just the very end, because usually they put up one way to stop mm -hmm. Nibiru, and then you can have Veiler and Nibiru after they've invested all their cards into the play. But it's very dangerous in this match, because if an Arvada comes out onto the field, then one of them is not going to work, and if they make you mistime it, where they just play around putting a Flamberge on, and even if there's a Nibiru, oh, I'll still get all my cards back, now you're like, oh, I'm in a weird spot again. Yeah, definitely something to consider for sure. And now, after the talents is resolved, I didn't see what he put back exactly because we were so deep in our discussion yeah. on whether you hold it or use it. That's definitely one of the questions people are going to be exploring as this format grows and evolves. But now it looks like Tyler is looking to his extra deck. He's going to link away that Poplar for Link Karibo. So now the Poplar will be able to go to that spell and trap card zone. So don't you think that Link Karibo is the enabler of all of these plays? Link ones are good, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> all Link ones. Like, even, I guess, uh, what is the main phase two one? Uh, Clara and Roshka? Uh, uh, Clara and Roshka, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one's even pretty good itself. If only it could be used in main phase one, the ABCs would have a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the World Championship this past year. Uh, but now we see the original Sinful Spoils being used to send that Poplar from the Spell and Trap Card Zone to the Graveyard. Now the Fire King engine is coming online with Ponox be being Special Summoned from the deck. Everything just lines up so nicely in this particular matchup. This, oh. this is the play. This is the play I was talking about. So here, if you were doing the play, you would link away Link Karibo and Ponix into SP Little Knight because that gives you a little hedge bet around the B-roll. Well, he knows the hands now, so he doesn't have to worry about that as well. But you can go to SP Little Knight. Then you would destroy the Kieran to add the Garunix. The Kieran effect would summon the Garunix from your mm -hmm. hand. This would be the play. I wonder if he's doing it. That would be awesome. But... I wonder if he has it in his extra deck. That'd be kind of yeah. interesting as well. Some people chose to play it. Some people have cut it. Because the extra deck space is so tight in the Fire King Snake Eye deck, you have to pick and choose which cards you're going to want to have access to for your uh, available options. I think the options of building a Fire King Snake Eye deck, there's just so many additional cards that you can choose to play. And... Uh, 
The thing is, it feels like you're sharing your deck with your opponent, especially in this mirror match when you have the charmers. He's oh. doing it! This is what I'm talking yeah, about! Here we go. If he here does go. the play I just described, I would be blown away because I haven't seen anyone really focusing on this play at all. So with the SP Little Knight dropped onto the field, we are seeing... He's doing it. This is this. If he summons, if he summons the Grunich to Kieran's effect, this is it's it. He's doing the play that I was describing. That's wild. Oh nope, he's gonna add Kieran. Maybe he already has. He has to have Grunich already. That, yeah, that has to be it. That has to be it. Otherwise, this play will go won't go anywhere far. But it's really nice when you have the gear, the Kieran, in your hand for that follow up. Oh, I think there it is. I think there it is. Yeah, there it is. The Grunich activates in hand. Is he acting the Grunich or is he acting the Kieran? I think. He's oh, not he's doing, doing both. It. He's doing both. Dang, he's not doing. He's the not doing play. your play. Not your play. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't play the Xyz monster, but instead the Ponix is going to come down. The Grunix effect's going to activate and destroy Arvata to bring back Kieran. See, it, it's, it's a very interesting choice here. Uh, the Arvata likely is going to be summoned up at some point during this turn or the next. And people need to play these monster negates. They mm -hmm. have to play it now. That's why a lot of people would maybe choose to go into uh, Appaloosa. But the negate is really mad. But like the, the thing is, the fire attribute, it's quite dangerous. It uh, just is. in case some people are playing super poly, where mm -hmm. if you leave too many fires, oh, your whole board's gone. Yeah, I've even seen people so scared of super poly that they'll link away their Amblo L for a Zelantis just to get that fire monster out the field. So you have like Zelantis Arvata. Yeah. You're giving up a little bit in the recursion you get from that Amblo L, but you're playing around a card that can absolutely devastate your strategy. Mm hmm. But now we are going to see Snake Eye Ash brought back from the princess. We talked about this in round yep. one. If it gets negated at the beginning, you can always link it away and bring it back to get that second effect to get your Snake Eye engine back online. Now, does Tyler have anything in the graveyard that he wants to push to the back? That's the other question. <laughs> I don't think he went to the IP Mask Arena just yet. No, he has SP Little Knight, which isn't too bad to bring up with Snake Eye Slain Bird's Dragon. Yeah, one fun fact about Flamber Dragon is you can also summon your opponent's monster that's in the spell and trap onto your side. It's pretty so cool. So when you push it over, you can also take it as well. Uh, there, now, he is going to go from the Promethean Princess, linking down into the uh, Salamangra Sunlight Wolf. This yeah. is also a wonderful play. There's many different ways you can, you can go up the ladder, you can go down the <laughs> ladder. You just need to know what you're doing. Definitely. And those two monsters coming back, the Sunlight Wolf's going to be able to add back a monster. He's going to go for Flamber Dragon, probably. Since he already has a Kieran in hand, it's kind of dangerous, but if you're able to destroy the Flame Bridge in your hand to summon Kieran, then you get to summon two more level ones. Really good if you have something like IP Mascarena that you mm -hmm. want to get a lot of materials for to make a giant Appaloosa during your opponent's turn. But at the same time, if you do that, the bigger your Appaloosa is, the more dangerous Triple Tactics talent yeah. can become. I mean, you can shut down your entire hand because your opponent just got your Appaloosa. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there's a lot of different ways that this can play out. We can go into, like, a, if we want to Link Karibo, a fire and a dark. Heat, heat soul. soul. It is Heat, heat Soul. <laughs> heat Soul is going to provide you with an additional card. I think we're probably likely going to end on Amblo as well mm -hmm. along the way. I'm. He could that's just, my guess. That's or, my guess. Or he could leave the Kieran on the field and just go into, like, IP, have IP Heat Soul, gets the two draws. Then he can destroy the Kieran with his Kieran, get the Kieran pop mm -hmm. immediately. Like, there's just so many different ways you can go about it. You have to find the one that you find the most effective. But he's going to pay 1,000 life points here with Heat Soul to draw another card. And with so many of those non-engine cards, those defensive cards that you can use from your hand, Heat Soul is really, really impactful this format. And then when you get into games two and three, you're just digging for cards like Anti-Spell Fragrance. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> But that's how the opening play can differ from game to game. You just, it's just there's no generic opening that you can always do. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, he has to reposition the graveyard back to the top. Yeah, that's kind of, if you play like just without a mat all the time, sometimes you can get a little mismatch. But definitely want to have him set up the right way, especially when the zones are outlined so clearly on exactly. our remote dual game mat. Oh, so many options here. He's not fire locked. He's got four monsters. Taking two monsters, a link three. He's leaving. I mean, he's definitely going to link this Kieran off. So it is going to be the Amblo L, as you described. So now he's maybe you still can't have that extra draw from Heat Soul on the opponent's turn. The Amblo L can bring that Heat Soul back yeah, exactly. onto the field. Just Kieran it off. And yep. now we also have the IP. Now we can, this is uh, this is very interesting. Now you have both the IP and the Heat Soul option. And with that Flame Burge in hand, we talked about it just a second ago, you can destroy the Flame Burge in hand to summon the Kieran. Then you start worrying about having not enough monster zones to summon yeah. all these fire monsters during your opponent's turn. There's just too many monsters. I can't summon them all. <laughs> Bad problem. <laughs> a good problem to have. Exactly. Yeah. Now, one dangerous thing about activating so many effects is that in a, a skilled matchup like this between two really skilled players, if you accidentally overuse one of your effects, 
it will come back and bite you. Oh, yeah, definitely could. You, even though you have a decent setup, the setup you're looking for turn one, you definitely want to keep in mind, like, all those board breaking cards like Triple Tactics Thrust, Talents, Change of Heart, Snatch Shield can be impactful. But let's see, is it going to be... So this is great. So I do... I like playing this in Fire King Snake Eye as well because it is so good going first or second. So now if any point does Tyler special summon a monster to the field or normal summon somehow during his bonus turn, he can special summon one of those monsters from his spell and trap card zone to the field. This also sets it up like the previous game that a previous round that we saw cam uh, managed to put uh, the flambridge dragon in the back and the nibiru being summoned because your opponent summoned a monster that flambridge gets pushed back to the front so good so yeah he's gonna put the oak in the back row so now the oak can be useful if he sends it to the graveyard later on he can summon it back with flambridge dragon use the effect to get another fire monster onto the field and then we're gonna see a normal summon a snake eye ash let's see if this prompts a response here from tyler this is uh quite an interesting point I wonder how this is going to play out. See, like, if you don't read your opponent's cards, like, oh, it's just a field spell. Like, oh, the other players don't play it. I, I guess it's not doesn't matter. But it will matter. It you have to read your will. opponent's cards. Especially at a tournament level like this, I think every card has been pushed to the maximum e efficiency so that nothing's wasted. If you miss something, it's going to cost you. And definitely you want to make sure you cover all your bases. So Snake Eye Ash is going to add Snake Eye's Poplar. Poplar is going to be summoned to add a Snake Eye Spell Trap. Another cool thing, if you use the Divine Temple and you open up with uh, Diabell Star plus Poplar, you can use Poplar to get the Field Spell while the Diabell Star can get the original Sinful Spoils. Mm -hmm. But you can't go the other way around. because That's the, right. Which only sets Sinful Spoils while Snake Eye Poplar uh, can add any Snake Eye Spell Trap. All right, now we are considering. Looks like Tyler has nothing on resolution of adding the original Sinful Spoils from the deck to the hand. Special. Special right. summon out. Uh, oh. Snake Eye Birch. Yeah, Birch is a cool one. It has that same Snake Eye effect, but you can do it on your opponent's turn by sending two cards, just on a Snake Eye monster from your deck. But uh, other effect reason why it's so powerful, if you control a fire monster, you can just special summon it from your hand. Who doesn't love a free fire monster? Yeah. <laughs> in today's, in this climate, I love it. <laughs> They're all just combusting out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, man. Birch, poplar, what are, are they trees or something? Yeah, they're all named after trees. They are named after, you know, the, the ash tree. Yep, there yeah. you go. I think this this weekend we're going to be saying Ash is going to negate the Ash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt, I have to say Ash Blossom and Joyce Reed. Yeah. Now. I've got to <laughs> separate the difference between the two Ash cards. But now we're going to see a link with Birch to summon Link Kribo instead of the Poplar. Kind of interesting. He does have the Oak in the Spell and Trap card zone to send, so he doesn't need to put that Poplar in the Spell and Trap card zone quite yet. I mean, but this, this is, is holding back, just saving, just in case maybe there is an Ibiru. If you chain your cards right, after like the fifth summon, you go IP chain link. Uh, you go IP chain link one. You find your way in. Is there a way to actually get the Nibiru onto the field and dodge the uh, the the tributing? Mm, I don't know. Uh, not really. I don't think so. You yeah, think chain link. Yeah, I don't think there is. Yeah, there's, no, they'll still, the Nibiru will just wipe it all out. But now that the princess is on the field with the IP, this is something. I mean, we know he has the Kieran in hand to get the princess off the field. But you got to be careful because once uh, this happens, you're only you know, able to summon fire monsters. That I don't know if there's any effective fire monster when it comes to disrupting your Nightmare opponent. Phoenix. <laughs> Nightmare Phoenix. Nightmare Phoenix. Yeah, you can it. destroy a uh, spell and trap, but uh, you're definitely not going into the Appaloosa. There is no SP, although the SP is already in the graveyard. And we're going to see Amblewell trigger here. We're going to see if Paulo changed the Divine Temple. Well, actually, that would be the other way around, but it looks like Paulo didn't use his Divine Temple. So here we are going to get the monster we saw earlier. This is going to be the Deco Taker Heat Soul, because that's one of the valid monsters you can summon back. And that's going to provide uh, is a Tyler with an additional draw. Yep, and that Amblewell also represents a point of disruption in the graveyard. If a Link 3 or lower monster is destroyed while it's in the graveyard, he can banish it and destroy a card in the field. But it does the Divine Temple is going to summon out that Snake Eye Oak. And now the... Oh, so this is why he used the Birch first, mm -hmm. because he knew that the Princess could come out, and he knew he needed the level 1 in his graveyard to summon back. The Poplar, he could have put in the Spell and Trap card zone. Heads up play from Paulo, and really, it really shows you the minute details that matter the most when you're playing these kind of decks. These micro-interactions will amount to a lot. You get a lot... All your resources back as much as you can now with all the cards out right now Promethean Princess out you know we have a little bit of a fire lock here so Nibir is not going to be an issue until that card kind of gets off of the field 
Yeah, and so he still has Garunix access, right, in his graveyard. Apollo's monsters, Snake Eye monsters, are also all a little bit bigger. Yeah, so Thanks okay. to that field spell, they all gain 1,100 attack. So they go from oh, 1100. Tiny, 1,100. Okay. They go from tiny little monsters to formidable, normal, regular-sized monsters. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, we're going to see the um, effect of Kieran come down. I think it is targeting the Promethean Princess. That is a link three, so that's probably going to lead to another card triggering, like the Amblo Whale. Yeah, he can destroy two cards. So, the, yeah, the, the Amblo Whale can happen. The Garunus can destroy Kieran, so he can destroy another card. So that's two destructions. And he can summon back Arvata if he has it to have a monster negate as well afterwards. So I'm pretty sure we're trying to aim to destroy as much as we can when it comes to stuff that can bring Flambridge out. So, so he's going after Oak and Ash, probably? Yeah, probably Snake those Ash. two. Otherwise, uh, that's going to be a lot of problems. <laughs> and probably even maybe even set up an additional negate if it's possible. Effect. Garunix effect. Okay. Get destroy a card in the deck, a fire monster from the deck. Likely a Kirin to bring back Arvada, unless Arvada is not in the graveyard. Okay. It's a Kirin. There is an Arvada in the graveyard. Most of these players will be setting up Arvada into the graveyard as soon as possible because the, the negation is just so crucial. Because if you can get it out with Kieran, you get the destruction and you get the follow-up negation on top. And that's what you need. You need cards to handle two things because every single card on the field more or less does two things. So if your plays don't do two things, you're going to fall behind. Yeah, I love that Arvada has having a time to shine finally because it kind of it wasn't out with that first wave of Fire King. It's a card they got way later on. I think like Code of the Duelist yep, or something. Yep, yeah, much later. And it didn't really have enough cards to bring it to the forefront. But now with a whole Structure deck behind it and structure deck Fire Kings. It is having its time to shine. I always liked Fire Kings, and then when I saw Arvata, I was like, maybe there's a chance. Took, you know, seven more years, but here we mm -hmm. are. So it does look like he is going after the oak with that first destruction effect. Now he looks like he's considering using IP here to go maybe into SP Little Knight. SP would hurt. SP would hurt. But, you know, here's the thing about SP. If, even if you do banish one of those Snake Eye monsters, mm. just remember the Snake Eye can summon it back from the banish or from the graveyard. <laughs> so it's like you're not really hitting everything. It seems like the deck just has, you know, a finger in every pool. Has great applications in Infernoids, actually, mm -hmm. because you can you use Decatron, send Decatron, banish the Decatron to summon another Infernoid, and then you can summon back that Decatron, use its effect again because it's not once return, yep. and then you can link it away from Promethean Princess and use its effect again when you bring it back as well. Mm-hmm. A uh, Link Karibo has been activated, and that puts the Poplar into the back. It can't go there. That Link Karibo should go somewhere else, I think. Oh, it was in the graveyard. It was in the graveyard. Oh, yeah, he yeah. summoned it turn one earlier. Yeah. That's it right. summoned it earlier. Like you mentioned in the previous <laughs> games, Link Karibo will help you uh, basically dodge different effects and just, uh, just establish itself in the chain link and removing the monster off the field. Indeed it does. Now Tyler sitting on Arvata and IP. I imagine you have to IP here and go after that Snake Eye Ash. SP is really, especially SP. SP it again. has a back end effect as well. Yeah, you, you get to do double removal in this case, and I think that is another very pivotal point. Everything needs to do two things when all of your opponent's cards do two to three things. I think this is why this deck is just so strong. It is. It's incredible. The layers, and but it's able to also play through. Okay. Oh, okay. Never mind. I love this. <laughs> now we're just going to use your opponent's monster as a link material with the under under goddess of the closed world. Yeah, and its other effect is really strong too. Graveyard summon gets shut down and also negates the entire field. It's like actually, it basically acts as three effects here. One, you eat up one of your opponent's monsters. Two, negate the field. Three, the graveyard also gets one negate now. I think I might have to find my underworld goddess and throw it into my extra deck. It seems pretty strong here. And also, like, this deck kind of struggles with those, we, everyone says, you know, towers-type monsters, the monsters that are unaffected by other cards. Because you have to, like, you can't destroy it by card effects, you can't banish it. This is the way you can remove an opponent's monster off the field just by linking it away. It's also quite neat that Underworld Goddess, you have to target it in order to affect it. Luckily, in this deck, you do have a lot of stuff to target. But in case it's not targetable, of course, there's always going to be the uh, Kieran to, uh, to assist <laughs> with that. Indeed. So how will Paul... Okay, there's still some defensive options in Tyler's hand. That's the toughest part, is when you're going second and your opponent has the full board, and then they have more options on top of that. Yep, you, you see the original Sinful Spoils. Tyler shows he has the Ash Blossom in Joyous Spring. Paulo is out of plays, and that is going to be enough for Tyler to take <laughs> game number oh one God, here uh, against Paulo. Just incredible plays there from Tyler. Yeah, everything was perfectly calculated. Indeed. I don't think there was a single misstep in there just to lock out the opponent. I mean, Underworld Goddess, like, 
everything needs to do two things. You can't just end on something like a, uh, like a nightmare unicorn and think, oh, it just sits there and doesn't really <laughs> do anything. But if you have something that just keeps the pressure on as you get rid of the cards, you know that they're going to have to like think around that monster. And just I just love the removal mm. of just like the material cost for the underworld goddess. Yeah. That card just, oh, I need a removal. I don't need to target, I just clear your monster. Yeah, and you mentioned it negates all the effects on the field, but being able to negate an effect that special summons from the graveyard, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Is incredible in the Fire King Snake Eye. There's so many cards that can special summon from the graveyard. I think one additional thing about uh, this particular interaction with IP Mascarina, mm. especially on your opponent's turn, you can use it to clear their monster, right? But if they try to use Triple Tactics Talent, you can still use the IP Mascarina to still make the Underworld Goddess. Oh, wow. Because it still counts for the material that your opponent controls. Oh, that's so <laughs> cool. That is a really neat ruling to keep. Uh, in mind when you're playing. Yeah, the Triple Tech Talent versus IP Mascarina, really popular thing for players to discuss, but the player who summoned it right now, that's who's the one who gets to resolve yeah. the effect. And since the IP can still be used in this case, that makes it even more dangerous. Indeed it does. Now they are side decking. So when you're going to side, is it, I feel like it has to be a little harder to side for the Fire King Snake Eye deck, because it has so many different options. I mean, you're still going to be looking to put in stuff like Anti-Spell Fragrance, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's any other cards that the Snake Eye, the Pure Snake Eye deck is going to put in going first in this matchup. I think it's really hard. Do you just want to secure your own board down? Are you going to put in cards like Cross Out Designator? We saw mm. that in the previous one, where you can just lock out your opponent, maybe play a simplified game state. I'm not sure if that was the right call in some instances, maybe force into a kind of a beat down Diabelle's beat down. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, it's a really hard call. Like cards like Call by the Grave, you know how a lot of people chose not to play because it's not consistent enough. Oh, it's a one mm. card. Oh, but or you're banishing a card that you want to use exactly. yourself. Exactly. It's, it's really hard. It's a very, very hard call. Even the timing on when you banish a card also matters because you have to read the card text carefully it's like oh do i destroy the cards first then i special summon so if i chain onto it you'll still lose my monsters like there's a lot of little intricacies that you need to understand definitely so now they are sided and <laughs> shuffled up we're gonna have to see if paulo will have a bit better of a start now that he gets to go first and get his strategy online. Will Tyler draw those necessary weapons and options going second to combat the field that Paulo's going to try and make? Totally so this is why in my side deck and maybe some other people out there, Dark Ruler No More found a place because I like it against Pure Snake Eye. I don't think there's too much they can do against that card because they put it. I mean, the one thing that's downside is they will survive and go on to the next game. And we are going into the next game. It's game two, round three of six here at the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series championship one player will come out on top out of all of our uds winners that have participated in this tournament Ooh, and i do see a cross out designator i think in paul's mm, hand so it's like okay. you called it a little bit it's a really safe card to open mm -hmm. and it's one of those cards that forces things into a simplified games at least when you shut it down for this turn it's not like called by the grave where you shut it down for two turns and you can't use it yourself mm. you definitely can keep using it during your, your opponent's turn so yeah and the best part in this format is if you even if you draw it in your opening hand your opponent doesn't have anything for you to cross out on mm -hmm. your own turn you can set it and it actually is a pretty solid set as a defensive card as well if you can just hit something like snake eye ash bonfire wanted mm -hmm. there's a lot of different options you can hit to cut your opponent off as well i think i love hitting snake eye ash in a mm -hmm match because it turns the effect off and when it comes back from the graveyard it's also still turned off definitely and now we see the bonfire coming down for Paulo to add snake eye ash snake eye ash is going to add a level one fire and it's probably going to be snake eyes poplar but you never know i know a lot of people play two and maybe sometimes side the second one out but nope it is going to be snake eyes poplar too good too good it is the gift that keeps on giving pays for its own <laughs> cost brings the bill in and pays for itself <laughs> indeed it does and let's see what he decides that he does have options and he's going to choose the divine temple of the snake eye which is a really cool one this may mean he has diabel star in his hand because you definitely want to have access to the original sinful spoils in your mm -hmm. combo as well we're going to put another copy of snake eye ash into the back maybe this is indicating he has snake eye oak in his hand and he's going to use the effect of Snake Eye Ash, and it's going to summon from the deck a Snake Eye Monster. Yep, going to get Snake Eye's Flame Birds Dragon. Now for the rest of the turn, if that leaves the field, he'll be able to spell summon two level one Pyro, so now he has a little bit of Nibiru protection. And we're going to be linking that off. Poplar is going to activate within the next chain. If we are getting into a monster, that is going to be the IP Mascarena. 
All right, so it looks like he's going to go from the more traditional line where you go IP Mascarena. This is susceptible to Nibiru sometimes, but oh, this is kind of cool that since he uses the Poplar to put the Ash in the Snake Eye Ash in particular, not Ash Blossom and Joy Spring in the spell and trap card zone, he's going to be able to still special summon that back up with the Divine Temple, and he still has to, to be able to use with the original Sinful Spoils if he so has it, but he's going to link away the Poplar for. Link Kribo, so that's two Cybers monsters. So it looks like he might be looking at Heat Soul, but nope, he's just going to go into Princess. And the Princess can bring back the Flame Birds. The Flame Birds can put the IP Masquerade into the Spell and Trap card zone. And then he can link away the Snake Eye Ash and the Promethean Princess into the Arshu Blows and, and Blow Well. Okay, we've got the Flame Birds Dragon Summon onto the field through the Promethean Princess. We're likely going to see the IP Masquerade pushed to, to the Spell and Trap zone. What a wonderful effect. It's cool. I like it's a fun interaction. You know, with the Snake Eye Ash, Ash also in the bag, because sometimes you can just summon that as well in case you do lose your copy of IP Masquerina, and then you're going to be able to get additional fall, add more oh, cards. Yeah. Like, just because you're not able to put an IP Masquerina doesn't mean that there's nothing you can put in the bag. <laughs> Definitely. Now, this is going to be where... Oh, no, he's going to link down. Okay, he's going to go into Sunlight Wolf. This means he probably has Birch in his hand. Okay. We're going to... Oh, it's the Dive oh, Bell, yeah, sorry. Bell yeah. we, okay, we, there it we, is. We called that earlier yep. because he didn't go for the original Sinful Spoils. So now he's going to be able to send that Snake Eye Ash to get to another monster. Now he could choose to send the Field Spell here if he wants to have another monster on the field. And then maybe he has something like an Appaloosa line as well. But he could also still go into Heat Soul. The Link Karibo can come back. And then mm -hmm. the Sunlight Wolf is a Cybers monster. I like making Heat Soul every turn. I mean, I don't know about you, Yu-Gi-Oh, drawing yep. cards. I love drawing <laughs> cards. You know, heart of the cards, you know, just... If you have five cards, the heart of the cards could just be, you know, a nice drawing logbird to shut your opponent out. <laughs> Indeed, the more cards you draw, the more heart you have, right? Yeah. So I've got six hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I really believe in the heart of the cards. I'm going to keep on drawing until I win. <laughs> the, the classic oh, Yu-Gi-Oh! way. So he's going to use the original Simple Spells to summon the Oak from the deck. The Sunlight Wolf is going to chain to it to add back a Fire Monster from the graveyard. And then it looks like he's going to chain Link Karibo to take the Oak into the graveyard. The Oak's going to bring back the Ash. The Sunlight Wolf's going to add back the Oak. I was like, why did he chain the Link Kribo there? It's because he wanted to add back the Oak. Oak is a fantastic follow It could just mm. lead to like, the whole board just completely being rebuilt. It's kind of interesting how Tyler has not played a single card here. Is he going for the board-breaking strategy instead? Sometimes you just don't draw those defensive options. Sometimes oh, but here oh. it is. <laughs> Nibiru. And the, the Flame Bridge effect's already been used. That's right. That's very, very crucial. And cross out, out designator. designator. Nice. He's going to call Nibiru the primal being. Banish it from the deck. You called it that it could be like one yep. card you side in going first. I'm psychic on these things, you, you are, know? You are. I'm sitting next to Esperoba. <laughs> Let's see what the cosmos is telling me next. <laughs> Tom Box flew his family in to watch them with binoculars to see the hands. They're feeding him the information to cast, actually, yeah, right, right now. <laughs> but that is a huge point that shut down Tyler's ability to interact at that point. And the end board here is here to stay. Indeed. And now we do see that Heat Soul come down as we knew it was. So he's going to cut before he draws a fresh card. This is huge. Knowing that your opponent has a Nibiru in hand, you know that you're only doing now four cards in hand. So if you can do card for card trade against your opponent, especially when you're fully established, that's where it's very, very crucial. Indeed. Oh, oh no. no! It feels bad when you get cross out and taxes. That's the one two punch. Double Double the oh no! Oh, his oh, hand no. is horrible. That's to... hideous. That's a... <laughs> if I had a hand like this, I'd be like, sure, I don't care what you pick. Are you going to leave me with a pair of Nibirus and a pair of Talents? Oh, devastating here from Tyler. The Cosmic Cyclone is probably not going to be very effective here, but we're going to get rid of because I'm pretty sure that Tyler wants to get rid of the IP Mask Arena because that's actual disruption. You know, if I'm Tyler and I'm looking at this hand, I would still be so thankful that I drew this hand going second instead of first because, I mean, you you're kind of slighted to lose games going second. I mean, it's, you still can win them. There's plenty of ways to win, but it's definitely in the favor of who goes first. But mm -hmm. if you were to draw a hand like this going first and just have to pass with no oh, plays... Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, it's even worse. That's even so worse. So at least now he has the hope of a top deck, but he's going to need a lot. Appaloosa <laughs> coming down. Now, he there's knows, triple tag. There's, there's triple a couple tag. of them. Okay. But that, that just means Apollo has to be very careful of when he chooses to use a monster effect during the next turn. That negate of Appaloosa could end up backfiring. Yeah. But knowing that Tyler does not have a summonable monster that is crucial 
And also, there's no Fire King Island to destroy. <laughs> this, this is, <laughs> okay. I mean, Tyler, not happy about the card he drew. I don't think there's anything you could draw to really get back in this one. I mean, at least a, something to prompt the Flame Burge into the IP or the Appaloosa. But if Paul has something as simple as an infinite permanent set, mm -hmm. this game is locked up. Mm hmm. I mean, that's, that's assuming too Tyler much drew reveal. At Snake Eye Ash. Like the classic cross out designated triple tactics talent, that is a branded Chimera classic. <laughs> no, where you simplify the game. I think it might be your game. classic. That's my classic. <laughs> and you simplify the games to the point that, yeah, you know what? I have three cards. He has three cards. I can answer everything. Sets three cards face down. We know one of them is potentially two triple tactics it talent, so one could tactics. be a new one. <laughs> so so you set like this you set two on one side, one on the other. I, I think the one next to the deck, for sure, Triple Tactics Talent, and you kind of hide the other one between the other two. Or maybe that's the mind game. Maybe they just put the one with the, uh, uh, you just put the <laughs> one that's actually different onto one next to the deck, and like you hope that your opponent overreads the situation. Always gotta be okay. two steps ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but see, Tyler, showing you got to play with it. You got sometimes you got to do it the best with what you have. Definitely not an ideal hand, but Paulo, you know, Paulo's a technical player. I would say he's one of the best technical mm -hmm. players out there. Watching him play with Sky Striker back in the day was amazing. He would end his board five, six cards in hand, five spell and trap cards, and he's really technical here as well. IP Master One has been pushed onto the field. We during are not end phase, probably during, during end phase, so that he, uh, Paulo just drew a card to, uh, to hand. I mean, he could have used the IP Master Range to clear off one of the back, but maybe it would have just been a little too much, maybe mm. play into certain things. Because IP Master Range, of course, you would enable the uh, triple attack and maybe allow uh, the Tyler to draw additional cards, maybe dig the out. <laughs> that would not be good, but here is that Snake Eye Oak that Paulo added back to his hand yeah. off the Sunlight Wolf last turn. That's going to summon, I, I believe, Snake Eye Ash, yep. And Ash is going to add another card, and that is going to be the Pop Larch. Get another card, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, he has enough damage. thought about it. I'm surprised Tyler hasn't conceded out. You can see, I, I just saw his head, like, scan from left to right. I know that scan. That is a, I'm adding up how much damage you have on board right now. <laughs> <laughs> that gesture. Oh, that's the read. I see. You see, because he's leaning forward. The only reason you'd be leaning forward like that is because you're really looking at your opponent's side of the field. He's trying to see all those stat numbers. He's like, all right, that's uh, 800 plus 1100, yeah. so that's 19. <laughs> but did you calculate the field spell <laughs> exactly. on top? You got to okay. make sure. You got a bonus 2200 there for the two small snake eyes. That's a lot of damage. Uh, if you reach 8000, it could just be completely over at this point. Now, when you do that calculation, you're just debating whether or not you should just pick up your cards and maybe go into the next game. Save a little bit of time because these games do have a lot of intricate uh, interactions. Mm. So it could burn a lot of the clock just thinking about which ones, you, which line you want to go and which line your opponent would go into. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, We're already so at 14 and a half minutes. But yeah, okay, there we go. There's the damage. Oh, the so number I, clicked. Yeah, <laughs> I think he did the add-up. He saw that he was a little short, and then he ran the number. He just needs All right, as soon as he summons this much more damage, I'm going to concede, and the witch came down, and there it was. Paulo evening things out, and we're going to a game three. That was an incredible hand from Paulo here in yeah. game number two. I mean, yeah. having the bonfire, the cross out there, the yeah. talent. <laughs> like, you're, that, I don't think you can ask for better three cards in your opening hand. I mean, the, oh, oh, the Die Bell Star. Yeah, Die so that's Star, four yeah. incredible cards. <laughs> that was Paulo just having perfect play into it. Oh, I guess unfortunately, you... Tyler's the, the two pair with the Cosmic Cyclone mm. was just a little bit unfortunate. Yeah, that's I mean that's why with cards like Triple Tactic Talent, even though they're high impact and you want to see those cards as often as you want, sometimes there is an argument to only play one copy of a card like that because not only is it situational and requires your opponent to do something, even though they're more likely to do something in this format uh, by activating a monster effect in your turn, they're also going to keep in mind that Talents is wildly played, so they might not activate that monster effect. But if you only include one copy of Talents, you can't draw two of them, just saying. But you're also going to see that card less often with only one copy in your deck. I think it's especially rough, especially, well, especially uh, when your opponent triple tactics now looks at your hand mm. and players at this skill level will know exactly how to play around you. I think the information of just looking at someone's hand could just completely change where the line's going to end. Oh, yeah, you yeah, have perfect information because you talked about timing being so important. Yeah, now they have perfect timing on you every time. It's just such a hard comeback. As you can see, Paul did not like, oh, shotgun additional cards, put cards onto the field, just to completely avoid getting hit by Tyler's triple attack, just in case. Yep, and we see Paulo siding very quickly here. 
picking out the cards he wants to use or maybe the cards he's taking out of his deck looks like his side deck going back into his box you see both duels very focused a lot of times we see how ycs feature matches with people all smiles i mean both these duels are very happy to be here and having fun but going into game three knowing that you can start off 3-0 in the six round tournament is huge you'll have a huge advantage only needing to win maybe one or two more rounds after that to lock up that top four spot but you definitely don't want to have more than two losses now, when it comes to, like, deck building for an event like this, now, you're only playing against, basically, among 16 different uh, competitors here. Like, do you think they can, they're playing cross-up because they know that most of these matches are going to be, like, a mirror match or mm. a lot of snake eye? Like, it plays into a factor where maybe in a larger tournament, it might not be as successful. Um, yeah, I do think that probably played a factor to to, for, to push them to include something like that. But I still think even in a major tournament, that's something you can kind of count on. Like, this would be the time where cross-up designator is probably at mm -hmm. its best because you are more than likely to play while their other decks mirror matches, but still have those applications because if you're not playing a mirror match, they're for sure throwing in those cards trying to stop you from building that huge board probably as well. So it'll have some crossover applications, but I do think you're correct that since it is a more smaller, more concentrated tournament, you can definitely take more liberties including cards like Cross-Up Designator in your yep. deck. It's one of my favorite cards of all time. I, like, I, ever since it came out, I mean, I love Nobleman to cross out, and then seeing that same artwork is awesome. But let's go ahead and jump right into it. It's game three. Will cross out Designator make an appearance here on Tyler's side of the board? Or is he going to draw into something like Anti-Spell Fragrance to try and shut down? The thing about Anti-Spell Fragrance, not as good against pure Snake Eye. While they do have a lot of spells, just Snake Eye Ash can out Anti-Spell Fragrance. But usually mm -hmm. you have something to protect it from, something like SP Little Knight as well. We're so, going to see how this kicks off. We're starting with Bonfire, as I mentioned in the first round. This is a big tell, because yep. this is especially okay. susceptible to Droll sure. and Longbird. But are, <laughs> are people like going ahead of the games like, oh, Droll and Longbird's not that great? And that's like, been a lot of talk of that. Uh, this is a really interesting yes. format where you can debate on so many cards. Mm. Yep, but he does add Snake Eye Ash, not burning algae, just to keep the joke going. <laughs> 1,000 life Where's points. Where's Nurse Reficule? Yeah. <laughs> so Snake Eye Ash has been summoned onto the field, and that's going to add into the hand Snake Eyes Poplar. Did you yeah, know that it's Snake oh, Eyes oh, I Poplar? Know. Yeah, Snake Eyes Poplar, Snake Eyes Flame Bird Dragon. Dragon, the rest are Snake Eye. Yeah. So, no, so it's multiple Snake Eye monsters. It's never Snake Eyes monsters. Yes. <laughs> Careful with what you write on the, the deck Yeah, it makes me wonder, there's, is there a connection? Is Poplar like a baby Flame Dragon. Oh, maybe. They're, they're the only snake eyes monsters. We'll but. know when this thing gets a lot larger. <laughs> <laughs> there is a reason why Diabell Star right wants now. that snake eyes poplar, and now Ash is going to be used here to send both. Does Paulo have an Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring to stop Snake Eye Ash Effect to summon out Flame Birds Dragon? No, we're going into the deck and we're going to be summoning out uh, Oak. Oak. Okay. Okay. That's uh, a very interesting one. line. This this means I, the last time I saw someone do this against me, they had Ponix in their hand. Okay, okay. Yeah. How I, does that end up? Um, well, I Nibiru'd right here because I didn't want him to use Oak to go into Flame Burge, and mm -hmm. then he summoned Ponix and still made his entire board. Yo. <laughs> <So> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, like, for some reason, this kind of is a key indicator that he might have drawn into the Ponix, so now he can use the Oak. Gets the Oak into rotation to summon back with Flame Burge. Mm -hmm. So, oh, he probably has original Sinful Spoil. So here he used Flame Burge to put a monster in the Spell and Trap card zone, so you can use original Sinful Spoils on that card. I think Tyler wants to enable his Fire King line, but now we're going to Link Summon into Salamanca Sunlight Wolf. Ghost Rare copy. It's beautiful. That's out of Legendary Duel Soul Burning Volcano. It also contains Raging Ooh. Phoenix, but Bell on Flame Bird's Dragon. That's the best card to Ghost Bell. That is a, a very, very big impact. How are we going to follow up here? I mean, I assume he has Sinful Spoils or Punk. I mean, we know he has Or the he already original. has the yeah. Fire King cards, one or the other, but mm. we do have the the OG, the original Sinful Spoil, Snake Eye. That's going to probably allow the summon of a monster into the Salaman Great uh, Arrow. But what would you even add back? I guess you could add back the Oak into the hand that allowed the fall up, similar mm. to how Paulo played it out. But we're going to get the... Ponix. Ponix. Okay, well, it's interesting Ponics. that he went for the Oak. Yeah, this is... Oh, Oak is interesting, but if you have Oak in the graveyard, when you do, uh, say, um, get the Flambridge back onto the field and you somehow put it back off the field, now you can summon out Oak and an Ash, and then you get a Poplar, and you just get everything back onto the field. You get one additional monster. Indeed. Yeah, alternatively, if you play the Snake Eyes or Snake Eye Field spell, um, yeah, this is a, you do a completely different play in this scenario. Mm -hmm. This is that play where I'm talking about where you can do... Uh, Celine and stuff, if he has Diabell Star as well mm -hmm. to go into it. But yeah, having the Oak in rotation is always advantageous. But the Ponix is going to grab Fire King Island. Maybe he has Sanctuary already in the hand. 
I mean, assuming the way he did this play, he for sure had some sort of access to the Fire King engine on top of everything else. Yeah. But there's so many different routes to get to the same kind of end board, and Tyler's showing that off right here, right now. No, I love the side deck of these players. They, mm. They're so different. The, they are. The, the, the tackling of how people want a side deck is oh. like, it's like you look at the main deck, it all looks kind of the same, and then we look at the side deck, it's like, oh, this is a completely different play style. <laughs> definitely is. Yeah, this play definitely feels like it plays a little bit harder into Nibiru than some other uh, options that Tyler has access to. That's cool. yeah, but the Paul ghost spell probably caught him <laughs> off guard a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, Island is good. Yeah, this is interesting. Okay. He's deciding, yeah, destroys a card from the hand. Destroying the Flamber's Dragon. That he just added back? Yeah, I believe it can't be used at this point. Uh, yeah, it definitely can't be used. So. The Runic's Effect, we're going to destroy another card. Yeah, yeah alternatively, uh, he could have destroyed the Ponyx. So, got the Grunix. Some of the Grunix used Arvada yeah. to bring back the Ponyx. And then link the Arvada. Yep, and then link away the Ponyx for the Link Karibo. But I guess this way he gets a different monster, an additional monster on the field. Arvada destroyed. Arvada effect activated summoning Arvada. a legendary Ponyx uh, onto the field. That effect is negated, of course, but it's going to also be destroyed during the end phase. I don't think that particular part matters too much unless you want to add the card back into your hand. It's but actually pretty useful if you summon back Kirin with Arvata. You get an, during the end phase, the Kirin gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. You get to summon back a different monster. You get to summon back Arvata yeah. and destroy a card. That kind of comes up sometimes. More so it came up before Phantom Nightmare was mm -hmm. released. And we have the Promethean Princess, Bestower of Flames, uh, uh, Link Summon onto the field, and that's going to bring back the Arvata. Arvata now has been summoned onto the field. Unfortunate, Paulo didn't have Nibiru. It would have been huge here. paulo has got to think deep. There's a lot of lines to actually break through. So many lines of defense, so many lines of disruption, and when we finish this field. Now he's going to link away the Grunich. You always want to make sure you link away the Grunich. You'd much rather have it in the graveyard than on the field during the opponent's turn. Does it do anything on the field? Not really. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's big. It's big. It's there to stare you down. <laughs> Just like the original Grunich, definitely better off being in the graveyard. This one doesn't have to be destroyed. It waits to see what other monsters destroyed, then it comes out to help. He's waiting for the explosion to happen to just come out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed he does. So not a bad... Start. So, yeah, since he summoned it yeah. off Arvata, he's going to be able to return the Ponex yep. so to the hand. It does get destroyed. We do have Garunix in the graveyard. We have the Promethean Princess also in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to get to this inboard. Tyler, I think, chose kind of a route that ran as fast as he possibly could into Nibiru, mm -hmm. but unfortunately that didn't happen. The but rock now couldn't keep up. The, the, rock, the rock wasn't there, so he still has an established board here as well. So much in the Summoning graveyard. Three. Wonder how this is gonna this is gonna play out here. Draw phase. Fire King Island, a bit difficult. A draw phase. We are going to see wanted. Yep. Draw and lockbird can only be used in every phase, but the draw phase. So sometimes, if you, usually, if your first action is going to be summon Diabell Star, you can want Ghost it. Bell. Remember, wanted can add back from the graveyard, and therefore the Ghost Bell is allowed to negate it here. Definitely wanted in Flamber's Dragon. Big reason why Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion has been rising in popularity recently. Yes, now, no and Promethean Princess, too. Yeah. A lot of options. Yes. Back to my hand. Oh, he was destroyed by... Yeah, mandatory. Yeah, you have, right? you have to get it back. You have to get it back. In the end phase, right? Mm-hmm. That's true. Cool. So well, I'm just that managing your resources there. Hand. No. Okay. Do you need everything? Now, the one thing about Paul is Paul only played one disruption mm. so far, so he has a handful of cards to play. Definitely does. But is this enough? There's the uh, Snake Eye Feels, the Divine Step Temple of the Snake Eye. I'm telling you, Fire King players out there, try it out. Try this card out in your deck. I promise you, it is good. Like, if you just open this and Snake Eye Oak, those two cards together, you pretty much get full combo. Mm -hmm. There is a and way you can to play do it. stuff, too. Yes, it's yeah. actually really cool. Yep. And we're going to put the Oak in the back. There we go. Free play. The time is around. All right. Sounds like time is called for our other players. The feature match started a little later, so these players still have some more time in this game. This is a tight situation. Very, very tight situation here. We have one the one, one of the best things about the Arvada negate is that this does not destroy the card. Mm. I think that's very crucial. You don't set off, you know, a chain explosion of cards. Usually a bad thing, but it's sometimes a good <laughs> thing when you're worried <laughs> yeah. about having like all these other card effects activate. Poplar has been summoned. 
and sent to the graveyard. No as effect. No effect, apparently. He probably has original in the hand already. Oh, that's unfortunate. You know, you're not getting maximum resources, not seeing additional cards. Poplar, activate targeting Poplar, putting Poplar into the spawn trap zone. Yeah, because he definitely would want original here with the wanted in the graveyard, so he has it as well. So mm -hmm. he's going to use it here on the Poplar. No Does Ash. Poplar have anything? Doesn't look like it. Another thing I like to do, so if you use Nibiru, uh, you lose all your fire monsters, so you won't be able to use Promethean Princess afterwards. Mm -hmm. But if you can get Snake Eyes Flame Birds on your field, and you use your Nibiru on your own Flame Birds Dragon, you clear out their board, and you get your fire monsters back, mm -hmm. you still have that Promethean Princess follow-up as well. That's We're right. not going to see that here, but it's something to consider if you're at home wondering how you... some different options you can have with the deck. Oh, Bonfire activating later now. He drew, what, one, two, three, four power spells? Not too, I wouldn't call the field spell a power spell. It's definitely something you want to add from your deck to your hand instead of draw, but Bonfire is going to add a Pyro. He's already summoned Poplar from the hand, I believe, right? So... Uh... No, no, no it hasn't. has not. Okay. No, I think that was the uh, the first summon. Oh, he normal summoned the Poplar. Okay, but you get to do each uh, effect per turn, so Poplar is going to come down. Oh, boy. Apollo with... I mean, uh, this is the timing where I love to play Bonfire. This is like, oh, they're, they're, most of the cards are gone. The things that I would, you know, test out and, you know, do a little Ash Blossom <laughs> test. Oh, that's going through, too. So this is going to go through likely when I add it to my hand. So Tyler decides to negate the Arvata, no, keep him from getting another monster on the field, but doesn't use Amblowell to summon back? I don't know. Maybe are we still in the different chain? No, he does not summon it back. But Amblowell, <laughs> without a Link monster, will not have any further interaction. Mm. So now Want is going to draw a card. Thank you. This is difficult. The draw additional card from the Wanted. That is just so consistent. It's so good. It's so good. You go through so many, so much stuff in your board ends up with like a couple monsters, but those couple of monsters in that huge graveyard represent so much in terms of interaction. It's very misleading. It's a very <laughs> misleading field. Yeah. If you just can somehow empty the board without destroying a single card, then you'll feel a lot safer. But if you're if it involves the battle phase, if it involves destruction, then it you're the just... graveyard, the hand. Yeah. We just it, like, we, I remember when like the Dragon Wars came out, I'm like, okay, the graveyard's in my hand now. This is new. Mm -hmm. But now we've kind of gone to that next level where the graveyard's your hand, it's the disruption during your opponent's turn, and your hand is also a big interaction during your opponent's turn. So like, you never know all the points of dis interruptions mm -hmm. you can actually have, and which is so cool. And one more thing. Your opponent's graveyard is also your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> We're sharing a deck. <laughs> so it looks like... Okay, so this is on... Oh no, he's using Hita to summon back Prince? Oh no, the Hita was summoned and now Tyler's gonna use Princess Effect mm -hmm. in the graveyard, targeting Arvata and Hita. It's gonna destroy both, so both oh, effects right. can activate. Oh, we oh. are seeing the activation of Arvata. Of course, Destruction is going to bring back another monster. Arvata, Arvata, Arvata Destruction. Arvata. And then it's going to activate Garunix, so. And that's going to activate the effect of the temple. Temple's gonna push the oak onto the field because the princess was summoned out. So many triggers, so many lines. I love Divine Temple of the Snake the Eyes. And the yeah, Arvata. Garunix and Arvana effects. Garunix effect. We're gonna summon out two monsters here and probably see a Kirin destroyed. You see, Tyler, summoning, normally some of your monsters are in defense mode, so they can't crash their monsters in and go to the Fire King engine, even though it's, it's a pure fine. snake eye. But now it's time winding down. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to summon your weak we monsters in defense mode. So but I wonder, they're the running phonics? really low on time here. It's very dangerous. Yep. Now he still has Grunix effect and Oak effect. Everyone's just activating effects. What would Oak bring back? Can you burn? Oh. No, it's time in the round. They're both 1-1. One, one. This could be a draw, I think, because he doesn't do any damage in this phase, all right? It could be dangerous. The, it's okay, could, you could you see some surprises. I hope not. Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely don't want to be the one surprised. <laughs> Oh, I thought Maybe one of our judges has a tattoo of a monster yeah. on his leg. That might be a surprise. Okay. You, you legally could summon um, oh, no. the Runix from the Avada and then the Phonix. Um, However, yeah. this so is... So it would just be the... Uh, but, but this would be... I guess they're trying to resolve uh, what's happening on uh, the summon the there. Yeah. Um, so this wouldn't get destroyed. And it would stay like this. Okay. Do we get an extension? Sorry? I think there may be a judge uh, yeah, intervention kind of at the moment. Yeah, we're just listening in. If there's anything I can do. Unfortunately, I have one. Um, one more bayonet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I can burn. We are equal. Let me double check. So just be mm -hmm. safe. Oh, he's checking his uh, extra deck to see if he has an option to deal some effect yeah. damage. That's unfortunate. Oh, yeah. but Tyler also has a Nibiru in hand. I, 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 I knew like, it this whole time that he yeah, had Nibiru. I didn't want to like spoil it because I wanted no. to take him to make an impact. I wanted like Paolo to get to that point where he was about to do some damage and then be like, no, nah, see, I got the Nibiru. But yeah, it's with both draw. players winning one game apiece, it's going to be a draw. They're going to be moving on with a 2 0 and 1 record. Not the worst. Yeah, draw is not a loss, but you only get one point, but it puts them behind all the other people that don't have any draws. But there is an additional two rounds where you can use this draw as a way to catch up on your points as well. Definitely. That's a, that's a different point here. But yeah, both players are winners. Both players are kind of losers here. <laughs> but we're going to probably still have an interview with one of our players after this. But it's still a phenomenal match from both players. Uh, I mean, uh, Tyler's game two plan, I think that ghost spell threw him off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But even if you like kind of lose yourself in your own combo and you're not doing like the same kind of way you normally go about it, you can still kind of find yourself back way to get to that end board that you're looking for where you have like that at least five Amblo well and Arvata. And when we talk about like Super Poly, sometimes you just want to link away that Amblowell for a Zelantis, and yeah. that wasn't the case there. He decided to leave it up. I wonder if he had the Zelantis. No, it wouldn't have made much of a difference. There was no Super Poly from Paulo's side, but still an incredible duel, Tom. I, that's yeah, it is, <laughs> and that's why I mentioned earlier, like, oh, you got to be careful of how when you want to choose to kind of scoop up the cards. You need to buy yourself maybe a little extra time. You have to calculate everything, and in a matchup where there's 14 different things happening, each of those things is going to take up a little bit of time. You got to be very careful. So so when it comes to like, oh, when you know you don't have an option and you want to be able to play it out, you don't want to go into time, mm. maybe you have to pick up your cards a little bit sooner and just take that assessment and just work with it. Yeah, I mean, I play extremely fast. Like, I played in a tournament last weekend and I, there was 20 minutes on the clock at the end of every single one of my rounds. Oh, you're really so, you know, fast. Yeah, I, I, I'm going quick. Like, I'm just really committed. I don't like to take a lot of time. Like, I, I like to think, mm -hmm. but I like to do all my thinking and my preparation. Yes. Like, when I'm drawing hands, when I'm practicing, I don't want to have to waste any time contemplating my moves once the game happens. I mean, sure, you can take some moments to consider your options if you have two close plays that might really determine the outcome of the game but i don't want to, have to think like hmm, when i summon snake i ask where do i go from here like i, I want to have a big game plan mapped out because yep. i never ever want to go to time but unfortunately that is what happened here but you know no burn card in the time that makes it a little bit nicer i mean yeah. a draw is not as fun but it would feel a lot worse if there was something like you know, volcanic scatter shot or oh, the that would, the cure master. Oh no, that would just that would just feel awful because there's just nothing you could do. Half the time when you see that stuff happen, there's just nothing you can really do about it. And like, oh, I played into time. And you know, some people just accept it. Some people they don't accept it so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I am on the side of those cards should not be in your side deck because you should not plan on going to time mm -hmm. ever. But you know, if you're playing at a quick case, but sometimes you know, in the games where they're complicated game states, you're gonna end up running out on the clock. Now, I'm going to like point out, like back in YC's Vancouver, I've seen Jesse Jesse Cotton play mm. in terms of like, oh, he's just sitting there thinking. He looks like he's very worried, but then he plays card for card. Every card, he laid his whole hand face down in the finals match and mm. just played this card, expected all the interactions, flipped the next one, <laughs> one after another. He knew the exact sequence, but he spent a little time thinking about it, but then exactly, did all the preparation, knew the line, and just like, yeah, this is exactly how the, it's going to go as predicted, and he won the entire thing. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I was there for that. I unfortunately missed out on that YCS Vancouver. That was with Unchained, right? Yeah, that was yeah. with Unchained, and I was uh, recording that match at the table, so I got to see it all happen. I was like, what? He looks so stressed. <laughs> but no, he had everything. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can't get that same facial reads on some of the top players that you would normally get from other players. I mean, I'm a big guy looking at the the body expressions like oh are you holding your head in your hand or you keep putting your head on your hand how is it because you're thinking too much is because you're worried about what's going to happen did your demeanor change when something happened in the game these are things you got to keep in mind as you're playing because you don't want to give away mm -hmm. any free information to your opponent as well so against billy i'm just gonna just always uh -huh. look you know, oh, pretty, oh, i won't oh, have my no. head i usually talk out loud you'll know how i'm feeling just something like oh well that was not a good card to draw like, <laughs> that was unfortunate i mean just save some time get into i, I I just I just really don't like going into time I like no, like worst. you said just pre your preparation should prepare you to not get into those situations but this is again a deck with so many interactions like, like you're back in definitely but speaking of how complicated it is we're going to do an interview with both players since it was a draw so I'm going to toss it off to our interviewer and thank you let's talk to one of our tie winner losers <laughs> draw <Roma> contestants, contestants. <laughs> testing one two three testing one two three DZ one, two, we three, hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Now? Oh. 
Hello, we are here with one of the players that drew, Paulo. I am curious, why did you choose to play the regular Snake Eyes variant instead of the Fire King Snake Eyes variant of your deck today? Yeah, so uh, the problem with the Fire King version is that you, you have a lot of brick cards, which are all oh, Fire King cards. Um, it, it gives more power to the deck playing Fire King, but I don't think the power is necessary. I feel like if you play the deck pure correctly, you don't have the the problem of having the bricks and also have more no engine space so i feel like that's the main what did you do with the spots that you cut the fire kings for hand traps or flex spots both uh, like i play a bunch of hand traps as you guys could see and and you know, I, I have like cards like corsault as well that we saw so that those are the the spots were there any plays in the match that really stood out to you that you were proud of <laughs> I don't know if I'm proud of that, but <laughs> I drew a talent of, a, of the co of Hitso, hey, and, <laughs> and that was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I'm proud of that. Yeah. Well, congratulations on moving on 201, and good luck in the rest of the tournament. All right, thanks, Doug. I love that. I was like, I don't know if I'm proud of it, but you know, I'll I got take that it talent. all day. I'll take it all day. Like, yeah, I drew broken, and then my extra draw was also awesome. Yeah, like, <laughs> I got to tell exactly what my bones is gonna do next turn, and uh, I secured the deal. Definitely. <laughs> now I don't know. I think we're saying by we're getting ready for our next interview. We're doing an interview with both players. I think that is what we are waiting on. But it was so cool to hear from Paulo. I mean, you know, he does want the win, does want, uh, mm -hmm. want to be there, but you know. It's funny that he mentioned that he had more cards in his deck to include, and I didn't think about that. Yeah, more non-engine. That is some kind of benefit to playing Snake Eye. That's true. But I think we are ready for our next interview with our other contestant. Take it away, DZ. Okay, we are here with Tyler, the other player that drew in this match. Why did you choose the Fire King variant of the Snake Eye deck as opposed to the more pure version? Um, you know, honestly, I've just been kind of like... I really like the Fire King cards, and my friends and I have been playtesting that version of the deck, and I, I, the pure Snake Eyes never really like stood out to me, I guess. You know. Did you have any interesting tech cards in your deck for this weekend? Um, I wouldn't say they're super interesting. I just went for like max consistency, and that's what we kind of came up with. I think uh, like the Underworld Goddess was like a little bit, yeah, it was like the, the 15th card, and I could have made other plays too. I just was like, oh, this is, might be kind of cool, so yeah. That kind of answered my next question, but were there any other plays in your match that really stood out to you that you were proud of? Yeah, drawing double tactics, double nib was pretty awesome. <laughs> no, no. Um, that uh, the Underworld Goddess play was kind of cool. I think if I had a little more time to prepare for the event, I, I could probably play faster. I'm just like having to think really hard. So it's um, especially under like under pressure and everything, you know. So I feel like uh, I think I I think I could have won that. Um, if I just like had more confidence in like my next play after next play, you know, I was kind of taking it step by step. But yeah, we're uh, having fun anyways, and it's a learning experience. Good luck in the rest of the tournament. Moving on at 201. Thanks, Doug. And just like you said on the episode I watched this morning during our anime marathon, dueling's about fun, guys, not war. Don't destroy each other. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have fun when you're playing the game, and that's what Tyler's here to do. And yeah, he's noted what we've been talking about the preparation yeah. to any turn you're going to is important the clock isn't there to say this is how much time you have it's a countdown to when the game is over you don't want to play to the clock you want to play to your game yeah and uh, he mentioned that he was too cautious with every single play he made and uh, I think that's where the practice kind of comes in when you have the practice uh, you get to play faster you get to be more confident with your plays definitely and, and uh, it came in here and speaking about being confident I am confident that you can join in on the action this week and be a part of this awesome quarter century celebration celebrating 25 years of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game we are donating money and you can donate as well to Doctors Without Borders that's right participants who donate 10 USD or more will receive one entry into the highest tier that their donation makes them eligible for as well as any entry for all subsequent lower tiers 130 lucky winners will be chosen at random and there's some fantastic prizes all the way down from game mats up to a giant Sly for the sky dragon card that i want so badly but i know one lucky person out there will be walking away with that and then we'll be back with more undisputed ultimate duelist series championship very shortly three rounds in the book three more rounds to go today before we cut the top four don't go anywhere we have more dueling action coming shortly hey guys this is yuya and yuto and yuri and yugo on behalf of all of us, I would love to wish a very happy 
25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. Uh, so I have many great memories of Yu-Gi-Oh throughout the years on the almost decade that I've been working on the show. And one thing that sticks out to me, one thing that I will never forget, are the episodes in Arc 5 where Yuya is dueling his counterparts, uh, Yuto, Yuri, Yugo, even Zark in the later seasons. Um, that was, as a voice actor, something I never thought I'd get to do. Uh, dueling myself, my many, the many versions of my characters, and uh, spending hours in the booth yelling at myself, essentially. Uh, but it was so much fun. It was really cool to watch and be a part of seeing that episode come together and, you know, uh, somewhat of a bucket list item for me. So one of the most iconic and most requested lines I have for any of my Yu-Gi-Oh! characters from the fans would have to be... Swing far, Pendulum! Carve the Arc of Victory! Yu-Gi-Oh! has done so much for my life and my career. Um, I would venture to say that some of my breakout roles were on Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, mainly Yuya. This was the first main protagonist role I've had on a series before. And to embody that character and to watch him grow and come to life and watch his arc, arc five, uh, it was really just an incredibly amazing experience, one that I'll never forget. And in addition to that, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! has brought me so many friends and, and people who I consider close as family. Um, so it really is a gift that keeps on giving. So if I could be in any other Yu-Gi-Oh! series, uh, I would have to choose the original. It's just such an iconic show. And what spawned from that original cast, the original series, is we're still seeing it today. So um, that would just be an absolutely amazing experience. I am so grateful now to be a part of the Yu-Gi-Oh! family. And thank you. Thank you to all of the fans who have watched and enjoyed and reached out and met through the years. It's been Truly, an absolutely life-changing and incredible experience. Thank you. I would pick Professor Crowler. He has a PhD in dueling, so he's the most qualified in my opinion, even though his track record's not that great. Uh, I'd probably pick Playmaker because he has Firewall Dragon and that card's really good. Uh, I think it would be Revolver or Varius from Yu-Gi-Oh! Rings. He's the leader of Hanoi Knights, the original user of Rockets and Boros, which is also the deck I won my UDS with it. And I like the deck a lot, I like the archetype a lot, and it will be a very wonderful opportunity if I can team up with the original user from the enemy and then have a good experience with it. Uh, I would pick Seto Kaiba. Uh, the reason being is because um, I liked his character. His character was different in the show. Uh, he had a different attitude and a more competitive aspect. Um, but yeah, that's the character I would choose. I would choose Kaiba because I think he's one of the best duelists of all the anime. I think I would choose Yugi because he's the king of the games, so he would have it easy. I would choose Joey Wheeler because for me he's a person that nunca se rinde, que aunque haya muchas adversidades, siempre continúa y continúa y no importa el resultado, él siempre va a dar lo mejor de él. So, I think with such high stakes, when I'm playing, I try and be super respectful to my opponents, but uh, with such high stakes, I might choose Kaiba because he's kind of the opposite. So, maybe together, him and I could uh, make a, a good tag team. I will definitely pick Yusei Fudo. First, because he's my favorite character in the whole series, and also because, I mean, he, he has all Synchro Monster at his disposition, especially Stardust Dragon, that is the best Synchro has ever made. If it were to have a duel with a character from the series, of course, I would choose Kaiba, because he uses dragons, and the dragon is the best type that exists in the game. I'll pick Raphael, because he doesn't lose unless he wants to lose, so I feel like it's my best chance of survival. I guess Yugi, he's really lucky. <laughs> he might help me, so. If I'm doing a shadow duel and the loser gets sent to the shadow realm, I feel like I have to pick the Pharaoh at 10. When it comes to clutching up in those high stake situations, it seems to always do it, so I guess, yeah, the Pharaoh. Um, I'd love to pick Joey, but you know, I don't know if he has it in him to, 
to go the distance. So uh, I'd have to I'd have to go with Yugi just because of the plot armor. You know, he draws what he wants when he needs it. Uh, I'd pick Saito Kaiba. I think we have similar personalities. We're kind of abrasive. A lot of people don't like us, but when it comes down to it, uh, we would do anything for the people we care about. So we get it done. Uh, I would love to pick Joy because it's like the more realistic character. But if I want to win, I will go with uh, Kaiba. It's like he's maybe the best deck builder in the in the like in the anime. Hey guys. I'm Jess, better known as Sunsea Jess Online. I'm the 2023 European Champion for the Yugi TCG, and today I've been invited by Konami to join the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links Rival School Academy. Now, although I play a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh!, I'm a complete beginner to Rush Duel. So today, I'm going to be tutored by our sensei, Suzaki-san, who's a well-renowned caster from Japan. He's gonna help me build a deck I've been given, improve on it a bit, so that I can beat, sorry, I mean play against and compete with our other students who've come from across the globe. Oh, that sounds like the bell. It's time to begin. Hi, konnichiwa. Hello. はい、よろしくお願いします。I really appreciate you helping me out with my Rush Duel deck. Um, I'm pretty new to Rush Duel, so I've played a lot of TCG, but I've not played a lot of Duel Links Rush Duel. Could you please explain a little bit about it? Understood. Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links is iOS, Android, Steam, and it's a free game for everyone. You can play it as fast as you can play it as fast as you can. なかでもラッシュデュエルは最近ユーギオデュエルリンクスに実装されたまったく新しいルールのエキサイティングなデュエルを楽しめるゲームなんです。so the deck I have is Roman Psychic deck. いや、とてもいいデッキだと思います。それでは早速デッキの中身を見ていきたいと思います。So obviously this is the deck that I've got. What are your thoughts on this? How do you think I could improve this? はい、このデッキのキリフラはこのプリマギターナなんですけれども、攻撃力が2200と少し低いんですが、効果を使うことで大きくパワーアップすることができるのが強力なデッキになっていると思います。他にも攻撃力2300のホールダーブリッツがいたりファーフルのカードもあったりするんですけれども他に気になるところはやはりサイキック族じゃないプチモスとか回復効果を持つレッドポーションやダメージを与えるヒノコもいいんですけれどもこ
相手に使われても強くて厄介になっちゃうので、えー、これを破壊できるこのカードも入れたいと思うんですけどどうでしょうか That seems like a really good strategy, especially if that card's so good with reducing attack points. If the other students are playing it, I need to be able to counter it. Ah, so now this card is a very good card. So, this card is a very good card. So, this card is a very good card. So, this card is a very good card. It's really good that we're already at 30 cards. Do you think I have too many spells and traps now? Ah, I don't know. So, this card is a very good card. This feels like some kind of hidden test. So, I'm hoping my grades don't tank because of this. Personally, I'm thinking the correct answer is to play one less spell trap and play one less copy of the spell trap removal card and then play an extra monster so that I can always summon as many monsters as possible. But please correct me if I'm wrong, you're the teacher. えー、と今貴重な意見を聞けてよかったですでハンマークラッシュを減らしてじゃあモンスターを増やしたいんですけどサイキック属モンスターは、えー、とたくさん今入ってますのでもう残りがない状態なのでこの2枚入っているこのマジカルゴーストアンデッドではあるんですけど増やしてこれでどうでしょうか I'm a really big fan of normal monsters. And seeing normal monsters do things when we don't play them that much generally, especially when effect monsters are just more popular. So I'm really happy to play an extra one. So I'm really happy with that change. Okay, Sensei, I have one last question, which is the most important question by far. Who has the brighter hair? Me or my character in Duel Links, Roman? <laughs> I'm honored to hear you say that, and hopefully, my bright hair lets me shine bright and outdo all the other students. So I'll get to play you in the finals. That's it for this video. Be sure to keep an eye on the Yu-Gi-Oh Card EU channel for updates on how our matches go. Also, you can check down in our description below to see how my competitors are doing and see how their deck building sessions went. And in the meantime, don't forget to download Yu-Gi-Oh Duel Links to try out this new Rush Shield mode for yourself. I'll see you in my first match. Are you ready for this duel? Yeah, unfortunately for you, this is my Phantom oh. 5. Oh my god, it's really pretty anime. Oh my god, what is this? Oh no. Alright, welcome back. We are back with the Ultimate Duelist Series, right? We are here to crown our undisputed champion here in beautiful Los Angeles, California. Again, we waited so long for these matches, but we still have plenty of matches left. However, this is where it's going to get a little bit more difficult. Think about this. None of these competitors can be number one except just one of them. So as we continue through the tournament, we're going to have to start eliminating people. They're going to be out of contention here. Yeah, that's right. We are finally hitting that point when those duelists with already two losses, if they lose one more, they are out of the tournament. They are no longer going to be able to compete. So let's start meeting some of those players. Let's toss to Kangas, see who we have in front of us for round four here. How are we doing, Kangas? We're doing all right. Thank you very much. Caster is here to introduce the next round, starting on the red side. He is the master of bowling, Ryan Murakami. Ryan Murakami, one of the first UDS champions, before we even knew that the belt came with so much power, he won with his Cosmo strategy in a field where Cosmo was not popular anymore. This is basically a more of a pendulum format, so he always comes in with something a little bit more off meta, but he always shows his game sense. He's so smart when playing, not that smart outside of that. He makes some crazy decisions, we see it all the time. That's why I love him so much. But I'm really excited to see him play here today. Certainly going to be a fan favorite with crazy moves, but he has an opponent, of course. Let's go back to Kangas to introduce that one. And on the other side of the alley, on the blue side, the self-proclaimed inventor of Dragon Link, Shun Ping Zhu. Yeah, I think Kanga said it best here. He really brought Dragon Link to the TCG here, Shuping, winning the final North American UDS with Dragon Link. Favorite card, Guard Dragon Alpi. I think it makes a lot of sense. Oh, absolutely. And it was really heads up, too, because Dragon Link hadn't been fully established there. So to call him the inventor of that, I don't think is a misnomer. And look at that beautiful Dragon shirt, too. Definitely representing the pride of his deck, even if you may not be playing it. Yeah, and I think we've seen something from previous rounds from him as well. There's a, a tech card in his extra deck that you wouldn't expect from any of the current strategies that is just really interesting and it kind of just shows his love for the dragon strategy. Oh, absolutely. We don't want to spoil any surprises, but if we do get to see that monster, that will really show you that it is still Shunping at the wheel. 
Now, this is going to be a matchup that I don't know if Xunping is going to be prepared for, not to spoil it just yet before the entire chat gets to see here. But Ryan is not playing one of the fire strategies this That's weekend. true. That's true. So it's true that the fire deck is very, very good, but it does have certain weaknesses that we've seen some of the players exploit against one another, where it was banishing cards or trying to seal off the graveyard. Imagine if you didn't care about your graveyard at all, what kind of cards you could run in order to stop your opponent. Absolutely, you want to just fly away from the fire sometimes and just rise above. And if you don't have to care about the graveyard that's cindering, then you can just go ahead and normal summon a bunch of times. I know, it's almost like you uh, still have to worry about cards like Nibiru, obviously, if you're summoning multiple monsters in the same turn. But we may not see that many special summons. We may be seeing a lot of normal summons. I'm sure the chat is typing away what deck they think we're talking about. Now, both these players already do have two losses, so I think we really have to mention this is an elimination match. Absolutely. At this point, each player has three points, meaning they have one win in the tournament. However, we're already this far in, and so if they do not take a win here, they are likely not going to be eligible for that top four unless some weird cataclysmic event happens. So that means that every duel from here on out is really going to count, and we may not get to see these duelists again, unfortunately, because one will win and one may be eliminated from contention. Yeah, and of course, none of these players are slouches, right? Every single player invited into this tournament has won an event before, so they're all really strong players. So seeing any eliminated is always really hard. But of course, we can only have one winner. And even if they are not able to make that top four, they still get some additional prizing up all the way down to top eight. So they are going to still continue to play it out and try to win as many matches as possible. No, that's absolutely correct. Well, we're only going to be featuring a top four cut for single elimination. Anybody who makes the top eight will still get additional fabulous prizes. We showcase those in the beginning of the event, but that's important. That shows that even this duel, if you get a loss, hang in there, keep winning, and you might take home something that no one else does. Now, I think this dice roll is going to be fairly important, not necessarily as important as previous rolls because there are some cards in Ryan's strategy that don't really care if you're going first or second. Yeah, you're not worried about it if you've got a deck that, uh, well, could just ride on whatever air currents happen to come their way. Judges going ahead and getting everything set up. Didn't get to necessarily see who went first or second there because the die rolls were a little off to the side. But again, we know what's being played, so we know that this will be an interesting duel no matter who goes first. All right, we're drawing our cards out, just making sure everything's ready. Does take quite a lot of infrastructure to get this tournament going, but all the staff are just hanging in there, making sure that this is the best tournament possible. But forget that, it is time for game one. All right, let's see who gets to win the roll here and be able to start us off. And you can see it on the screen. It is Snake Eye versus Fluanderees. Fluanderees, that off-meta pick that I'm talking about. Ryan always brings something a little unexpected. He's trying to focus down on slowing the game and just win off of the amount of recursion that, like, I mean, I suppose the Snake Eye deck has a plenty of recursion itself, not necessarily as much without the Fire King cards, but Fluanderees is the peak recursion, right? If you can get as many turns as possible, you can just keep summoning those monsters, get as many oh, Empens on the field, really just focus <laughs> down all the power uh, uh, in the deck. And you can really shut your opponent out because you don't care about the graveyard. You're allowed to play those cards like Dimension Shifter, uh, even Dim uh, Dimensional Fisher as well. Oh, as absolutely. But we haven't seen any of that yet, so it may not be in the hand. Looks like we're just going to start with a bonfire, grabbing a Snake Eye Ash. Yeah, good, yeah. Be able to resolve both those cards as going to be the most potent hand that you can have in the Snake Eye strategy, being able to see access to the Divine Temple as well as it having access to the original Sinful Spoil. So I think we're going to see a lot of synchro plays happening from here on out, maybe. Absolutely. Now, for those of you watching at home who might be confused about the configuration of the board, remember that if you are left-handed, you can always request an accommodation from a judge, and so that's why we're seeing the graveyard and the field zone swap there. Awesome. All right, Shu trying to move as quickly as possible here, uh, trying to get the game going. Maybe having a little bit of matchup knowledge knows that he might need the additional time to try to grind his way through this matchup. Certainly the players have been able to kind of take a look at what everyone is playing. This is very much a normal tournament scenario where you're able to kind of get up, walk around a little bit. So he might know exactly what's on the opposing board and just trying to get set up as fast as he can and doing a great job of that. Yeah. Yeah, so here's something we definitely don't see every day. Parallel Exceed, this has been gaining some popularity from some regional lists. You're able to immediately put two level four monsters, even though they are naturally level eight when they come out on the field by Parallel Exceed's effect, they do become level four. And you're immediately able to go into that rank four monster. I personally like Dweller and Baguska, but 
this is the Sergeant Banshee Sunday. that's able to add any Pyro from your deck to your hand. Not a bad idea, right? We know that Fonda Fontaine from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX gave us Bonfire, but there were other cards allowing you to search Pyros before, yeah, so it's just wild to be able to see that. Shunping showing that he's really thinking about the extra deck the same way that he piloted Dragon Link. Well, now he's got some great Xyz plays, too. Not trying to go any slower. Immediately links away the Link Rebo and the Banshee into the Little Knight. Looks like Little Knight is going to banish the Banshee here. Ooh. Fertile Flame Banshee just going ahead and getting to the banishment there, but already summoned back. All right, this is a lot of bodies generated already. So adding the Birch to his hand so he's able to extend even further. There's not even the effect of Ash being used to go ahead and special summon another Snake Eye monster from the deck just yet. Looks like we're going to see the Little Knight, the Birch, as well as the Banshee link away, I imagine, to the Apollo. Yep, that's Appaloosa Bow, the Goddess. 24, 24. Absolutely gorgeous card and really important because we've seen how important it is to get ahead of those Nibiru's. We've seen plenty of summons, although we really haven't seen much from Ryan. Not sure what kind of poker face this player might have, but he does seem like he's just kind of hanging out, waiting for his turn to happen. And it's going to be a little difficult to play through the various effects of Apollosa. Yeah, Appaloosa, one of the few things that I think the Snake Eye deck can do, uh, naturally at least, that is a hindrance to the Flowandry strategy. You don't really care too much about the destruction or the general removal, but like the effect negation is definitely what you want to look out for. So Ryan's probably not too happy about having to face the Appaloosa. And typically in the Flowandry strategy, you're not going to be playing something along the lines of Nibiru because you can't afford a special summon ever if you want to keep using your Flowandry's effects. You absolutely just need a normal summon and normal summon. But the reason why you get that many normal summons is because each of those Flowandry's effects is giving you an additional normal summon. But if Appaloosa is going to be negating those card effects, well, you're not going to get that initial normal summon. So Unfortunately, you're only going to get that one bird, and they will not flock together. All right, looks like Snake Eye Ash is going to be able to use its effect, sending that Poplar from face one the field, summon the Snake Eye Oak from the deck, Oak effect, going to be able to target the Snake Eye Birch, bring it out from the graveyard, and finally, we're going to use that Diabellister that was added in the beginning of the turn from the Wanted. Not going to need to get a Flame Birch from the deck, just going to use the one that was set. Oh, and we're going to be able to set the Trap Very card here. Yeah. I think that might be the first time that we're actually seeing Sinful Spoils of Betrayal Silvera. Yeah, this one, if you're not familiar with it, because I know I hasn't really seen a whole lot of play yet, uh, allows you to uh, negate a card effect as long as the Diabellstar is face up on the field. It's funny, actually, to keep Diabellstar on the field because we're so used to her just kind of saying hi and then bye. You know, obviously, that's part of the strategy. But again, yeah, being able to, you know, negate those opponent's effects just for already playing your favorite deck is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of these players came into this tournament expecting to play against Fluandries, but if you're trying to make a board that's good into the Fluandry strategy, this it might be it. Definitely feels like it. And now we're finally seeing the Monster of the Hour. It's Promethean Princess, Bestower of Flames. Going to be able to bring back that Flame Bridge and likely going to be able to use that IP Masquerina uh, just with Flame Bridge's effect. And just being able to bridge into that earlier in the play. Now you're finally going to be able to make that last Link 4 monster, unless you want to leave the Princess on the field. I imagine you don't want to if you want to bring up that IP Masquerina, but uh, there is a consideration to leaving the Birch on the field because Birch does have an effect on the opponent's turn exclusively to special someone from the deck as well. Oh, so yeah, you're going to be able to leave the Birch when you're able to use the Sinful Spell spells that I didn't realize he had not used yet. Which is amazing because now the Bestower of Flames is in the graveyard, so the second a monster gets Special Summon, you could destroy a Fire and one of those Flanderies. So not only would you be able to negate the effect, but if there's any Special Summons at all that happen in this duel, Bestower's ready for that too. It looks like Shu actually does not play a copy of Jet Synchron, because I imagine you would go for that here. So opting to just really focus on Link Summons and I guess the additional interruptions from uh, cards such as the Betrayal Severia. Ah, the player who invented Dragon Link playing Link Summons? Who'd have thought? That looks like one final card drawn off the wanted here to, uh, just to keep generating all that value. It is quite a bit on the field there, and it does show you that each of these players is playing this deck almost completely different. There are lots of nuanced variations on it, and that's what shows that these are the best duels in the world. They also have different opinions from one another, and there's no wrong way to duel, but right now I think uh, this may be wrapping things up. Yeah, I mean, it is like week two, right, of these cards being legal. Not everything has been figured out yet. We've seen a lot of minds. This is the interesting thing about a tournament like this where it's so small. Normally, a lot of players like to work together, and they want to try to make the best board possible, or like rather the best strategy possible. But oftentimes when you have this many players that are going to play against each other in such a small tournament where you know you're going to play against pretty much every single one of them, Taking you don't want to talk to any of them, Oh, right? absolutely. I think that might be why we were taking a look at the graveyard for the Infernal Flame Banshee. You think to yourself, maybe I should try this sometime. But that's not going to go in a Fluanda Rees deck, so let's yep. see if the Oh, no. That's it. Yeah, I mean, th that was plenty of interruptions on the field, and I think Ryan didn't want to waste any time here. 
He uh, knows that he's not going to be able to even attempt to stop this. Uh, I think he was able to see the top card of his deck. It wasn't anything to really break the field. And Fluundry, sometimes you don't even get to start playing, right? You need to have access to one of those critical normal summons that gets the entire engine rolling. Sometimes you miss on that, too. Absolutely, depending on what your hand is. But the good news is Ryan has the opportunity to choose to go first, so this won't be a complete shutout of Fluundry, especially for those fans of the bird strategy back home. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the weird thing here. Do you think, based on what we've seen so far, that Shu knows he's playing Fluundry? <laughs> he put up a very different board compared to what we've seen, but it's true that the deck is able to just do those different things, right? It's not uncommon to have IP Masquerina physically, you know, in the spell and trap zone, ready to be summoned out. We saw that from previous duels. But if he knew about the flow on Reese, right, if he actually did get a chance to talk with some of the other duelists and scope some things out, that was a beautiful way to stop that, right? There was just no version of that that a single flow on Reese normal summon, which usually starts an incredible turn, was actually going to be able to go off. So unless he drew some sort of power spell, which clearly he didn't, he was not getting into that duel. So Shinping did the right thing. Now, that strategy, I feel like even if you weren't against Flounders, I think that might have been enough to stop most strategies. So because Ryan picked up his cards without playing a single one of them, He's preserving that information, right? He Just is. in case. And that's one of the things that I think duelists sometimes, when they're watching other duelists play and they see someone surrender very quickly, they think, no, nah, man, you could probably still do it. But here's the thing. First off, this is a Yu-Gi-Oh! competition with rules. So that clock that you see in the bottom of the screen, it is ticking down. And saving your time for later so you can make those difficult decisions and turns later is important. There's nothing wrong with getting out of the game early. And just like you said, Asala, it's important to shield that information. If you're not going to win the duel, there is no reason to reveal your best cards to your opponent. So if you pack up game one, it just means you're going to have a better game two and possibly three later. Now, we've talked about the fire strategy several times throughout this tournament, and we will continue talking about it before the uh, next day is over. But let's talk about Fluandries. What reasoning do you have with the release of Phantom Nightmare to play a strategy such as this one? Well, it's the Swallow's Cowry, right? That obviously gives you a little bit more movement in the deck. And so, obviously, you know, each player is going to have a different opinion. Some people want to play one, some people want to play two or three. I guess we'll see that if there is a Swallow's Cowry here. But the other thing I think is really just the inherent advantage of the Dimension Shifter, right? The fact that you're not worried about your great graveyard at all means that you can say goodbye to anyone else's and use a bunch of other powerful cards, not just beyond Dimension Shifter, but also things like you mentioned, Dimension Fusion, yeah. Dimension Ground, there's yeah, a lot of, oh, Dimensional Barrier, what am yeah. I saying? <laughs> that would be crazy. Fissure, Fissure. Dimension, there's, there's like a lot so of dimension many Dimension cards, it's all Yu-Gi-Oh, but that said, you really do have access to so many different We're ways to just interrupt your opponent in a different way, right? And when they're running so many of those different fire cards, think about it, true. Your Dimension Shifter prevents you from getting Ash Blossom, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can't send the card to the graveyard. Well, not the Ash Blossom particularly, but Effect Veiler, Droll, and Lockbird. Oh, They're yes, you're right, you're right. We've been having a long day here, so all the cards start to blend together. But Shunping doing a great job of just kind of already knows what his game plan is. It's really Ryan who's going to think that out, but he didn't really showcase much. He did access the side deck, so hopefully we're able to see some bird action here, too. I know there are a lot of players who love the fire deck, but also love to see some variation in the format, too. Yeah, I mean, that's what keeps Yu-Gi-Oh! so interesting, right? There are several options, even though there is that one strategy that everyone's talking about. It's not the only one, and there's plenty of other things you have to look out for. If you spend so much time dedicating everything to beating this one deck, you will lose to these other ones. You absolutely will. It's one of those things where it's not necessarily a rock, paper, scissors format, but it is true that if you're not worried about your graveyard and perhaps two of these decks played against each other, well, all of a sudden, they're dimension shifters, they're dimension fissures. They don't really do anything. So it just kind of depends on whether you've got the right thing for your opponent. And that's something that people are going to have to keep track of in YCS Vegas. This is not format defining. This is just a great showcase of these decks and players. But you might be able to find a way to beat them and then showcase that in Vegas next week. Yeah, I think Vegas is going to be a really interesting one where you don't get to get away with making a pick like that as often, where you get to main deck so much anti-fire strategy because there are so many other decks. I mean, we haven't even seen a Voices Voice yet, but there are other playable decks, but I think in a tournament like this, going into game two, of course, where the fire strategy has been so strong and you know everyone's probably going to play this exact deck because it's so competitive and it's clearly the best deck so far, you get away with something like this. And I think Ryan is going to show off in this game being able to start just why an anti-meta choice like Fluendries could win here. Definitely excited to see it. Let's see what he starts with first. It's a great start, Fluendries map here. Gonna be able to reveal Eaglin. Oh, goodness, so he's going right in. It looks like that's, a, I imagine it's a Rubina, but it might not be. Uh, oh, it is a Rubina, okay, very good. So banish our Rubina, go ahead and grab that Rubina back. Eaglin's gonna be able to resolve, gonna be able to add a, well, is it level five or higher? Believe so. It's not every day you see Fluanda Reeves. I'm sure the master duelists in the chat definitely are feeling it, but it's great to see M-Pen there too. 
right, so we have Empen back in hand. He do, do, is granted another normal summon along with that uh, Surge. And it's going to be used on Rubina. Rubina is going to be met with Ash Blossom. Oh, but speaking of the Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, that is going to stop Rubina in its tracks, so it's not adding that level 4 lower Winged Beast to the hand. Normally, that stops your chain of normal summons that come with, in addition to the effects. But because of the effect of map, you have an additional normal summon as well. So you can keep this chain going with the Empen here. Empen Chain Link 1, Eagle and Chain Link 2. Eagle is going to be able to go back to the hand. Hits keep on coming, but nothing seems to be going on on Shunping's side. The Ash Blossom was certainly a valiant effort, but it looks like we are furthering Fluanderies. And Eaglen, I'm uh, rather, what do you think Empen's going for here? You have a couple options, right? Normally, it's something along the lines of Dreaming Town. Maybe you want an advent to just try to keep your plays going. Sometimes you want to get the continuous spell to be able to tribute your opponent's cards or even cycle some cards from your hand. But it looks like we are just going straight for that Dreaming Town, oh, which yes, is going to be able yeah. to, in your opponent's main phase, give you a normal summon, which is going to be able to start this chain all over again. But let's not forget about its secret effect in the graveyard. When you conduct a tribute summon, you can banish it, set all of your opponent's <laughs> monsters face down. And that's so strong because obviously with a Link summon based deck, as Shunping showcased all those fine Link monsters, you cannot conduct a Link summon when the monsters are face down. So you're absolutely right about this anti-meta pick. It's not just about banishing the graveyard. It's also about you know interrupting those them, options though. and making sure you can't summon. Yeah. So Shunping's got a lot cut out for him, but he's gonna go ahead and draw now. Okay, there's one monster in that hand. It is a copy of sure. Snake Eye Poplar. Uh, but uh -huh. we do have one, and there's plenty of engine as well. Yes. Still no shifter from Ryan Murakami here. Not <laughs> ideal for the full laundry strategy. <laughs> Obviously, that's what got you, you know, this far. That's what you wanted to see in this deck, but we haven't <laughs> seen it just yet. Uh, looks like we are bonfiring. The watch is going to grab the Diabell star okay. here. Uh, I mean, do you even lead with the pop bar now, or do you just give it up? You have infinite permanence, which is. I mean, it's still very useful in the Empen because remember, Empen does not allow the effects of special summon monsters in attack position to resolve. That's true, it's true. It's almost its own little floodgate in and of itself. It's a monster that really just stops the waters from flowing. And yet, Shunping is taking a little moment to think there. So obviously, Empen is going to kind of slow things down here. I mean, as far as the. Empen is at least a little bit more manageable because you're able to summon a Flame Bridge in defense and just push it down. But. It looks like we're going to just be leading with the Diabell Star, holding the infinite permanence in hand for a uh, following turn. Uh, summon successfully. I'll summon target Ash. Poplar is going to be able to leave itself in the graveyard, go after a different oh, fire monster with the Ash Blossom. Um, and there is the Feather Storm! Oh, man. Harpy's Feather Storm, obviously one of the best Fluanderies cards ever printed. Yeah, you know, if it's one bird, it's they're all the birds, right? Yeah, birds of a feather flock together. I'm sure the Harpies will get along with them just fine. I think the entire point of Fluanderies is all the friends he made along the way. Surely there's one Harpy in there. Oh, absolutely. We're going to attempt to keep playing. Going to be able to put the Birch on the field by giving up the Diabell Star, which means you already opened this info spot. So the Diabell Star wasn't going to be getting too much value anyway. And you are able to cycle for a draw here with that Wanted now. Try to just preserve as many resources as possible. Try to, I think, I, what you're really looking for is a copy of Divine Temple now. So as soon as Ryan starts playing, he's going to be able to be able to play as yes. well. Temple's going to be able to push up a monster from the back row. It's wild that all of these powerful cards meant to stop plays, such as Ass Blossom and Harpy's Featherstorm, haven't really done a lot to change the tempo of the duel. Really, this is about the deck itself. That's what's carrying the duel. Now, Ryan still has that Dreaming Town as soon as Shu attempts to leave the main phase here. He's going to potentially able to summon another copy of Empen, or maybe just climb up into something along the lines of Miss Valley Apex Avian, just to have an interruption set on the field before having to start his own turn. Yep, there's Eaglin, and there's the Rubina. Now the Dreaming Town paid off. He's also, if he does conduct a Tribute Summon, able to reset that Birch, so Birch won't even have an effect to attempt once it comes to Ryan's turn. Certainly helps that it really is just a series of heads-up plays, and I think this is obviously what we were hoping for before. Taking a quick look at the graveyard before we search our deck. Finally getting to bring out that level four wing beast. Can't quite make that up from the bottom corner, but I'm sure we'll get to see it soon. Yeah, in Shooping's graveyard, there's a Poplar, an Ash Blossom, uh, and a Diabell Star. Ryza, oh, and uh, Ryza is just going to go after the couple sets here. Uh, so Ryza will target this and this top to deck, and then I'll target that to hand. Great to see Ryza yeah. the Mega Monarch doing what it does best. Two, two, Certainly going to slow down Shung Ping. Anything else or nothing? Uh, nope. And then, uh, what was it? Eagle. 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 
Yep. Being able to fully resolve the chain here, Eaglen will go back to that. That's what really makes the Flow Hunter so powerful, right? The inevitability, all these cards just giving themselves right back to the player. No, it's a very strong deck, and it's a very strong series of cards. You're absolutely right. I mean, you can see Flawandries in the Dreaming Town. It really is about the friends that it makes along the way. Uh, sort of a migration circle in all the places you go in between. But speaking about going in between, we're going to Monster Reborn, the Snake Eye Poplar. Which still can't activate its effect. Okay, yeah, I was about to say, you still cannot activate its effect, right? Uh, the Birch is going to be able to respawn to summon itself because of fire is on the field. So back to being a uh, live effect now. Okay, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Love seeing that monster reborn, by the way. It's a and great me, me picture, great art. Yeah, so, and these. You know, when you're playing such an anti meta strategy such as Ryan, you think oh, part sorry. of <laughs> doing so is you know, like placing the cards like he does so unorganized just to maybe more so infuriate your opponent? Because I know it infuriates me. It, it's definitely one of those things where obviously the judges, you see, they're making sure that everything is exactly where it's supposed to be zone wise. But he also may just be playing fast and loose. He's excited. Maybe he smells the blood in the water because he's able to get all these effects off. And obviously, Shinping hasn't done as much. We are going back into the deck here, just cycling through. Yep, going to be able to use the map again, get access to a different normal summon. Going to go for the two can, or sorry, uh, the Stree here. Stree's effect uh, is to normal summon and banish a card from either graveyard and then get that additional normal summon. Sure. Stree's going to be added back to hand. Eaglen is going to be able to resolve. I wonder which big tribute he's going to go for now. I think we've seen every one of the Flandries so far except Snout. All right, uh, that could be another Empen. I mean, that's a lot of levels, so I think it is another Empen. And it looks like we're going to be normal summoning uh, that tree now. There's not much in his opponent's graveyard. Uh, he's just going to be banishing his own yes. Dreaming Town, which will make it more accessible. Yeah. Not burying your head in the sand this time, just able to keep moving on. Right. Again, you can actually see Fluanderese, the magnificent map. That is the entire migration cycle of our Fluanderese, and you can kind of see all the different pinpoints there of where it's gone along its journey. We've actually gotten the full journey here. I mean, this is really what we're hoping, that Mist Valley Apex Avian, having that full negate there, too. Right, so Apex Avian now finally on the field, going to be able to stop the Birch. Ryan is just going to want to be able to close his game out. Might not be able to do it just yet because those two bodies are blocking him. Uh, two can target trap. Okay, there's the two can. Going to be able to add back the banished uh, Dreaming Town that he did this turn. So he's going to be able to reset it. Just keep this flow going. Robina is going to be able to normal summon as well off the two can effect, and then of course the street is going to be able to add itself back to hand. And there and back again, a Fluanderi's journey. And the, here's another tribute summon here for another M pen. Um, now, the second M pen is one, super important two, because three. you cannot just get rid of that first M pen and suddenly get your effects in attack mode now. Uh, right. Got to deal with both of them. But did he use the ban? Yeah. yeah. I know I use this one for sure. Yep. Cool. These are good. To, yeah. okay. right. So, Eaglen and the two can are, I believe, going back yep. to hand. And M pen finally going to be able to grab another card here. What are you even looking for? It seems like you pretty much have everything. Possibly, you know, something to do later. Oh, this seems like a fine choice. Being to be able to put back some of those cards, just get some draws in as well. It's interesting too because you know we've talked about so much in the last couple of formats how important it is to save a little bit of gas in the tank so you have a follow-up play. But Fluanderese doesn't really need to worry about that. They just go and go and go. But let's see how much further we have to go on this duel. It looks like a Birch was used. In oh, <laughs> Birch was used in the main phase. Going to head and. Able to special summon out that Flame Bridge from the deck by sending itself and the Poplar. Flame Bridge, yeah. And again, um, yes, you could use uh, that Flame Bridge to maybe clear the field a little bit, but with Poplar, Apex Avion and Poplar, two yeah. copies of M Pen, it's going to be That's very the, difficult to clear to, yeah, all the yeah, rubbish yeah. away that keeps that activated effects happening. All right, so we look like we're going to use the Poplar to put the Ash Blossom back there, which makes sense. You do want to keep as many Snake Eyes or at least level one fires in the graveyard as possible for the Flame Bridge. Uh, but at this point, uh, you could just uh, enter uh, Battle Phase, attack yeah, with the Avian. Some yeah, like, um, you know, just have another defending body here. But you can attack with the Avian over the Flame Bridge, negate the Flame Bridge, and just keep uh, the game going. And then you have the Dreaming Town to reset up the Avian at any point. We're in the Battle Phase now. Apex Avian will go ahead and get rid of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Looks like we're going to go ahead and uh, say goodbye to Flamberge. Just to your hit. Yeah, thank you. I feel like you're always going to stop this here. Is there any reason to just give just that to your opponent? I don't really feel like. I understand you can put the Apex yeah, Avion back out quickly, so it might as well go ahead and put that back to your so hand in the gate. 56. Yep. 56 ones. Leaving, er, 55, yeah, sorry, sorry. Leaving Shu with one. very few resources now. I believe that's one card in the hand. Going to be drawing into two. Not going to be a whole lot that you could draw into uh, in this position. 
Yep. Well, especially given the setup that we have here, it, it's going to be very difficult, and it would not be hard to get the Apex Avion back in the field. So it's one card in the hand, but it's one card in the hand that's going to have to play through all of that. And then whatever you draw, well, we'll see. Opting to put back the Eaglin as well as the Toucan. So keeping the Stree, Stree potentially being one of the stronger ones to be able to lead with, getting rid of an interruption from the graveyard immediately. Another heads up play there. Oh, he looks like we have summoned five times, though. Uh, Honestly, I think this is okay. Not too bad, with, uh, not too bad. I think he can certainly get back in the duel, especially with all those set trap cards. He has additional ways to get back in, but going to calculate here. Of them plus Rope in a Judges just verifying all the five yeah, summons. And then Empire. Then Apex, yes. Okay, yeah, there wasn't. There were several monsters summoned, even if they were normal um, summoned. Again, it's a great deck. You don't have to have multiple special summons to put multiple monsters on the board. I will say though, uh, this Nibiru token, this primal being token rather, is uh, much larger than that Nibiru. Oh, very, very big. When you have no other cards, uh, it's going to be quite threatening. And if you decide to do commit <laughs> another card, all those birds come back from the hand. Oh. There is a Rabina Banish, uh, so you know the it's full it's chain is still available. Absolutely. Now, it's one of those things where, you know, this duel could end fast, it could end short, but uh, the great easy. news with Luanderee is they always have a way back in. It's nope. almost like a full power. Uh, various other decks would... Oh. oh! We interrupt this broadcast for anti-spell fragrance. I don't think it was necessary, but Ryan just wanted to make sure that this game is over. Uh, well, I mean, it would be a bad time for a change of heart, turn that to attack bone and go in. Don't have to worry about that with an anti-spell fragrance. Also going to see our Dreaming Town activated. Yeah, I believe uh, Shimming was a attempted to Get pass turn, but he's going to just opt to keep playing here with the Dreaming Town. I don't think it's quite necessary. I think the Nibiru token um, would be able to attack over the Nibiru for that 2,500 points of damage. Certainly would, but wants to go ahead and keep committing cards to the board. Going to no. go ahead and use Stream. So and Pen gets banished. This comes oh, it looks like Stree is going to be going after his own uh, graveyard to keep so resources Stree's available. So he's uh, able to tribute now with your opponent's card uh, because of Mr. the spell. Yep. You remember his name again. Oh, it's going to be the sunset that you're looking at over there, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not thinking you keep nipping against me. Unexplored, Unexplored wins. Unexplored, Unexplored wins. wins. That's yeah. right. There's so many tongue twisters when you're commentating a Fluon Rees match, but that's all she wrote after seeing the Miss Valley Apex yeah, Avion. Uh, honestly, yeah. I mean, another negate, it's yeah, such a strong card. You know, it came out of an era where they didn't expect you to be able to quickly, easily return those wind monsters and then drop them back on the board. But it's honestly not that hard now with the effect of that card being able to just be dropped out again and again and again. It's a wing beast, so you can normal summon it. At some point, it was a lot scarier when you were able to use things like a union carrier to flick uh, the, uh, rather, the other avian, right? And it was just an infinite loop. But I'm glad we're not doing that anymore. I think this is a lot more reasonable. Twice is probably okay. An infinite number of times is a little too far. Yeah, this is is in pole position. We aren't racing for the infinite loops here, but players playing, talking amongst themselves there too. Great sportsmanship. They've probably been here, you know, they've known each other. This is a very tight knit scene between all the different duelists because when you compete at the highest level, you see the same people across from you time and time again. <laughs> yeah, I imagine these two players have actually played each other before at some point within their duelist history. I mean, we're celebrating 25 years of Yu Gi Oh! history here. The players have been playing for quite some time, especially to make it to a tournament like this. No, absolutely, and they're smiling and they're chatting. Remember, this is a match where if either of them lose, they likely are no longer in contention for the top four. And yet, look at their faces. They're happy to be here. They're just ready to duel. They're having a good game. They know what's going on, and that's the great sportsmanship you get with an ultimate duelist. Now, Ryan, going to have to take the back foot here. He's going to have to go second, almost assuredly. Because I don't think Xu Ping, especially when we saw game one, that was a very decisive victory. He's going to just be able to try to do that again. Given you don't always get to open Bonfire as well as wanted, that is pretty ideal. But Ryan still hasn't had hit the ace in his hole, you know? No, he hasn't. We can just hope that it shows up, right? It would be incredible for Fluanderee's fans to just see that first turn dimension shifter. And that might be all she wrote, but... It really just depends on the heart of the cards, right? You have a decent chance if you roll in three copies of opening it in your first hand, but we've had two duels and that chance has not happened yet. Another card that I think is really interesting in any of these strategies that are focusing on banishing all your opponent's cards with something along the lines of Shifter is Gravekeeper's Inscription. Oh, and I feel like Gravekeeper's Inscription is just like, a, it's, it's not, 
like a card that we see enough for how good it is. Yes, it's a spell, and yes, that opens it up to certain vulnerabilities, but it's got basically the same effect of just locking your opponent out of a turn of accessing their most important resources. Yeah, having essentially three effects, right? One of them including Abyss Dweller, mm -hmm. which is very strong to be able to activate as a spell to just cut off your opponent's turn, even g going second, right? You can do it at the start of your turn going first, and obviously that's very powerful. It cuts off uh, the following turn as well. But when you're able to play into a field going second and still be able to lead your turn activating that card, against something along the lines of Fire King Snake Eye, you get to cut off the entire graveyard here that probably cuts off the Garunix, the Kirin, the Promethean Princess, as well as any additional value that can be generated. But against Pure Snake Eye, maybe that's not as good because you are actually generating a lot more hard interruptions. We did see the uh, Sinful Spells of Betrayal Severa as well. You're able to just interact with it just pretty cleanly. But do you think it ever matters that it has to be the first card you activate in the main phase? It, it, the fact that it's the first card in the main phase does open up to certain other things. Obviously, that competes with other cards that can't be activated as the first card in the main phase, but I don't feel like that's too scary. I think you can drop that down. The only thing that makes that kind of an issue is it's it's not the strongest card maybe game one, so it's not something you'll commonly see in the main deck because you don't really know what your opponent is playing, and therefore you wouldn't know which of those great three effects to pick. Yeah, they have plenty of time here to get this one. They've played through game one and two so quickly, they should be able to have an, a complete game three here. This is the type of duel you love to see. Both players really got to show off their game plan. Shrimping in game one, Ryan obviously in game two. So now we got to put the pedal to the metal. They have to find out which of them is going to at least be on their way to qualifying for the semifinals tomorrow. Yeah, Ryan shuffling as thoroughly as possible. I think he really didn't like the hand that he got game one. He's not taking any chances here going into game three. Why worry about the heart of the cards when you could just power shuffle? Shunping just in a, a sort of meditative state, you know, not really worried about it. Just been at these top tables before, obviously, every one of these duelists had because they are carrying those heavy Ultimate Duelist Series belts. But right now, I think both of these duels are ready for just a great game, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we see in the final, well, the final duel. Yeah, both players trying to get themselves mentally prepared. Going into this, the decks are shuffled up. They're going to be presented just once again, I think. Yep, it looks like he's going for a final cut there on shoe side. And then finally, we're here, going into game number three. One of these players will lose their contention into the top four here, so they're playing with everything they got. They have to, because if not, unfortunately, while they still may be eligible for that top eight prize thing, they won't be eligible for that amazing ring that they're looking for. Looks like Shipping is going to take the lead here. Stand by. Stand by. Shifter. Oh. There it is! Oh, there it is. I love the smile, by the way. Like, he knew it was there. Like, stand by. And there it is. We are not going to see any cards going to the graveyard. At least not for a little while. No more foot. Uh, That's still a strong start here. You're going to be able to get access to Snake Eye Poplar. And I don't think it's immediately done for the Snake Eye deck when you get hit with something along the lines of Dimensional Shifter no, because you have access to Temple. Exactly. We talked about this earlier in the broadcast that no duelist gets this far and just loses to a single card, right? Oh, if you know that yeah, Shifter yeah. obviously is strong against your deck, you've formulated different play lines that you can make just through that. And so we're seeing that exactly now as we go ahead and go from Snake Eye Ash, adding the Snake Eye Poplar and using its effect to special summon it from the hand. Well, it looks like Shu also plays a copy of uh, Sinful, uh, Sinful Spell or Snake Eye Charge, right? The quick play spell? Oh, that's right, that's right. And that is really cool about Shunping's deck because he's running all these different Snake Eye and Sinful Spoils looks that we haven't seen from some of the other players. Just showing a little bit of creativity there. And we haven't seen that card you were hinting at earlier. I don't know if this will be the duel for it, but if we do get to see it, that would be pretty exciting. It looks like it's going to just opt for the Divine Temple here, keep it safe, going to be able to put something else in the Spell and Trap Zone to be able to bring up as soon as Ryan starts playing. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and Link Summon, unfortunately banishing the Poplar for a Link Karibo. Not the end of the world for the Poplar. It can come back with the effect of Snake Eye Oak later. Oh, and we do have the Parallel Exceed. Ooh. Now, so this is where I'm talking about, like, to, in order to counter something along the line of Dimensional Shifter, you could play something like number 41, Baguska. Oh, you absolutely could. But I wonder <laughs> if we're going to see an Infernal Flame Banshee again. I guess that gets access to Birch as well. So you have several layers. Of or you could just go straight into an IP Masquerina here. All right, 50-50, it's one or the other. Well, okay, at that point, if you're overlaying, I think it's okay. the Banshee. Okay. Yeah. You could have it's a fancy way of setting right? his materials. Could be a showman. Yeah. Okay. At this point, we have enough uh, bodies represented to maybe potentially go into an Appaloosa as well. Really hoping that Ryan doesn't have anything to follow up with the Dimension Shifter here. So we'll be grabbing that Birch. 
so cool to see Infernal Flame Banshee. I know we've talked about it quite through the broadcast, but it's true that like you have other ways into your pyro monsters, and that's a great example. Yeah, five and under four. Cool. Oh, it looks like he did open that copy of the Silvera. Not going to be useful without Diabelster on the field. Yeah, that's one. Do you think it's going to come up that the Snake Eye monsters are significantly stronger than the Fluandry's monsters with the temples on the field? They are. You know, I've been playing a lot of Snake Eye on Master Duel, and I love Divine Temple for that reason, because it is a little weird. Sometimes you do find yourself in a situation where maybe you don't need to make the Flamberge or any of the other combo monsters. You can really just assault them with level one fire monsters. 1100 is a huge boost. That's probably the biggest boost any field spell's ever given. Uh, Wetlands, right? Wetlands has uh, the water boost for 1200, doesn't it? But just, okay, think about co comparing Wetlands to Temple. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, you're right, you're right. We were just doing raw numbers, but it is true the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye is an incredible card. Wetlands is just a good card. Yeah. Banshee's going to be able to activate its effect when it's banished, summon itself back. Dark is going to be able to take the Dimension Shifter here. I'm surprised at how, I'm honestly impressed at how she has been able to play without having to use his graveyard at all. Again, you do not get this far without having a game plan for when one of your mechanics is locked out, right? There's so many different I mean, things that are in this game, whether it's the graveyard, the hand, the banishment, etc. But when one of those gets cut off, you cannot fold the duel, right? You can't just say, I surrender. Yeah. And this is what Shunping's doing as he summons another Snake Eye and combines them, assumedly for another Link monster. I think maybe an IP Masquerade? Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Sure. It looks like this is going to be approaching the end of Shu's turn here. Going to be able to set that one. I think it's just the bluff Silvera right now, unless there is a way to magically put a Diabell Star on the field for Shipping. Well, the deck's cool. certainly powerful, but I don't think that is going to be in the cards yeah. for Shunping. Certainly the energy that Ryan had after discarding that Dimension Shifter has faded out a little bit, right? He wasn't completely shutting his opponent out of the game, so he's going to have to have a great Fluandere's turn. Let's see what he gets after drawing his first card. I mean, yes. You want to start with that Magnificent Map? Uh, I'll do six for cost. Oh, I mean, that's a good way to start, too. I'll accept that. That, that could be a Magnificent Map. Let's see. Yeah, usually Pot of Prosperity, you know, you can sacrifice the ability to uh, end the game that turn because you are only doing half damage, but Fluandry isn't really attempting to end the game as soon as it can. It just wants to generate its value as fast as it can. So well, that isn't evenly matched. <laughs> Definitely a visible reaction from Shunping at all the great cards there, all the different ways to banish, right? Two evenly matches there, the Dimensional Fissure we were talking about earlier, a rivalry of Warlords. The thing is, if you are taking that evenly matched, you're likely just leaving up an Appaloosa, and you Appaloosa. have to deal with it. <laughs> if you already have access to map as well as one of the birds, that's going to be strong yeah. enough. But outside of that, you might have to take something else. Well, this might be a painful choice, but it seems like he's going for the evenly match. Interestingly, he went for the one on the right and decided, no, I want the one on the left. I'm ready. I think he liked the Okay. <laughs> um, battle. Um, yeah, and battle. Yep. Yep, opting to leave that Appaloosa on the field here. Certainly the right pick, though, so every other card's going to get banished face down. Now that the Oak is banished as well, most players only play one copy of that, so everything banished is going to be banished uh, permanently. Oh, and do we have duality now? Can we find the other piece that we uh, need? Brick. Oh, that's an advent. That could get there. Hmm. Feels like the advent's the thing to take. Obviously, the Miss Valley Apex no, Savion did a lot of work, but... I don't think you want to start with it. You want to just find it along the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hand. Let's put a pop back first, if that's not getting pinched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, great sportsmanship. These duelists definitely have played against each other. They're just happy to be here, but one of them's got to win, so Ryan's got to make his choice on this pot of duality. So this is a uh, three. So, yeah, yeah, right. so again, Ryan for those in the chat who... Oh, I think he has three other cards in his hand, right? So it's getting a little thin. We've played uh, three powerful cards back to back to back at this point. Dimension Shifter, Pot of Prosperity, as well as Pot of Duality. But... Ryan's going to have to start actually playing the game himself here. Oh yes, those, those pot <laughs> cards are great for drawing things, but you do have to play the cards you draw or add I to mean, your hand. Your hand. Definitely, not, definitely not this. Uh, cool. Okay, so it's not the avian. The fact that he's even considering the prosperity does not bode well. I guess the a lone Appaloosa is not going to get the job done at this point, right? He's not going to be ending the game for Shooping if Ryan is forced to pass, so he can uh, perhaps bank, bank on just being able to see another turn. All right, put the Prosperity back. Wasn't going to save that for a later <coughs> duel, or a later turn, I should say. A later duel would be interesting.
All right, do we see the advent used immediately, or is he going to attempt to lead off with the normal summon? Okay, yeah, so there is the advent. Yep. Going to be able to banish Impen. So as long as he has yeah. one of the p more useful normal summons in his hand, like either a Ravina or an Eaglin or a Toucan, as long as it's not Stree, <laughs> he should be able to be off to the races. Stree certainly would be the worst choice right now, but we'll see what he happened to draw. Impen. It's not a good one. Mpen might not be the best one, but it's not a bad one. As soon as you get access to Toucan, you're able to add it back, and as soon as that's on the field, the Appaloosa will no longer be doing any work. Oh, well, none of those cards are in the graveyard, actually. They're all banished. Oh, yeah, my bad. Yeah, this has been a very graveyard-free duel. Ryan deciding what he's going to do there. Looks like we got a Robina. Oh, it looks like another card in his hand is another advent. Yeah. That will allow him to keep playing on the following turn here, just making this Appaloosa just a little bit smaller piece by piece. Sometimes that's really all you can uh, do is just whittle down your opponent's effect. ability to negate your cards. Shit, <laughs> 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 yeah, I remember. Oh, so excited there, but okay. got to make sure to mind our manners. So now if the Rabina's effect is negated, remind me, are you able to access oh, your extra deck now? Uh, let's take a look at Rabina's effect just so we can... Imagine if we didn't activate Potter Duality class. <laughs> true, true. Obviously we're not special summoning here. But taking a look at Robina, doing our little Yu-Gi-Oh! Judge call here. Yep. Meanwhile, it looks like we did find a Snake Eye Poplar here, which is going to be able to access most of the engine at this point, given it's unfortunately not going to be able to go into Oak, which is what he needs to generate as many bodies as he, uh, he will require to put out a Flame Burge. And without any graveyard, it might not be able to do enough with everything gone. Turning back to the text of Robina, by the way, you can only use each of the following effects of Luandries and Robina once per turn and cannot special summon during the turn. You activate either effect. So if you're activating yeah. the effect, if it's the activation's negated, you're okay. But if just the effect is negated, and very many cards do that, then that would not stop it because, again, you would activate it at that turn, and that's a condition, awesome. not an effect. Chilling one, chilling two. But we've got our Yu-Gi-Oh! judges here to make sure that all that stuff happens fine yeah, and fair. The Pop is going to be able to push itself back into the Spell Trap zone. The Snake Eye Ash is going to be able to add a, a level one fire here. Likely just another Ash. That's all that's really left. And literally, it might be the only thing left at this point. But... Yep. That is enough to put out a Flame Burge by using the effect of Ash, and maybe that'll be enough to get shipping through this game. It is true that while <laughs> Robina by itself really isn't that threatening, if any of those face down cards can get you back in the game, at least that means that you'll have that banished and kind of can begin your Fluandere's turn from there, regardless of who turned it is. So let's think about damage at this point. Remember, Ryan is at actually 8,500 points of life because of the advent. That is true. The advent does give you an additional 500. And we are not getting quite close to time, but that 500 life points could be important. Uh, our judges are likely keeping track of that. But it is true that once you activate that, for those of you at home watching, the 8,000 on the screen should be 8,500. The Appaloosa is, I believe, at 16 after using one of its uh, effects. That is correct. Shunping earlier said in the duel that it was a three material Appaloosa. So using one, that would bring it down to 1,600. All right. How do we find the damage? How do we find 8,500 in this turn? I mean, the game is built around 8,000, so you would have to just put a little bit extra on the board. Uh, might be time for something like Amblo Whale, right, going all the way in. But obviously, you know, you've still got to get those base combos out. So, oh, looks like we're banishing. All right. So this is a play I expected. Flame Bridge likely used its effect targeting the Rabina to put it in the Spell and Trap Zone. Advent chained and so banishing the Robina as cost, but met with an Ash Blossom as well. So really limiting Ryan's resources, putting him on Draw Bird. Definitely has to draw a bird, just has to pray for it. And we've had yeah, various Ash decks, Ash you know, that mm -hmm. if they get that one Ash card Ash they well, need, the entire Ash. turn changes. Um, maybe it's two, yep. Flame Bird's gonna be able to put back that Poplar here, just gonna be able to generate more resources for Shu and as soon as Ryan is not unable to so get his engine going. But there is one set yeah. remaining. I wonder what it could be. Ooh. We are drawing here. A lot of damage taken, but all it takes is one normal summon here to get Ryan off to the races. Well, hopefully we get to see that face down card. Took a little check at it, thinking about activating it. Take a look at the graveyard here. As long as it's not Rabina, I think. As long as you're not drawing Rabina, you should be fine. That's great one. Oh, yeah. 
Sure. We're gonna so go we're ahead gonna, and negate. We're going to cut off the Rabina here. Okay, that maybe it isn't that great of a one. Because you can get a tribute summon, but it's not going that far. You can at least crash with the Appaloosa now, but I don't think you have that much life to work with anymore. And it is a little scary. Obviously, you know, we've seen turns where people have to use their battle phase to clear a monster from the field that can negate card effects, but it doesn't usually turn that duelist's way, right? That's kind of a symbol that you're not able to play through their strategy, so you just have to push through it and then give them another turn. And sometimes giving your opponent another turn is your last turn. Ryan really considering his last set card here, the only unknown in this game at this moment. Really thinking about I got a little bit of a peek. It definitely looks like it's a spell card. Yeah, right. yep. okay. uh, crash. yeah we're going to crash with the Appaloosa here. 800 to 800. Ruby, uh, the Eaglin will be banished by its own effect. Good. End phase. Yep. Yep. A Flamer is going to be able to use its effect to bring out the Poplar during the end phase. Going to be able to grab another copy of... Or Okay, no. We're going for the Snake Eye Chase. Again, Shunping has been using so many of, like, basically the entire package of cards, right? Not just relying on the strongest of them, but also the ones that are versatile in different situations, and it may pay off here. I mean, at this point, you have Flame Bridge and a monster, and you have targets in the graveyard, so you can just... i ah, just doing it. <laughs> Put Diabell into the back. First one. Yep, it places Diabell Star in the Spell and Trap Zone. And then during the end phase, you can banish it to actually move something from the spell trap zone uh, up into the monster zone. Certainly, when we talked about Crystal Beast earlier, I think you have a, a certain promise that we're honoring, right? A little Crystal Promise, because it's true. We haven't seen this back and forth of monsters from the Spell and Trap Zone to the main monster zone since, well, Centurion, right? But this is a lot more active than that. Centurions even are so interesting because they're continuous traps. They are continuous traps. And there's certain situations where that could come up. Oh, and we have the Snake Eye Ash as well. I, oh, we knew that because it was added off the previous Snake Eye Ash. I don't think it has any targets left in the deck to add. But we are able to go into Nightmare Phoenix to really clear that last uh, unknown resource here. Phoenix. Time to find out what it is. One. Doesn't want to discard it, but has to do it. Uh, discards the Flame Bridge. The Flame Bridge is live at this point, so that's another extra value. Yeah, we got it. Amen. And GG, that's the Ryan game. will concede here. It was a Dreaming Town, not able to get those what summons off. Eaglin was... I guess the only bird that didn't work in that scenario. Well, the Nightmare Phoenix was a bird that definitely worked. Of course, it's a fiend monster card, but it certainly has the shape of one. And once he was able to clear that out, that did spell the game. But really cool to see that Fluandries is still good. We might end up seeing some of the teammates at the YCS next week playing Fluandries because it does really play through this deck in a great way, especially when it does get that Dimension Shifter. Absolutely. I mean, it didn't get it this round, but we saw how powerful it could be. Even through the Dimension Shifter, I guess that's how Shuping really built his strategy. You think he built it with something along the lines of Dimension Shifter in mind? Because there were so many summons that were not typical to the actual Snake Eye strategy, but more so generated by off the back of the value of Parallel Exceed. <laughs> yeah, and it goes to show you, once a Link Summoner, always a Link Summoner, using some great stuff, but obviously the Parallel Exceed, jumping on the back, opening up the Overlay Network, and showing off just that amazing Infernal Flame Banshee. It's, it's wild. I forgot that card existed, and I think we all did until we got to see it, but being able to add Pyro Monsters is very strong right now, and Shunping showing why he is still in this tournament and still eligible. We have seen it used twice to access Snake Eye Burst, but do you think it's ever used as a starter to try to add uh, Snake Eye Poplar? I think you certainly can. I'm definitely going to try that oh, yeah, duel when I get that. home because, <laughs> honestly, yeah, Parallel Seed sounds like a lot of fun. And it's another thing we don't have bonfires, and not every duelist does have bonfires. This is a way for you to get back in the game without having to worry about that. Or, hey, maybe you'll have some luck on Maze Millennium Pools next time. Shoot, going to be able to move on with a record 2-2. Two and two. A little bit of sweat, you know. A little bit of sweat. That gives him six points in the tournament. We have two more rounds, so he's eligible to win a total of 12 points. 12 points might get you to day two. It might not, but at least Shun Peng is hanging in there. He's just got to kind of win out from here, take it one duel at a time. We've been in this position before, right? If you're not down and out yet, then you just have to go as far as you can. You absolutely do. It's one of those things where sometimes, you know, the tournament, you just really got to play it out. All of our competitors here are going to be sticking it out, too, for that top eight prizing. So even if Shunping doesn't win out from here, he still has an ability to do that. But yeah, everybody's had their back to the wall. It's one of those things where even if you've won and you've gone undefeated, we've also seen people immediately lose in top cut. So every duel is important. Yeah, that's the thing, right? You feel a lot more comfortable being undefeated in the tournament, but once you're in top cut, it's completely reset. I can tell you, 
I have gone into the tournament losing the first two rounds, and I just decided to commit to playing anyway because I didn't really feel like I, I came all the way here. I want to play out the rest of the tournament. I got 32nd. I got to play. I lost immediately. It didn't matter, but I still played it out, and you still make that top cut sometimes. No, you still do. And the other thing, too, is regardless of what happens, all of these duelists are ultimate duelists for a reason. They're likely going to be going to YCS Las Vegas, and if not, they'll be competing in a future championship. So this is really good experience because there has never been so much on the line. There has never been so much for grabs, and you're playing against people of equal skill. This literally gives you some of the best experience you could possibly have as a duelist. Yeah, I would say that this tournament is oddly more competitive than any other tournament that you'd play anytime soon. I don't think Vegas will be as refined, and uh, anyone playing Vegas is lucky to be able to watch this because they're going to be able to get so much valuable information from these 16 duelists. No, I know. This is really, honestly, great from the commentator's desk, too, because now I know exactly what we'll be seeing from some of the Fire King and Snake Eye duelists as well, which has really just been a great masterclass. Although you're right, I would have loved to see some Voiceless Voice. Maybe they're still out there somewhere in the tournament. Why do you think Voices Voice was less popular in this tournament? It, it's one of those things where, you know, without, I'm not saying anything bad about the strategy, but it's true that they have a linear form of protection, right? You mm -hmm. get your Skull Guardian out, you get your low prayers of the Voiceless Warriors, you get your barrier protections, etc. And it's a really good defensive wall. And then if that wall breaks, you have to have a backup plan. And with the Sinful Spoil Snake Eye strategy, they're able to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. We saw that exactly in this duel, because M-Pen feels very much like a wall, too, mm -hmm. that you have to break through. But at this point, we're going to go ahead and go down to our stage, I believe, so we can go have an interview with our player. First off, congratulations on your victory. And uh, how did it feel to win your match? Uh, it was definitely a scary matchup, so um, I feel lucky for sure, uh, not getting shifter like only once in game three. So yeah. Um, why did you choose the deck that you've used throughout this tournament? Has it worked for you very well? Or? Yeah, I think like with the new supports from Phantom Nightmare, all the Snake Eye cards are definitely like one of the best cards in the format. So yeah, they've been performing well. I just unfortunately was losing to time in the past couple rounds. And. Uh, how did you per how did you personally uh, prepare for this match? Uh, so this match specifically, I was playing against one of my friend in my area uh, multiple times, like every tournament almost. So I'm very familiar with how uh, flu my opponent's deck really works, and I think that's the very key of uh, how I actually get an edge on this matchup specifically. And uh, was there something that stood out to you in this match? Uh, it was just being lucky and dodge the shifters, and uh, which I did for game one and two. Game three, I got a shifter, but my hand was very good and was able to just play into it. Right, awesome. Well, thanks again and congrats. Thank you. I think that answers your question then. You were wondering, does Shun Ping have advanced knowledge and how he's supposed to combat Fluanderese? Yes, he does. His friends play it, and it's good to have that. So that's why you got to get your community testing and getting all those different decks, not just the best deck, but all the possible matchups that you might run into. Yeah, the experience really showed in that game there. I think it's one of those things that really more experienced players, more veteran players, they just have that advantage because they've constantly played, even if they're not practicing against this deck right now, they probably played against it in the past and they just have that knowledge just backed in. Cause it's not like you forget every time you start a new series or you get a new set, even though you're focusing on all these other strategies, those decks that you've played throughout the history of the game are still there. You have those memories and you can just bring them back whenever you need to. No, that definitely pays off. Certainly we've seen lots of Fluanderies at the top tables before the Yu-Gi-Oh Championship Series. So that definitely helped and having recent matchup knowledge with that was good too. Unfortunately, Ryan likely will not be eligible for that top four cut, so we'll have to say farewell to our Fluon de Riz friends. But at the same time, he's still going to be eligible for that top eight, so he definitely will be competing, trying to banish as many graveyards as he can. Yeah, hopefully he'll get a little bit luckier. But uh, we'll have to see as we go on into the next round. Oh, and let's go ahead and talk about our charity drive details again to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. Konami is hosting a charity sweepstakes with some amazing prizes. Participants will have the chance to win one of a multitude of prizes, all while benefiting Medicine Sans Frontiers, that's Doctors Without Borders. Now, listen closely to the details. Participants who donate 10 US dollars or more will receive one entry into the highest tier that their donation makes them eligible for. So read the website closely because there are different tiers, but you also get an entry for all subsequent lower tiers as well. One 130 lucky winners will be chosen at random, so please donate. It goes to a great cause, and you'll get some awesome prizes along the way. I'm really looking forward to putting my number in there for the Slifer. I think I really just need to finish my collection on that one. So I'm hoping I get a little lucky, but it's for a good cause anyway, so I don't really mind either way.
Well, if the slide for the Sky Dragon goes missing, I think I know who to chase down. But it is an amazing prize. So again, please donate if you can. We're very thankful for all the donations that have come in, but we'd be equally thankful for even more. And it just goes to show you, again, that message about you know, Doctors Without Borders, almost said a Duelist mm. Without Borders, but it is true. We have international players, we have interpreters out there helping those who speak different languages other than what our judges and, and players are speaking. And it goes to show you, you see a picture of that Mist Valley Apex Avion, and like the words are perfectly in your mind, and it shows you that we really do all speak the same language. You see that pot of greed, we all make the jokes, what does it do? You know exactly what it does, and that's because we all speak this language that is the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. Yeah, I've played this game with so many people at, at this point, and I feel like the majority of my friends aren't even from where I'm from at this point. I know people from all across the United States and even some of the more Latin players here are some of my best friends in the world. And it's because of this game and the memories that we've shared and the travels that we've done. So it's really exciting to be able to support something like this. It really is, it really is. And again, you know, I know we're pushing the charity donations, but you really should donate to that cause again for all the different fabulous prizes. But we also have all of our fabulous competitors. So here's the thing. We still have rounds and rounds and rounds, so now it's gonna get down to the wire. You've competed at the top tables. What does it feel like when you're going to those last few matches and you're on the bubble? I think the pressure really hits, and especially you know when you don't have the luxury of having a few losses available to you, you really start feeling the pressure, and you start taking less risks on it, I wanna say. You can take more risk when you have a loss to give, but now players have to play really tight, and because that, that kind of changes your mindset, right? Sometimes you just want to make the safe plays, but that doesn't always win you the duel. Sometimes you have to take those risks, so hopefully these players are experienced enough to know when to make that call. No, absolutely. Sometimes it, yeah, the saying is go big or go home, right? And sometimes you want to be conservative. You see that face down card, and other times you're Shunping, right? You just normal summon the Nightmare Phoenix. And what if it was one of the oldest school cards in the book, Torrential Tribute, right? But he went in, he decided he was going to get rid of that face down card, and that carried the duel. And so that's what's really going to determine who takes that ring home or not. When you're able to make those conservative decisions at the right time, like you said, and when you're able to just go in and make this happen. Yeah, I think one of the key things that really makes these players better than everyone else is they're able to make those decisions on the fly and they know even if they are one loss away from losing everything, they are still going to make the same play they've been making at any other point in the tournament because they know it is the correct one objectively, even if it is a little bit riskier or it could lose to X amount of things. It is true that technically speaking, there is nothing different about the duel out there except what's in your mind, right? It's still cards, it's still effects, it's still a game. But when you're there, you have to like push that back. You have to get that brain, you know, fog out of your head and only think about, okay, I'm gonna do this like I did in practice. And that's really what Shun Ping did. He saw the dimension shift that we heard from him and he was just completely fine. It's like, yeah, apparently it wasn't that big of a deal. Just summon, 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 and you're good. And that's really what you gotta do. You just gotta swing that back like you did in practice. Now the Snake Eye strategy, again, I didn't think was going to be that capable of playing around Dimension Shifter. And you know, it's one of those cards that's supposed to be the end all be all. You activate it and your turn ends, right? You just have to wait till the next turn. We saw that Parallax Seed was a key part in that, being able to avoid the actual Snake Eye cards and just really focus down on the Link Monsters in your extra deck. How else would you go about targeting down something like Dimension Or I mean, not even targeting it down, but just dealing with those kind of strategies. I think it's probably pre-planning and making decent combo lines. Think about it, when you mention these game-ending cards, we've seen a lot of game-ending cards, even from the same tin. Nibiru of the Primal Being is also supposed to shut down duels, and we've seen multiple rounds throughout this tournament where they're just not worried about it. But speaking about being worried about it, we're gonna go ahead and toss it back to Kangas over on the stage to announce our next players. Yep, we're going right to the next round. Thank you very much, Caster, as we're getting ready for the next round. So introducing on the red side, engineering his victory, Rudolf von Landwest Rodriguez. Rudolf hailing from, I want to say, yeah, Santa Cruz, Bolivia. His favorite card, Heavy Metal Flows Electromite. I wonder if he won with that Pendulum strategy back when it was popular back then. This is one of the ones that did, had a little bit less coverage, so you couldn't even get to see, but there were so many UDS tournaments out there. A lot of champions that we hear less about, but you know they're here for a reason. Absolutely. Be nice to see Heavy Metal Flows Electromite, but we'll save that for Master Duel. But we still have a competitor. Let's see who our number two duelist is. And his opponent on the blue side, he's come here to box, Oscar Alexis Vargas Martinez. Yeah, his nickname Canelo, because he does seem a little bit familiar. He is from Mexico, favorite card, Utopia Double. He won the very last UDS Invitational available in Bogota, Colombia. Oh, and Utopia Double is such a fan favorite card. We've seen various high level tournaments being won just off of that card using double or nothing. But our players are here, they're getting ready. So what do you think these two duelists are gonna be doing against each other? So I know that 
Oscar is again playing something we haven't seen in quite some time, but not, again, a really scary strategy that, you know, you know, for a couple of Forbidden Limited lists ago was the most demanding strategy okay, in the field. Okay, I know what you're getting at, and I'm certainly sure some of our nuanced fans in the chat are knowing as well. That's going to be interesting, too, because this gives us a second look at what, well, Fire King Sinful Spoils or Fire King Snake Eye is going to do against, well, no graveyard. At least it's not going to be that easy anymore. It's not one card in the extract that's going to be removing every single card from the game and just putting every card in the banished. But, you know, you still have access to cards along the Dimensional Shifter, probably, in his strategy. But we just saw from Shunping's duel that, well, Dimension Shifter is not the end-all be-all. But it was also true that Shunping was playing some very heads-up cards using the entire Dia Bellstar lineup of all the different Sinful Spoil Snake Eye cards and using that Parallel Exceed to show that, well, I'm not really worried about, you know, one particular answer. Answer. Now, we are going to be seeing, I believe, the f we saw the Kirin in the deck being shuffled. So it's going to be the Fire King Snake Eye strategy here. So a lot more graveyard reliant, I'd say, at this point. Certainly more so than just the traditional straightforward Snake Eye deck. A judge is just getting the players set up, making sure they understand everything going on there. And so again, this is just an incredible production. You know, make sure in the chat, make sure to thank everybody who's working on this because this is this is an incredible showcase and I don't think we've ever done anything like this. So hopefully we get to do it again sometime. But for now, we're going to focus on this duel. The players seem just as focused too as they shuffle and cut across the table. Now, if we're talking about strategies, obviously there's enough to say about the Fire King one. But when we look at Oscar's strategy, I think this is a more interesting pick than the Fluandry strategy as well because the Fluandry strategy is one that still loses to a lot of the same cards that are being used to target down the fire strategies, right? right. The Droll and Lockbirds, the Effect Veilers, the Infinite Impermanence, they're all very powerful. Not so good against Kashira. Not so good against Kashira. Let's go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and let the players know, or rather let the fans know that that's what we're going to see. Kashira, I still think, is a great deck. It's true that it has a different vibe to it, but it doesn't care what's happening. If it's banished, even if it's banished face down, that's what it wants to do. But Fire King, not so much. You're right that we're not just seeing the Kashira Arise Heart just slam down on the table and end everything, but it's still a good deck that keeps the graveyard at bay, and that might actually carry Oscar through the duel. So we're going right into game one of our next round here, the undisputed Ultimate Duelist series. Now, Kashira obviously wants to go first, but it's been historically really strong at going second, and I don't think it really cares as much about what the opponent's gonna do. It just wants to rely on powerful spells to really break it apart. Now, you didn't miss anything. Our players just set their hands down. Those sort of five set spell and traps on either side. <laughs> Looks like Rudolph's going first, though, with Fire Kings. All right, that is definitely ideal for Rudolph. I think he threw his plays a little bit. Doesn't seem like it's going to be as simple of a start for him. Oh, no, it might be Oscar. Because we did not get to see the die roll this time, so just waiting for somebody to drop a card. There we go. So it is Oscar. And then we're going to be leading with the Fenrir. So this brings us to an interesting point in the Kashira strategy. There has been a popular combo lately where you were able to add the Kashira Rise Heart, normal summon it, key, key part here, normal summon it, and then go into, uh, after using its effect, of course, into a Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack, and then just being able to link off the tokens, make two copies of Link Spider into uh, Earth Golem G or whatever. And That's incredible. I thought we got rid of Aurora Dawn. <laughs> Joking, of course, but it's true that those tokens being able to be used as links really gives something else to the Kashira package. It's not just about Xyz summoning, as long as, just like you said, you don't use Kashira Rise Heart's effect. Yeah, Kashira Rise Heart only locks you into Xyz summoning if you special summon it from the hand. Same thing with Kashira Theosis. It will lock you into Xyz summoning for the rest of the turn after you use its effect on field. So you, as long as you avoid those, you are able to link summon. So you can go and use this combo to go into something uh, along the lines of Deco Takar Heat Soul, get a draw in, maybe climb a little bit further into an SP Little Knight or an Appaloosa, just to uh, protect your plays from something along the lines of Nibiru, and then just, again, do standard Kashira things, but sometimes just leaving the Kashira monsters on the field is a little bit more ideal, but it looks like we are going to be hitting a rank 7 here. Is it going to be the Shangri-La, or is it going to be Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack? Wow, Draco Sack. I haven't seen that hit the top table since 2013's NAWCQ, but it is definitely working itself out. Removing that material of Kashira Fenrir, and let's go ahead and see some tokens. Likely these tokens are going to be immediately linked off into a Link Spider each. 
Now, let's talk a little bit briefly about why you might want to have kept those Kashira monsters on the board, especially for our viewers who ha maybe haven't seen Kashira on the top tables in a while. Each of those monsters has an effect that can activate after your opponent uses one, and it banishes something face down. With the Fenrir, it would have banished a monster face down or a card that was face up from the field. With the Unicorn, it would have snatched a card from the extra deck face down. But looks like we're going for the Lynx instead, and it's just like what you said. Yep, the G Golem will bring back the Link Spider. Going to be able to use those two Cybers monsters, an Earth and a Water, into Heat Soul. Yep. Heat Soul's going to be able to pay a thousand life points. Going to be able to draw one card here. <coughs> Certainly great to see it. Haven't decided to make any other moves there. Certainly the Cash Tier of Birth, just getting that so fast, does give you the ability to special up another monster. That looks like we're doing that now with the Cash Tier of Fenrir in defense mode. Yeah, the Birth allowing you to just keep the most important Cash Tier being Fenrir. That is the one that actually removes a monster, or not a monster, any face-up card on the field. Unicorn being able to go after your extra deck has been really important in the past, but it looks like it might not even be a choice here. You're able to just get both. Just an incredible card, and it shows you, like, these cards were so powerful in last year's North America World Championship Qualifier. We saw lots of Cashier and Mirror matches, but Oscar's showing up and saying, no, this is still a good deck. So now, this play can leave you with a bit of a problem. You have now locked yourself into Link, or sorry, Xyz monsters, and you've left up the Heat Soul and the Draco Sack. You could have gone into Appaloosa, but you're opting to prioritize the draw here. If your opponent has a copy of Nibiru, the Primal Being, your entire field might disappear. Certainly, but maybe he's not worried about Maybe he just banished those Nibiru of the Primal Beings with Cash Tiro Rise Heart's effect of banishing those top three cards face down. Yeah, I suppose if they were in the top of the deck, I don't think either player was really worried about them at this point. Passing that over for a quick cut. Certainly yeah. big Master Duel vibes. Anybody who's recently been playing that has definitely seen this field pop up, and it's just great to see that Draco sack again at the top tables. I believe the Rise Heart and the Unicorn will now be overlaid for a copy of Kashira Shingrei Ra. There it is. So on the opponent's turn, or sorry, just during the standby phase, Shingra will trigger to be able to special summon a Kashira monster from the deck, getting back that unicorn. No. Uh, heat Soul priority in the draw phase, or not priority, but like uh, once past priority. Right, so for a low, low price of 1,000 life points, drawing an extra card there. That does put Oscar at 6,000. And now in the standby phase, we are free to use the Shingira. Now I wonder if we're pulling some heartstrings in the chat. Is this the first time many of them have been cheering for Kashira? I I feel like it's more likely that they're rooting for Fire King at this point. It's true, it's two heavy hitting decks that do a lot going up against one another. And sometimes that can feel monolithic, right? You're staring up at these big Kashira monsters, you're staring at these big Fire Kings, and you're not sure what you would do. It's time to see what they do against each other. I just don't know anyone that likes Kashtira, man. I love Kashtira. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> it's just a cool deck. You know, you look at all the art and you see them converting all of those, you know, parts of the different planets into those face down cards. Yeah, I guess the lore wise, it's cool. Uh, sitting across from it <laughs> is just a different experience entirely. Yes, it's great when you're Kashtira Rise Hard, it's bad when you're everybody else. Rudolph really pondering his opening play here. He's going to be leading with the Snake Eye Ash. It's going to be able to resolve, going to be able to get the Poplar, trigger the Poplar, but the yeah, Fenrir is going to be able to go after the Ash immediately if he wants to, and then Unicorn's going to be able to go after a card in the extra deck from the Poplar. Now, we've seen a lot of commonality between all of these extra decks on the Fire King uh, Snake Eye side. What is it that you would go for first? I feel like if I was doing the Unicorn, I would desperately want to go ahead and grab the Link Karibo to maybe stop any of the dodging, but what about you? Mm. I mean, yeah, I think any one of is probably what you want to go for. If you see that there's only one copy of Promethean Princess, you absolutely go for true, that. True, true. But outside of that, maybe just it's any really form of removal. Like, I, I think something along the lines of World Seas Atlantis could be a really mm. easy pickup because uh, okay. one of the more Quick powerful point. resources that oh, so the Kashira strategy has against the Fire King strategy specifically is the rank okay. 7 okay. in... Uh, let's see if he uh, even plays it here. Oh, no, surprising to see it not here, but the Harmonizer. Oh, Harmon I love Harmonizer so much. And considering that it benefits from having different attributes attached to it, if the only attribute you're staring at fire, well, it's a really easy fix to go ahead and grab one of those cards from the graveyard, slap it underneath Harmonizer, and then just be safe from there. Yeah, Zalantis makes it a really easy out. You're able to banish them, uh, the monsters, if someone in the pack in face-down defense position, making it really easy to go after. But 
outside of that, it's that's a little tricky. Certainly is. But now we're staring things down. Rudolph's got to make a decision here with four cards in hand. And you can feel how tense both these duelists are. Going after the Little Knight, that's always a strong target as well. Certainly, certainly so. It keeps any of your own monsters from being banished from the field. And to a degree, it keeps your Xyz materials safe. Because if those Xyz monsters leave the field, well, those materials are going to detach themselves. Shingra could have locked a uh, zone there because a card was banished face down. We haven't seen zone blockers on the top tables in a while either. Según yo, este tendría que resolver, ¿no? En resolución. He's uh, declaring the effect of Shingra uh, to lock the zone now. I banished uh, one card from yeah. him. I'm asking from the timing to activate this card. So it's absolutely true that you can basically keep slapping on those, well, zone blockers, right? It, what it is, is every time there's a card oh, okay. that's banished face down, Kashitira Shengala Aiba is going to be able to lock a zone. What I mean by that is no card can be played in that zone. So chain link one Shengri Ra, or sorry, chain link I'm one Poplar, uh, chain link two oh. Shengri Ra uh, from nope. its trigger, okay. and then now on the last yeah. bit of the chain, Ghost Mourner is going to be using its effect on the Poplar because it was summoned in this chain. Ghost Mourner is certainly a great card for all stages of the duel. That extra effect damage really can help sometimes. On a Poplar, it's probably okay. You can take it a little bit. But hey, anything more than zero. <laughs> Every life point counts, as we've seen for some of these duels ending in time, unfortunately. Just so hesitant to make a move. And understandable, Kashtira, again, monolithic, giant, level 7 monsters with huge stats and powerful effects. Yeah, it seems like Kashtira Unicorn has been used, but we still have yet to use... Uh, oh, actually, probably the Fenrir went after the Ash Blossom, and then that's when the, uh, the <laughs> Kirin was used in the hand. Reminiscent of a Unicorn, but not quite. Certainly a lot of Kirins floating around since uh, the last couple of months. So we are going to go ahead and make sure we calculate that effect damage, because we did have Poplar leave the field. I believe it's 700 damage. Cause I think it is 789, right? 700 from Poplar, 800 from Ash, 900 from Oak. But uh, Poplar is going to be able to put its, uh, or itself or the Ash in the Spell and Trap zone. It looks like there is going to be another card in the chain. Oh, nope. Uh, okay, so we are now going to be using the Diabell Star to get rid of the Flame Burge here. In a new chain, we're going to be able to activate the Flame Burge to summon back those two level ones in the graveyard, and Diabell Star is going to be able to set a Sinful Spoil spell or trap. Well, finally getting in, certainly don't have to worry as much. That is one of the, the technical weaknesses here. Once you get rid of all those scary Kashira effects, notice there's not really much left that's active on that board, right? We've already used Kashira Shangri Ira to special summon. We've already used Unicorn and Fenrir. Draco Sack isn't doing anything except getting ready to make tokens next turn. And we've also used Decode Talker Heat Soul's draw effect. So at this point, Rudolph basically can play unmitigated unless there's some point of interaction in Oscar's hand. See, I was about to say he should probably activate that Sinful Spoil spell right now, while he only had two cards in his graveyard, because Kashtira Birth, if you activate a spell card while the Kashtira Monster's on the field, you are able to banish three, exactly three, cards from the graveyard. Well, he may not be thinking about it, but now he is. Okay, well, now you don't have to worry about it anymore. Going for straight into Nightmare Phoenix, going to eliminate the Kashtira Birth, and I think going for that game shot is extremely easy now. All interruptions are used. It's just any other points of interaction from Oscar's hand at this point. That's it's a really clear uh, line from Raging Phoenix into the Zalantis. Absolutely. Looks like both Oscar and I were confused. We saw the bonfire and thought it might be a spell, but you're right. It was the Nightmare Phoenix discard to go ahead and get rid of the birth. Getting rid of the birth is super important, right? You no longer have access to those extra free normal summons of a level 7 monster. You don't have the spell being able to be banished from the graveyard. You do not have the ability to special summon either. Either. So it means that if we can't finish this turn from Rudolph's side, there's at least less follow-up on the other end. Rudolph, however, playing, uh, sequencing this entire turn extremely well, knowing how to get the Poplar value toward the end there. Didn't use it in the beginning because he knew he was going to be able to summon it back with the Flame Bridge, making the Nightmare Phoenix not taking any risks. And then after that, being able to put it in the Spell and Trap Zone off of its own effect, sending it for the Sinful Spoils, getting access to the Ponyx. And it seems like you were barely interrupted at all. Holding on to those last two cards, but at this point, we 
really, if you're cheering for Rudolph, you need to see those Kashira monsters go to the graveyard fast. Now, it's a little harder to get rid of Kashira Shangra Ira because of its protection effect from detaching materials, but any one of these monsters left on the field can really get you back in the game, right? Kashira Fenrir could grab something, Kashira Unicorn could do the same, but now we're going to see Fire King Island, right? And still thinking, though. I mean, he might want to go uh, into something along the lines of Appaloosa just to try to protect his plays a little bit more. Because... Princess? Oh, okay, he's going to go straight into Princess. He did have a line, uh, if he wanted to just play around Nibiru exclusively, mm -hmm. go into Appaloosa and then uh, make the Zalantis, but never you actually use its effect? Well, he might be confident regardless of the Nibiru thinking to himself, honestly, it would be kind of cool if we lost all the monsters on my opponent's field because then that would be an easier way to get through Kashtira. Shangra Ira, but instead we're gonna go ahead and move it to the spell and trap zone and send those materials to the graveyard. So that's already one monster out of the way. We can activate the Sanctuary now. There are only two cards in Oscar's hand. Even if it was Nibiru the Primal Being, that's not a card you really want to resolve as a Kashira player. You need to clear be able to clear your own Nibiru if you want to start playing, unless you have another copy of Kashira Birth. No, absolutely. So just depends. Oscar's still thinking. He doesn't seem like he's downtrodden or out of the duel, just sort of watching his opponent, making sure that each of those moves is something that he may want to jump in on. But we're going back in the deck here and grab an Aegor Runix. So, okay, this is uh, something that I'm a little bit surprised to see. Uh, because you could have gone straight for Arvada here if you wanted to just kind of skip this line, because now the Kieran has to summon the Grunix in your hand anyway, because the Ponix is on the field, and you're not allowed to use the Link Rebo because you are under Promethean Princess, so unfortunately you will not be able to do uh, that. We can't do that. You absolutely cannot. But it wouldn't be an issue as long as you didn't activate the Grunix, because the Kieran could summon the ah, Grunix. Este no bajar el link ah, the there we go. No hablas yo, but I definitely understood you cannot mm -hmm. Link Karibo right now because it's a dark monster, and Promethean Princess has locked you in a fire as well. It's on the field. It's <laughs> time to mano. <laughs> So we're just going to make sure everybody puts those cards back. It's okay. It's considered what's called an illegal activation, but it's not a big deal. So uh, depending on the chain links here, this could make quite a big difference because you then wouldn't have been able to resolve the Kirin. Mm -hmm. So as long as Kirin was chain link two, you're able to resolve it and summon the Grunix anyway, and it would just resolve essentially the same way. Certainly, and I think that's why we're going to place the Grunix there. But let's take a look at the graveyard. Okay. Go so we're going to be able to at least send the Arvada now, or rather destroy. Feels like Sen, but it actually is Destroy, which is pretty cool. It's what makes this deck so unique, destroying yeah. directly from the deck. Keep in mind, destroying from the deck does not send it from the deck, so you cannot Ash Blossom. That's true. It's a nuanced difference in the language there. It looks like that last card is Snake Eyes Birch as well, so it's another additional extender uh, if he ever needs it. But at this point, I think the game's pretty simplified. Uh, you're not super worried about something along the lines of Nibiru. You're just going to go for it at this point. Yep. Certainly Oscar's a patient duelist, but I could not imagine him holding the bureau until just this moment. I mean, yeah, I suppose he had, like, the way things have gone, he didn't really need to until... He doesn't need to until the very end. He needs to hope that it's a game shot that he can to Biru. <clears throat> Certainly paying attention, obviously caught the Link Karibo just as fast as we did. Oh, hey, it's Zelantis. Yep, it's time to go for the play. You're going to be able to summon back the Kashira monsters. Probably face down, doesn't really matter, though. They, it's either face down defense position or face up attack position. But you're going to be able to summon every monster back. Use the effect of Promethean Princess because a monster was special summoned to your opponent's side of the field. It does not have to be that they special summoned it. It just has to be special summoned to their side of the field. Princess will be able to destroy one fire monster you control, monster they control. And then, because your fire monster was destroyed, you get to trigger that Raging Phoenix, summon itself back, gain all the attack of that monster you destroyed, and able to just keep it going. And then, of course, World Sea Dragon has another effect in the battle phase. Based on how many monsters are co-linked on the field, you are able to destroy up to that many cards on the field. It's such an incredible card, but it is kind of funny that one of the best cards in the Fire King deck is a water monster. We got to see how good it was earlier in Jesse Cotton's duel doing the same thing to replace all the monsters on the board. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and splash. You can almost imagine World Dragon, or excuse me, World Sea Dragon Zelantis splashing down the field, all the monsters just flying up into the sky and then dropping down in these different zones. The only thing I'm worried about is, does he have enough zones? Uh, because he will not be able to summon the Raging Phoenix because uh, the Princess will take up that zone, but I don't think it matters. I think this is just enough damage anyway. Certainly helps uh, not having those Xyz materials anymore anyway. So obviously the Cashier monsters have been reset, but they've already used their effects this turn, yeah, so they cannot use their effect again. No, you put them Yep, opting to just destroy the Asher, knowing that he's not going to be able to use the Raging Phoenix anyway. Can he still try to 
to summon princes even if he don't have space? Yes, because when you attribute... Judges are explaining that, yeah, the princess is going to go to the graveyard. Summon princess when there's no main monster zone. Yeah, yeah. Can I read? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to confirm if you can activate princess with five monster zones already filled up. Because it would be destroying the monster and summoning it. Would the game recognize that there will be space available at resolution? Well, luckily, we have some of the greatest Yu-Gi-Oh! judges to ever judge the game here, so we'll find out shortly. Seems like that. Oh, are they saying you cannot? No, uh, maybe they're saying we can, but we haven't destroyed our fire monster yet. He might have chosen his opponent's card. And Oscar already sent it to the graveyard, but it seems like we're resolving it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it looks like we can. We got our answer. And it's going to be important here that Oscar had paid 2,000 life points already. In the battle phase, you are able to destroy likely both the Kashira monsters, and then the rest of the monsters can just go in and hit Oscar to the face, and that will be enough to clear up this game. Sort of a tidal wave to wash away all the Kashira. Yep. The sigh of relief when you're allowed to enter the battle phase. No activations were met. Up. Oh, okay. We're leaving up the Fenrir here. Yeah, cool. Yep, and that is enough. Oscar is going to hit the concede button, and we are going to move on into game number two. What an incredible matchup, though, getting to see both decks really execute their game plan, but obviously it wasn't enough on Oscar's side with Kashira. Not because the deck is bad, but just because, honestly, World Drag World Sea Dragon Zelantis is just that good. I mean, yeah, that's uh, kind of why I said if you couldn't hit the Princess, I would go after the World Sea Dragon, because I think your goal is to simply not lose that turn. Well, you, like, the effect of Little Knight, although very uh, potent, if they're using it to immediately banish a card on summon, you are not going to zero that turn. Exactly. They cannot attack directly. Yeah, they can't attack directly because of the effect. And so maybe this is going to change things. We'll learn a lot about Oscar as a duelist if when we get into the next duel, we see Kashira Unicorn pilfer through that extra deck and say, you know what? I'm not doing this ever again. We're going to save this world, see Dragon Zelantis aside. Yeah, and this really kind of just shows why Fire King is such a dominant strategy. It's able to like go through a few interruptions very easily it seemed like a very s strong board, but in the eyes of Fire King, it really wasn't much of anything. I know, I know. And me as a Kashira fan, I'm like, oh no, okay, I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board. But Oscar obviously did not get this far in the tournament, right? Still had two wins, two losses, and is eligible for the top four. So he must know what it is that he's got to do. But I don't think he was expecting that Zelantis, so that's certainly something to watch out for next time. That's the thing about the extra deck, specifically with Unicorn. You're able to snatch so many different monsters, and there's so many different choices, so it is hard to choose, right? I was probably going to go for the Link Karibo, but that may not have ended the duel for the right hand in there. You might have gone for the Zelantis. He went for the SP Little Knight. But those unicorn choices are going to be really important going through the next duel. I think what this really showed is that the Kashira engine alone is not enough to actually stop Fire King. And you really need to focus down on those powerful spell cards or just powerful non-engine in general. So maybe looking for something along the lines of Dimensional Fisher or just finding a Dimensional Shifter and really, uh, or again, Gravekeeper's Inscription. Oh, that Gravekeeper's Inscription. I'm going to have to go trade some cards when I get back to my locals because that is a really good card. That honestly could turn out to be something that is uh, widely played in future formats for sure. But it's not something we've seen here. So what do you think as a Kashtira player you need to possibly pop in from your side deck? Uh, I think you were just looking for maybe any powerful forms of trap cards. Maybe just kind of keep it down the line. If it's not great for inscription, Maybe more cards that do similar things, or just an anti-spell, a summon limit. True, true. It's great when you're playing a Kashira. I know everyone's saying, why is he saying it's great playing a Kashira deck? But it is because they've got their own game plan, but it's actually a relatively small skeleton of a deck. So you can fill in lots of different tech cards, lots of different things you can add to it, which is why we saw all kinds of things throughout the last formats, like Kashira, Vanquish Soul, right? Mm -hmm. And you can even play Kashira Tune just because of the level 7 synergy. So that means that all that space that Oscar has, he can use to access his side deck, put some cards in. He's cracking his knuckles there. Maybe he's got the answer. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. You know, it being one of Kashira's greatest strengths, it's also one of its greatest flaws how yeah. small the engine is. Because sometimes you just don't see any of them. Yeah, you, if you don't draw a Kashira monster, well, you're like, oh, well, I have some cards. But we'll see what he draws in game two of our round five of the Undisputed Ultimate Duel of the Series. Do you think he's going to take the lead again, or do you think he doesn't want to take that risk anymore? I guess we'll have to find out one way or the other, but I'm, I hate to say it, I would Somebody. love to see some Kashira action. So this is Oscar's last chance to All show right. it to us. That's, that, yeah, he's doing Kashira things. Is that a starlight on top of that? Mm -hmm. If you're going to be activating Shifter, you might as well do it nice. Definitely. 
I mean, that, that is exactly how you want to do it, too. <laughs> Shifter into Unicorn, the number one starter for the... Oh, into Birth. You don't even need Theosis immediately. Everything is good here, so we're going to go ahead, and maybe that means that the Kestira Theosis is in the hand, <laughs> but either or, we're going to probably slap down that Birth now. We do get that free normal summon of a level 7 monster, so maybe the Kestira Fenrir? It is a Kestira Fenrir. Hey! Perfect. And this is the thing, when you are already resolving Dimension Shifter, you don't need to do anything else. You don't really even need to touch your extract. You can just leave up those two guys, and that's probably enough. That probably is enough. I remember, Kashira Fenrir, for those who don't know what its effect is, although how could you? It's such a common and powerful card. It's going to be able to banish a m card that's face up on the other side of the field, and then Dimension Shifter is what got us in here, right? Until the end of the next turn, no cards are going to the graveyard. They are going to get banished instead. So we'll see how far Oscar decides to go, or if he just tries to keep most of his cards close to his chest. He just wants to have follow-up, right? I feel like unless you have maybe access to a Kashira Riseheart, you're probably going to end here. Maybe you would make a Kashira Shangra Ira and then special summon one of the other monsters back out. But I wouldn't want to do that if I didn't have access to that extra free level 7. It is, yes. it is strong to just have Kashira Unicorn and Kashira Fenrir. I mean, it would only... He summoned twice so far. Two more summons to keep you still under Nibiru range to just summon the Shangri Ira. I think it's worth it. And you Coast. get to hit three cards from the top of your opponent's deck, which isn't negligible. No, it honestly could be the three cards that he needs, especially since there are one ofs here and there. And we are going to go ahead and banish a Kashira card, so we're special summoning it. I think we are going to see that play. It's going to be just those four summons and then getting out before it gets ugly. Yep, and then putting out another Fenrir in the banished. At least this way, Birth can do something if he manages to keep the Fenrir on the field. You know, there's keeping little things available, right? So it looks like we're going to go ahead and banish those top three cards. Taking a quick look there. Didn't see Rudolph Grimace or anything, just taking note of those cards, so maybe it wasn't anything that was too big of a deal. Yeah, not really trying to lose the Flame Bridge, original Sinful Spoils, or even the Ponyx this early. Or maybe the Grunix. Oh, goodness, to yeah. To end phase. Looks like we're proceeding to end phase. We're just going to go with these cards. He made exactly the plays you expected, and I think the standby phase is going to have some fun cast your action, too. All right, it looks like two copies of Ash Blossom and inf Infinite yeah, Permanence, yeah, an four. Oak. Perfect. Eh, that's, hmm, how much do you, re uh, you probably ash that and then imperm the Fenrir, right? Okay, well. I feel like I would have taken the line of play that you did, right? If you ash blossom the Kashira, there's there's nothing that Kashira Fenrir could banish right now. So obviously that keeps it, you know, sort of muted. Then you use the infinite permanence on it and then begin your plays. It's either that or like, oh, well, I mean, hmm, even at that point, I probably would have asked it for several reasons because I, I think you might have to pass your turn. I don't think you're able to play into this right now. Well, it looks like we're going to go ahead and activate Bonfire. Sort of difficult, though, because even using the effect of Poplar to special summon it will put Kashira Fenrir in a position to gobble it up. So we pass the Poplar. I think maybe he can hear me. <laughs> Of course, the players can, but it is just the same line of thinking. Maybe I don't put that monster on the board so I can special summon it, because if I did, I might lose it. I wonder, uh, this is something I've seen a little bit niche, but some players have taken the opportunity to play, because you've summoned so many level one monsters, you can play a plethora of rank ones, right? Yeah. right? Oh Maybe no. something along the lines of the Lurilus that makes yes. it so you can't be destroyed battle, or even Kikinagachi Fucho. Oh, right, right. There are so many cool things. In the same way that we got to see Shunping Shun use various level four or rank four XCs, possibly using a rank one XCs would be just as neat. Okay. Looks like we probably need... Oh, we did not normal summon. Okay, so we did use this effect to special summon, so we are going to go ahead and banish it. Doesn't mean you don't get to access your deck, so let's go ahead and see what next card he pulls out. Is it going to be the temple? Uh, I do see temple in his deck. Thinking about it, thinking about it. Take a quick look at the hand for reference, and it's temple time. He's going to at least buy him some time, maybe. Still has those Ash Blossoms to try to keep him around, but uh, using the Ash Blossom after putting a card face up on the field, not ideal when there's a Kastir of Henry facing you down. All right, looks like we're going to go ahead and grab another Snake Eye from the deck, but you are absolutely right. Every time you are activating a monster effect with these Kastiras on the board, you're risking it, right? You're risking losing everything, and even though we don't have any cards in the graveyard now, it's true that eventually those are going to stack up, and Kastira Birth adds another problem to the mix. Honestly, I feel like you should at least take Solace and you got hit with Dimension Shifter when they were going first. So you have a game where you get to start and hopefully what doesn't happen again. True, true. Rudolph's in a good position from taking that first duel. 
Is that a copy of Nibiru in his hand? I think it is. And that's why he's setting and passing with an Ash Blossom Nibiru and not much else. That is the end of his turn. This is when I do normal special. Se pasa uno yep. Exactly. When a monster is normal special summoned by your opponent, you are able to special summon a monster that is a continuous spell in either spell and trap zone. I think that's a great example again of the sort of duelists without borders attitude, right? We can understand the duelists because you just you just know what they're doing. It helps I speak Spanish. Oh, okay, okay. Well there <laughs> we go. You could be my interpreter. There is the Ash Blossom now. The Fender will be able to go after either the Temple or the Snake Eye Ash there. Oscar immediately activating it. Taking a sec to think. Certainly could just grab another Cashier Unicorn. Oh, it's going to be a Rise Heart here. Interesting. Oh, so we didn't opt to actually go after one of the uh, face-up cards after the Ash Blossom. Interesting. I'm not sure he might be saving it for the attack. Remember, there are two ways that Cashier Fenrir can use that powerful effect. It's when your opponent uses an effect or when Cashier Fenrir attacks. I, don't, I think he wants to make his push now because he was been given. I mean, he knows what happens if you give Fire King a turn when they're able to access their graveyard, right? He doesn't have enough interruptions, and now it looks like the Snake Eye Ash is going to be able to hit the field and just put up some form of interruption, uh, or not interruption, but rather at least some bodies to protect yourself, while also generating some value, right? Certainly, do need protection when Cashier yeah. does get its game plan going. It is just a bunch of bruisers trying to beat you up, oh, no. but by having some defense mode monsters, at least the life points are a little safer. Certainly a lot of time on the clock, too. I don't think we're going to go to time Three. on this duel, but it just depends on who wins this one. Oh, yeah. I wonder if Ash is going to add another Poplar just to put more bodies on the field, or if you're not risking having both of your Poplars banished and you're just going to grab another copy of Snake Eye Ash at this point. Uh, maybe the right thing to do, because again, look at that banished pile. It's stacking up, and those face down cards are not coming back. So that is a zone that is being locked by the effect of Kastira Shengura. So again, for those of you at home, Kastira Shengura Ira, every time a card is banished face down, can pick a zone on the opponent's side of the field and lock it for being used. That face down card is not a token. It is just going to be used as our zone marker. So when you see a face down Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game card without a sleeve, you cannot be in that zone. Now the effect of Kashira Birth is activated to special summon uh, the banished Kashira Unicorn. Unicorn immediately activating its effect, going to be able to add a Kashira Spell or Trap from the deck, to, or sorry, Spell, just Spell, from deck to hand. I mean, it's good, it's good. We need a Kashira Ogre for the traps. <coughs> Oscar thinking about the next Kashira play. He has now Better summoned do, uh, twice. Uh, this is going to be number three. So it's got to be an attribute other than fire. We could see an appearance from Kashira Ogre. Uh, that one makes a lot of sense because it does have to be someone in defense position. The best one is the one that can attack while in defense position. Definitely, and it stops the effects of your opponent's monsters when they're battling. Does it also do piercing damage? I feel like it does. I feel like it might. It's been a minute since we've actually had that come up, but with those face down snake eye monsters having such low defense points, it's probably worth giving a look into Yu Gi Oh! Neuron. I need to, uh, do you have a calc? Oh, no, right? <laughs> <laughs> and survey so says... He's just trying to do some math really quickly. Looks like we're not doing any piercing battle damage on that one, but it is negating the monster's effects until the end of this turn. I don't know why, it just it gives the feeling that it would. You would think so. There's a lot of cool stuff that the Scareclaw stuff goes, and here's Scareclaw Cashtura, so you can see it at home. It's a great card, whether you're using it in a Scareclaw strategy or Cashtura. Hey, you could use both in a full-on Monodium combo. And then tribute summoning Vanity's Fiend. Okay, oh that's goodness. enough. <laughs> that'll do. That'll do. That'll do. Famous card that's going to prevent. That's the effects. No effects can be activated, right? No, no special summons oh, at it's all. Oh, special summons. Okay, I'm thinking the other one. Majesty's Fiend. Yeah. Majesty's Fiend. That's right. This is the classic, the original, straight out of, I want to say, Cyberdark Impact. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, we're celebrating 25 years of Yu-Gi-Oh! What a great way to do it by showcasing some of the greatest cards through the game's history. A card that limits play as much as that came out the same set as Instant Fusion, the one that starts almost everything. Cyberdark Impact was such an interesting set because you weren't sure what those cards were going to do at the time, but as the years went by, again, we're celebrating 25 years of this franchise, Cyberdark Impact one of the most, like, most impactful set we have ever seen. Yeah, truly, I think it was very underrated in its time. People had a lot of negative things to say about it, but we look back at it now, some of those cards 
have really stood the test of time. No, we were wrong then. We were wrong because it was one of the greatest sets ever released and showcasing an Oscar really showing why those cards are so good. Obviously, we've seen Instant Fusion throughout the years and even the Cyberdark strategy came back too. So now Rudolph hopefully just gets to go first and he knows he's playing against Kashira. He knows he likely doesn't have to deal with something along the lines of Nibiru, the primal being, because again, you don't want to have to resolve a Nibiru as a Kashira player. You want to have the open monster zone so you can special summon all those Kashira monsters because they require you to have no face up monsters on your side of the field or just no monsters in general, right? Exactly. And so it does give you like an incentive to use Nibiru if you wanted to stop your opponent's things, but it's a huge drawback in a way that almost no other deck interacts with it. If you control a card, you're not special summoning that Kashira Fenrir. You would have to rely on a Kashira person and the normal summon of a free level seven. With that in mind, I wonder if he's going to change his infield all how he's going to adapt, because I think that was one of the key things with this, this strategy. There is no set end board. We've seen a lot of different ones, right? We've seen a lot of uh, just different extra utility. True, without Kestura or Rise Heart, right? Not to be confused with Kestura or Rise Heart in the game. You don't really have a set game plan anymore. It kind of reminds me of the decks that have been flexible throughout the trading card game's history. Gladiator Beasts is a weird example, but that is a deck that just shows up and reacts to whatever's happening, and I feel like Kashira feels that role now. Yeah, and I wonder if the Fire King decks has to be the same way at this point, because when you know you're not playing against Fire King, or any Fire deck in that matter, you can just change your end board entirely just to counter exactly what your opponent is doing, because you don't have to worry so much about playing around those cards that are very specific to the mirror match. Exactly. You're not worried about them using a Hita to steal your monsters out of the graveyard. So all of a sudden, sure, let's put some fire monsters in the graveyard. That's fine. And so that does change your plan. So hopefully Rudolph is taking note of that, right? That he can change his lines of play because he doesn't have to be as conservative as he might have to be against a rival fire deck. And I think when you take Gravekeeper's Inscription into account, because I think that's something that these players have to do when you're playing against one of these decks, right? That's one of the few cards that gives them an advantage when able to play against your strategy. It's one of the reasons to play those decks. So instead of putting as much of your value in the graveyard like you normally do, you want to have as many interruptions on the field as possible. So if that means you have to end on the Appaloosa, you have to end on the IP, you have to make sure you have the Flame Bridge, you don't have to uh, go prioritize as much about playing around Nibiru, so you're maybe you're not doing the Arvada line, you're making sure to go for the Kirin line, just making sure you have as many ways to remove your opponent's monsters as possible, because how many Kashira monsters can they open? It's hard enough to open one. Can we just get rid of the one and the two and hope they'd have no way to continue? Well, usually as Kashira Duelist, that definitely is your concern, just like you said, because that package is so skeletal, there are so very few Kashira monsters in the main deck. And so as you're trying to draw it, we've seen duels at the top tables where you just didn't get anything, right? Maybe you put the Fenrir out, something happened to it, and you're like, well, I passed my turn. And if you don't draw one the next turn, or the next turn, regardless of if your opponent hasn't had a chance to really get to the game, they can just attack you with the one monster they have, and eventually you will lose that duel. I mean, yeah, we've seen that happen in the fire strategies as well. One Diabell star against the world. Oh, goodness. The double Diabell star earlier in the tournament today was just so fascinating to watch because it shows that when, you know, games can get simplified. You know, you, you imagine Yu-Gi-Oh! to be all these cards swiping back and forth on the table, but eventually you and your opponent trade resources back and forth over and over, and then you're back into that solid feeling that we've all been in where you're like, the fate of the world depends on this, and you just reach into the deck, draw your next card, and that's exactly what we're going to see here at Game 3 of Round 5 of our Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series. I have to imagine... Rudolph is going to want to lead here with that Diabell Star as well as Snake Eye Ash opening. That is the best opening you can have. It's what he used to start off the game one and able to conquer the Kashira field. I love how careful these duels are, just really making sure I'm not going to pick up my cards so the judges tell me to go ahead and get playing. Oh, wow. That might be one of the worst hands I've ever seen. Oh, no. That means Kashira might have a chance for those cheering for it. Because I think that last card is a copy of Flame Bridge, so it's Arvada Flame Bridge, Double Ash Veiler. That doesn't do much, but one card could get you in the game. Yeah, it looks like he's going to normal. This is weird, because this is a strong play into a lot of decks, because you're at least able to have one interruption. As strong That's as a it, stretch. Arvada Pass. Strong as a stretch. Hey, but Will think it? about it. We Seven already eight. know how small the Kashtira engine Seven. is and how fragile it can Seven. be. Imagine, technically, Arvada could get something done, but with the dimensional fissure on board and Seven. the pressure planet rate sought, we're going right to Kashtira Town, Good. unless Good. Ash Blossom is discarded. <laughs> and hopefully there are no monsters, but is that a call by? Is, are you going to chain call by right now? Just push up. Oh, no, okay. It's just, you know, summon Fenrir, and the game is over. Well, you wouldn't be able to call by, obviously, but yeah, the Fenrir is going to change things up here. Obviously, just doing some battle damage. Seven, seven. 
Seven. Yeah, you know that your opponent's hand is very weak here when you're able to just go into an Arvada pass. Thank no you. Snake Eyes to really speak of. Fenrir. And now you have Dimensional Fisher on lock. Fenrir, main phase two, just able to get access to your engine and just do everything you need to do in main phase two. You're not really worried about anything anymore. Absolutely. You know, Dimensional Fissure is such a powerful card. You know it could be a scary card when it's such a small sentence. Look at how few words of text are on that card. And those are usually the ones that are the biggest, the most powerful cards. Your Harpies, Feather Dusters, your Raigekis, or in this case, banishing all these cards instead of letting them go to the graveyard. Yep. Look at Oscar not committing anything else, knowing his opponent's hands weak, not at attempting to allow him to activate any of them. And uh, that was one of the strongest top decks you could get, a Snake Eye Ash. But into a Fenrir as well as Dimensional Fisher, I don't think it's going to be enough anymore. Rudolph certainly not slamming down that ash on the table until just now. Deciding what may happen here. He's just, he's just going to permanence. chain the Infinite Permanence, and then you're going to still be able to banish it with the Fenrir. You know that was the card from the top of the deck, otherwise it would have been summoned last turn. <laughs> and so there it goes. See you, All right, and that's going to be past the turn. Fenrir is going to be able to use its effect again. But it's going to be a little harder to summon those monsters now at this point without a copy of Kashira Birth. It is difficult because even if you search out the Kashira Unicorn, how are you going to get onto the field without Kashira Birth? So maybe grabbing the Kashira Rise Heart? <coughs> at this point, you can grab uh, Scareclaw Kashira, banish whatever with the Kashira Rise Heart, and then just uh, potentially add it back with a. Sorry, banish whatever you have with Kashira Scareclaw and then banish a Theosis to add it back. True, you can. Looks like we're doing a little slightly different sequencing. No, okay. Gonna banish the Most Kashira Birth. Right, you want to have that accessible, so at any point you're able to banish a Kashira Theosis, you can go ahead and add that back. Looks like we're gonna be losing a Poplar, a Kirin, as well as the Oak, I think. Banishing your own cards to get the back is not something we see in every deck, right? I think only like Branded Chimera is doing that right now, but that's certainly neat to see it. But the Ash Blossom is going to stop the attempt to do that with a Kashira Theosis. Well, now uh, if he was able to use Fenrir to add the Scareclaw Kashira, the Theosis is going to be able to just add back that birth. <coughs> He's thinking here. Uh, such a great, gorgeous card. Remember, for those of you hearing in the background the freeze play, that only applies to the rest of the tournament. Our match still has at least eight minutes left. Looks like he's going to be hitting the overlay network. Or, no, maybe just for oh, a tribute summon of Kashira Unicorn. Oh, but it's so good. You need that Kashira Unicorn so bad. Getting Kashira Birth is really integral to getting this engine online effectively. Doesn't feel like an engine, right? It's a few isolated cards that share those names, but it's true that Kashira Unicorn is what's holding the team together. Two. Mm -hmm. Going to be able to use the effect, get back that Fenrir. And at this point, everything is where uh, it needs to be. Declaro con 27, effect. 26 because of the boost of the Raid Soth. Exactly, and I'm interested to see what the Unicorn is going to get rid of with this effect. He knows his opponent's on the back leg, but it's also possible that he still gets rid of Zelantis, so he never sees that again. At this point, it probably is Little Knight or Nightmare Phoenix, just to protect the Dimensional Fisher, right? Oh, no, he looks like he, he's scared. He's going after the Raging Phoenix. Okay. That is what really enables Zelantis to be as good as it is, but we also might be taking... Oh, there's so many... I'm uh, just going after the Raging Phoenix, not taking any risks there. Shows you, I mean, that play left an impression on him. Is the total damage you're doing also including the plus 200 from the field spell? Yep. yep. Okay, how much damage is it? So, to say 53, 4k. That's what I meant, by the way, about yeah. Kashira Birth. You see all those little boxes in the background? I always imagine those to be the face-down cards, right? They are literally converting a planet into face-down cards. 700. I never thought of it that way. Uh, okay. it's it, one if you way look to at each of the Kashira cards, you can see all of them like hauling away these boxes. What are in them? I just imagine them to be, well, Fire Kings, Snake Eyes. <laughs> oh no, and that's the game! Showcasing a hand of only Ghost Sister, Flamberge, and Effect Veiler. Great you, cards in their own right, but not enough to get you out of this <laughs> duel. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those yeah, problems with decks like this. So you play so much non engine. You have to see your engine to be able to play. It doesn't matter how many of those stoppers that you have for your opponent if you don't get started yourself. We definitely have seen that throughout the tournament, right? It's just one of those things where if you have all no and no yes, then how are you going to show your opponent what it is that your deck's about, right? You can't just have strategies or you can't just draw those cards that don't really do something to get your strategy online. And what a deck to have nothing against Kashtira, where those kind of cards, especially even post site, those are not cards that are going to be doing very much against that strategy at all. You have to really hope that they don't have any monsters, but when you open Fenrir, that Fenrir is going to be applying the most pressure every single turn. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Fenrir is one of the most fearsome cards that has ever been 
difference it. It's one of those things that ever since we originally saw it, bueno, algo, it, it algo que que shows you what de one card can <laughs> sí, sí, do, seguro. the strength that you can put in one card. Obviously, it's not too unfair. There's a lot of ways around it, but if you don't have a way around it, it feels very strong. Now, Kashira will be able to move on in the tournament three and two, wants to lock up one more win to be able to try to get that chance to go up into day two. We Kay. will be having, unfortunately, Rudolph eliminated from that top four contention, but still able to play for that top eight. Oh, absolutely. And the prize packs that they are eligible for, we showed them earlier on the stream, are just absolutely incredible. But speaking about historical tournaments, you know there is a possibility that Kashira takes it all. How would you feel if it was Kashira instead of the various fire decks that we've seen on display here? I might throw up. <laughs> it is one of those decks where, you know, you just you play against it, and you know that it's designed to undo your strategy, so it can feel very imposing to play against, but I know somewhere out there there's someone like, yeah, Riseheart, I can feel it. It's still a little fresh, man. Ha, it is true that the NAWCQ from last year was so Kashira centric, and I can feel if those scars run deep, so hey, I'll leave off the Kashira, we'll let Oscar take it away from there. Gosh, but still one round left to go. So this is it, when you think about it. We talked about what it feels to be like on the bubble, but what does it feel like to really be at the last chance? You know, I know what it felt like from watching our Duel Links Invitational, because I was cheering for our team captain, and we had to go through a couple of losses there, so I certainly, oh man, the stress. But when you're a seasoned competitor, is there stress, or is it just another duel? So, a hot take here. I think when you get to the last round, there's a bit of a relief, because you know there's only one more. You don't have to keep thinking about everything after. It is the one and done, which it should be the mentality every single round. It should just be that round, but you always have to kind of think about in the back of your head how much more you have to do. But now it's just one more. True, You just true. have to play that one round. Win, lose, or draw, there's only one match left for the day, so that makes sense. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And if you happen to go to Top Cut, you just feel elated and then play those duels tomorrow because that's all you have to worry about then. Are seeing our duelists go ahead and get ready for possibly... Just a little camera footage there. Just <laughs> Oscar smile at the camera, giving the thumbs up for all our Cash Tira fans, if any of those exist out in the chat. Yeah, another Fire King defeated here. So we know at least two decks still remain, I believe, at this point, because Andres was still undefeated a few rounds ago with his branded strategy. So those are the other two people besides the Cash Tira that we're in this tournament without a fire strategy. It shows you, though, that like just because people tell you these are the cards to play, you don't have to listen to them. Every champion is their own unique person and had their own unique journey. When you look at that top cut list and all the decks that they qualified with, we think, see things like Cosmo, Pendulum, etc. Now, granted, those decks were better then than mm -hmm. they might be now, but the thinking process of like, they're going to play that, I know that's the best deck. I'm going to just sneak my way around that. So mm -hmm. those were those choices they made, and obviously it's paying off for Brandon Castier, at least so far. Yeah, I think this is one of those interesting things uh, with Brandon. Because you have access to the Gimmick Puppet Lock, you are able to cut off the entire turn of the Fire King strategy, regardless of what they do. So as long as you're able to play your own strategy and it's going to win anyway, so that's that's a gamble you can take, right? Absolutely. Although one day I just can't wait to see a Brandon player toss into the wrong player, and they are playing Gimmick Puppets. But let's go and go to our stage for a new interview. How did you feel to win your match? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I thought I was going to lose because I only opened two hand traps, but fortunately he briefed and I couldn't make through. Why did you choose the deck to use today? Uh, I used uh, Kashtira because uh, the other guys were going to play fire and they, they spent too much time practicing the deck and I think I, I was not in, in the same level of, uh, as them. How'd you personally prepare for this match? Um, I guess doing what, what I know to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was something that stood out in your match? Um, I don't know. Uh, the, the whole match was pretty difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations on your, uh, on your win. Hopefully the rest of the tournament goes well for you. Thank you. Again, really the heart of a champion there is thinking just like we were talking about. They're going to be playing fire. They're going to be focused on fire. I'm just going to go around that. You know, he had a little bit of humility there, too. He was like, I'm not as good as the other guys. Obviously, you are when you're taking Kashira this far in this quality of a tournament. Yeah, I think he brought up a really big point there. Not everyone has the same amount of time to prepare for this tournament, and he knew that people have already spent a lot more time dedicating themselves to the fire mirror match, and he wasn't going to be as ready as them. So he picked something a little bit more off the wall that gave him a better chance, and sometimes you have to be able to make that decision. You definitely do. Again, every champion 
champions their own person. So let this be a lesson to everyone at home. Don't let anyone tell you what deck to play. Obviously, cards are good. There are cards that are good, but you can put whatever 40 cards you want as long as it matches with the Forbidden Limited list and do as well in the tournament as this person did too. Now let's look back at what we can do for the charity here. That's right, it's a minimum of $10 or more. We'll receive one entry into the highest tier that their donation mark makes them eligible for. There are multiple tiers here, so make sure to look at the website and see what those minimum tiers are. And every tier you get, you can get everything below that tier as well. So 130 lucky winners will be chosen at random to get some fabulous prizes. So again, just to make sense of that, if you really donate in, you will be eligible for all those tiers below. If you donate $10, you'll be eligible for the $10 tier. So again, pay attention to that website because it's a really good cause. We know how great this community can be. Let's show Doctors Without Borders how great it can be. Now we talk about, you know, without borders all the time here in this tournament. We saw two Latin American players play here in Los Angeles, California, because they won how many years apart? Oh goodness, I think it's been quite a bit. And that's the thing, remember that the entire Ultimate Duelist series has been from 2015 is when we started this. And it is almost 10 years later to get us to this spot right here. Yeah, so uh, we have one player that was able to win their tournament in 2020. I think one player that was able to win in 2016. Really a huge gap there, but we saw both of them really powerful. And we, it was lovely to see how well they played here. But we'll have to take it to a quick break and we'll be back for round number six.
Hello and welcome back everyone to the beautiful sunny Los Angeles, California here at the Konami headquarters. It's right, we're at the Konami eSports studio here celebrating 25 years of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game and we're at the quarter century celebration. We had Duel Links and Master Duel yesterday and today it's been the undisputed Ultimate Duel series. We're gonna crown one UDS champion to be the undisputed best in the world as they might say uh champion here for Yu-Gi-Oh! it's been an exciting weekend so far tom box tell me about how your day's been it's been really exciting it's a learning experience we get to see the best plays from everyone and it's very very diverse much more diverse than i would think you know we're just learning from the best Definitely, I had a lot of expectations coming to this event, but these players have surprised me with not only the decks they brought, the tech choices, and the plays that they've made so far. It's been a really exciting event, five rounds in the book. We finally made it to the last round of Swiss. After this round, we are cutting to a top four that are gonna come back tomorrow to play until we crown that undisputed champion. We've seen some epic games. We just saw Kestira actually take the win in our last feature match. Yeah, that's super exciting. Surprising text coming out from that game, the Vanity's Fiend. And uh, I believe the players are ready, so we're gonna pass it over to Kangas to reveal our players for the next feature match. Thank you very much. Caster is introducing for the next round on the red side, the winningest YCS player in history, Jesse Cotton. There he is, the man, Jesse Cotton. He's been undisputed in his own right, winning five YCS championships. Absolutely amazing. And now he's here looking to win the tournament this weekend. Now we featured him earlier this morning, mm. but he's back on the hot seat. Must mean his opponent is someone that's also going to be pretty good. I mean, every player competing this weekend oh, is one yes. of the top notch duelists. Yes, he's going to get ready. This is going to be an interesting match, but I think it's going to be pretty neat. We're going to see something different from these players, hopefully. Definitely. And his opposition on the blue side, the confirmed inventor of Dragon Link, <laughs> Shunping Zhu. There he is. He said he had a formal opponent. That's right, Xu Ping. And as you mentioned, he was the first person to win with Dragon Link over here. He actually won his UDS with Dragon Link. Mm -hmm. And it was not only any UDS, it was the last one that was held in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was there for it. I was cheering him on. I had some other friends in top eight. But his Dragon Link strategy really took off by storm. He'd already won a YCS at that point, but the UDS really solidified him as one of the top players in the game. Now, now Shinping previously, when he was featured, he fought against Flu Wanderers, and he managed to play out of a lot of troublesome cards. And but this time it's gonna be a mirror match, somewhat of a mirror match. We know what these players are playing. We have the pure form of Snake Eye, and then we have Jesse Cotton playing the Fire King version of Snake Eye. And they're gonna see how they handle this now. Yeah, and Xu Ping has some exciting cards in his deck. I hope we're going to get to see them come into play. I yes. don't know if we got to see them earlier in his previous feature match, but I know he has some extra egg monsters that are really nice into the mirror match that you wouldn't expect in a Snake Eye deck, but we'll have to see if it's coming out. And we also saw Jesse on the internet playing more of a straightforward standard version of that Fire King Snake Eye deck that is so popular now after the release of Phantom Nightmare just mere weeks ago. I mean, these players, they come here to win. It's not about just coming here. They need to take the title home. They want to take the ring home. What would you do if you ever got the ring? Oh, I mean, I would just retire. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Oh, no, I would definitely take that ring. I'd wear it all around. I'd go to my local tournament. I'd be like, oh, you want to do high roll? But make sure I'm rolling the die in the hand with that I have the ring Cut on. my deck. <laughs> put, put it over. You can hit out the pinky right there. <laughs> yeah, it'd be definitely something I'd either want to show off like somewhere on display at my house. But it's definitely uh, something that all these duelists here are looking to get their hands on. Now, these two duelists, we did see them in a feature match already. But they're here because they're playing essentially on the bubble. In order to have a chance to make that top four cutoff, you're not going to have more than two losses. Even though you have the two losses, you still might not make it, but there is a chance, and both these players have two losses, so the winner here will have a better odds of making it to top four, but the loser is almost certainly out. Yeah, you don't, you want to be in the... You, don't, you probably want to be above the X2 range, but X2, it's a bit tight here. Top four, not, not a very common top cut. Definitely not, but let's go and jump right into it. It's round six, game number one here at the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series. And let's see who's going to win the all-important die roll. Going first is such a huge advantage. She's going to let Jesse roll the dice first. Oh, There's a 10. Ooh. That's pretty big. Only a couple numbers are going to be able to beat that. Oh, 11! 
11. Okay. <laughs> the bow player is <laughs> laughing a little bit. It always feels good when you beat a high number when you're rolling second. Mm -hmm. And Xu Ping did there. And he's going to draw his opening hand here in the final round of Swiss. Let's see how he's going to start things off. I see a lot of green in that hand, a lot of spell cards. That's draw good news. Go for the field spell. Yep. I always forget Xu Ping is a lefty here, so his board is a little bit reversed to normal. He's going to go for Divine Temple of the Snake Eye. That's going to let him place a Snake Eye monster into the spell and trap card zone. Such a safe card to open with. Now you don't really have to worry too much about Nibiru's interaction. We're going to start with the Snake Eye Ash into the spell and trap zone, and we're going to use that as the cost for the original. Yep, so not being able to open up with Snake Eye Ash, but having the Divine Temple... Actually, open up with both of the one of spells that you usually want to add from your deck to your hand here. It's okay. But We're going to go into Oak. Oak is going to bring back the Ash. That just loads up the play right here. Does Jesse have anything to cut this Snake Eye Oak off from bringing back Snake Eye Ash that hasn't used its effect yet? He does have Effect Veiler. Effect Veiler. That's a dangerous start, but we'll see if Shinping has a follow-up. Triple Attack has been kind of on and off today yeah it is a monster effect not quite as good as infinite permanence because it does turn on that triple tactics talent as you mentioned what is going to be the fall up here if he doesn't have another monster he could be in trouble oh, and he no. doesn't sometimes effect failure is strong enough to a weak hand and now shun is setting two and he's going to offer jesse to cut the deck because his turn is almost over here now what could the back row be to kind of keep jesse at bay we're going to have to find out. There's still a, a one card left in Xinping's hand. Maybe it'll be enough to kind of buy the turn back. We're into the main phase one. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at maybe things like infinite impermanence is what you can hope for. I mean, sometimes just that one effect negation is enough. It was just enough here for Jesse to slow down Xinping. Now, what is going to be Jesse's starting move? He's a five-time YCS champion facing down Xinping, who is a YCS champion in his own right as well, and it's Oh, cross-out designator on an, on an open play. He's leading off with cross-out designator? That is very uncommon. What is he doing? What is Jesse cooking here? He's going to banish <laughs> infinite impermanence. <laughs> very, very smart. So he's playing around double infinite impermanence, so none will resolve. He's just going to do it right off the bat, because that is two infinite impermanences. He doesn't have to worry about it, and he's just going to go ahead and summon Snake Eye Ash. Now, this is a, it's a this bold is move, Cotton. It, for we'll sure. see if it pays off. For sure. But that means... Even if he tries to play this one out, there's going to be double imperm if there is a follow-up on the next turn, if there is even a next turn. But it's not infinite impermanence. It's a main deck copy of Forbidden Droplet, a hot tech card that we see in some side decks, not in a lot of main decks right now. And uh, there we have it. We're still negating the Snake Eye Ash. No one wants a Snake Eye Ash to ever resolve, unless you're the one playing it. Definitely. Oh, just going to battle, battle phase. Ooh. You just go to attack. You see how fast Jim Ping picks up that pin? He's like, I'll take that damage. This means you're not going to be summoning monsters. any more monsters. He bought his turn back. It cost him a Snake Eye Oak and a Forbidden Droplet, but he does get his turn back. And just a pass <laughs> back. Oh, so Jim no. Ping drawing the two cards in hand. He has original in the graveyard as well. Now, I won't write off Jesse just yet. If you open a a weak hand, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. uh, that means your hand could have Stop been me. full of disruption, so you might be able to buy the turn back again. Snake eye. So he's going to banish the original Sinful Spoils to put a Snake oh, yeah. Eye card on the bottom of the deck yep. and then allow him... Well, it's going to shuffle back into the deck, mm -hmm. and then he's going to allow him to add a level 1 fire from the deck to the hand. That's so good. That's basically the entire deck. <laughs> Lots of options. Snake Eye Ash is a good one, and he is going for Snake Eye Ash. Now Jesse, with no... Spells and traps on the field. There's the droll. Yeah. You did mention those cards in hand are usually not useless. He does have a droll in Lockbird. Pretty good to hit off the originals, kind of like using droll on a bonfire, essentially. Mm -hmm. So now that Ash is not going to be able to do too, too much, but this isn't exactly the worst position to be in. One for one, another card that can <laughs> bypass the draw in Lockbird, summon straight out of the deck, don't need to add it to hand. And that's going to summon out Oak the Snake Oak. Eye Oak. That he just returned to the deck, so now he can bring back Snake Eye Ash. Won't be able to add anything, but he gets two monsters on the field here. That makes Flamberge online if he wants to you know, put that monster onto the field. Yeah, he could go into Flamberge if he has another way to get another monster on the field as well. He can do a lot of different things. They're boosted up right now by that field spell, but it looks like he's going to send the field spell and Snake Eye Ash to go to Flame Burge. So he does have the two monsters yep. that he'll be able to link away and then have even more monsters. But Jesse's still sitting on two cards in hand. His options for 
His defensive options aren't limited. Okay. Well, they're a little limited. A little bit limited. <laughs> there are certain cards that Xinping probably should be playing around. I think you've already played five rounds previously. You mm. know mm. what's going to be the popular tech. And if you've been paying attention to the matches around you, you would know what to kind of avoid playing into. Okay, we are probably seeing a Link Summon play coming up. He's holding it. There's the IP Masquerina. Indeed it is. So oh, it looks number. like Flame Bird's effect's going to activate, bring back two level ones to the field. Does Jesse have something like Nibiru the Primal yeah, Being? Yeah, that's, that's the only thing I can think of to kind of cut this play off. But Shrimping is committed into making this play. We already got into Princess. the Promethean Princess. And we're going to summon back the uh, Flamberge. There is the Nibiru. Nibiru! So Jesse opened a handful of Disruption. That's why he couldn't continue his play with oh, his one card. This is huge. This is controlling the tempo. You know, if you don't have a handful of you know ability to play, then you need to know the right timing for these cards. But was Shinping expecting this? Uh, I think he was kind of hoping it didn't happen, but you know, sometimes you just can't really play around Nibiru. Mm -hmm. One of these still progresses plays, even though Jesse was on a weak hand. Any top deck can really jump the Fire King Snake Eye player back into the game. Yep. So you kind of want to go for it, especially when your opponent's sitting on a couple cards. There is some merit to say to play it even a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Maybe link away into SP Little Knight instead of IP, bring back the two. So if Nib happens, you at least have SP coming back. Mm -hmm. But it's a tough call. Yeah, it's definitely a tough call. I think Shimping really wanted to close out that game a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. But here we are with the graveyard fanned out. Jesse making his calculated plays. If there is a snake eye, and there is a snake eye, it's a poplar. Mm -hmm. Poplar's effect is going to activate. We're going to be able to add one of the snake eye spells into hand. Yeah, I was going to say this cross out being used preemptively would come back to bite him if the other card was infinite and permanent since he used it preemptively. Mm -hmm. Could have still had it here, but... Apparently not. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a uh, misfire almost. It <laughs> 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 was a warning shot. I, I still like, yeah, I, I like the idea there. I mean, it's better to call it than not to call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we're seeing more reasons why you can use Anima, because when you summon the token, you can always put it into a zone that Anima will point to. Okay, and we are linking them off into the next monster. Dark Charmer, the graveyard. What is in there? We've got the IP Mascarena. Oh, that's going to provide great protection for whatever that's got to come out after it. <laughs> it's definitely well that dark being able to revive a link to is kind of cool. Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames, and that's going to be protected by the IP Mascarena. Just in case there's a ghost ogre. Or just something. in case. <laughs> just in case. So now let's see what Jesse's next step is. Princess is going to spell someone back a fire monster from the graveyard. He's going for Snake Eye Ash. Nice. Going to activate the effect, and it's going to resolve. This is going to cycle everything into, into play right now. Yep, he's going to be able to add Poplar, special Poplar, if he so chooses, but he's going for <laughs> Ponix instead. Mm -hmm. Ponix does have the effect that if uh, a card is just a fire monster is destroyed, you can special summon it from the hand. So there are ways to special summon it from the hand. I wonder if Jesse's going to be able to do that. I'm not sure there's a lot of self-destructive ability at the moment, but there's a Flambridge. Flambridge has been summoned onto the field. If, yeah, if there's nothing from Shooping's hand, he will be able to put enough damage to finish the game here this turn. Yeah. There's many different ways he could go about doing it, too. So we are using Flamberge Effect to push the Dark into the Spell and Trap Zone. 27 and 3,000 so far. Shimping did take a bit of damage earlier. We are going to proceed to mm -hmm. Hita. Mm -hmm. Yep, looks like he might be looking for the Salmon Great Phoenix line that you can do with Zelantis yep. with a co-linked fire monster. But we'll have to see. He still has to worry about that one face down that Xunping has. But maybe the Phoenix will be the one to clear it out. <laughs> <Could be. laughs> Are we going to see the the you know the maximum timing on that backer, or is that a bluff that is going to basically end this game? All right. So Jesse's going to use Hita to summon Oak from Xunping's graveyard, and now he's already used Oak's effect this turn, I believe, to bring back Snake Eye Ash. Mm -hmm. And we are putting them into the graveyard, performing another Link Summon. Yeah, it is the Nightmare mm -hmm. Phoenix. Yep. And he's going to discard, destroy. Yep, he'll be able to do the full combo. Oh, it's oh, another it's a droplet. droplet! That could oh. have been impactful. Mm-hmm. So now he can link into 
Raging Phoenix. Palooza? No, we're gonna oh, have Palooza. We're gonna we're gonna keep it secure. Yeah, he, here. I don't think he has. You the need meat. another you monster. You need another monster. That's right. Or if he had the princess effect still to bring back the phoenix underneath it and then go yes. into the mm -hmm. He might also not know about the Zelantis and the fire mm -hmm. monster co-linked, being able to destroy it in battle and then summon back the raging phoenix. It's not a very well-known play. But oh. the now we have the oak summoning uh, back the ponyx. I think this is going to open up the Fire King line. Once the Fire King line is online, there's going to be additional damage through the Garunix and the additional monster being pushed out. Yeah, there's just so many ways you can navigate your deck to find to put 8,000 points of damage on the board. He has the Fire King Island already. Doesn't have to place it with the Sanctuary he just added. And with the Appaloosa online, you don't have to worry about Nibiru anymore. So this is Smart. going to be a very clean way to do damage. Even if you do not, do not finish Shinping off, then it's still okay because you get to shut down most of the other monsters coming out of the turn after. So very secure play. But of course, if you can finish them off, you finish them off. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to give them another turn with so many powerful cards that they could draw off the top of the deck. I mean, Shuping only sitting on one card in hand. So now it looks like he's going to use Fire King Island to destroy Ponix to add Grunix. Grunix effect reveals, special on himself from the hand, destroys the Kieran from the deck, going to bring back that Ponix. Uh, and mm -hmm. don't forget the attack boost that comes from that particular effect. So. It should be 16, 25, uh, oh. 33. 33, 38, 38, 38 yep. yep. Oh, and that's found enough. the number. All right. Jesse, wow, what a game. Jesse's going to take down game one. As he, he, did he, he ended up losing that die roll, too. So winning yep. game one despite losing the die roll because, I mean, he had that key effect veiler. I mean, this is I like to play cards like effect veiler, effect nation. Sometimes it's not enough, but other times it's just right. Sometimes they're going to have those hands where they're going to have all the defensive options and just have that normal summon of that one snake eye ash. If you have something to stop that one initial push, you get that opportunity to have the turns. We saw that there, the tech cards instead of the engine cards in Chimping's hand. He drew double copies of Forbidden droplet mm -hmm. while they're really good at breaking boards and being able to use defensively you don't want to see multiples as your opening hand going first that's right and uh you know jesse's hand didn't look too hot in the beginning either you know getting stopped by the droplet in the beginning but however mm -hmm. keeping every single card in the hand finding the right time buying the turn back was very very crucial the nibiru doing massive damage when shinping uh, over committed a little bit into his play and getting his whole entire turn stopped by a single copy of nibiru getting jesse to you know another turn in that other turn is what finished him off yeah i think that is the key moment to look at in that first game then if you're the primal being really turned things around in jesse's favor had he not had that card jumping would have been able to finish him off that turn now this is why i mentioned if you were paying attention to jesse's facial expression he has that expression where he's thinking oh, it doesn't look too good and then the situation didn't look too hot if you know if he played around the nibiru it should be played around the nibiru uh, but you know he played into it and then it just was like oh one card top deck we can get all the way through yeah i mean it's I so scary a really good point yeah because before jesse dropped on nibiru he was holding his head yeah. up with his head he looked sad to me i was almost gonna <laughs> comment on it but now i think that was strategic strategic sadness <laughs> <laughs> strategic sadness like, you look like you got nothing <laughs> And then you're like, oh, wait, never mind. Here's this Nibiru that's actually sitting in my hand. It's going to get me back into this game. I mean, I've been in that position Chu Ping's been in before where you're like, well, I have to kind of go for it. I can go for a game if he has Nibiru. It's tough. You can trying to find some middle ground, but anytime you find some middle ground, you're really giving that other deck a chance to jump back into the game because yeah. there are so many ways to play through just minimal disruptions. And if Xu Ping didn't go for like a game shot there, there wasn't going to be much he could do in terms of disruption because mm -hmm. anything, any play he made to try and get to that Oral Load Savage or that Baron de Floor or something like that mm -hmm. would have been met by the Nibiru. Yeah, it's very difficult. Xin Ping was really deep in thought. We're just thinking back of what he could have done better right here is very deep in thought. And uh, I think that's what you got to do as a really top tier player. Think about the previous game. Try to analyze what you can out of your opponent's deck, like the play style that they're going with, knowing that Jesse has a ton of disruption from the hand, even if nothing is really being played, even if his turn gets skipped. You have to play around so much now. Yeah. He got hit by everything. Yeah, it was a lot. It was Droll, it was Nib, it was Valor. We'll see if that happens here again in game number two as we jump right into it. Jinping's going to be going first again. Let's see if he can get off to a little bit better of a start this time. But I mean, we're, uh, we were talking about the difference in Snake Eye versus Fire King Snake Eye. People say the Snake Eye deck seems more consistent. I would. You know, disagree a little bit, but you're giving up that power of having Kieran to be able to dodge stuff Kieran's like Effect Baylor. Kieran's too good. Or yeah, I mean, Kieran's I, too I good. I love it. And we're not talking about the Magic Spectre, Kieran. We're no. talking about Fire King High Avatar, Kieran. No, I love that oh, card. Oh, no. No, he just said three and passed. 
Not like this, Xinping. No. But hold on. It, there could be some hope, but there was no anti-spell fragrance, so this is going to be a bonfire that is live. Oh, Does Xinping like have a disruption in his hand, or maybe he you know, opened it with all of them in his hand? But if you're going to be going first, you usually may take a couple copies out, mm -hmm. just like so increase the consistency of opening your plays. Okay, we got a Poplar added to hand. And there is no response to the Poplar activation. The hand on the cheek for Xinping right now. Yeah, I mean, if I said three and passed here in game two after losing game one, I wouldn't feel too confident. He could also be doing the same thing Jesse was doing game one, be like, oh, man, I mean, but then he has some defensive option in his hand. I mean, his cards in hand have to be something that he can use. If they weren't Snake Eye cards that he could summon. I mean, there are probably certain disruption lines that are possible here. This is what I'm talking about, playing the Divine Temple in the Fire King Snake Eye deck. It's nice to have an option to get with Poplar if you also have Diabell Star access. I wonder if one of the back row is like the Sinful Spoil of Betrayal. I, we did see it added in the previous games, and but he has nothing on the field, unfortunately. So we're now going to see a normal summon of Ash. Now both monsters being on the field essentially means that you can already get access to the final board. We're going to see if the Fire King line also gets turned on here. So he is going to add the legendary Fire King Ponix to the hand. Three. We could expect more uh, Forbidden Droplet, but... I would have to guess one of those cards is Forbidden Droplet. But uh, you would you would have activated... like yeah. I probably would have activated on the... Uh, Ash, just so that they wouldn't get the additional card, but there's the field spell now. Jesse Khan playing the field spell in a Fire King build. Like you said, even in a Fire King build, you would still play the field spell. Oh, yeah, I like it a lot, because then you get that Flame Burst protection. If you get Nibiru, you get to summon the Flame Burst from the Spell and Trap card zone, or you get to do your full combo to where you can go into something like Appaloosa and then use the original Simple Spells to send the Flame Burst, and you get three monsters for that deal. Nightmare Phoenix targeting the card closest to Xinping's deck, and... No response. No response. It gets destroyed. Cross, cross, out, cross designator. out designator. Interesting. Oh, he can't stop any of the Fire King cars, but uh, interesting he wouldn't go yes. after Snake Eye Ash. Yeah, just turn off the Ash entirely. No, but maybe he knew that he would have to go through his back row, so he'd rather value him going into something like Nightmare Phoenix to take it out to protect the other ones that he finds more valuable. I'm starting to think that his back rows have to be some sort of huge swing card or something like that, something that's going to really turn things around. He's, he knows that he has to wait for the perfect moment to disrupt Jesse here. Mm, this is this is a tough call. Okay, we're seeing. Oh, another oh, crossout. Did he multiple open multiple crossouts in this particular line? So okay, well, he didn't have to preemptively activate one. Losing one does not matter because you can only activate with them once per turn anyway. And we're turning off flame version instead, which is also a high impact mm. negation here. Two monsters that aren't going to be coming to the field. And you don't get to push a monster into the back either. Yeah, definitely huge here. Keeping the monsters off the field for Jesse is the way Xunping can get back into this game. He, he still needs a top deck, a monster that he can summon. That's true. Can Jesse still find a way to push for maximum damage? You're only one back row left Let's see, does he go into Princess? Yep, Promethean Princess, Bestower of Flames. And what would you summon back at this point? Would you still go for the damage for the Flamberge? Oh, Ponix for sure. Yeah, he hasn't got, this will give him access to the Fire King stuff. Fire King uh, engine will be online if, as long as the Ponix is not going to get it here. And it does not, so Ponix is going to be able to add Fire King Sanctuary. Such a such a powerful card. Oh, it is. I the mean, just, it's funny because all it, oh, Ponix or Sanctuary? I, I mean, all of the above. All but. of the above, <laughs> but the Promethean Princess it feels like a sprite elf for kind fire of. monsters. Yep, kind of. Except she does a lot more. <laughs> or less, depending on which way you look at it. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. She does have the applications during the opponent's turn, just like Elf, though, as well. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to send that Princess and the Ponix for a Link 2 or 4. Imagine, what does he play? It's going to be Amblowell. Amblowell. Yep. We were locked into fire. Amblowell and, oh, you're right. And then Amblowell and Princess in the graveyard. Pretty strong disruption on its own. But, oh, Nibiru. This I'm is right? Or no? Is he using Fire King Island? No, that is the Fire King Island destroying the Amblow because it's oh. also destroyed that. We'll summon back, perhaps, the Promethean Princess. We're going to get Kieran, and of course, uh, I believe the, is there a Garunix already? The, yes, he already has it he in has, the hand. He's got the Garunix. I There's jumped a gun on the Nibiru. I think I saw it in Shooping Sad, but we'll have to see if it does make yeah. an appearance. Right. Uh, okay, we are going to see a pretty interesting chain. We're going to wait for Jesse to check his extra deck. Yep, 
Right now we're waiting to summon this Garunic since the Anvil is destroyed. Does he, you, oh, maybe he's thinking about his chain links if he wants to summon back the Promethean Princess with Anvil mm -hmm. Whale. I think, uh, yeah, there's going to be the Promethean Princess. That's 27 at least plus another 27. And then if he destroys Kieran to summon back, or you summon the Kieran out of his hand even, mm -hmm. that would be enough damage. Yep. That's a lot of damage here. If that's a drop, maybe, I think if there's a Nibiru, then we would have a bit of hope. Mm -hmm. Kieran has been destroyed. Yep. It looks like he destroyed it from his hand. Special summon, destroying the face down. Oh, oh it was no. original. Does Chu Ping have Nibiru? I thought I saw it in his hand, but I might have been mistaken. He might be waiting for the battle phase declaration. This is the last step. Jesse's trying to find a way to close it out. With the damage on board right now, he needs to convert that Ponyx or add an additional monster onto the field to, to seal this one. He has a bonfire in hand. I just, he just peeked at it. Yeah, sometimes bonfire can be a little redundant if you already have Snake Eye, Ash, and Poplar, or if you already have a copy of bonfire mm -hmm. that you uh, We're going to battle phase, and so they're five, swinging 20, in. 32. 71? 71? 71? 71, yeah. 900. All right, 900 life points remaining for Xunping. He's going to need something big here now to get I, back into it. One of the highest impact card uh, that got played here was the cross of Designator turning off the Flamberge. Now there's no monster being pushed back onto the field, which uh, saves a lot of trouble, I mean, a, a lot less to deal with on the field. Now we're going to go into Sunlight Wolf and Jesse in main phase two. Continuing to oh, there's See, I knew it. I, I knew he I saw it. He <laughs> waited for the commitment, so and now the token's a lot smaller after the big monsters have been gotten he rid was, of. He was so committed. He was committed to taking the 7,100 points of damage just to make sure there was nothing else Jesse was going to do, just in case he was trying to trick him mm -hmm. uh, by going to that battle phase and forcing it out the Nibiru. But in, Shuming does have the original in his graveyard now, so if he can find access to a Snake Eye card, that'll allow him to search something next turn as well. But he needs to draw a Snake Eye Ash or a Bonfire. Yep. And he needs Jesse not to have something like Ash Blossom and Joy Springs. But uh, Jesse is continuing his play, using the original to summon out the Snake Eye Oak. Snake Eye Oak is going to summon back another monster from the graveyard, just keeping himself in the game, just building up a wall at this point. Maybe uh, even a disruption. We're going to see how this one plays out. Now, there are cards in Shinping's grave, but does Shinping have any fire monster in the grave? Right? I think I would almost bet so much money he was checking original to see if he could put back a banished snake eye to do the search effect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I don't think. I'm pretty sure it's only from the graveyard, but I know Wanted's from the banished or graveyard, but I'm pretty sure that one is only from the GY. Okay, we're going <laughs> to link that off. Karibu. Link Karibo. And then maybe into SP Little Knight. SP Little Knight is pretty strong. Oh, he could just banish the original. Uh, yeah, it's going to be SP, SP, banishing the Nibiru. Uh, so just SP Little Knight, one face down. Shunping with one card in hand. Didn't have anything to start his turn. He's going to need a big draw. Looking at his face, let's see what he thinks. He's checking Somebody. things. So even Shunping didn't open the most optimal hand. And you still <laughs> managed to buy a couple <laughs> turns back. In Like, Nibiru is such a clutch card. It can be. It can be the one saving grace. So he Ooh. did draw one for one. Gonna send. Oh, but the Snake Eyes Flamer Dragon is huge because that is a Snake Eye monster you can put back with the original. Mm hmm. And that's going to be important because Shimping runs two copies of this card. One of them got banished by the Cross Out Designator. So he's, the second copy here is going to be super important. So his opening hand was Snake Eyes Flame Birds, Cross Out Designator, Cross Out Designator, yep. Original, oh. Nibiru. Those are the yeah, five. Yeah, those are the five. Not a great one, but he's finding a way. He still has to worry about the SP Little Knight being able to take a monster off the field. This could be an infinite impermanence here from Jesse to stop Snake Eye Ash. We'll see. But apparently not. We are going to get the search to the deck, and we're going to add a Poplar into our hand and likely going to summon that out. we got to maintain a healthy field of monsters. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to pay those costs. Indeed we do. Let's see what he decides to add here. He's looking. He's thinking. It has to be Poplar, I'd imagine. He hasn't um, technically. Oh, he, he hasn't uh, normal summoned yet. Yeah, so he could hold off on adding the poplar since he has the original to still add the poplar mm -hmm. later on and special summon in the hand. But well, decides to go ahead and go with the poplar because in the reverse he can still use the original to get that monster he wants to normal summon as you just That's mentioned. Right. That's right. 
There's so many different ways to go about this deck. Now, now that the Poplar has been summoned onto the field, is he going to go for the field spell, or is he going to go for a different Snake Eye card? I think I believe Shunping is the one that's been playing basically every single like Snake Eye spell trap. <laughs> Did you, oh, you've seen him use Subversion and stuff earlier, maybe? He's been using, like, the different ones, like, the different spell, like, the uh, the trap card. We've seen it play, put oh, it into play. Okay. And he also used uh, the chase, Dramatic Snake Eye Chase. Oh, okay. We've that's seen that as well. That's an interesting option. It gives you kind of a... It has two purposes in the deck. You can discard it with the uh, Diabell Star, mm -hmm. and then you can negate any time your opponent chains to one of your Snake Eye or Sinful Spoil cards. But also, like you know, the on-field effect, by sending a Diabell Star to the graveyard from your field or hand, you can just negate a face-up card. Yeah. Kind second. of like a Hot Red Abyss. And he is going for the chase. Dramatic Snake Eye Chase. Yep. And if you don't rush. Chase places a uh, Diabell Star in your Spell and Trap Card Zone, and then during the end phase, you can banish it to Special Summon a monster from the Spell and Trap Card Zone. He's going to activate it. And the Abel Star has been placed into the Spell and Trap card zone. I wonder what Jesse would be waiting for for the SP. Like, what's the you know the most crucial card that he has to take out? Which monster is it going to be? I sometimes let it rip on the Snake Eye Ash, but I guess with Oak being a viable option to be able to special summon back the Ash from the Banish, mm -hmm. might be something he is considering holding off on that for. I think we're gonna see the original being activated from the graveyard and put back. Oh. Put or back I, the, uh, yeah, I think he's doing Poplar right now. I think it was something right? Um, I don't know. There's so many things that actually interact <laughs> with the graveyard. It's a little bit harder to tell here. And it is going to be a Poplar. Poplar putting the... Sure. Yep, yeah, putting into so. the Spell and Trap Zone. So now he can use Ash to summon Oak. And then he'll be able to use the Flame Bridge effect if he sends it. That's a smart way to use it. Everywhere can come from anything. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere can come from anything. That is a broad statement, <laughs> yeah, broad but a true statement, one. A very true one for this particular <laughs> matchup. You can send send the uh, Flying Bridge from hand. You can send it as a spell and trap. There's just any way you can put the card back onto the field or into the hand and just send it back into the graveyard. It's such a great advantage. Definitely is. Xunping with a weak start, but trying to fight back here in turn number three of game uh, number, number two. He needs to win this game. If he doesn't, oh, his hopes of making the top four are done. Well, Xunping showing that he's not tunnel visioning into a particular play. I think if you're going to be playing a deck like Snake Eye or Fire King Snake Eye, just don't tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Check all your options because you have options everywhere. It looks like he's thinking about adding Birch, but he's just going and to uh, go for summon Poplar or Summoning. Flam Birch effect. He does have two level ones in the graveyard now. And those can summon back too. We have tons of monsters available here. But still, what is that SP going to do? SP has just been sitting here. Jesse probably has that mainly as his only disruption. I think that's why you would hold back for so long, waiting for the most crucial timing for the SP. And here, we're gonna now we're gonna use the original Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. Putting the Flame Burge Dragon back into the deck to add Snake Eye Oak. This is gonna allow Shinping to summon it onto the field and perhaps even use the effect to push it off. But you got to be careful. Again, SP still on the field. Such a, a such a strong card to make off. It definitely is. And it, you mentioned earlier, he still has the normal summon after summoning all these monsters. Right, he's not committed yet. Let's see if he decides to... How he's going to decide to navigate the SP Little Knight. He could make his own SP Little Knight. Banish Fire King Island. Oh, wait for the chain SP Little Knight. Chain his SP Little Knight to their SP Little Knight. Everyone's banishing everything. We'll have to see. There's a lot of different options. Uh, that token is also not very large either. Mm. It was uh, it was summoned on the Salamangrid Sunlight Wolf. He could also just go to a four material Appaloosa. Mm hmm. There's still Link Karibu <laughs> on the field <laughs> yeah. too. He has a lot of options here. He also plays some other extra deck monsters that he might be eyeing. I know there's one gigantic Link Five in his extra deck that he really likes, but we won't talk about that until we see it. Happened to come up, but oh, he is gonna. It looks like he's going for SP. Yeah, okay. It kind of counters SP, kind of counters SP. If they use theirs, you use yours, banish one of their targets, and then you will come out on top there. So he used just two. Uh, well, none, none of the monsters were from the extra deck, so mm -hmm. we're not gonna see the immediate banish. So you can still basically attack directly, uh, otherwise, you turn off your ability to attack directly. We might have to pass turn to your opponent. What do you say? 
Oh, Diabell. Mm. We're going to see Diabell Star sent to the grave, summoning back the Flamberge Dragon. Oh, this is going to be <laughs> neat. So the, the Flamberge has like, gone from the graveyard to the Spell and Trap card zone to the field to the graveyard, back into the deck, yep. and then back onto the field. All <laughs> Everything in this one everywhere. Turn. Everything <laughs> ever all at <laughs> once. <laughs> You're right. That's a good way to describe this. Some the flame has been everywhere just yeah, this turn. Just exactly. I don't think I've ever seen a card do that. <laughs> <laughs> he went to all the zones. There's still one banish as well from that cross out designator. Oh, and he pushed the Amble Whale to the back so that that is not a disruption later on. Yeah, because he, he could just leave that SP Little Knight up, and when it's destroyed, he would be able to use that Amble Whale to destroy a card that was the on Shooping's side. Yeah. Shooping only at 900 life points, back against the wall, but he's going to have to do his best. This is a very complicated scenario, but Shimmy's doing his best just to navigate through everything, pushing things to the side. Yeah, he's a phenomenal player. I mean, Jesse, a, a monster in his own right, but Shooping. Well, he's someone like I first met him. He was using Phantom Knights, and yep. he was like playing with like an OCG Phantom Knight deck, and <laughs> he was doing things I'd never seen before. He has like a playtesting group where he plays with some uh, some of his friends yeah. in the OCG, and always comes up with some really cool ideas. And he's mm, really showing it here mm -hmm. this weekend. No, I mentioned that how Jesse is a super creative player, mm -hmm. but Shun Ping is also in the same realm as Jesse when it comes to like being super creative, trying different ways to play. I mean, he put Quad Boral Dragon when no one was really playing Quad Boral Dragon. Yeah, now he's playing Moral and Dragon, but no one else is playing Moral exactly. and Dragon. Well, maybe spoilers, but uh, Hida is bringing back Nightmare Phoenix. Oh, boy. That's a Link 2. So he's got a lot of materials for Link monsters on the field. He hasn't used Princess yet this turn. He's holding his SP Little Knight to deal with Jesse's SP Little Knight. Looks like he's going to Link away the Nightmare Phoenix and the Snake Eyes Poplar. Okay. There's the Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames mm -hmm. in Quarter Century, right? Uh, some, uh, Indeed. Promethean. Promethean Princess Effect. Uh, Jesse's thinking on this. Perhaps this is a very crucial point. Yeah, is this where he needs to use the SP Little Knight just to... I mean, it doesn't really matter what he does, because the chain of the SP Little Knight will take out one of the targets, and mm -hmm. then his SP Little Knight will resolve, and Jesse's won't. And it is Nothing. good. Yep. Yeah, I think his best bet is just to kind of leave it up there and hope it's enough. We're summoning back Poplar onto the field. This is such a tense moment between these two players. There's a lot on the line. I mean, the winner. You know, if, if Jinping wins, we got another game going in. Oh, if Jesse takes this one, he might secure a spot for the day two. And to the top it. cut. Definitely. Both these players really oh, need to win this to have a chance to make the top four. He's going to link something out that Salomon Great Raging Phoenix. Then he's going to link it away for World Sea Dragon Zolantis. Okay. Effect. Um, yeah. There's going to be the effect of Zolantis. Called right here. That token's, token's going to be gone for good. Yeah, token won't come back. One fun fact about Zalant is if you've taken control of your opponent's monster, they get to summon back to the, uh, the owner's side of the field, so just be careful with that, especially if you use triple attack. You could be advantageous if your opponent doesn't have a monster and you need to mm. destroy yes. a monster with Princess. You banish their monster, give, give it, back it back to them. them. Yep. Yep. It's That's really another cool play. play to do. That's another play to do. On summon. Uh, On summon of the Promethean Princess, Princess. effect. Oh, boy. Sorry. We're going to get quite a bit of co-link here. Yep, he's going to use the princess to destroy probably Flamebridge. You want to destroy your biggest attack monster because that's seven, more attack for the nine. Raging Phoenix. Jesse still has SP Little Knight, though. Chain target person yep. yep, so yep. now Shooping has to chain his SP, targeting his own SP and Jesse's SP. The Hida will stay on the field to be destroyed by the princess. The princess will come out, and then the Raging Phoenix will come out, and that will be enough to attack for game unless Jesse has something face down. Let's see if that is what Shooping decides to do. This is so, so tense. SP Little Knight has to banish both, right? Yes, and it has Promethean to banish Princess both. Just has to destroy one. Correct. The wording is very important. Yep. Learning the problem solving card text is key here. And Shooping sees it. He just banishes the SP and his SP. Raging Phoenix is going to come out. It's going to gain the attack of Hida. Oh boy, battle phase, and Jesse boom. picks up his cards! Bing, bing, boom! That's that is wild! That is wild. Xinping starting game number two. His tournament life on the line here, and his opening hand going first, just set one, set two, set three. 
go. <laughs> and it turns almost, it around. It almost feels like Jesse's first first turn. <laughs> like it seems like, oh, maybe, you know, breaking wasn't so bad. Oh man. And those cards he set weren't defensive options at all. It was two cross out designators and an original sinful spoil. But cross out designator can be used defensively and he did. It was he, just it, enough maybe. He shut down the most important card, especially when you're trying to push. Yes. Flamber's Dragon shut down and luckily it's not called by the grave which shuts it down for your turn. This only shuts it down for the one turn so it's back online on your own turn. And, and it's so great. Yeah, I mean, even more to that point, this is also pure Snake Eye, right? If this was Fire King Snake Eye, there's only one copy of Snake mm -hmm. Eye Flamber's Dragon in the deck most of the time. But the fact that he's playing Pure Snake Eye, he had that second copy, not only to use just a little bit, but as you said, it hit the field, it hit the graveyard, it hit the tech, and yeah. it came back to the field again. It traveled around the world <laughs> at once. What an amazing play. This is kind of the kind of play we expected from the Ultimate Duelist Series champions that are here today to become the undisputed champion, the champion of champions. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, just really living up to it here on the bubble in round six. I mean, six rounds for a 16-player tournament, you're going to have a chance to play a decent portion of the field. You know you're going to have to be the best of the best to make it there, but that's what's going to make it so much more worth it. The ring, it looks amazing. It's beautiful. It has those beautiful diamonds, diamonds emeralds, ruby. rubies. Rubies. Yes, but it's more so about it's what it's, it's what it says, the story that ring means. The people they had to defeat on their way to get that ring, it's just as important as the ring itself. This is so strange. When you go into like a 16-man tournament, this feels like you took top cut mm -hmm. and just put it into a Swiss round. You <laughs> yeah. took top cut into a Swiss round. I feel like we started the tournament and the top yeah, cut. Yeah, exactly. Agree. exactly. And, you know, they all have their belts and everything. No, there's no two round buy. I get to play the extra two rounds I mean, just to make it definitive. We could pretend like there was a two round buy. Just <laughs> everyone got one. Yeah. yeah, we're actually in round eight. <laughs> we should have done that. Just to, that would have made so much more sense. Oh. It would have been really fun. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you forget to bring your belt? Well, you have to plan out. <laughs> but, no, but we actually, we make everyone show up and have to wait the two hours for the buy. Start the clock. No one's <laughs> no, that would have been that would have been hilarious, but no, we, they don't, the buys are not needed here since all of them are used to them. Though they don't get to sleep in, they got to start on time just like everyone else for this yes. tournament. <laughs> oh man! I mean, but at least they all got their own seat, kind of, because this is a very tight venue. Mm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, they, just by participating, they got that awesome participation back oh, with yeah. the UDS game mats, all those UDS pins from the past UDS uh, times, and that bomber jacket that's going to be custom for fit for them. Yes. With their, I'm pretty sure it's going to have like their name on the back or yep. something like that. Really, really cool stuff. And or they could put final boss in the, <laughs> the UDS final boss, <laughs> the undisputed <laughs> champion. But let's go ahead and find out which one of these players is going to have a chance to make top four. It's game three, round six, the last round of Swiss for the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series. Seven Shipping. minutes left on the clock. Time is winding down. We're going to have to play fast. Jesse's going to get to go first this game for the first time in the match. Yeah, first time in the match. Uh, Xinping, see how he adapts going to second. All right, Jesse's oh. already going to start off with the best card in the deck. It's Snake Eye Ash. Does Xinping have anything to stop this effect? Imperm. Is there a Kieran? We're going to see if this makes all the difference. And it goes through. Wow. But that's not the end of this game just yet. Yep. We get, oh, As the Fire King Fire Island. King. Yep. So at least being able to access the Fire King portion oh. of the deck. Destroying the Ponyx is that's huge. That's really good. That's huge. Because it's going to not only put the Fire King in the graveyard, now he's going to be able to summon the Grunix to destroy Arvata and be able to bring back the Ponyx. Let's go for Kieran first. Kieran summoning back the Ponyx Ponyx effect. I think that's going to give him another card. Ooh, he oh, chooses he to play Skyburn. I love this. Yeah, I this love is, this. This is the exact scenario why you want to play Skyburn. When you open up with Island, you're able to search another defensive option. We haven't seen Skyburn that much recently, mm. but what it does, you can target face of Fire King cards, Fire King monsters you d control, destroy them, and destroy target as many cards on the field and destroy them as well. Yes. I think that's probably going to have some level of impact, especially if Shinping decides to play the field spell. You can just take it out, and then it's gone. Yep. And then you don't have to deal with the additional monster in the back. Okay, so we see why he went after the Kieran instead of Arvata, because he knew he was going to do this play, and he wanted to put the Kieran in his hand, so he'll have a way to enable that Garunix from the graveyard later on in this turn. And the Snake Eye Ash has been summoned back onto the field. And now it's going to tag into the Flamber's Dragon. Snake Eye's Flamber's Dragon touches down. 
Has the Promethean Princess on the field. Wait, a little bit Firelock. I think we might just be getting out of the Firelock right now, just so yep. we can enable more cards. The We can also trigger the effect of the Snake Eyes Flamber's Dragon. Mm -hmm. Amblo Will can also be destroyed by the Kirin in case nothing mm -hmm. kind of comes out. I wonder, so I, while Shuping was looking through his deck in that previous game, I saw some of his side deck cards, and I saw a super polymerization. I'm going to whisper like Jesse can hear me, mm -hmm. even though he cannot. But maybe, nope, doesn't look like Jesse noticed that either, because he could link away that mm -hmm. Amblo well into a sea dragon, world sea dragon. But unless Shuping explains something like the Earth Golem Attic Nister, I don't think the Super Poly will be too effective here. He could hold off on it, potentially, until uh, Jesse commits more fire monsters to the board. But Super Poly, definitely one of those really good board-breaking cards. Does he have it, though? Nope. Yeah, we're going to start off with normal some of the best card once again, but Perfect. on Shinping's side, activating the effect of Snake Eye Ash. Um, Jesse. Jesse's thinking about a follow-up and a response to this play. Everything's so critical here. Yeah. And it goes through. Yep, Snake Eye Ash is going to add... A level one fire from the deck to the oh, hand. It's Snake Eyes Poplar. Poplar is going to reveal itself since it was added to the hand to special summon it out. Oh, cross out designator. He calls Snake Eyes Poplar. So he's going to banish a Poplar from his deck, and its effect will be negated for the rest of the turn. Much, so much easier card to banish, especially in this particular build. Oh, boy. So that does not allow Poplar to be put onto the field. We're going to see the Snake Eye Ash being linked into Link Rebo. Some but two darks and... Oh, there's the Parallel Exes. That's the one unique thing about Shinping's deck. There's, okay, there's many of the unique things about his deck, <laughs> but this one in particular, I don't think any of the other players are playing this. I've never seen it in a Snake Eye deck, but Shinping always with some innovation in his list. So he's going to use Princess to target the Link Karibo. This would stop the Parallax Siege from yep. coming out. No arrows. Yep. No Link arrows. You cannot summon. Will we be able to save this? Now he played into this one. He that the, Everything was public here. Mm -hmm. Looks like he might have not thought about it. Maybe. But now that the princess is out, well, I mean, we know Jesse has the cure in the hand to destroy the princess and get it off the field. The IP Masquerade becomes a little less valuable, but... It means Jesse will have to commit some cards before he uses this Mascarena. Ending main phase. Ending main phase. Is there oh. evenly matched? Battle phase. End, End of battle. battle. Yep. Me too. Main two. <laughs> oh, just trying to... Sometimes you have to make these calls just to bait out additional cards. Maybe spend away your IP Mascarena into the other monster and just make the board a little bit easier to clear. This cool. is tough. Yeah, just one face down speller trap card. Jesse starting with IP and Promethean Princess still on the field. He'll be able to lead off with that Bestower of Flames effect to summon back a fire monster from the graveyard. He's going to be able to go for Snake Eye Ash if he wants or Snake Eye Flame Burst Dragon right away. Um, this is already 57 with 6,500 points of damage. That's a lot of damage and no normal summon committed just yet. We're going to see Wanted um, activated. This is not looking good for Shuping. Well, we can't summon out the Diabell Star just yet until the Promethean Princess is removed from the field, but that's going to be a lot of damage. That's going to be more than enough damage. Fire King Island effect. Yeah, he just has to destroy any fire here, summon back the Garunix. Kieran, the, Kieran, in the you best take one. Out the back row. Yeah, oh, this is going to be rough. And can we do all of this under five summons? Very likely. Uh, I think so. He's at very, one. Very He's at one right one. now. One. <laughs> just need to summon two. <laughs> he just can summon one monster. Oh, he had another copy of Kieran because he has the Grunix in the graveyard. Two. It's forbidden Ooh, droplet. That's pretty good. Discards mm -hmm. the parallel. Exceed. Flamberg. And we're gonna turn off the Flamberg. So that's fifteen hundred less points of damage, but that's still gonna be 15 plus 27 that's 42 plus the Arvada so added on at 936 that's 78 this is way more than enough if he just goes to the battle phase here Jesse's yeah. doing the calculations one more time I don't and he is and holding the beer there we go Jesse, Jesse cotton <sighs> taking the win dodging the beer shows the six card was the Nibiru for Shu uh. devastating.
My so close. Good for oh man, but what a match between two titans of the dueling community. But in the uh, end, it looks like Jesse Cotton nice. is going to have the best chance out of these two to make it to the top four. He's not guaranteed. We're going to see how the tiebreakers all line up. Who, how do the players with the draws finish? But he has put himself in the only position he can to make that top four. We might see him be one of our last players who could potentially be call themselves the undisputed ultimate dual series champion and i don't know if we will ever ever see this happen again <laughs> maybe we will maybe we won't <laughs> i don't know i would like to see it again it's such a wonderful series to just crown some of these big big duels all into one tournament definitely oh. i can't wait to see how it's going to play out if this man the myth the legend jesse Cotton will make it all the way. I know he was a lot of people's picks to win it at the beginning pick. of the weekend. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, the little bit of my pick. Uh, yeah, Furman didn't quite make it. He got a, three losses a, a little early and wasn't able to have a, much of a chance to make it top four, but still is going to get that awesome participation pack. Same thing for all the other players who make it. There's 16 players here, only four make it to day two, but the other 12 who don't are still walking away with fantastic mm -hmm. prizes celebrating the Ultimate Duelist Series. But we definitely going into this weekend, we knew that Fire King Snake Eye was the deck. I know there's a big debate among the community, which one is better? Is it better to include the Fire King stuff with the Snake Eye or just to go pure? And I think we see really good arguments for both, seeing how both these players uh, play. And we saw some really useful techs from Xu Ping. You get a little more room to include tech cards because, I mean, you're just replacing those Fire yep. King cards. They're not like adding more Snake Eye cards, maybe a couple here or there, but mainly it's just going to have more room for the tech cards. But to me, that means a little less consistency, yep. potentially a little more uh, you open yourself up to effect negation on your Snake Eye Ash a little bit more when you're playing that pure Snake Eye build. Yep. But, you know, still at the end of the day, it's a viable option. And I'm sure we'll see one of those in Top Cut as well. But I know for a fact we're going to see a Fire King Snake Eye in the Top Cut. Yes. Whether it's Jesse or Cam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, what was really wonderful about Xinping's play in the game, too, just cycling the Snake Eyes Flamber Dragon from one zone to another, knowing how to manipulate it perfectly timing so that there's always a copy available mm -hmm. in the right spot, and ultimately using that to take the win from Jesse. But then we got to the game three. Yeah, just wasn't there for I mean, that game two between those two, probably one of my favorite games of the whole weekend. Just yeah, watching that flame bird just dance around <laughs> everywhere. It's just so funny to me. And like, it wasn't like it took Xu Ping a long time to come up with that play. Like he knew what he's well prepared, well practiced, knew what he was looking for, knew despite having an awful opening hand, not what you want to see to keep the mental to stay in it, to be focused, to realize it doesn't matter how you draw, this is what you have to work with. You can't be upset about it. You just got to work with you have. got to do the best that you can. Exactly. Your all. I mean, that's like what a lot of more novice players just can't handle. Oh, I, I brick, I couldn't play. Mm -hmm. But you need to be able to see these lines, see these options. I mean, he also ate a dimension shifter as well previously oh. and got out of it. Yeah, sometimes you just have to wait. I mean, a lot of people say, how do you beat Dimension Shifter? You just got to wait it out. But I think our interviewer is ready with our winner. So let's go ahead and see what's going on at the stage. All right, we are here with Jesse Cotton after six rounds, hard fought. How did it feel to win that last one? Uh, it felt really good. I was really nervous. I was not playing my best, especially game two. What was going through your head in game one? Your hand was a little bit awkward, but you kind of managed to play through that. It's a blur. Oh, what the hell? What happened game one? Um, <laughs> when the nerves get you, it's hard to remember. Game one, I went second, and I veiled his oak. And then I honestly couldn't tell you what I did. I don't remember. <laughs> were there any plays that you could remember that you were really excited about? Oh, actually, I do remember game one. I I, uh, I didn't know Shu's deck, because um, obviously, you limit how much you can see while you're spectating other rounds. I knew he had a Borl a Borland in his extra deck card I was going to be conscious of. I didn't know what his tech cards were. So when his two sets, he had two set cards face down, um, my hand lost impermanence. I decided to cross out ahead of time to play around two infinite impermanence. Um, however, if, if I had known he had played Forbidden Droplet, then I would not have done that. Um, but yeah, that's what I did. How ready were you for like the other random Snake Eyes cards? Because there were a lot of them that are very versatile. I mean, I play Subversion. Uh, I think it's great versus the non-fire decks and uh dramatic trace i've like i read i've read and i've like maybe played a game or two with it but um I, i'm not too familiar with it yeah all right well congratulations and uh good luck if you go to day two 
Thank you very much. And uh, surprise, surprise, I'm not Tom Box, <laughs> but I'm hopping in here. How, where did you <laughs> I get know. here? Yeah, I just I looked this way for like a second. And yeah, I'm, Tom, uh, you look a little I'm different, Tom. You gotta, you Actually, nice... I, I am Tom Box. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but thank you so much for the interview. That was awesome to see Jesse Cotton. We're still going to wait to see if he actually is advancing to day two. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, with that performance, that was great. Really good series to close out there, right? Oh, yeah. It was amazing. I mean, two titans of the community yeah. going at it in the final round with everything on the line when on a bubble match. Yeah. I can't think, ask uh, for much more. Flambridge is now going to be called Mr. Worldwide uh, <laughs> from the Hurricane game community. He was going all over the place right there. He really was. Uh, every <laughs> zone, every spot you could go to. Speaking of worldwide, shout out to everybody who's been donating, coming in. Let's remind everybody about the charity Drive. Doctors Without Borders. Well, we're partnering with them because we're duelists without borders. Everybody who donates $10 USD or more will receive one entry into the highest tier that their donation makes them eligible for, along with all the subsequent lower tiers. What that means is if you donate more than $10, you can go into higher tiers, but you still get an entry into all the ones below it. And at the end of this all, 130 lucky winners will be chosen at random. This is a huge opportunity to uh, partner with Doctors Without Borders as well as to get some cool stuff for you at home. So keep those donations coming in. And with that in mind, we actually have an update here, Billy, because uh, we have some really cool donations that we want to highlight. First off, shout out to Mike Son for a thousand dollar donation. That is Amazing. insane. It was such a huge donation coming in and it really does make a difference. But we also have a lot of other donations with cool messages attached to them. So we wanted to highlight some of the fun ones that came through. So Billy, take a peek. That's what ones uh, do you want to highlight? Oh, I mean, first I got to shout out Shelly and Steve Furman, Aaron Furman's parents. Yep. Thank you so much for donating $50. You know your son's here giving it his all. And it's awesome that you're there watching and supporting him mm -hmm. and getting in on the donations with helping out supporting Doctors Without Borders. Uh, one from Isaiah as well, uh, saying that their mom taught them how to play the game when, with the first structure decks. Uh, and so happy to be part of the community. I honestly have a similar story. I remember getting the Red Eyes Darkness Dragon structure deck. Mm -hmm. My brother got the, the zombie one. I forget the name of that one. But uh, the, the Red Eyes versus zombie, zombie structure one, decks yeah. at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Those were a fantastic. The, the power level of those were so good at the time. <laughs> yeah, they were really good. Same kind of thing for me. And as well as, I just want one more to Earl. Earl, I know you out Earl? there. Always helps us out. Judge, $10 for doctors <laughs> and duelists everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everybody who had donations come through. Keep them coming. We're going to be shouting you out for the rest of the weekend as well going into tomorrow. But that brings us to uh, kind of the end of the day two here for the uh, quarter century celebration. So it's time to chat a little bit about what's coming forward here. Peak at coming events, Billy, because there's some really cool stuff that duelists uh, can start qualifying qualifying for. That's right. We have the Phantom Nightmare Regional Qualifier Game Mat. If you go to any regional or if you want to participate in an OTS championship, you'll be able to get this awesome game mat from February to April. With the card we've seen a lot yeah. of this weekend. <laughs> it's one of my favorite game mats I've ever seen. That's right. Promethean Princess, Bestower of Every Flames. duel, right? I think we've seen this card literally every single duel. Pretty much. I think so as well. It's definitely a beautiful mat. And as I mentioned, if you can't make it to a regional qualifier, Check out your local OTS store. We have OTS championships, and you mm -hmm. can qualify and still win this amazing game app. But it has that different logo where you're going to be that champion for logo. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to check out our other events, we have a Speed Duel main event game app for Remote Duel main event series. I think we have it, yep, February 24th. It's coming up very soon. I, it's so good, right? I love Dom Zalug. And then this mat I love featuring Silver's Cry. It's going to be another Duel Links main event game app for the Remote Duel main event series. Both these mats are incredible. I want. Mm -hmm both of them. Dude, this one looks so sick. Oh, 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 we got Zeus as well. Yeah, the Master Duel main event game map for the Remote Duel main event series, and I'm pretty sure this is a big map, yeah, too. Yeah, the it's not just, Yep, the death map, so it's going to be a little longer, featuring Zeus on a game map, and of course, our new win a map, the game map prize. It debuted this weekend at the Team YCS in San Jose, Costa Rica, and it features all of these pots from the pot collection. Look at those smiles. Uh, it's so cool, <laughs> and you see a pot of green in the center. Really fantastic. Lots of awesome stuff you can win from uh, our Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments. The the pot lore is incredible, by the way, on the artwork. I, I love like <laughs> following all the different pot cards. And it's then great. like you have like the the greed guys yeah, like running yeah. away with like, the pot. Something's going on with uh, the the greed guy, the greed goblin, <laughs> and the pot of greeds. Uh, also, uh, upcoming events. Uh, I mean, it's awesome to highlight all of those with all of the stuff that you can win from those. Uh, what are you most looking forward to? I know that there's the event next weekend that everyone's getting ready for. Oh yeah, the team YCS in Las Vegas is next weekend. It's gonna be streamed. We're gonna be back 
here again. Well, not here. We're going to be in Vegas casting that tournament, mm -hmm. and it's going to be incredible. We're going to see what kind of implications are going to fall out from this UDS and transfer into that. Same thing yes. for San Jose, Costa Rica. I'm assuming a lot of people uh, preparing for next week are uh, looking to get their hands on the Snake Eyes cards, <laughs> or at least oh. Prometheus Princess as well, because I, we've <laughs> seen how much damage it's done so far here, whether it's a pure Snake Eyes or the Snake Eyes Fire King. Which one are you liking more so far? I mean, I guess uh, um, you know we I'm just a Fire, saw Fire King, King win. <laughs> So. <laughs> I'm a Fire King Snake Eye guy. I mean, I would play pure Fire Kings. I mean, I was playing it before the Phantom Nightmare stuff. You still included like one Ash in a Flame Burge, uh -huh. but a lot more leaning on the Fire King aspect of it. I love Fire Kings from the be uh, from the beginning, and now that they're one of the top decks, I couldn't be happier. All right, fantastic stuff. Well, with that being said, uh, we're going to send it to a short break, but stick around because we actually have some other stuff planned for the rest of the day. We're going to have a really fun round table to close things out, talking about uh, how things went over at the Tokyo Dome event to celebrate the 25th uh, anniversary, as well as peaks going forward, and also confirmation on what the top four will actually be going into tomorrow. So you want to stick around. We'll be right back after this. Um, I won UDS Medellin in Colombia in 2019. I played Sky Striker, which was one of my most successful decks. And it was really challenging. It's a really difficult event. I got close two times, like I got third, and then I got second, and then I finally won. So yeah, it was really, really challenging, but it was really, really nice to win finally. The UDS that I won was in Panama 2019 with Lunalite Orcus. It was a tough tournament. I played a lot of really good opponents, including top four. I played another UDS champion, Andres Torres. In the finals, I played world champion, Galileo de Valdia. I won um, Las Vegas 2019 with Sky Striker. Um, it was a very challenging event. Um, you know, I went through, I don't remember how many rounds it was. I went X2 day one, though, and then I won out day two. And, uh, you know, it, I, I think that's the first time I've ever really been in top cut. And so it was, uh, you know, it was very challenging for me. And, I won the UDS in Florida with Pendulum Editions, and I was fortunate enough to go undefeated through the entire event. So it was, had some challenges, but one of the easier tournaments I played in. Uh, it was in Mexico, Monterey, 2018, I believe. I was playing Thunder Dragon. Uh, yeah, it was really hard because it was an FTK format. Everyone was in dangers. And I decided just to play Thunder Dragon because I like it. I think I was like the only player with Thunder Dragon at that event. And yeah, so it was really hard. I won UDS Chicago, Illinois 2016. It wasn't really challenging. I went undefeated, didn't really, didn't lose the match. Gané el UDS que se llevó a cabo en mi país, El Salvador. El deck a utilizar fue ABC. Fue un torneo fuerte, pero al final se logró. I won the uh, first UDS at Vegas and I played Zodiac. And I think any time that you're playing a tournament that's got 13 rounds of Swiss, it's going to be challenging, so. Yeah, I would definitely say that it was super challenging. Well, I won the UDS in Ecuador March 2016. I played Cosmo in that event, and yes, it was a lot of a challenge. I won UDS Kansas City in 2018 with Goki, and it was not very challenging. But you can read my feature match and let me know. Yeah, I won UDS LA in uh, 2015. Uh, I played Cosmo, and uh, yeah, it was pretty challenging. Every opponent I knew or heard of, and they're all pretty good. Yo gané el UDS de Bogotá en 2020 con Luna Light y sí fue un evento desafiante porque era el último evento en el que se podía clasificar al campeonato indiscutible de UDS. Entonces por eso fue complicado, fue un torneo muy largo, pero afortunadamente lo logré ganar. Uh, I won UDS Tulsa at uh, beginning of 2020 with Rocket Dragon Link. Uh, I went undefeated for the whole event. I guess it wasn't as challenging. Um, I won with uh, uh, UDS Indianapolis in 2019 and I won with Pure Thunder Dragon. Um, it was pretty challenging, considering that 
maybe I was one of the only Thunder Dragon decks there, uh, as far as pure, and everyone else played a heavily combo based deck. Uh, but it was a, it was really challenging in the beginning. I lost the first two rounds, and I ended up continuing to win. Principios de 2017, gané con Zodiac en Perú y finales de 2017 gané con Spiral en Trinidad y Tobago. Eh, fue un reto porque todos los torneos a los que voy siento que son un reto por todas las personas tan buenas que van a jugar y pues fue algo muy, muy extenuante, tantas rondas, tantos jugadores, el día 2 seguir jugando porque no estás dentro del evento. Creo que el UDS por eso me encanta porque es uno de los mejores eventos por tanto juego. Gané el UDS Invitacional de Santa Cruz el 2018 en Bolivia. Eh, jugué Pendulum Magician y sí fue un evento muy desafiante porque fue el primer evento premier al que asistí y pude ganar. This is the Pharaoh, wishing the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game a very happy 25th anniversary. Great job, guys. Amazing what you've done. So this is Dan Green. I'm the voice of the Pharaoh and Yugi, and I am so happy to be celebrating this 25th anniversary with everyone. It's amazing how much this game has influenced so many people's lives. But all of the people that I get to meet at conventions over the years, they tell me stories about how the game has introduced new relationships into their lives, ones that they truly value. And that alone, I think, is a tremendous achievement. And when I'm fortunate enough to be able to host one of the events where they're dueling for whatever sort of championship, the YCS stuff, those duelists have such intensity and dedication and devotion, it's really admirable. It's really remarkable. One of my uh, favorite memories that's Yu-Gi-Oh! related um, goes way back to when Yu-Gi-Oh! first came out. And this has a part two. But the part one is this amazing looking blonde woman came up to me and said, are you the voice of Yu-Gi? And I'll get you uh, more info on that later. But um, that was really special, being recognized for work that I've done in voiceover was really unique. Because, you know, it's not often that people will be able to pick you out of the crowd as you walk down the street. In terms of the most requested line, it's gotta be... <laughs> In terms of the most requested line, it's gotta be, it's time to duel! Uh, another good one is Exodia Obliterate, which is really fun to say. And if you haven't had your morning coffee, it gets the blood flowing. It's nice. In terms of the positive impact on my life and my career, I wasn't doing much voiceover at all before I started getting into the dubbing of anime. And that's led to a whole change in my career where now voiceover is what I primarily do. I've even been teaching it for several years. Of course, I teach people how to do it wrong, so I don't have any competition. But the most remarkable positive impact, and this is part two of the story of my favorite memory, is that without this show, I wouldn't have met the woman who became my wife, and I wouldn't have the children that I have today. So it's really hard to beat that, even in comparison to whatever professional achievement you could compare it to. Um, and in terms of how this game positively impacts people in their lives. When you go to these conventions, you see the openness and the acceptance. And I think that one of the greatest themes of that first series in particular was the theme of friendship. And I, a lot of people identify with Yugi. A lot of people deal with feeling like they're on the outside. And sometimes, unfortunately, a lot of people deal with bullying. So that the show, which is about playing a card game to a large degree, also being a show where people can understand what makes for a good relationship and what they deserve from a relationship and what they should give to a relationship is pretty cool. If I could play any other character in the show, it would be Kaiba. Villains are, well, not that he's a villain, he's a rival, as Eric would be quick to point out. And playing the antagonist, let's say, is generally more fun because it's a more active role. You're you're doing the things that the heroes are like, oh no. Um, so that's always that's always a nice thing to get to do. And I, I don't think that I could do it nearly as well as Eric Stewart. But in terms of which role looks like the most fun, it would have to be Kaiba's. And with that, 
I wish you and everyone who's a part of this amazing community that makes up the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game a very happy 25th anniversary. Look forward to the next one. It's time to do, 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 do. Welcome back, everybody, here to the Quarter Century Celebration, where we just wrapped up day two of the undisputed UDS Championships. We're getting ready to shout about the Legend of Duelist Quarter Century special event that happened at the Tokyo Dome, and I'm joined here on the couch by Jerome and Rhyme Style. But gentlemen, before we get too much into that event, we actually have to update everybody on the UDS Top Four, the undisputed Top Four Championships. Yeah. I have the list right here. I got the list. Jerome, do you want to do the honors? You know what? All right. Jerome will do the honors for us. All right, Jerome, All right, please announce everybody the top four for t going into tomorrow's <laughs> event. I haven't done this for a while, ever since I stopped judging. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm excited for this. It's like riding a bike. You got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. In first place with 16 points, Cameron Neal. In second place with 13 points, Andres Torres. In third place with 12 points, Juan Andrade Castro. And in fourth place, also with 12 points, which was the borderline, nobody with fewer than 12 points made it. It is none other than from the winning team in yesterday's <laughs> oh, come on. Just say it. Jesse <laughs> Cotton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You kept us waiting, Jerome. Uh, you, you gotta hype it up. You can't just like, you know. Run. Yeah, true. Yeah. True. Well, the Good last point. This one's always the most important. <laughs> exactly. It is. It is. Well, congratulations and to that the That was my top teammate, four. too, so definitely, I agree. It's most important. You know? Oh, yeah. You, you we're on Jesse's team. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good That's point. A Any insight match, into his strategy? Hey, were you well, judging his play today? We stayed up all night. I taught him how to, like, oh, do yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You gave him the ropes yeah. going into today's <laughs> event, of course. <laughs> well, shout out to the top four. That will round out day two for the undisputed UDS championships right there. But now we can chat about the Tokyo Dome event here. We're going to have a little roundtable discussion because the two of you were at the event to witness it all, and I hear that there's a lot of cool stuff going on. So <laughs> I can't wait to learn from the to? two of you. Where do we start? Well, let's start at the beginning of the event because I hear there's a concert that happened, right? Yeah. Yes. All right, so t talk me through the concert. What, what was it like? What were your reactions? What were the highlights? So there were two things first. Uh, the first part, they played you know, an orchestra rendition of Passionate Duelist. That's awesome. Which is something that opens up a lot of things. You saw it at the World Championship. Mm -hmm. You saw it at the World Championship a few years ago as well. And then after that opening ceremony, they had, you know, there was some talk time. Uh, they described some of the things that were going on at the event. And then we had the opening theme concert. Okay. And it starts out with uh, Genkai Battle, the ending from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX by oh, Jam Project. Oh, yeah. So it started out with that, and they all come out, and it's pretty hype. It's an excellent song to see live. Yeah. And they complete that song, and they talk to the members for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the other three then come back, and Osaki Endo stays out, who you might know from doing some of the 5Ds themes as well, like some of the really hype ones. I believe in Nexus, uh, mm -hmm. going my way, things mm -hmm. like that. So he stays on, and he does both of those songs, yep. Believe in Nexus and Going My Way. And it's super hype. That guy still got it. Seeing that live would be it so was cool. so cool. He is with, so good. With 25,000 people, by the way. That's, right. Yeah, the crowd was huge, <laughs> yeah. right? All right, what was uh, the crowd reaction like? Were they all it like... It was hype. Yeah. yeah. I honestly didn't know what to expect. But again, being in a giant stadium full of people who like the same thing is always cool. Mm -hmm. And I think they did 25,000 first day, 25,000 second day. And everybody's just like... These are our people. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like you can feel the energy. It's just great. 25,000 for 25 years. Look at that. <laughs> it worked out. It was, it was a massively big deal. I can, mm -hmm. I can actually show you this. Oh, oh okay. We, we have show and tell. full page ad taken out in the paper. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Oh, I'll bring this out. <laughs> Take a look at that. There is a whole full page ad taken out wow. in the paper for this. The amount of people was so great that they had to bring them in in shifts. Wait, raise it up again? Raise this up? Um, if you scan, what was it? This right here, I believe? Uh, you get you download a VR or a, an AR app, and you can see blue eyes flying around inside the stadium. Yeah, oh, it, it's very cool. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. I mean, yeah, they even show that off at the top. Oh, I guess that's Boy's Ultimate Dragon yeah. up at the mm -hmm. top, but that's that's sick. Mm -hmm. They do so many cool things when it comes to the live events, and I mean, that such a big stadium. How many people had their phones out doing that? Did, I, did you try it out? I 
tried it, but I didn't have a Japanese phone and an account. Oh, sure. But uh, <laughs> somebody else did it for me, and we got to like piss around. That's awesome. Blue eyes flying around in front of us. It was kind of cool. That's really cool. <laughs> That's really cool. So that was the beginning of the uh, of the yeah. entire event. But there's a lot of stuff that happened after that, right? Yes. So one of the big ones that I know everyone got to see and react to. The reaction was incredibly positive. I loved it. Was the sick animation. The um, uh, fr I believe it's called Yu-Gi-Oh card game, The Chronicles. If you yeah. haven't seen it, go YouTube that right now. Go check it out wherever you want online. It was amazing, right? The quality of it alone, plus we get to see some of the key moments in the lore from yeah. the cards. It was so cool. Yeah, so if you've been watching all weekend, you've probably seen it you know, in bits and pieces, mm -hmm. you know, the Charmers section or the Albaz section, all of that. But seeing it all together, all in a row, is just extraordinarily hype. You, you've got to do it. You have to. Yeah. I love the energy change as, you know, Aaron's favorite characters in lower popped up. Yeah. But it wasn't until Fallen Albaz popped that the entire stand oh, just roared. That was the big pop? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, you know, no surprise, not, the story to, there is recent, and it's yeah. so cool. And not to plug it, but I did a reaction at the stadium. You can look it up on YouTube. <laughs> but I mean, it, it was cool. Just, just, just seeing that in a giant, again, in a giant stadium full of 25,000 people mm -hmm. who all love Yu-Gi-Oh! And seeing that at the same time, at the same reveal, was just special. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that uh, I, a lot of people are probably jealous hearing these stories, but I feel like I'm living vicariously through <laughs> you because I could feel that energy as well. Uh, what were other big moments, though? Because there were a lot of reveals. I mean, mm. the end, the Sky Striker, did people go crazy for that? They, they did. I think the second biggest one, though, was the Melfi section transitioning into <laughs> the Zeus fight in space. <laughs> that transition period was so well-timed. <laughs> that was incredible, yeah. Uh, and the Zeus battle was sick, yeah. right? Yeah. You can literally Very see good. the moment where you detach, too. <laughs> also true. Also true. If you ever wanted to know what Zeus's attack might yep. look like if mm -hmm. it was on the anime, kind of like that. Yeah, the the video itself was amazing, but uh, what not everyone realized was it was also announcing a Konami Animation Studio. So it's cool. I mean, we don't know what is coming <laughs> next for that, right? There's been nothing confirmed, but it opens up a door, right, for more either cool videos like that. Maybe, you know, everyone hype up the branded video as much yes, as you can. Yes. Maybe maybe it's going to happen, right? You know, out of I curiosity, know. I don't know how we can see. Maybe we'll, people will tweet it. But I want to know, what of all the lores, what do people want to see the most? That's a good question. There's a lot of it. Like, the Crusadia lore is really sick as well. Uh, you know, watching the whole Ib journey uh, would be really sick to see in some type of story. This guy, Striker, I mean, it seemed like they were teasing something at the end because a lot of them had a card artwork, yeah. right? They, they got a manga for that in those stories. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. They, have, they have a lot to work off of that. Yeah. So, either way, whatever it means, whatever the future plans are, I think it's cool. And like I said, it opens a door for Konami to do a lot of unlimited different content. things. Yeah. It's literally unlimited content. And the fact that the quality was so good, too. I was a little sad that we only got just a tiny little bit of Visus and Diabelle Star as well. Yeah, I want yeah. to see maybe a little more of that myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not to put my thumb on the scale of which things we want to see more of. <laughs> I'm going to just, uh, let's just say it, the Melfis. What? Give us a whole show <laughs> of Melfis. Why not? <laughs> not? They didn't show, but my girlfriend definitely wanted to see uh, Dragon Maids, though. She was like, just, oh, if you were yeah. to do like one episode of the Dragon Maids, like... That'd be great, too. Yeah. <laughs> what we're saying is there's a lot of potential. Yeah. There's a lot of different things that that could potentially open up. So that's awesome. But another big thing that happened was uh, something you could actually experience. You could yes. only experience that. And, Jerome, I'm sorry. I know that you didn't get to. But <laughs> Rhyme did the VR experience. Can Talk I, to me about what that was like. I'm going to start off by saying I'm the biggest VR hater. Because, okay. one, I get, I get sick doing it. And, Ooh. two, I just feel like it's kind of like a gimmick. that's like whatever about it. But... When they were like, do you want to try? I was like, yeah, whatever. I, I guess I guess I can give a couple minutes to try. Yeah. It was amazing. It was like, you know, as, as kids, the thing we wanted the most is hologram duels. We wanted the duel. Yeah, disc. We I mean, to everyone look, imagines yeah. Bean versus Pegasus on the big stage. Yeah. You're like having the duel disc, right? When yeah. I say I promise you this is the closest closest thing to that, it's the closest thing to that. And I'm not trying to like gas it up like, oh, you know, you got the experience. Of, you're just probably hyped up. No, it's real. You go inside. <laughs> Obviously, it was limited. I think they were definitely trying to test out what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. You walk in, you know, you play Necro Valley. You, the entire field changes. So oh. it's like, if they were to do, like, the whole VR thing one day, it's like, does that mean, you know, the, the field spell will cause the arena to change? Yeah. And then, you know, Dark Magician Girl pops up, attacks Sagi. Blue Eyes shows up. I don't know if I can reveal what happens next, but Blue Eyes attacks. Yeah. And, then something <laughs> happens and he looks to your left. He's, you know, you stand there. Like, the demo that they showed doesn't do it justice because the demo that they showed was kind of like, you know, you see it from the spectator view, but being yeah. inside, like, looking around, you know, Dark Magician be, like, was all up in your face, like, oh, what are we going to do? Like, it was <laughs> Judging just... your hand, like, yeah. why did you built this deck? Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the future. And I'm just like, I remember afterwards, I, I, I looked at everybody, I'm like, can we, like, speed this up? I need this, like, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 
It, it, I, hearing you explain it, because we had a conversation a little bit about this before mm -hmm. this entire weekend event, and we were talking about, like, you know, when you were kids and you wanted, you imagine, like, oh, maybe in the future we're going to have the technology to have holograms summon up. And I'm happy you say, like, well, this is just that, basically, yeah. right? Like, imagine you play Necro Valley, boom, mountains exactly rise up uh, <laughs> on each side, and then you're face to face in I, the valley with somebody. I just love C Reacts with that, too. And me and C Reacts had the same reaction. Like, when Blue Eyes shows up, like, He's the, the blue is just towering above you, and she attacks you, <laughs> and we're both doing the same thing. We're just reacting like, like, and then the smoke clears. Oh. You look to your left, and Dark Magician just stands like, "I got you, bro!" Like, oh. it was just amazing. That sounds so cool, mm -hmm. Jerome. What do you think when you hear something like that? <laughs> it, I jealousy mainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the main thing. <laughs> but also, I would also like them to hurry that along as yeah. much as possible because I want to try it out too. I'm, I'm actually with you as well. I'm not the biggest on VR as well. Mm -hmm. But if you let me duel in VR, I'm in. Yeah. Just immediately. You know, VR, like, I'm not trying to knock VR, but like, you know, you're moving around, you know, you're running around, you get sick, you get motion sick. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel motion sick at all. And I get motion sick pretty fast in VR. So it was like, if there's a game that's going to do VR right, it's this. Mm. Let's just not add 5D's motorcycle uh, duels is what you're I might get sick if we know. do that. Yeah, that, that, would <laughs> that would be really cool. I do want to so. try that. Yeah. I do want to try that. Uh, either way, that experience sounds so awesome. And I can't wait. Like you said, let's hurry that up. Come on. Let's get that uh, get that into our pockets as soon as we can. I, that's also something that might get me to finally uh, get into VR, too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on the same page there. Well, I won't make us well on that for too long. I know a lot of people wanted to hear about that. So thanks, Ryan, for talking about your experience. Any other things that you want to finish I, off with? I probably will say, because a lot of people were messaging me like, oh, should I get VR headset now? I would just wait, because, again, this is not going to be a tomorrow thing. We, we don't know yeah. when it's coming out. So just wait until we get an announcement and then figure out, you know, what we need and everything. But the but future is great. Have it on your radar. Have <laughs> the it future, on your radar. Yeah, have it on your radar. The future is great. Okay, that's awesome. Well, thanks, Ryan, for chatting about that. Uh, moving on, though, some of the other cool things that happened at the event. I, I don't know what this is, but I was told to ask about the food. Okay. What was going on with the food? So I actually have something. For oh, you have well. something. So okay. what I brought with me here, this is the brochure that they gave out to everybody who came into the Tokyo Dome event. And What's in here is it's got a map of Do you the want me to open it thing. up yeah, for you? Can you open right. this up? So there's a map in there of everything as well as, you know, here's what all the events are. Here's the schedule for the stage shows and the like. And if you see over on here. Oh, yeah. You can see that there's uh, some food items there are, yep, up you, in here you got as it. well. They kind of arranged their, like, cafe collaboration Exodia right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's five different items there. Yeah. Uh, there's the, uh, the Blue Eyes Parfait <laughs> over there is the first one. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of got a vanilla, not quite yogurt. It, there's like blueberries, yeah. Blue, yeah, yeah and blueberries. They're uh -huh. like candy I see blueberries it. too. There's like it's a cinnamon kind of blue. granola perfect, there yeah. at the bottom. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so I had that. It was pretty good. I would have preferred the red eyes chocolate one. That's right next. Oh, to it. yep, of course. But of course. when we went to try and get that one, it was sold out. Like I saw the signs for it at one of the uh, concession stands, but by the time we got there, it was sold out. Maybe uh, confirmed Red Eyes more popular than Blue Eyes? I, huh? It's yeah. possible. <laughs> we all knew it all. Uh, right? They were yeah. gassing it up in the stage show a little bit earlier okay, as sure, well, sure. and it was full of chocolate, which automatically makes it better. Clearly, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so moving on, we have the uh, the Thunder Force Soda. That's the uh, the Slifer or Osiris-themed drink as okay. well. It's kind of a sour apple. I think it tastes kind of like a sour apple soda. And sure. they put something similar to Pop Rocks in it as well. <laughs> so that was crackling like yeah, thunder. Yeah, you, know, you need the lightning. Well. Yeah, you need, yeah, the, lightning you need the effect, the shock. If it's not reducing my attack by 2,000 points, <laughs> I don't want it. And it certainly did. And it was very good. Okay. I like that a lot. Now, now, this next one, I think, might require a little... Why, why is Raw a hot dog? <laughs> so that is the God Blaze Cannon <laughs> oh, hot dog. Oh. Uh, it is very spicy. That's amazing. <laughs> it, is, it was uh, very spicy. Uh, between the three of us who there is myself and our judge team, uh, Julie and Chris, we couldn't finish it. Okay. In between the three of us, it was oh, wow. very hot. Wow. It was very hot. Well, I mean, if, if Joey could barely handle it, I don't know what we're expected yeah, to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, Joey dies in that one. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was the episode preview. There was actually a stage show where they talked about their favorite moments from the TV series. Uh huh. And one of them was this, the preview of the episode before, you know, Joey gets wrecked. And it's all like, no, you'll be fine, Joey. And then the name comes up on screen, and the episode's just called Joey Dies. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when the episode just, like, tells you what's about to happen. Okay, there's one more yes. on there, though. It's the obelisk. Uh, I like this one a lot, though. This is the obelisk God Hand Crusher burger. Oh. So this was a burger that had uh, cheese that I didn't quite identify and a sauce that I didn't quite identify. Obelisk is mysterious. And a, uh, like, fried Spam oh, okay. on the bottom of it as well, which I never actually had fried before nice uh but i did have that and it was quite good 
I liked it a lot. Well, I'm happy I asked about the food, I have mm-hmm. to say. <laughs> so we were one piece short of Cafe Exodia. We were not able to oh, get the Oh, yeah, yeah, You yeah. forgot one of the most important part, though. What yes. did you get when you got the food? Ah, okay. So they all had, like, little items with them. Okay. So, for example, if you take a look at the uh, Thunder Force soda, it's got, like, a little key tag get in on kind of thing yeah. on there with the art of uh, Cyrus' Slifer on okay. it. And in addition, you got a sticker with each of them. Of the rat, of the uh, associated god card or mm. the monster in question, so red eyes, blue eyes, etc. Sure. Also, it's a little hard to see in the blue eyes parfait, but the I marshmallow imagine, yeah. on top there also has a blue eyes printed on it. Okay. So the blue eyes white marshmallow was pretty tasty. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't get a chance to try it because uh, the lines were ridiculous. Again, 25,000 people. It was they ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So uh, anytime there was like downtime, everybody got up and got in line. And That's cool. I tried. <laughs> I tried and gave up. I, I want to try the Slifer drink because Slifer's the best god card, you know, I'm just, just oh, tossing it out there. Oh, I, just I, I like the Slifer drink a lot. Would you have tried the raw hot dog? And do you think you could have finished well, it? Well, it's funny because C-Rex, so C-Rex is vegan, and he leans over to me and goes, if I bought you a, a wiener, would you eat it? I'm like, yes. yes. I, don't know what, I, don't know, oh. I don't know why, oh. but I'm, I'm like, oh, I see why, because it's, it's meat and you want the raw sticker. Yes, bro, go get, the, go, go get it. And then he also tried to wait in line and just failed because it was just that. Oh, <laughs> no. That, did, what, did he tell you that it was a spicy one, or did he even know? We didn't know. Oh. That would have been a, that would have been a shock. Yeah. That would have been content right it there. Was, it was very shockingly. <laughs> like, you expect it to be a little spicy, you know, because Phoenix rising from the flames and all that. <laughs> yeah, 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 not yeah, that yeah, spicy. Yeah, not that spicy. <laughs> Sirius also told me to just go ahead and toss it out there. You know, Wing Dragon Raw needs more support. And, you know, I'm going to take my opportunity to mm-hmm. say Slifer mm-hmm. as well. All right. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Well, uh, one final thing that we wanted to uh, highlight here before we wrap up this part of the round table is the fact that we have a, a fun socials giveaway which I believe you have some things so uh, at the end of the month um, keep your eyes on the socials because we're going to be giving away three sets of these Dark Magician and Blue Eyes card sets which I believe we're going to open up here well. alright so they, they uh, combo off beautifully Rhyme Style, do you want to take one of them? Yeah they, they yeah. actually connect which is kind of sick so I haven't seen these yet I don't know what they look like but I'm excited to take a look at them Okay, so so which one's supposed to be on the right, which is on the left? Here we go. It's like this. Oh, I already revealed it, I guess. So you connect them, and I believe it's supposed to make the Tokyo Dome. Yeah. That is awesome! It's kind of hard to see, but you can see. Yeah, there it is. Ooh. Yeah, they're, they're really shiny, but you can see the outline behind. Yeah, right in there. That is beautiful. Yeah. Quarter Century Secret Rare, Blue Eyes and Dark Magician with the custom art background making the Tokyo Dome. Three. The names are green as well. The names are green. Ooh, that's awesome. Yeah. So three sets of those will be given away on our socials at the end of the month. So make sure that you're following. Make sure that you start following there. Oh, there you go. Uh, because uh, that's awesome. You don't want to miss out on the opportunity to get those. Those are beautiful. But with that being said, thank you, too, for coming on and chatting mm-hmm. about the Tokyo Dome event. We're going to send it to a short break. Or, or actually, we're going to take a look at the set that was just released. And then after that, we're going to have a roundtable discussing what that means for the metagame and all the cool strats coming out. So we'll be right back after this. Hey everyone, this is Billy Brake. Welcome back and get ready for an exciting look into 2024's first core booster set, Phantom Nightmare. This 100 card set is bursting with new themes, new effect monsters, spells, and traps, plus a new strategy inspired by one of the more memorable story arcs in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Let's get right into it. Here is Phantom Nightmare. If I were to choose one word to describe Phantom Nightmare, it would be legacy. This core booster revisits the legacy of one of the most beloved booster sets of the GX era, breathes new life into a long line of light ritual monsters dating back to the earliest days of dueling, and introduces a world premiere theme full of monsters that continue to defend their home, even though their physical bodies are long gone. So, let's start at the very beginning of the set with a card that's number 001 in the set, and is aiming to be number 001 in your heart as well. Yubel was originally introduced in Phantom Darkness, but the spirit of Yubel is live and well here in Phantom Nightmare. While super polymerization was crucial to the character Yubel's plans in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, it wasn't really part of the strategy based around the card Yubel until now. You'll also find new cards based on Yubel's monsters from the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX series. 
the original grinder golem may have been used by Jesse Anderson, but he was under the control of Ubel at the time. And we saw just a few episodes later that this card was actually part of Ubel's deck. The original Samsara Lotus and Spell Chronicle, on the other hand, got a lot of work as part of Ubel's strategy in the duel against Jaden. Remember these cards from the Dawn of Dueling? In Phantom Nightmare, these two and more are reborn as servants of the Voiceless Voice. Defend low the prayers of the Voiceless Voice while calling upon the power of Light Dragon and Light Warrior Ritual Monsters. These two monsters on the side may look familiar as well. That's right, these new cards greatly resemble Sephira and Sor Avis, don't they? You might want to check your collection for these Ritual Monsters, as they work well with this new theme. Ultimately, you'll want to Ritual summon the new Skull Guardian, Protector of the Voiceless Voice, alongside Lo. While Lo is on your field or in your graveyard, the new Skull Guardian's attack points rise all the way to 4100, and that's just a third of what it can do. Get on your bike, or bike equivalent monster, and ride into battle with a new strategy that excels at Xyz summoning. Diabellstar the Black Witch returned from the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye with a mysterious new Snake Eye monster in tow. But now she's caught in the crosshairs of the Goblin Bikers. The basic Goblin Bikers are level 3 monsters that can special summon themselves in a flash by detaching an Xyz material from an Xyz monster. Any Xyz monster, including your opponents. Will the Goblin Bikers apprehend Diabellstar and get their hands on her Snake Eye charge? Or will they severely regret their life choices? You'll just have to wait and see. Some lucky players who attend the Phantom Nightmare Core Booster Premiere event can get a head start on building their own Goblin Biker deck by winning a promotional copy of Goblin Biker Grand Entrance. So make sure that you get to your local official tournament store. In Phantom Nightmare, you'll come face to face with Vados, the Eruption Dragon of Extinction, a monster whose power can destroy the cycle of life and death itself. The defenders of Obsidine could not save their home from the might of Vados, and were reduced to ash along with their city. The destructive power of Vados was so great that their very souls were burned into the remains of the city itself. And now they relive their struggle against Vados for all eternity keeping up the fight for so long that their names have been lost to the sands of time. Phantom Nightmare brings back a lot of old favorites as well, covering a wide variety of summoning techniques and tactics. Raid Raptor soared to even greater heights with a rank 13 Xyz monster. The Aroma strategy branches out into fusion. Magispectors tackle Pendulum, Xyz, and Link summoning all at once. And new Goatee monsters make synchro summoning even easier. Of course, there's more where that came from you can find a special present from a certain Link 2 monster, or finally add Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames to your real-life dueling deck. Whatever you're in the mood for, you won't want to miss out on Phantom Nightmare. Phantom Nightmare is lurking around the corner and waiting for you to unlock all of its secrets. If you want to get your hands on it early, be sure to visit your local OTS during our premiere weekend on February 3rd and February 4th. Stay tuned as this week continues for videos from your favorite content creators exploring the strategies and themes in Phantom Nightmare. Plus, for a more exclusive deep dive into our new world premiere theme, The Ash End, we'll be releasing a bonus segment tomorrow exploring the mechanics of this brand new theme. Finally, we cap off the week with content creator pack openings. I'm sure you will be full of surprises. Secret rares, ultra rares, super rares, and of course the latest quarter century secret rares will all be up for grabs. Glad to have y'all join us once again at this in-depth look into Phantom Nightmare. Always a pleasure. I'm Billy Brake. Thanks for watching and don't forget, 
It's time to duel. The key cards for the new Ashen theme are Vados, the Eruption Dragon of Extinction, and Obsidine, the Ashen City. Let's talk about Vados first, since it's a monster you might see even outside of Ashen decks. Vados can spring out of your hand as a quick effect to lay waste to any card in the field zone. When you use this effect, you special summon Vados to your opponent's field, destroy the card that was targeted, and then you can either add to hand or set an Ashen Continuous Trap from your deck. There are many field spells out there that add a monster from deck to hand and set off entire combos on their own, so a quick effect way to eliminate them before they can do that can be very useful indeed. But what about the big monster you leave your opponent with? Your opponent will be hard pressed to use Vados to advance their strategy, because if it goes from your opponent's field to your graveyard, you can use it to destroy all monsters on the field. The Ashen Field spell is Obsidine, the Ashen City. If it's destroyed or banished while it's in the field zone, you get to special summon an Ashen monster from your deck. Destruction is preferable, as Obsidine can return a copy of itself from your graveyard to the bottom of your deck to let you draw a card during your end phase. There's one more line of text there at the start, which will be important momentarily, but at the most basic level, what you want to do is put Obsidine on the field, then destroy it with Vados, Special summon Vados to your opponent's field, get an Ashen Continuous Trap from your deck, and special summon an Ashen Monster from your deck. All of the Ashen Monsters can be special summoned from your hand while Obsidine is on the field. The King of the Ashen City can command other Ashen Monsters into battle. The basic version of the effect special summons from your hand, but if your opponent controls a monster with 2800 attack or more, like Vados, you get to special summon from your deck instead. A king with a massive dragon-sized problem is often in need of a hero to deal with it. As a quick effect in the main phase, Hero of the Ashen City can destroy any pyro monster on the field. Then, if it destroyed Vados, you can place an Obsidine from your deck into your field zone. This is also where the first line of Obsidine comes into play. During your turn, it greatly expands the reach of which monsters your hero can strike down by changing your opponent's special summon monsters into pyro monsters. Finally, the last of the Ashen monsters in Phantom Nightmare is Priestess of the Ashen City, who can add any other Ashen card from your deck to your hand. I think you'll find yourself using this to get another copy of Obsidian quite frequently, but you can also grab any of the other Ashen monsters. As long as Obsidian is on the field, having the King or the Priestess is the same as having all three. King can special summon Priestess, who adds Hero, or special summoning Priestess lets you add King, which special summons Hero from the deck. One of the great things about Vados is that it can set this trap card directly from your deck. So if you destroy your opponent's field spell on the first turn of the game and give them Vados, they now have to deal with the fact that you can just take it back from them on your turn if they leave it on the field, or if they get rid of it, you can wipe out all monsters on the field add Vados back to your hand, give it over to them again on your turn, and then take it back from them with the trap. In the process, your opponent's monsters will lose 2,800 attack points, likely leaving them with nothing. A successful strike with Vados and all three Ashen monsters will deal exactly 8,000 damage, so you'll be putting your opponent in a difficult spot from the word go. I've spoken a lot about the importance of both Vados and Obsidian. So, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this highly convenient card that could get them both in a flash. Awakening of Vados is a quick play spell that puts Obsidine directly on the field on either player's side of the field. Then, if your opponent controls a card in the field zone, you can add a level 5 or higher Dark Pyro Monster from your deck to your hand. The obvious choice is Vados, since this is Awakening of Vados. But keep in mind you can grab King of the Ashen City or Hero of the Ashen City as well to help you assemble all the pieces you need to achieve victory. All of these cards are easy to get out of your deck, and in addition to using the in-theme cards, you can use Bonfire to add Priestess of the Ashen City to your hand, 
or a Lore of Darkness to dig deeper into your deck, since all your monsters are dark. All right, welcome back, everyone, to our post day one of the UDS, day two of the quarter century celebration roundtable. I know y'all just talked about that awesome Tokyo Dome event. Man, it made me really wish I was there. It seemed like there was so much awesome stuff to do and see. But now we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that we've been seeing this weekend. And that's right, we just saw the trailer for Phantom Nightmare, the latest core booster to the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. And it is quite a good one. There's a lot of stuff in there. We've seen the Ashen stuff. What are some of the favorite things out of there that you like, Jerome? I wish I had been around for the premiere event, but I was in Japan for that and for the release of the set. So I haven't gotten my fan nightmare yet, but when I do, I want to get my hands on the Goblin Bikers. I play a lot of rank three kind of stuff. Like lately, I've been playing a lot of Gold Pride, for instance, and using the Armored Xyz cards from Age of Overlord as well. And the Goblin Bikers kind of lean into that game plan a lot. So that's what I'm looking forward to getting my hands on as soon as I get the chance. All right, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Goblin Biker, Big Gabunga. That's my thing. I just want to be able to tell my opponent, I'm summoning Big Gabunga, and you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Big Gabunga's a great card. It's really cool and has an awesome name. How about you, Tom Box? What are some of the things that you like out of Phantom Nightmare? I like the voices. I covered the voiceless voice, uh, I guess, in the reveal of Voiceless Voice. However, my big attention is spent on U-Bell cards. Yes, I love the spirit of U-Bell. Actually, when the first time when it came out, I tried it out at my locals. I forgot that the Spirit of U Bell can actually summon from hands. So I was just taking a lot of unnecessary damage. But once I realized that, hey, Spirit of U Bell, oh, when they attack, I get to summon out Spirit of U Bell. And uh, I realized a lot of people make little, little misplays, forgetting about like certain effects, such as, oh, if you destroy the Spirit of U Bell, you get to summon a different U Bell. And uh, I love it against the voiceless voice matchup when they destroy it. Like, oh, by the way, I can summon another one because it's destroyed from the hand. I summon a U-Bell. You crash into it. Now you have to, and I have Nightmare Pain on the field. They have to hit into it and take the effect damage. That's like really, really good. So I really like the U-Bell stuff and I think it's going to get even better. So that's why I'm just starting early right now. Yeah, there's the parallels between Spirit of U-Bell and Spirit of Neos. Yes. <laughs> Both of them summoning in the same kind of way. Yes. Yeah, definitely two cards that not only do awesome effects, they look awesome in themselves and have that revitalization of the, you know, the old school cards that we always like to see. And yeah, Ubella fan favorite. And it's definitely going to have more cards coming as you're alluding to. So definitely keep an eye out for future sets if you're also fans of Ubell. Now this weekend we are celebrating the quarter century. That's 25 years of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. But we have a team of YCS that also took place in Costa Rica this weekend. We have a little bit of a look in to see what that was like. So let's go ahead and take a look at our our team YCS in Costa Rica. Dear duelists around the world, my name is Brian and I'm here with my friend Anthony and we are here in the Team YCS San Jose Costa Rica 2024 in the Costa Rica Convention Center. So Anthony, how do you think about the event right now? The organization has been excellent so far. Uh, we have a lot of players. We have a total of 135 te teams, yeah. which translates to 405 players in total for eight rounds of Swiss format today and top cut for top 16 tomorrow. So for that 135 teams, we have 10 teams that are our bounties in the event. So whenever a team wins one of these of these bounty teams, they will receive a pricing of total three packs for the booster packs. And as well for this event, we will have a lot of other side events like win a match, regionals, and of course the Dragon Duels that we'll be covering later. Brand, stay tuned and also you guys at home because we're gonna bring you some more content, some interviews with well-renowned players that are coming from outside the country. So keep an eye on it. See you guys. 
Well, that was fantastic. It's exciting that we have a Team YCS going on this weekend. They're always a lot of fun, and it's in Costa Rica. You know, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game without borders. We, it transcends language barriers, and just like that, Doctors, Doctors Without Borders does the same thing. They're trying to help spread, you know, good around the entire world, and that's why we're raising money from this weekend. We're going to donate to that charity. You can win some awesome prizes, and also just, you know, donate some awesome money to a great charity, because Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game without borders. We play all around the world, so we're going to be talking about that but it's a team YCS coming up next weekend in YCS Vegas now they're gonna be looking to the results of Costa Rica they're gonna be looking to the results of the undisputed ultimate duelist series how what kind of impact do you think this weekend's gonna have on next weekend I'll start with you Tom I think we got to see a lot of creative plays uh, from like some of the best players here I mean these are all champions in their own right. And uh, tomorrow, maybe we'll find out who's the undefeated one of them all. Now, I think there's a lot of interesting plays. I think if we could crown someone as the most creative player, I would have to say it's Shin Ping. Mm. Shin Ping did a lot of things that are definitely not expected. And uh, we got to see it. We got to see in the, the, the last round just now how even if you break, you, if you manage to get the Flamberger Dragon, you can dance it around the <laughs> field a little bit and it would go in and out of the deck and come back out. This is really well managed resource. And um, even when he got hit by a dimensional shifter, it wasn't all over. He had techs available for that, like Parallel Xyz, just using a Link Karibo, and managed to play out of it, not using any of the Snake Eye cards. I thought that was very interesting, and we might see more of that. Definitely. I think you definitely want to keep your eye on the Fire King Snake Eye deck and the Pure Snake Eye deck. Which one's going to kind of take be more popular? But there's a lot of other options. Are there any other strategies you're hoping to see next weekend kind of come out of this that maybe the people are going to see like the weak points of these strategies? Yeah, so the interesting thing for me this weekend is that we didn't actually see Voiceless Voice show up at all. And I suspect that all the Voiceless Voice players or the players who are planning on bringing that to Vegas in a week have been sitting here watching this trying to figure out all the different ways the Fire King Snake Eye Duelists have to get around things like Shifter or to dance that Flamberge Dragon around and coming up with their own counter strategies for it. So I think we might see Voices Voice appear kind of in force at the Team YCS in Vegas as a result. Oh, you know, I like that. I really hope so. I'm a big fan of Voiceless Voice. I mean, Low is such a cool card, and it really gets just that one card, gets your whole deck going in online. So it's a really like, simple and straightforward deck, but if you play it effectively, back up your Skull Guardian with something like Summon Limit. It's kind of tough for other decks to deal with, and I really hope we see a lot more Voiceless Voice next week. But who knows? The Team YCS is going to be a brand new weekend. Lots of going to learn from these tournaments, so anything really can happen. But there's also something brand new we want to reveal to you. There's a brand new game mat, that's a desk mat actually, that you can win from playing Master Duel. Let's go ahead and check out this quick video that's talking about this brand new game mat that you can win. Welcome back to the Steam YCS here at Costa Rica. This time we're bringing you some beautiful prizes that you can get from our side events, such as this amazing pot collection play mat, which has been delivered for the first time here I say price. What do you think, Brian? Uh, that's a really beautiful play, man, Pandony. But I think I will sit with this one. It fits very well with personality. What do you think about this one? Uh, that's absolutely stunning. I love Master Duel, and this play, man, is amazing. But for now, I got to keep it with the pot collection. Yeah, for sure. Remember that this play, man, you can get it from the pricing of the Master Duel tournament that we will have here in YCS San Jose, Costa Rica. Stay tuned for more information. Hello guys, welcome back to the coverage with the Team YCS San Jose Costa Rica 2024. We are here with the next door team. So guys, in terms of enjoying how you feel with this event, how is it going so far? It's pretty good so far. We're X1, but we're, we're expecting to finish strong. Uh, tournament's going well. Uh, could have played better in the earlier rounds, but we're trying to finish strong. Yeah, I, uh, I've been in Costa Rica three times now, so I like it here. It's awesome. And uh, yeah, looking forward to just keep on doing well. And I've been enjoying the event so far. Now, the next question that I want to give you guys is, what's the difference between preparing for a team YCS rather than just a normal YCS? So what do you guys think? Um, I think that in a 3v3 setting, like you're able to take a little bit more risks because uh, because it's 3v3, uh, every, the risk is mitigated and uh, spread out across three players. So you can lose a match and still win. So and also like from a tech choice perspective, you can definitely like 
play something more uh, high risk, high reward, because you know, you at the end of the day, you can lose one and your teammates can win. So I think that's like a major part of it. Yeah, just also testing with like uh, your teammates a lot throughout the just the time before, so you know what they're thinking and they know what you're thinking. So like when you're going through a match, you guys can talk very quickly and not waste time. Because since you're playing three matches at the same time, you don't want to waste any of those precious 45 minutes. You guys said it all, to be honest. Yeah. Practicing more, uh, all of us coming together prior, knowing what decisions we want to make so we don't have to ask each other. So we're just pre-prepping. Really free prepper rights. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome answers. Uh, I got one more question, but this one's just specific for Pac. Uh, Pac, do you think that you have what it takes, and your team as well, yeah. so you can be a team YCS champion once again? Uh, we did it. We were the last three or three champions, so I think we can do it again. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. awesome. Well, the best of luck, guys, and Thank you. keep enjoying the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank Thank you. you. All right. All right, that was awesome to hear from one of the teams competing in Costa Rica at that team, YCS. We're going to have to see if Pac's going to take it home tomorrow. We've been celebrating 25 years of Yugo here at the Quarter Century Celebration. Yesterday, we had the Dueling 7th uh, Invitational. We had a Master Duel Invitational. And if you haven't missed that, make sure you go on YouTube, find the VOD, and watch what happened. It has some epic moments you don't want to miss. Today, we had six rounds of Swiss for the Undisputed Ultimate Duel Series, where we cut to the top four who are going to come back tomorrow, and we're going to find out who is the champion of champions here from the ultimate duelist but before that we're going to be running anime episodes all night if you missed last night make sure you stick around to watch some of the most iconic episodes they're going to be not just from one series it's going to be from a hand-picked episodes from a broad amount of series i know jerome you're excited about some episodes that are coming on tonight i am <laughs> i'm gonna have it on all night i turned it on this morning before i came over here got to see yudo versus yugo i believe a really funny duel yeah phantom nights are awesome so we're gonna have to stick around watch the anime episode we're raising money for doctors without borders so if you want to donate make sure you find out check the link below there's been posting in the twitch chat links to the donations you can also win awesome prizes from donating 130 lucky people will be walking away with prizes you'll get them more information just by clicking the link below but we're gonna be back tomorrow and we're gonna have the top four going on we're gonna have the both matches streamed and then we're gonna stream the finals so you're really not gonna want to miss out on that stick around watch some Yu-Gi-Oh episodes come back in the morning for the final of the undisputed ultimate duelist series we'll see you tomorrow morning